Dragon's Breath Written Chapter 1 Emperor Qin Shi Huang Mausoleum, China A bruised sky of coiling purple and orange spread out across a blue canvas. At its center stood a giant mound encased in a forest of greens. The last shards of sunlight struck the pyramidal peak that enclosed Emperor Qin Shi Huang's ancient mausoleum, turning the thick forest to a bright red like a golden fire. It lasted just a few seconds, then faded like a puff of air, resembling the hot, fiery breath of a mythical dragon. A little over half a mile to the north, the gray Dongfeng electric van, ubiquitous in China, traveled silently along the Qinyongguan Highway as it climbed the historical roads that traversed the mountainous east-west barrier formed by the Qinling, Mikang, and Daba mountain ranges. It was a journey traveled since ancient times, when Chinese people moved between the Guazhong, known as the land within the passes, to the plains of Sichuan, the difficult terrain was once skillfully navigated using innovative technology called plank roads, by which ravines and steep-sided gorges were traversed using trestles fixed into the rock face. Although heavily upgraded and modernized, the Qinyongguan Highway still followed this ancient path as it snaked through rugged mountains, forests, wild rivers, and natural wilderness. The roads provided a bridge between southern trade routes such as the Tea and Horse Road to Tibet and northern routes such as the Silk Road to the west and formed part of the Great Road from Beijing to Yunnan, once described by Marco Polo. The Dongfeng slowed to a crawl as its underpowered electric Ricci EC35 drivetrain, which produced just 80 horsepower, struggled to make headway with its unusual cargo on board. The van pulled into a breakdown lane, its driver slowing right down, before eventually coming to a stop. The driver, a well-built man with a frame that appeared too large for the vehicle, put on the Dongfeng's hazard lights, but stayed in the vehicle, as though ready to drive off at a moment's notice. The passenger side door slid open, and a man with brown hair and ocean blue eyes stepped out. He was carrying a large tripod mounted telescope with the arrogance of a determined photographer. An onlooker might assume he was in search of that magic shot of the sunset over the ancient necropolis. Yet, to the experienced eye, the photographer also moved with the purposeful stride of a soldier. He stopped at the edge of the road before a 600-foot drop and carefully set up the tripod mount. Happy that it was stable, he closed his left eye and looked through the telescope with his right. Sam Riley grinned at the majesty of it all. He adjusted the lens of the telescope, and the ancient burial grounds of Emperor Qin Shi Huang came into focus. In size, the mausoleum was larger than the Great Pyramid in Egypt. Seen from this distance, it looked like a small mountain overgrown with thick vegetation. The emperor's tomb was located on the Li Mountain in the south, overlooking the Wei River to the north. His eyes narrowed, and a satisfied smile played out on his lips as he saw it. According to traditional Chinese geomancy and feng shi principles, the lay of the land from Li Mountain to Hua Mountain was shaped like a dragon. From this vantage point, at this time of the day, Sam was surprised to admit it. The damn thing really did look like a fire-breathing dragon. The imperial tomb was just at the eye of the dragon. According to the records of the great historian, Qin Shi Huang began building his mausoleum just after he became the king of the Qin state in 246 B.C. In 221 B.C., the Qin state conquered and absorbed the other six states of northeast China, 
and established the Qin Dynasty and unification of China. With the circumference of the inner city over one and a half miles, and the outer city nearly four miles, the mausoleum of Qin Shi Huang is the largest archaeological site preserved in China. A unique architectural ensemble, its layout echoes the urban plan of the capital, Xianyang, with the imperial palace enclosed by the walls of the city, themselves encircled by other walls. This capital of the Qin, to which succeeded on the present site of Xi'an, the capitals of the Han, Sui, and Tong dynasties, was a microcosm of the Zhongguo, middle country, that Qin Shi Huang wanted both to unify and protect from the barbarians that could arrive from any direction. In his lifetime, Qin Shi Huang imposed throughout the land a single system of writing, money, weights, and measures. The mausoleum of Qin Shi Huang is associated with an event of universal significance, the first unification of the Chinese territory by a centralized state created by an absolute monarch in 221 B.C. Sam studied the necropolis. The laborers came from three groups of people, craftsmen, prisoners, and citizens paying off a debt or who had violated the rules and were unable to pay a fine. According to historical records, the mausoleum was a notorious crime scene. Many laborers died of hardship during its construction, and all the workmen were entombed, along with the emperor, to keep the location secret. Ground-penetrating radar suggested a total underground burial space just shy of one square mile, which housed many large-scale alhambresque buildings with their precious treasures. But there was only one treasure Sam was interested in. Dragon's Breath. Frowning, Sam noticed the sun's rays were in its final death throes. In his attempt to breach the ancient tomb, he worried that before the sun rose again, someone may die. Sam had arrived here from South Africa in pursuit of the murderous Yuxia, who stole the map that he and Freya Capel had worked so hard to find. Freya, a midwife, had remained on the African continent while he had flown on to China. He missed her already, but there was urgent work to be done. The Yaxia were a secret society that was supposed to bring villains to justice, yet the Yaxia's code also stressed Buddhist ideals, which include forgiveness, compassion, and a prohibition on killing. Unfortunately, so far, all the Yuxia Sam had met had missed the memo about committing murder. Yet live or die, the only thing that mattered was that the dragon's breath must be secured in the process. At the back of his mind, Sam only had two thoughts. Would he reach the weapon in time? And would he or Tom be among those who fall? Sam swiveled the telescope around, taking in each of the main features of the ancient necropolis. It wasn't just one tomb. The entire complex, located twenty miles east of Xi'an, in the northwest of the country, housed more than four hundred tombs, covering the impressive area of some forty square miles. More than half a million workers labored there for thirty-eight years, following a detailed plan to replicate the entire known empire, China. Xi'an was a large city and capital of Shaanxi province in central China. It was once known as Chang'an, Eternal Peace, and marked the Silk Road's eastern end, and was home to the Zhou, Qin, Han, and Tong dynasties' ruling houses. Sam turned the telescope to the east of the emperor's tomb. To a casual observer, it appeared like any other natural undulation in the mountainous landscape. Sam reflected on the mental map he'd built of the necropolis. 
the seemingly modest location identified the builders' graveyards, where many of the half-million odd laborers and craftsmen who had once worked on the tomb had been buried. Sam pointed the telescope to the mound of the main tomb. The necropolis was constructed as a microcosm of the emperor's imperial palace, a large area of the mound covering the tomb of the first emperor. The earthen tomb was located at the foot of Mount Li and was built in a pyramidal shape, surrounded by two solidly built rammed earth walls with gated entrances. These consisted of several offices, halls, stables, other structures as well as an imperial park placed around the tomb mound. To the north of the emperor's mound was a relatively flat field of grass, outlining the geometric boundary of the rectangular inner city wall. Sam drew a solemn breath, reflecting on the serenity of the landscape. It was hard to believe that beneath those fields lay a mutilated skeleton's pit. No complete skeleton was ever found suggesting they had all met extremely violent deaths. Following this macabre tour, Sam swiveled the telescope toward the southeast, where the slaughter pits rested beneath a field of grass. Seventeen in total west of the stable pits, only eight had been excavated so far. While so far one pit simply contained a bronze sword, in the others, seven skeletons were found, with the heads separated from the bodies. On the complete skeletons, the upper and lower jaws were not in alignment, which suggested that they also met with violent deaths. The skeletons belonged to five men and two women, aged in their twenties to thirties. There were about two hundred burial objects, such as animal bones, decorations made from gold, silver, copper, and jade, lacquer works, and the vestiges of silk. Judging from these luxury funerary items and referring to historical records, it had been confirmed that the owners of these slaughter pits were probably princes, princesses, and other ministers killed by the second Qin emperor after he ascended to the throne. Sam shrugged. It was a tough life during regime change, as incoming rulers had the power of life or death, according to personal whim. To the west, Sam spotted a large, modern, domed building. It was made from metal and looked like a giant aircraft hangar. Exhaling slowly, he took a reverent moment to acknowledge the location. This was a modern museum. Inside, it housed the Terracotta Army. Sam recalled from his dossier on the necropolis that the Terracotta Army was discovered on 29 March 1974 by a group of farmers, Yang Shi Fa, his five brothers, and neighbor Wang Pu Shi, who were digging a well just under a mile east of the emperor's tomb mound at Mount Li, a region riddled with underground springs and watercourses. Qin Shi Huang's army was arranged in three huge pits as well as the hall of the two bronze chariots and horses. Housed within an area covering 245,000 square feet, over 8,000 terracotta soldiers and horses and over 10,000 bronze weapons were discovered in three different pits. He recalled from visiting the place as a tourist years ago that the army was arrayed in strict accordance with the ancient directives on the art of war, facing east toward the ancient enemies of the Qin state. Vault 1 on the right flank, Vault 2 on the left flank, and Vault 3 a command post at the rear. Sam closed both his eyes for a moment. Envisioning the Terracotta army in his mind's eye, he recalled that unique feeling of awe and wonder when he first saw it in person. The Terracotta army figures were manufactured in workshops by government laborers and local craftsmen using local materials. 
Heads, arms, legs, and torsos were created separately and then assembled by looting the pieces together. When completed, the terracotta figures were placed in the pits in precise military formation, according to rank and duty. The faces were created using molds, and at least ten face molds may have been used. Clay was then added after assembly to provide individual facial features to make each figure appear different. It is believed that the warrior's legs were made in much the same way that terracotta drainage pipes were manufactured at the time. This would classify the process as assembly line production, with specific parts manufactured and assembled after being fired, as opposed to crafting a figure as one solid piece and subsequently firing it. Each working section was required to inscribe its name on items produced to ensure quality control. This has aided modern historians in verifying which workshops were commandeered to make tiles and other mundane items for the terracotta army. Most of the figures originally held real weapons, which would have increased their realism. The majority of these weapons were looted shortly after the creation of the army or have rotted away. Despite this, over 40,000 bronze items of weaponry have been recovered, including swords, daggers, spears, lances, battle axes, scimitars, shields, crossbows, and crossbow triggers. Most of the recovered items are arrowheads, which are usually found in bundles of 100 units. The swords contain an alloy of copper, tin, and other elements, including nickel, magnesium, and cobalt. Some carried inscriptions that date their manufacturer to between 245 and 228 BCE, indicating that they were in use before burial. Since its discovery, archaeologists have assumed the Terracotta army had been built to provide protection to the emperor Qin Shi Huang in the afterlife. Sam now knew that hypothesis was wrong in every way. The Terracotta army weren't there to protect the emperor. They were there to prevent the evil of dragon's breath from ever escaping. Still sitting in the van's driver's seat, Tom said, Are you here to go sightseeing, or are we going to find dragon's breath? Sam dismissed him with a wave of his hand, a gesture of acknowledgment. All right, I'm about to switch over to dial and see what we can find. Returning the telescope to the emperor's burial mound, he took a deep breath and flicked a switch at the base of the device. Any similarities with a traditional telescope suddenly disappeared. Externally, dial looked like any other modern telescope used by a fanatical photographer with way too many dollars to spare. But within its casing was an altogether different machine and worth a lot more money. Dial used an array of high-tech data sensors known as Differential Absorption LiDAR to measure geophysical tracer gas. This one was specifically calibrated to measure atomic mercury levels that were displayed via a color-coded array. The visual image of the necropolis disappeared. In its place was a graduated series of colors identifying the amounts of atmospheric mercury measured in parts per billion, PPB. The entire surrounding necropolis was shaded purple, identifying the low end of the graph. The base of the emperor's mound was a mixture of blues and green, indicating moderate levels of raised mercury, while the entire mound itself was a dark red. This color indicated mercury was off the charts. Sam frowned and adjusted the gauge until the dial registered mercury in parts per billion in increments of 100 parts per billion instead of 10. It effectively made the device less sensitive. He brought the image into focus on the emperor's mound. 
where it had previously been flooded in dark red. Now the majority of the mound was coated in blues and greens. Scattered throughout were a series of small reds, and dark spots indicating gaps where large amounts of atmospheric mercury were escaping as vapors. Sam identified two moderate-sized ones about halfway up the mound, and one massive one almost at the peak. Historical records from the Qin dynasty estimate more than a hundred tons of mercury were introduced into the mausoleum to produce imitations of the Yangtze, Yellow River, and a sea of mercury upon which the emperor's coffin was to be placed. It was once a hermetic tomb, but more than two thousand years had eroded more of the structure, fracturing the seal that had once contained the mercury throughout the ages, releasing the toxic gas into the atmosphere. The high natural vapor pressure of mercury resulted in faint ongoing emission of atomic mercury vapor from the mound, easily detectable by mapping the surrounding air. Mercury, unlike other elements, stays in atomic form in the atmosphere. The differential absorption LIDAR dial technique was able to measure atmospheric mercury concentrations down to the Atlantic background level of about one to two parts per billion per ten square feet. Sam had seen enough. He packed up the telescope, opened the door to the Dongfeng, and stared at the laptop monitor which streamed the images from the dial. Tom was already examining it using mapping data capable of predicting the size of any fissures in the mound that could release so much mercury vapor. Sam exchanged a glance with Tom. What do you think? Tom shrugged. It displayed a map of the mound area with surrounding mountainsides and mercury levels in their various shades of color-coded values. The highest was at the top of the mausoleum mound, followed by three or four outlying areas. Each had been highlighted and then numbered so that anyone could tell at a glance how much was there. Tom said, Looks like the peak of the mound is the largest opening. There's a long way to go to reach the bottom, though. Ground-penetrating radar shows there would be a lot of earth to move just to reach the entrance. Right. Tom agreed, pointing to the smaller outliers, which were roughly a mile out from the mausoleum mound. He said, These would require less tunneling to reach, but then we're traveling much farther underground to get to the center of the mausoleum. Yeah. Sam brought up the map of the mausoleum. It was a digital copy of the one that was stolen from them in Africa only recently by the secret cult known as Yoxia. They had been searching for the near-mythical weapon known only as Dragon's Breath for centuries. Sam studied the map, and then his eyes returned to the laptop monitor. He pointed to a raised mercury section about two-thirds of the way up the mound. What about that one? Tom studied it. He clicked the computer cursor on the opening, and the program measured the gap. Tom slowed his breath. A suppressed smile formed on his parted lips. He kind of gave the impression of a haggler at a market, trying to work out the best way to go before bargaining with a street vendor. It looks big enough, but we'll probably need to take off the top few feet to reach the main fissure. We can do that. Sure, why not? Tom agreed. Sam said, Which way do you want to go? Tom glanced at the two main options. He grinned. I suppose it really comes down to one question. Which is, do we want to make a lot of noise or make our way in stealth? Sam nodded. Tom was right. It would take one hell of a massive explosion to take the top off the mausoleum mound, whereas the outlying cracks in the earth could be accessed after clearing relatively little topsoil. Okay, we'll go in by stealth. The last thing we want to do is show the Chinese government we're about to steal their national treasure. Tom put the Dongfeng into gear. 
Are you ready to do this? Sam's jaw set with determination. Yeah. What is it? Nothing. Tom leveled his gaze. Are you worried about the hundreds of ancient booby traps that are said to line the Emperor's mausoleum? Sure, a little, I guess. What makes you think they're still working after all this time? They built things to last back then. When archaeologists first entered some of the Egyptian pyramids, they were killed by much older traps. But that's not what you're worried about. Sam shook his head. No. I just hope we're here in time to reach Dragon's Breath before... Tom asked, Before what? Sam exhaled, a quick, harsh sound. Before Dragon's Breath is released upon the world. Chapter 2 Rare Birds and Animals Pit In command of this operation, Kiri Villaflor waited in the darkness. The woman was striking in appearance. With big almond-shaped eyes, a strong nose, a mass of blue-black hair tied in a ponytail, and a full set of evenly spaced white teeth, she depicted every bit of the image of a Polynesian princess from her mother's ancestry. Her natural authority and Spanish accent came from her father, who had been the head of a prominent Spanish bank, the third generation of a prestigious banking family. In her hands she carried a Star Z-84 submachine gun. A little below average height she made a muscular, commanding figure. The Spanish Selective Fire submachine gun was originally manufactured by the now-defunct Star Bonifacio Echeverria. The Z-84 was a sturdy, well-designed, late Cold War-era submachine gun inspired by the Israeli Uzi. Originally manufactured for use by scuba divers, the Z-84 could be used right out of the water without any need to drain the working parts or magazine known as over-the-beach or OTB capability. Kiri had always been partial to the weapon. It used a common and therefore easily accessible 9mm parabellum, blowback-operated, selective fire, capable of fully automatic firing, open-bolt weapon. Having very few moving parts made it simple to operate and maintain. Made mostly of stamped and cast parts, little machining was needed to produce the weapon. It uses an overhung bolt, meaning the bolt actually rides forward over the barrel. This allows a shorter overall length while maintaining a long barrel for better accuracy. First pioneered in the Czechoslovakian Sa VZ-23 submachine gun, the overhung bolt had become a fixture in many of today's modern-designed SMGs, being employed in firearms such as the Israeli Uzi and Italian Beretta M12. In a specially designed holster in the hollowed section at the small of her back was a German Sig Sauer P320 handgun. With her were five other people, three men, two women. Together they made a unique team of six. They were all mercenaries she'd recruited for this specific mission. Once top soldiers from specialist divisions, they had been hired from various countries throughout Europe. Smart, ruthless, efficient, and dedicated to their craft, they were the very best money could buy, especially on such short notice and Kiri needed them at particularly short notice for tonight's purpose. The team was capable of completing virtually impossible missions, anything from breaking people out of prison, cyber attacks, or abducting the most powerful people on earth from CEOs through to politicians. They achieved just about any assignment one might think of, and tonight they were grave robbers. The darkness turned to light as a pair of powerful halogen headlights flooded the ancient necropolis. 
The massive Photon Almond Shinjo truck slowed as it carefully drove through the open field. His foot on the brake, the driver released the pressure. A rush of air escaped from the air brakes as the massive truck came to a stop. Although the field betrayed no evidence of it, the truck had stopped directly in front of pit number six, the burial ground for rare birds and animals. This was the largest of all the accessory pits of the Emperor Qin Shi Huang. Imitating the appearance of the Imperial Garden when the Emperor was alive, the rare birds and animals pit was a place for the Emperor's spirit to hunt in the afterworld. Located in the southern zone between the inner and outer city walls to the west of the burial mounds, there were another thirty-one pits of this kind, arranged in three lines from north to south. Shortly after, farmers discovered the Terracotta Army on March 29, 1974. Archaeologists dug out two pits, in each an animal skeleton in a coffin, and a pottery basin were buried within. The animal skeletons were believed to belong to herbivores, such as deer. A bronze ring on the neck of each creature indicates that it was tied when alive. Further excavation found statues of kneeling warriors. These were believed to represent animal keepers within the royal court. The whole ancient site was priceless. Kiri wasn't indifferent to history, including the interment of exotic Chinese animals, but right now what was most important was that the location was perfect. The driver of the truck switched the ignition off, the headlights disappeared, and the field turned to a crisp darkness. A second later the back of the truck rolled open and a steel ramp lowered. Immediately afterward, heavy drilling equipment was driven down the ramp, along with four more members of the team, bringing the entire operation up to ten. These were the mining crew. Like the rest of them, they had been chosen for their specialist abilities. Unlike the first six whose expertise was in facing danger and quickly and efficiently killing their targets, the next four were miners who had worked in some of the harshest and deadliest environments on earth. To them it didn't matter that they were trying to rob a national treasure, or that getting caught would involve permanent imprisonment, at best, or execution. Instead, they saw the risk as high, but the financial rewards proportionate. One of the miners fixed his flashlight on the grass, while another ran a ProSec GP-8000 portable ground-penetrating radar along the field. It looked like one of those old creepy crawlies used in swimming pools. With four wheels, it supported a casing that looked like little more than a lawnmower. In the third miner's hand was a monitor that displayed the 3D augmented reality display. The process didn't take long maybe four or five minutes at most. The truck had stopped in the right spot. They were in the general location. The monitor pinged a couple longitudinal sheets of something metallic. The miner with a flashlight followed, stepping in behind the ProSec GP-8000. The miner glanced at the ground-penetrating radar operator, who nodded. Then the miner began to dig with a shovel, he carefully cut out two small squares. Kiri looked at the outline of the sheet of solid iron on the monitor. It was roughly ten feet wide by more than twenty feet long. After archaeologists discovered and examined the rare bird and animal pit, they had hastily covered the entire pit to protect it for future generations. One of her men fed a steel chain through two of the sheet's eyelets, before hooking it in on itself. The other side of the chain was attached to the Photon Almond Shenzhou. The truck driver turned the powerful Mercedes-Benz OM457 12-liter engine, and it began to run with a gravelly purr. He glanced at Kiri, who gave a small nod of approval. 
She hated damaging a priceless mausoleum. But time was paramount. Even now, she was afraid that she might be too late, and that the Yuxia might beat her to it. No, she thought, any amount of risk to an ancient historical treasure was a small price to pay for being the first to reach Dragon's Breath. With a weapon like that? Well, let's just say there was no prize for those who came second. The truck slowly edged forward, removing the slack until the chain became taut. The large Ningxia Shenzhou tires began to turn, momentarily losing traction on the soft soil and starting to spin. The driver shifted down into one of the lowest of the gearbox's eighteen gears, gently applied pressure on the pedal, and eased his foot off the clutch. The engine's RPM picked up, and the Borg Warner turbocharger whirred producing somewhere in the vicinity of fifteen hundred pounds of torque. The Ningxia Shenzhou wheels caught and spun slowly, slipped, caught again, and on the third spin they found the traction needed to overcome the iron door's extreme weight. The vehicle crept forward a little more than a couple of feet. Kiri lifted her hand. That will do. The driver stopped, placed the truck in park, and switched off the engine. She walked to the back of the steel sheet, where a three-foot void now scarred the otherwise clear field of grass and wildflowers. Kiri fixed her flashlight on the opening, and the beam shone through to the ground roughly fifteen feet below. An extendable aluminum ladder was lowered and a strong tripod frame of composite materials was quickly erected. A pulley was attached to the apex of the tripod. A steel cable was slowly uncoiled from a winch built into the back of the truck. A drill operator with a shaved head, with shoulders so wide they looked unnatural, and appropriately nicknamed Tank, led this part of the mission. He climbed down the ladder, while the horizontal drilling machine was winched down into the rare birds and animals pit. The drill was set on twin caterpillar tracks. This seemed fitting as its operator looked like a miniaturized M1 Abrams. Tank began the tedious task of working the machine toward the Emperor's burial mound. Its caterpillar tracks made a horrible crunching sound as it crushed the ancient terracotta pits in which the emperor's exotic birds and animals had been buried. The drill operator used a laser-guided projection, based on known locations topside, to map out and plot a theoretical course into the emperor's chamber. The drilling operation lasted just over thirty minutes and made one hell of a ruckus. Kiri ordered the steel cover drawn back, and the drill softened to a dull murmur. It turned to silence, which then was replaced by the sound of three loud bangs originating from the underside of the steel lid. She signaled the driver, and the steel was pulled forward once more to make an opening where the ladder had been left. Meeting one of the miner's wide eyes, she asked, What have you got? We're in, the miner said with a pirate grin. Kiri beamed with pleasure and gracefully climbed down the ladder. Exchanging a quick glance at the rest of her team, she gripped her weapon and said, Let's go! At the front of the group, Tank, the drill operator, crawled through and stepped inside the ancient burial chamber. As commander-in-chief, she was next in line, followed by the rest of her team of deadly misfits. They wore full-faced masks with skiba, that's scuba without the water, to protect them from the toxic high level of mercury vapors escaping from the Emperor's burial mound. Up ahead, she could see the beam of Tank's flashlight making a slow circle, giving him the first personal view of the Emperor's mausoleum in nearly 2,300 years. Incredible, Tank said, the excited pitch of his deep voice elevated and unrestrained. 
You've got to come see this place. A second later, there was a mechanical creak. This was followed by a sudden, wet, whumping sound. In a flash of movement, a large brass blade sliced the drill operator in half, right through his enormous chest. The massive man's bald head tipped downward, his wide eyes filled with horror. For an instant he stared at his mortal wound in disbelief. This moment of clarity lasted a second, maybe two. Then the lights permanently went out behind those once intelligent eyes. Lifting a hand to halt the movement of the crew, Kiri paused to draw in a shuddering breath before turning around to meet the gaze of the remaining members of her crew. Tank's dead, she announced. The stunned faces of her teammates stared back at her. Taking in their astonished shock and horror, she exhaled slowly. Each member of this crew just got a 10% pay raise. Let this serve as a reminder to everyone on this mission. The Emperor's tomb may be more than a couple millennium old, but it's still deadly. Chapter 3 The Builder's Graveyards A mile southwest of the mausoleum of the Emperor Qin Shi Huang, and about two miles from where Kiri Villaflor and her team were working, Hu Ching Li stood at the edge of the Builder's Graveyards. This position provided a clear and excellent vantage point for the entire burial mound of the emperor, whose name could be literally translated into tiger. Despite this, he was an unimposing figure. Just shy of five foot tall, he came across as short and wiry. At forty-five years old, it was hard to place his age, as he had one of those boyish faces. Tiger might have been a decade younger or older than he really was, but on closer inspection there were deep lines of strain. Then, in contrast, he wore an impossibly permanent grin, as though he'd only just heard the best joke, no matter what it was, that he was doing. Next to him was Ming Hui Zhong. Ming was 5'10", giving him the appearance of being tall in comparison to Hu, and equally wider. Although where Hu was lithe and muscular, Ming would be considered corpulent and undoubtedly fat. Together they formed the very last of an ancient brother and sisterhood known as the Yuxia. Expert swordsmen, they were armed with traditional Chinese sabers known as daos. In addition to this, they carried QSZ-92 semi-automatic pistols designed by Norinko, and currently in service with the Chinese army. Hu checked his weapons in preparation, ready for anything. Like many modern military pistols, the QSZ-92 had a double-action and single-action trigger with a combined safety-cum-decocker. Hu removed the dual-stack magazine. Inside were 20 rounds of proprietary 5.8 by 21 millimeter Chinese-made armor-piercing rounds with bottlenecked case and pointed bullets, closely resembling the Belgian 5.7 by 28 millimeter format. Unlike most pistol magazines, which narrow at the top for a consistent single-feed angle, the QSZ-92 had a true double-column staggered feed in the same manner as many rifle magazines. There was no star engraving on the pistol grip, indicating it was the military version. Who reassembled the weapon and attached its suppressor, which was mounted on the rail instead of the muzzle, due to the rotating barrel design, and then holstered the weapon in the small of his back. Traditionally, it was a poor place to holster a pistol, because the greater distance increased the time to withdraw, aim, and fire. Where to holster a weapon was a uniquely personal decision, and who had found keeping a handgun at the six o'clock position worked for him. It concealed well, 
and he arrogantly believed that any reduction in speed could be overcome by the fact that his reflexes were faster than just about anyone alive. He wore his bronze dao in a scabbard on his belt. The traditional Chinese sword was an anachronism in modern warfare, but in his experience it was a more efficient weapon to kill people in his line of work. Specifically, it was silent and deadly, and almost without exception, his enemies didn't expect it. Deep in his heart, he felt that there was a certain type of harmony in the fact that he was taking the weapon into the Emperor's mausoleum. His left hand tenderly touched the weapon's hilt. It always made him feel safe. The Tao had been in his family for seventy-five generations. The weapon was meant to have been buried along with his ancestor, a master alchemist, inside Emperor Qin Shi Huang's burial tomb. Instead, it was left with a man's son, along with a note telling him the truth and entrusting him to use the sword to defend the world against the evils of dragon's breath for all eternity. Tonight, after so many generations who had come before, it was up to him to prove that the weapon had been placed in the right man's hand. Tonight he would use the Tao for its intended purpose or fail, and the world would descend into chaos and anarchy. He was one of the last true Yuxia alive. Tonight was his destiny. Chinese literature often celebrated the Yuxia, which Hu Qingli now commanded, as a type of ancient warrior folk hero, depicted as a knight errant or wandering vigilante. This image, although flattering, couldn't have been further from the truth about the ancient brotherhood not after the recent deaths of several of their members in Africa. The true Yuxia, those who were never spoken about in classical Chinese literature, originated during the Qin dynasty. They were alchemists who discovered a weapon so powerful that it allowed the emperor Qin Shi Huang to achieve greatness and unite the factional and warring states into China within his lifetime. Regrettably, with this power, evil followed. When archaeologists began to discover the Terracotta army, they believed the warriors were there to protect the emperor in his afterlife. But the Yuxia knew the truth. After all, they had long ago set it up. The Terracotta army was never there to protect the emperor. They were there to ensure the evil housed within the Qin Shi Huang's mausoleum remained buried forever. It was this pledge that had been passed down throughout the ages, from father to son, or father to daughter if a son did not exist. This secret group had lived on the edge of society, with each generation becoming wealthier and better equipped to ensure their pledge was maintained. Their mission was to ensure that the weapon was never released into the world to wreak its deadly havoc once more. After twenty-three centuries, their secret had never come so close to being revealed as it was now. Whose chest tightened, and he exhaled slowly under the weight of this knowledge. It was up to him to succeed or fail in a noble endeavor that had been passed down throughout the generations. Whose heart began to race as he stared through the Night Fox 110R digital night vision binoculars. He searched the entire necropolis, zooming in and focusing on anything that moved or looked out of place. He began to relax a little. The place appeared isolated. That meant there was still time. He and Ming might still succeed in reaching the dragon's breath before anyone else. Halfway up the southern edge of the emperor's massive burial mound, he spotted something 
that sent the ghost of a shiver crawling along his spine. He fixed his night vision binoculars on the location and cursed. There were two people working a small drilling machine. It consisted of a large drill head and a motorized screw mounted on a large T-shaped platform held by two men, one on either side. Who had seen such a machine used previously? It was an electric earth auger. Designed to drill a vertical hole into the ground, this one appeared to be large enough to create a narrow tunnel, big enough for a man to be lowered deep into the recesses of the emperor's tomb far below. His eyes narrowed on the two men. One looked like a giant and was built like the small mountain upon which he was digging. The second, the smaller one, he recognized at a glance as the man who had found the ancient map in Africa and bested the rest of the Yuxia. This man's name was Sam Riley. Ming, who was looking at the site through a second pair of night vision binoculars, said, What do you want to do? Who drew a breath and slowly exhaled. Deep lines formed on his determined face. Sam Riley and his friend cannot be allowed to live long enough to reach Dragon's Breath. Chapter 4 Sam stared into the void. It was just eight feet deep, but that would do. Basically, just enough to reach the main crack in the tomb that had formed as the earth that made up the once 300-plus-foot burial mound had dried and settled over the centuries. He fixed his flashlight down the crevice. The beam of light flickered down the perfectly shaped drill hole and into the natural fissure. The opening they had just created with the auger was the narrowest part, before it opened up to something they could easily descend. Sam couldn't help but smile. After nearly twenty-three hundred years, the Emperor Qin Shi Huang's mausoleum was open to the world. He hoped the small opening wouldn't allow too much outside air into the ancient tomb, allowing oxidation of the priceless relics almost certainly stored within. He recalled that the terracotta warriors were once brightly painted, though exposure to the air and sunlight caused the paint to flake off almost immediately. Until further technological advancements had been made, the Chinese government had rightly decreed that no archaeologists were to open the tomb. Of course, all that became moot when Dragon's Breath was about to be unearthed. Besides tormenting some internal intrinsic archaeological ethics, Sam knew that what they were planning on doing was not only highly illegal, and if caught they were likely to be imprisoned for life, if not executed by the Chinese government. He and Tom both wore digital body cameras. In the devastating event that the priceless artifacts within the emperor's burial tomb were destroyed, it would offer some historical record of the archaeological site. If they were caught, it would also provide irrefutable, incriminating evidence of their guilt. If they failed in their mission to loot and secure the Emperor's greatest treasure, a mythical weapon known only as Dragon's Breath, there would be consequences to the world not seen since the creation of the atomic bomb. The warning alarm on his wristwatch went berserk. It was connected via Bluetooth to an RA-915M mercury analyzer, technically a portable multifunctional atomic absorption spectrometer with Zeeman background correction. Mercury itself was odorless, making it a deadly poison. As soon as the drill head punctured the topsoil reaching the fissure, the gateway had been opened and the light dribble of increased atmospheric mercury vapors that the spectrometer had been reading turned into a lethal tide, much like a shattered dam. Sam hit the mute button on the alarm and reached for his Skiba mask and twin carbon fiber air tanks. 
Beside him, Tom was already donning his breathing equipment. They left the heavy mercury analyzer where it was. There was no need to bring it down the opening. After all, the mercury levels were only going to get higher. Already they were high enough that any more than a few breaths would kill you. Instead, he hit the preset timer on his watch, which began to count down. They had two hours. It wasn't a lot of time, but it would have to do. Sam exchanged a glance with Tom, who had finished setting up a tripod with a motorized pulley system. It was the same sort of setup paramedics used to winch themselves down from medical rescue helicopters. Good to go? We're all set, Tom replied, tightening the final safety line that secured the tripod to the base of a large tree. You want me to go first? No, I'll go, Sam grinned. Besides, you might not quite fit. Tom laughed. Despite his size, he was roughly six foot four and 250 pounds, without an ounce of fat on him. Tom seemed to have a surprisingly limber frame, in which he was capable of maneuvering into the tightest of cave systems, irrespective of whether they were wet or dry. He glanced at Sam. Don't you worry, I'll fit. No chance in hell I'm going to let you be the only one to have all the fun, especially given this is the first time in more than two millennia that this tomb has been opened. All right, I'll meet you down there. Sam locked the helmet strap under his chin, switched on his helmet light, and clipped onto the end of the winching cable with a carabiner. He doubted many of the ancient booby traps used to protect the emperor's tomb from being robbed were still fully functioning, but all the same, he wasn't taking any chances. In addition to breathing from Skiba, his entire body was protected as best as possible from his Kevlar gloves through to his thick military boots. He wore a ballistic-resistant tactical vest made from a mixture of composite materials, including soft Kevlar and hard body-shaped titanium plates that helped absorb the impact and reduce or stop penetration to the torso from firearm-fired projectiles or fragmentations from explosions. Even his Skiba face mask was made for special forces using UHMWP, ultra-high molecular weight polyethylene, a subset of the thermoplastic polyethylene. The material consisted of extremely long chains with a ridiculously high molecular mass. The longer chain served to transfer load more effectively to the polymer backbone by strengthening intermolecular interactions. This results in a very tough material, with the highest impact strength of any thermoplastic presently made. It was considered the gold standard in ballistic resistance. In addition to body armor, they both carried an MP5 submachine gun, C4 plastic explosives, and Glock 19 semi-automatic pistols. Sam double-checked his winching gear was connected. He attached a heavy backpack to a second carabiner, letting it drape below him. Just above where the carabiner fastened to his harness was a switch connected to the winch cable. It was a simple device linked to the winch motor via a wire that ran inside the cable. Two directions, up and down. Sam said, "'Wish me luck.' and pressed down. Tom nodded, guiding him into the hole. Good luck! Sam slowly sank into the depths of an ancient hell. This tomb was built for the dead and designed to ensure none of the living ever lay eyes on it. Besides the sea and river of mercury that off-gassed vapors that would kill a human, it was said that the mausoleum was riddled with booby traps. Despite being over two millennia old, it has been argued that they would still function as effectively as the day they were installed. In addition to traps, the place was a veritable fortress designed to snare would-be grave robbers, 
for eternity. The drilling hole was just wide enough for his shoulders to squeeze past, and as he slowly winched through that section, all he could think about was Hannibal Lecter and Silence of the Lambs. The thought of being permanently entombed down such a terrible hole seemed horrific. After a few seconds, he passed through the man-made hole he and Tom created and entered a large, slightly angled fissure. It was large enough that he and Tom would have been able to make the descent side by side from this point onward. The beam of Sam's headlight flashed off the fractured walls, revealing little. It took a little over two minutes before Sam's boots gently landed on solid ground. The headlight beam flickered across the chasm that ran in a downward slope. His gaze followed the beam of light as it became swallowed by the void, before the chasm opened into a massive, level, underground clearing. He unclipped his carabiner from the winch and gave it two sharp tugs. Tom got the message and immediately began to pull the cable up from the topside motorized controls. Sam retrieved his backpack, pulled it over his shoulders, and tightened the strap. Inside, it contained much of the equipment he hoped he wouldn't need to survive, including a spare carbon fiber air tank. Glancing upward, Sam watched as the winching cable disappeared into the darkness above, and then carefully scrambled down the rest of the fissure, pressing his hands and feet on opposite ends of the walls in a process rock climbers call stemming that works by maintaining opposing forces to produce friction. Within a minute, he'd clambered down the last of the fissure, which then widened as it entered the domed mausoleum of the ancient emperor. The sound of Sam's breathing in the skiba echoed in the acoustics of a large cavity. He pressed a button on his helmet light, and the wide arc beam faded away. A moment later, he switched on his more powerful narrow-beam flashlight. The beam shone far into the massive chamber, where distant figures of ancient imperial guards cast long shadows deep into the emperor's tomb. Sam stared in awe. He fixed the light of his flashlight straight up, taking in the giant copper dome that rose some fifty feet above his head and disappeared far in the distance. Seismic surveys conducted by archaeologists indicated the emperor's tomb was housed within a dome roughly the size of two American football fields. Sam drew a breath slowly, almost reverently. It had the same sense of surreal mixed in with magic as the first time a person stands at the base of the Great Pyramid in Egypt and looks up. With the wholly inadequate lighting to expand his vision and take in the entire thing, his mind was left to imagine. Behind him, Tom stepped up. Wow! Sam nodded, his gaze slowly taking in the wonder. It sure is something, isn't it? Tom opened his mouth to agree, but never got around to it. Instead, the tomb filled with the unique noise from ancient machines that suddenly came alive. With their intricate series of cogs, spirals, and moving parts, they would most likely have modern engineers in awe. Sam recognized the sounds. Not identical, but they were similar to the ones the ancient Egyptians used to protect their pyramids from grave robbers. They used a series of pulleys, gearing mechanisms, and weighted devices, all of which didn't dilapidate and fail over the passage of many centuries. Sam and Tom positioned themselves back to back. It was a protective stance. They both attached their flashlights to the barrels of their MP5 submachine guns, although Sam wasn't sure what good the weapons were likely to be, against whatever ancient trap had just been triggered. Sam asked, You see anything moving? Tom shook his head. Not yet. A few seconds later, 
the sound of mechanisms working, almost grinding away, ceased. The silence seemed even more sinister. Tom exhaled. I don't suppose that means we just got lucky, and the Chin Chi Huang's builders weren't as good as we thought. You think the entire booby trap just failed? Sam asked. It had crossed my mind. Sam said, unlikely. A rush of liquid flowing through thin, purpose-built channels made of bronze filled the tomb. Sam tilted his head while moving the beam of his flashlight around the vault. Tom did the same. They were trying to discern the source of the sound, but they couldn't see or hear anything that allowed him to pinpoint the location or origins. Instead, it seemed to be flowing from and in all directions. It lasted nearly two whole minutes. And then... Like the heavy cogs and ancient machinery, the hidden liquid ceased its journey. The sound was replaced by one he didn't immediately recognize. Tom's eyes narrowed. What is that? Sam shook his head, mystified. Then it hit him. He'd heard that sound before. It was made by a flint stone turning, causing sparks. In this case, hundreds, if not thousands of them, slowly turning, grinding against their respective minerals and creating sparks. In the distance, a small glow, like the eyes of wild animals, began to light up. The glow spread outward and ran wild throughout the entire mausoleum. Fire danced as it spread from archer's tower to archer's tower, running along slim, sinuous lines, presumably of whale oil, lighting ever more intricate and ornate golden lamps, until the entire tomb switched from darkness to daylight, revealing a unique image of the emperor Qin Shi Huang's ancient world. Chapter 5 Sam's eyes landed on the scene before him. Replicas of palaces, scenic towers, and the hundred officials, as well as rare utensils and wonderful objects, filled the tomb. Mercury was used to fashion imitations of the hundred rivers, the Yellow River and the Yangtze, and the seas constructed in such a way that they seemed to flow. Above were representations of all the heavenly bodies, below the features of the earth. A celestial vault. On the floor of the vault, mercury, representing the rivers and seas, was kept flowing by mechanical devices. The dome of the vault was decorated with the sun, moon, and stars, and the ground depicted the nine regions and five mountains of China. The Emperor's royal guard filled the underground landscape. The best of the Terracotta army surrounded the Imperial Palace. Unlike those within the museum, these had never been exposed to sunlight and oxygen degradation. The result was astounding. They looked identical to how they were the day they were sealed inside. The sight took Sam's breath away. These figures looked perfect. Their individual facial features identified each and every single one of them as an individual warrior who served Qin Shi Huang. Add the fact that everything looked completely lifelike. Sam recalled reading somewhere that the terracotta warriors weren't just lifelike depictions. They were based on the emperor's actual army, and every warrior had posed for hours so that an artist could make a perfect rendering of them on the terracotta. This was better than that. It was almost as though the emperor's actual royal guards dipped in some sort of embalming lacquer to keep them frozen in time. They carried weapons, including swords, daggers, spears, Lances, battle axes, scimitars, shields, crossbows, and crossbow triggers. 
The tomb appeared to be a hermetically sealed space big enough to act as a hangar for three jumbo jets. Sam recalled reading that after the excavation of the terracotta army, the painted surface present on some terracotta figures began to flake and fade. It was a tragedy that the lacquer covering the paint can curl in fifteen seconds, once exposed to Xi'an's dry air, and can flake off in just four minutes. The palace was surrounded by soldiers. Unlike the well-known terracotta army, whose color had quickly faded after they had been removed from beneath the ground and oxidation allowed to occur, these were still every bit as colorful and beautifully lifelike renditions of the emperor's actual warriors and royal guard who posed for their likeness. He walked from one warrior to the next, taking in their superb detail and craftsmanship. It was the first time he really looked at the pigments. The figures were painted with ground precious stones, intensely fired bones to make the whites of their eyes, pigments of iron oxide for dark red, cinnabar for red, malachite for green, azurite for blue, charcoal for black, cinnabar barium copper silicate mix to make Chinese purple, tree sap to make brown. There were pinks and lilacs, and all the other colors one could imagine mixed into the colored lacquer to finish the individual faces, giving them a realistic feel with eyebrows and facial hairs in black and the faces done in pink. Life-sized, the terracotta figures typically ranged from 5.74 feet to about 6.6, .6, with the officers depicted as taller. They varied in height, uniform, and hairstyle in accordance with rank. Their faces appeared to be different for each individual figure. Sam recalled that scholars had identified ten basic face shapes. The figures of each warrior varied into general type. There were armored infantry, unarmored infantry, cavalrymen who wore pillbox hats, helmeted drivers of chariots with more armor protection, and spear-carrying charioteers. He moved on toward the archers. There were kneeling crossbowmen or archers who were armored, standing archers who were not. Besides these, the men were separated by rank. There were generals and other lower-ranking officers. There were many variations in the uniforms within the ranks. Some wore shin pads, while others didn't. Some wore long or short trousers, some of which may be padded. Their body armor then varied based on rank, function, and position in formation. Sam kept walking in silent awe. Two large bronze chariots, pulled by four terracotta horses each, guarded the main roadway that followed the mercury imitation of the Yangtze. At the end of the roadway was a perfect replica of Emperor Qin Shi Huang's imperial palace, surrounded by a large moat of mercury and more than a dozen archers' towers. It was the most beautiful and majestic thing Sam had ever seen. Chapter 6 Tom's lips parted in a bemused smile. I'd love to know what utility company these guys go with to get their electricity. Sam laughed. Not bad after nearly 2,300 years. Not bad indeed. I think it was nice of them to turn the lights on for us. Sure was. Tom looked at the glow that flowed from more than a thousand individual lamps. How did they do it? Sam shrugged. I don't know. They're not candles. The Chinese, especially around Qin Shi Huang's era, normally used whale oil lamps. If I had to guess, our uninvited appearance set off some sort of internal intruder alarm that caused hundreds of gallons of whale oil to flow throughout their intricate channels and light the tomb. 
kind of like the sensor light of a modern house that triggers a powerful spotlight to come on when a burglar approaches. That sounds about right, although I'm not so afraid of being seen. It's what we still can't see that scares me. Agreed. Come on, we need to go. Tom ran his eyes across the makeshift battlefield. Where do we head? Sam gestured toward the Imperial Palace. We need to find a way to get inside that. Tom frowned. Um, okay. They walked along the miniature plank road that ran alongside the Fo Yangtze River of Mercury. The plank road was formed by drilling cliff holes into the stonework of the small mountain that followed the river to admit wooden beams. Planks were laid out on top to form a path from mountain to mountain, like cliff and mountain bridges, resting on beams placed in the holes sculpted out of the rock. The road was practical, offering Sam and Tom a means to reach the gates of the Imperial Palace without climbing the small mountain, as well as being symbolic. The plank road was the first of its kind in China. It was built by the Shu as a gift to the Qin Emperor during the Warring States period. They were later called the Northern Plank and Jin Yu Roads, but are said to have followed the Jia Ling River into Shu, rather than go through the Han Valley. Up ahead, there was a golden ox with emeralds for its eyes. Tom swore. Look at this thing! Sam nodded. It's probably gold-plated, but all the same, it's worth more than my jet. What's it doing here? Sam ran his hand over the gold. It was cool to the touch. There was a story that the road was built by the state of Shu for the Qin state to bring their king a gift of golden oxen. This must be the emperor's reference to it. What happened after the Shu brought the emperor the gift? A wry smile crept up onto Sam's lips. What do you think happened? Nothing good, I imagine. You imagine right. The new plank road simply brought the Qin army to annex the Shu as well as 10,000 families of settlers from Qin. They continued along their journey. Tom studied their surroundings as they slowly made their way along the ancient plank road. Heaven and earth were represented in the central chamber of the tomb. Ceiling shaped into sun, moon, and stars by inlaying pearls and gems symbolized the sky, and the ground was an accumulation point of rivers, lakes, and seas, like Yellow River and Yangtze River, which stands for the earth. In the distance, the underground palace, a gem-studded replica of imperial housing above ground, the palace brightly lit by whale oil lamps for eternity. Tom asked, what made the Qin Shi Huang Emperor so great to deserve such a ridiculously lavish and extravagant mausoleum? Tom gestured toward the vast expanse of the underground world of the Emperor. I mean, even by ancient leader standards of those renowned for being megalomaniacs, this is excessive. For a start, Sam said, his palm against the wall as he passed. He was the first to introduce the title of emperor. Seriously? Afraid so. It was a title that China used for the next two thousand years. Sam's lips formed a wry smile. Actually, China was also a term he started, although it wouldn't be for many centuries after his death. Tom stepped up onto another plank. How so? The name China comes from the Sanskrit word Sina, derived from the name of the Chinese Qin dynasty, pronounced Qin, which was translated as Sin by the Persians and appeared to have become popularized through trade along the Silk Road and wasn't recognized until the 16th century. What was China called before that? Marco Polo, the famous explorer who familiarized China to Europe in the 13th century CE, referred to the land as Cathay, 
while in Mandarin the country was known as Zhongguo, meaning central state or middle empire. Tom said, So, what did Qin Shi Huang do to stand out so much throughout the test of time? Sam said, No one will ever know for sure. If I had to guess, I'd say he was no different than the rest of the great leaders throughout the ages, in that he genuinely believed he was sent here for a certain almost godly purpose. So what? Tom stopped and spread his hands. His delusion of grandeur gave him the power to make it happen. No, I think Dragon's Breath gave him that power. That makes sense. Tom considered that for a moment and then said, Now might be a good time to bring something up. What? So far we have no idea what Dragon's Breath actually does, right? Right. What makes you think it's safe to handle? Nothing. Tom frowned. Nothing? No. But we're better off trying than letting someone else get their hands on it. Sam smiled. Feel reassured? Oh, much, thanks, Tom said, in a voice that suggested he was anything but. They kept going in silence for a couple minutes. Sam considered Tom's earlier question about the emperor, the grandiose mausoleum and the long-lasting ramifications of the first Qin emperor. He said, I think Qin Shi Huang used Dragon's Breath to shift the power in his favor, but he used that power to grasp greatness with ruthless manifest. Tom kept walking. Go on, I'm listening. What did the good emperor do? He united China, establishing the Qin dynasty, China's first feudal dynasty. In part of that unification, he set together a standardization of the Chinese writing system, weights, measurements, and coinage. Okay, so he was industrious. Yeah, in an incredible way. He might have been an insane megalomaniac, but no one's ever said he didn't dream big. How big? He built the Great Wall, linking other sections of it together to protect the northern border. Qin Shi Huang built the Great Wall of China. Tom was incredulous. Didn't that take centuries to build? Sure, but it was the first emperor who put it all together. The Great Wall of China began when fortifications built by various states during the spring and autumn of 771 to 476 B.C. and Warring States periods, 475 to 221 B.C., were connected by the first emperor of China, Qin Shi Huang, to protect his newly founded Qin dynasty against incursions by nomads from Inner Asia. The walls were built of rammed earth, constructed using forced labor, and by 212 B.C. ran from Gansu to the coast of southern Manchuria. Not a bad achievement. Not all of his constructions were about gaining military strength. He built the Ling Canal to connect China's north and south river system, along with the first roadways through the Shu Mountains. He sounds like he was a good emperor. Sam nodded. He was... Mostly. Not always. How many historical crazed leaders do you know without faults? Tom turned the palms of his hands outward. Not many. Right. So what were Qin's faults? The Qin dynasty had just ended the chaotic warring states period. There were still many different ideas and voices in society. In order to strengthen his rule and unify the country, Qin Shi Huang adopted the practice of burning books. Many history books were destroyed, except some books on divination, medicine, and agriculture. Book burning, eh? Tom asked. Who else do we know that got the idea to burn books? Sam thought of Hitler and the Nazis' burning of Jewish books. He's not in good company. A common game for oppressive regimes. Sam nodded. Qin Shi Huang adopted legalism and applied strict Qin laws. 
even the smallest mistakes and crimes were severely punished. And you know all those great construction projects. Who do you think built them? Slave labor. Exactly. Chin Shi Huang was a big believer in forced labor camps. Up ahead, they came across a bronze pedestal. It was lined with several precious gems, casually dispersed throughout, all leading one's eyes to the ultimate prize, a sapphire. Wow, Tom said. Look at this thing. Sam cautioned. Don't touch that. Why not? Tom shrugged and picked it up. It's all right. I'll put it back. I'm not interested in stealing it. Tom handed it to his friend. Sam held the stone in the palm of his gloved hand. It would have been priceless. The sapphire stood out as at least one hundred plus carats. Crystal clear clarity. Perfectly cut. And entirely deadly. Sam put the precious stone back on its pedestal. Chin Shi Huang's tomb was believed to have precious gems scattered about to entice would-be thieves. Why? Because once tempted, they reach for the precious stone, which then triggers a special mechanism to release a deadly trap. Sam's eyes darted around the room. He breathed heavily and exhaled slowly. Sam and Tom turned back to back again for safety. Tom gave an insouciant grin. It looks like the booby trap failed. Sam frowned. I wouldn't be so sure. Tom gulped. No? Sam shook his head. I don't know what happened, but whatever it is, I doubt it's going to be good. They waited a few more seconds. When nothing happened, Sam said, All right, we got lucky this time. Let's keep going and don't touch anything again. Agreed. Sam stepped forward. A second later, there was a giant whoosh, and more than a dozen arrows fired straight at him. Chapter 7 Lying flat on the planks, Sam looked down his body at the three arrows that had found their mark. They were solidly wedged into the titanium plate housed inside his ballistic vest. Sam tried to take a deep breath. It hurt like hell, but different to death, which really meant something to someone who'd experienced both previously. Right now, it felt more like a deep, muscular bruising from the armor plating than a projectile breach. He exhaled through his skiba, the air silently going in and out of his lungs. There were no hissing sounds. It was a good sign. It meant that none of the arrows had penetrated his lungs. Looking down at him, Tom arched an eyebrow. You okay? Sam drew a breath through his nose and exhaled slowly. Never better. You want to turn back? Are you kidding me? No, Tom said. You just got shot because of me. Sam dismissed Tom's guilt with a wave of a hand. An easy mistake. You're all right. I'll live. Sam sat up with a gentle curse and said, Let's keep going. Tom took Sam's hand and hefted him to his feet. They kept walking, and the plank road opened up to a small rocky beach covered in seashells, overlooking a lake of mercury that flooded the center of the emperor's burial mound. Imperceptible small ripples of mercury washed across the beach. A single ornamental Chinese boat rested on the beach, perched up on the shore made of seashells. Along the side of it was a long sculling oar known as a yulo. It was a replica of a traditional Chinese sampan. The thing looked kind of like a gondola one might see in Venice. A sampan was a relatively flat-bottomed Chinese wooden boat. Some sampans included a small shelter on board, and may be used as a permanent habitation on inland waters. This one was made almost entirely of jade, and adorned with gold and brass fittings. It looked much like the other permanent decorations, such as the bronze chariots, 
and terracotta army scattered throughout the mausoleum. On the stern of the boat there was an inscription in gold calligraphy. Neither of them could read it, but Sam recognized the emperor's name, Qin Shi Huang, and guessed at a symbolic level the boat was there to help the emperor sail to the afterlife. Sam withdrew a pair of binoculars and surveyed the imperial palace, surrounded by a sea of mercury. All five of the underground rivers flowed into this giant lake, drawn by some sort of internal mechanism that pulled the mercury toward the imperial palace. It looked identical to those images of the Qin dynasty's original imperial palace. A large gate of bronze and gold, inlaid with intricately carved jade ornaments, prohibited the passage through to the inner sanctum and most likely burial chamber of the emperor, Qin Shi Huang. Sam recalled that jade was regarded as the most precious stone in ancient China, as it symbolized purity and moral integrity. Prized for its durability and magical qualities, the stone was laboriously carved and polished into all manner of objects, from jewelry to desk ornaments. It seemed a fitting stone to guard the emperor's final resting place. The mechanical river of mercury flowed freely through the gate, but the rows of poles were too narrowly placed for either Sam or Tom to get through. The entrance had a row of chains, apparently once used to raise and lower the gate, like a medieval drawbridge of some sort, or gateway to enter the palace via a boat. Sam passed the binoculars to Tom. Here, what do you think? Tom scanned the river to the palace. He scanned the entire palace walls before landing on the same gateway that Sam had found. After a few seconds, he asked, What is that? Sam said, What's what? Tom handed the binoculars back to Sam. To the left of the gate, take a look. There's a bunch of carved animals up there. Sam took the binoculars up to his eyes. He focused the binoculars on the place Tom pointed. His eyes narrowed. He could feel his heart begin to skip as he began to count. One, two, three, four. The sight depicted twelve animals, all carved out of jade. He grinned. If I had to guess, I'd say that's the Qin Dynasty equivalent of a modern-day keypad. Okie dokie. Any idea what the code is? Sam shook his head. No, but it shouldn't be too hard to work out. Really? Sam spread his arms outward. No, it's a secret code from ancient China, not exactly my strong point, but I'll give it a shot once we get there. Right, that brings me to the next point. Any ideas how we reach it? Sam said, how about we take the sampan? Tom looked at the ornamental bronze boat. No way in the world is that going to float. Sure it will. Tom was incredulous. This thing's clearly ornamental. It must weigh several thousand pounds. No way it's going to float. Not in water, but in mercury it's a different story. Really? Didn't anyone ever tell you mercury is just about heavier than anything else? No, I guess they didn't. Why? Mercury has a density of 0.49 pounds per cubic inch. This means that the density of mercury is approximately 13 times greater than that of water. Therefore, some objects that sink in water will float on mercury, including pieces of lead, silver, and steel. In fact, do you know an iron anvil will float in mercury? No way! Tom said. You're making this up. I'm not. What was Qin Shi Huang's infatuation with mercury, anyway? It wasn't just the emperor. It was a commonly held belief, promoted by alchemists throughout China, that mercury was some sort of elixir of life or liquid vehicle to immortality. Oh, yeah? Tom looked at the emperor's elaborate tomb. How did that belief work for him? 
poorly. It's believed Qin Shi Huang died after ingesting mercury pills made by his alchemists and court physicians, who advised him they had found an elixir of immortality. Oops! Yeah. He wasn't the first or last to die from mercury. Did you know the phrase mad as a hatter is likely a reference to mercury poisoning among milliners, so-called mad hatter disease, as mercury-based compounds were once used in the manufacture of felt hats in the 18th and 19th century? Tom glanced at him. Seriously? Yeah. The Mad Hatter character of Alice in Wonderland was, it is presumed, inspired by the phenomenon of dementia associated with hatters during the time Lewis Carroll had been alive. Tom suppressed a grin. You know, some people might call you a real smart Alex. Smart Alec. A puzzled frown creased Tom's lips. What? I think the term you're looking for is smart Alec after Alexander Hogue, a notorious Manhattan criminal from the 1840s. Alec is a nickname for the name Alexander. Unlike a real name, it isn't capitalized. My point, exactly. Sam apologized. Sorry, what were you getting at? Tom laughed. You know, some people might find your seemingly endless supply of historical, archaeological, and scientific anecdotes from which you derive out of thin air. Sometimes I really do wonder if you make them up, to be honest. Boring and highly annoying. Sam held his gaze. You don't like my tidbits of irrelevant facts? Not me. Tom replied with the wave of his hand. I love them. I'm just saying. Some people might not. Sam gave Tom wide eyes. Really? Hey, there's no accounting for what people like. Some people, perchance, might suggest that given we don't have an endless air supply and we're currently in a veritable death trap that aims to entomb us permanently. What's your point, Tom? Tom laughed. Maybe we should get a move on. Agreed. Sam looked at the ancient Chinese boat. Let's get this thing into the sea. Tom leaned on the sampan. A second later, there was a sound similar to the crack of thunder, and the entire ground shook beneath their feet. Tom frowned. What the hell was that? Sam swallowed. I believe that means we've got company. Chapter 8 Kiri Villaflor watched the disaster unfold. The crack of thunder was immediately followed with the entire antechamber giving way. The tiles split apart and the ground disappeared within seconds. Her team dispersed with the speed and athleticism of the professional soldiers for higher they were. Most jumped out of the way. Others clambered for the side of the falling ground, scrambling up whatever ruins were left. They were all professionals, their reflexes as fast as they come. But sometimes that's not enough. Jeremy Perez was unlucky. It had taken him little more than a split second to react, but it was a split second too long, and he was the farthest from the exit. By the time he'd registered the problem and had taken steps to escape it, the entire ground had dropped more than ten feet. He was too far down to clamber out of the newly formed void, and the fragile walls were crumbling in on him. Jeremy turned onto all fours to escape, and a split second later, a piece of stonework from the ceiling fell, landing on his air tank. The weight cracked the nozzle. Compressed air hissed. The aluminum tank shot off like a rocket. It ricocheted off the wall toward the ceiling and struck Jessica, a short, muscular member of the Sayeret Matkal, Israel's elite special forces, at the side of her head, killing her instantly. On the ground, Jeremy began to asphyxiate as his face mask was no longer being fed with air. The most powerful and primitive instinct in the animal kingdom kicked in, the urge to survive. 
He rolled over and ripped the mask off his face and began breathing the deadly mercury vapors. Kiri dropped her backpack, reached inside and grabbed a rope to throw to him. Hold this! Jeremy caught it in both hands, the muscles of his forearms working like little hydraulic pistons, his fingers clasped onto the rope like a vice. The tension in his face seemed to fade away as though he saw his imminent rescue. Kiri shouted, Pull! The rope went taut. Simultaneously, there was a second loud crack of thunder. Only this time it originated from the domed ceiling high above. Jeremy's eyes darted upward. The snap of thunder was replaced by the whispers of unimaginable amounts of sand falling through the newly formed opening. Quick! Kiri called out. Get him out of there! The sand began to fall. It slithered through the opening in the dome ceiling, falling softly to the ground below. Within seconds, it buried Jeremy's feet up to his ankles. Jeremy struggled like a canyoner trapped beneath the torrent of a deadly waterfall. The sand looked harmless, but was deadly. Jeremy tried to kick his feet free, but the sand trapped them as quickly as if it were concrete. Kiri coordinated the rescue effort, and with four people on her end of the rope, they were able to achieve a combined pulling power well in excess of 1,500 pounds, far more than any single person could grip a rope. They yanked the rope together. Jeremy sprung forward with a jolt. The rope ripped through his hands like Teflon. He fell forward onto the sand on outstretched hands. Jeremy quickly struggled to stand up, but the falling sands kept landing on him, making it seemingly impossible. It seemed surreal like one of the videos of someone drowning beneath a waterfall because they were unable to overcome the downpour, even though the water was only a few inches deep. The rope was thrown again. Jeremy caught it first go. Kiri ordered the team to slowly take up slack. The rope went taut again. But by this time, Jeremy was buried up to his knees in sand. They pulled, and Jeremy tried to shift the sand by adjusting his entire body, but the sand was like glue. Heave! Kiri shouted. Jeremy gritted his teeth and held onto the rope. His eyes were filled with defiance and his face set with determination. His body moved a few inches. The rope went slack for a second. Kiri cried out, Heave again! The rope went taut as a violin string. But Jeremy remained firmly trapped, his muscular body working like an anchor wedged deep within the sand. They kept trying, but it was futile. Like an hourglass, they were in a race against time, and the sand just kept falling. Kiri shook her head. Despite their best efforts, the sand buried him until just his hand was visible. The muscles of the forearm kept moving like a machine, as though its owner could somehow pull himself out from his demise. But soon the arm went still, and she knew there was no longer any point trying to dig him free. Alexis, one of her mercenaries, said, Do you want us to try and dig him out? Kiri shook her head. No, it could take hours. Luke, a French combat diver specializing in explosives, and who had a short and stocky sort of frame that would make a tree stump proud, fixed his flashlight at an opening behind the antechamber. He exchanged a glance with Kiri and said, I think we can reach the Imperial Palace through here. Chapter 9 Sam put his shoulder into the back of the ornamental bronze sampan. Tom followed on the opposite side. Working together, they gently leaned into the ancient boat, taking up slack, in preparation of the giant push required to free the ornament from its earthly hold. Sam said, on three. Okay, on three. Sam drew a breath. Three. Simultaneously, they both heaved forward. Nothing happened. The sampan didn't budge. They had grossly underestimated its weight, or overestimated their own strength, or possibly a combination of both. Either way, they didn't need to try again. It was clear without any doubt that nothing either of them were going to do could shift the archaic boat without some sort of mechanical assistance. Sam said, 
We're going to need help. Tom looked around at a series of nearby terracotta warriors, a bemused look in his eyes behind his face mask. Shall I ask if any of them are willing to give us a hand? You can try, but I doubt they'll be of much use. Probably not. Sam walked around the sampan and spotted a sculling oar called a ulo attached horizontally to the boat. How about a bit of mechanical assistance? Sounds good. What have you got in mind? We'll use the ulo. A ulo is a bent Asian sculling oar used off the stern of the boat. Its unique feature is in its curved shaft that fits into a pin that locates in a socket on the underside of the shaft. This creates a pivot which allows the oar to swivel and rock from side to side. The weight of the oar, supplemented by a rope lashing, holds the oar in place on the pivot. The weight of the outboard portion of the oar is counterbalanced by a rope running from the underside of the handle to the deck of the boat. The sculler mainly moves the oar by pushing and pulling on this rope, which causes the oar to rock from side to side on its pivot, automatically angling the blade to create forward thrust and move the boat forward. This method has been used for hundreds of years, and some reports suggest that it may have provided the early inspiration for the screw propeller over the more common paddle wheel of the day. Sam studied the ulo. Like the sampan, it was made of bronze and lined with intricate gold and jade carvings. It was stored on bronze hooks on the port side of the sampan. Sam tried to lift it on his own, but the weight was mighty, exceeding his strength almost as much as the sampan itself. Here, Tom said, reaching the other side of the ulo. I'll take this side. You take that one. Agreed, Sam said. On three. Together, they manipulated the large sculling oar to the back of the boat. They inserted the tip of the oar into a three-inch groove beneath the end of the sampan. It seemed to fit together as though it belonged there. Sam applied a small amount of downward pressure on the back of the ulo, which they were using like a giant lever attached to a screwdriver, prying the ancient ornamental boat free. Gold, like small pieces of glue that fixed the ancient sampan to the terracotta banks of the replica Yangtze and Mercury Beach, fractured and snapped. The sampan came free of its earthly confines. With another giant heave on the ulo, the entire boat slid into the flowing river of mercury with a splash. Together, they attached the sculling oar to the stern of the sampan. In China's ancient ritualistic society, bronze was used primarily for casting ceremonial temple vessels used in sacrifices to the gods of heaven, earth, the mountains, and rivers. They were also used in vessels for banquets, awarding ceremonies, and noble funerals. The sculling arrangement allows multiple rowers to operate one oar, allowing large, heavy boats to be rowed if necessary. The efficiency of this system gave rise to the Chinese saying, a skull equals three oars. Only in this case, it was being rowed by just two. The bronze sampan, floating on mercury, made for an incredibly stable platform. Even though the boat shared the similar dimensions to a small gondola, it was so stable that Sam and Tom could stand at any point on the boat without it tipping or leaning toward the mercury. To Sam, it felt like he was floating on a rock. In fact, it was more akin to rock than water. It reminded him of that time that he and Tom floated an obsidian raft down a narrow river of active lava. Sam and Tom quickly worked out the mechanical system of the ulo and were surprised by the speed at which it propelled the mighty bronze sampan through the mercury. Within minutes, they reached the gate to the imperial palace. Tom swiveled the ulo and the sampan turned and coasted diagonally coming to a stop beside the heavy bronze doorway. Tom held the gate to prevent them floating away and said, It's all yours, Sam. Let's see you crack the Chinese keypad. 
I'll do my best. Sam stared at the jade pad. There were twelve animals. Each jade ornament was attached to a mechanical switch. Sam tried depressing the first one, a dog, and he could feel the symbol slide deeper into the security pad. He pressed it again, and it slid outward again. Simple enough. Two settings. On. Off. He stared at each of the symbols, trying to recall where he'd seen them before. His eyes narrowed. A puzzled frown creased his lips. They seemed familiar to him, somewhere in the back recess of his memory, just out of reach. Then it hit him. There's twelve animals. Yeah, I know. Tom suppressed a grin. So what? Chinese Zodiac has twelve animals. Look! Sam spread his hands along each jade animal carving. There's a rat, ox, tiger, rabbit, dragon, snake, horse, goat, monkey, rooster, dog, and pig. Each sign is named after an animal, and each animal has its own unique characteristics. Great. Any ideas what it means? Each animal represents a time period. So, maybe... The animals match something specific to the emperor? Tom stood behind Sam, staring at the carved animals. Hang on. I can't say I've ever been all that into the Zodiac, but even I know some of them are missing here. Sam frowned. Missing? Are you sure? Yeah. Not all of the Zodiac are real animals. I think Sagittarius is identified as a centaur or something with a bow and arrow. Sam shot Tom a wry smile. Did you date someone who used to read her horoscope or something? Yeah, she was Sagittarius, the archer. That's how I know that sign is half human and half horse. Why? No reason, he spread his arms. It's okay. That's the Western Zodiac. Similar, but different. This is the Chinese one. They're not the same. No. Both Western and Chinese systems reflect several superficial similarities. Both have time cycles divided into twelve parts. Each names the majority of those parts with names of animals, and each is widely associated with a culture of ascribing a person's personality or events in their life to the Zodiac's influence. They're still different? Yeah, the Chinese zodiac is based on the lunar calendar that assigns an animal and its reputed attributes to each year in a repeating 12-year cycle. The animals of the Chinese zodiac are not associated with constellations. Okay, but how does any of that help us get into the emperor's tomb? I'm not sure yet, Sam said. Maybe it has something to do with trines? What are trines? Traditionally, a trine is extremely beneficial. It indicates harmony, ease, and what is natural. A trine may involve innate talent or ability. In transit, an event may emerge from a current or past situation in a natural way. Are you talking about astrology now? Yeah, in astrology... An aspect is an angle that planets make to each other in the horoscope, as well as to the ascendant, midheaven, descendant, lower midheaven, and other points of astrological interest. As viewed from Earth, aspects are measured by the angular distance in degrees and minutes of ecliptic longitude between two points. According to astrological tradition, they indicate the timing of transitions and developmental changes in the lives of people and affairs relative to the earth. And the ancient Chinese followed these trines? I believe so, Sam said. If I recall correctly, there are about four of them. I can't remember much, but I recall reading the first trine, which consists of the rat, dragon, and monkey. These three signs are said to be intense and powerful individuals capable of great good, who make great leaders but are rather unpredictable. 
The three are said to be intelligent, magnanimous, charismatic, charming, authoritative, confident, eloquent, and artistic, but can be manipulative, jealous, selfish, aggressive, vindictive, and deceitful. Wow, that sounds like the Qin Shi Huang we know. It does, doesn't it? Sam said. That's why it stood out for me. So, could it be rat, dragon, and monkey? Maybe, Sam said, as he tried depressing those three animals on the jade keypad. Nothing happened. Tom shrugged. Then again, maybe not. No, I guess not. What about the rest of the trines? Tom asked. Sam shook his head. I can't remember. Nothing? Sam said, Wait, there was a story about this. Tom looked incredulous. About cats and dogs? About the twelve animals? Go on. Sam drew a breath. The Heavenly Gate race story. Come again? It was said, long, long ago, there was a jade emperor who wanted to select twelve animals to be his guards. Like guard dogs? Yeah, only they weren't all dogs. There were twelve different animals. Okay. Sam said, He sent an immortal being into man's world to spread the message that the earlier one went through the heavenly gate, the better the rank one would have. Sounds like a familiar religious allegory. It gets less traditional as you go on, Sam said. The next day, animals set off towards the heavenly gate. The cat and the rat were not good at swimming, but they were both quite intelligent. They decided that the best and fastest way to cross the river was to hop on the back of the ox. The ox, being kind-hearted and naive, agreed to carry them both across. As the ox was about to reach the other side of the river, the rat pushed the cat into the water and then jumped off the ox and rushed to the jade emperor. It was named as the first animal of the zodiac calendar. The ox had to settle in second place. The third one to come was the tiger. Even though it was strong and powerful, it explained to the jade emperor that the currents were pushing him downstream. Suddenly from a distance came a thumping sound and the rabbit arrived. It explained how it crossed the river by jumping from one stone to another in a nimble fashion. Halfway through, it almost lost the race, but it was lucky enough to grab hold of a floating log that later washed him to shore. For that, it became the fourth animal in the zodiac cycle. In the fifth place was the flying Luong. The Jade Emperor was wondering why such a swift airborne creature such as the Luong did not come in first. The Luong explained that it had to stop by a village and brought rain for all the people and therefore it was held back. Then on its way to the finish, it saw the helpless rabbit clinging onto a log. So it did a good deed and gave a puff of breath to the poor creature so that it could land on the shore. The Jade Emperor was astonished by the Luong's good nature, and it was named as the fifth animal. As soon as it had done so, a galloping sound was heard, and the horse appeared. Hidden on the horse's hoof was the snake whose sudden appearance gave it a fright, thus making it fall back and giving the snake the sixth spot, while the horse placed seventh. After a while, the goat, monkey, and rooster came to the heavenly gate. With combined efforts, they managed to arrive to the other side. The rooster found a raft, and the monkey and the goat tugged and pulled, trying to get all the weeds out of the way. The Jade Emperor was pleased with their teamwork and decided to name the goat as the eighth animal, followed by the monkey and then the rooster. The eleventh animal placed in the zodiac cycle was the dog. Although it should have been the best swimmer and runner, it spent its time to play in the water. Though his explanation for being late was because it needed a good bath after a long spell, but for that, it almost did not make it to the finish line. Right when the emperor was going to end the race, an oink sound was heard, 
it was the pig. The pig felt hungry in the middle of the race, so it stopped, ate something, and then fell asleep. After it awoke, it finished the race in twelfth place and became the last animal to arrive. The cat eventually drowned and failed to be in the zodiac. It is said that this is the reason cats always hunt rats and also hate water as well. Tom said, That's a ridiculous story. Sam nodded. I agree. But there's something in the story that links to the Emperor Qin Shi Huang. I just can't see it. If Elise was here, she'd work it out within minutes, I'm sure. Tom frowned. You should have brought her. I'm terrible with this sort of thing. Just keep watching our six. Sam stared at the ancient keypad. I'm nearly there. I'm sure of it. Remember, we're on a pretty tight time schedule. Even if those people behind us don't catch up. Tom glanced at his digital watch. It was linked to his skiba and provided digital readings of the gauges and showed approximately 84 minutes of air remaining. We have a little over an hour to get inside. The frown lines on Sam's face deepened. I know, I know. I'm working the problem as fast as I can. Do you have a better idea? Tom shrugged. I'm not sure the Chinese authorities would approve, but we've already agreed this is about saving the human race and keeping Dragon's breath out of the hands of the ancient cults. Right? Yeah. What did you have in mind? Tom extracted a strip of C4 from his backpack. He held it up with a wry grin and said, We do it my way. Chapter 10 Kiri Villaflor watched as Luke shimmied up the chimney-like opening to the level above and then dropped down a secure rope to use as a makeshift ladder. She followed him through the new opening toward the ceiling, behind the remnants of the previously booby-trapped antechamber. It was a large, sealed room in complete darkness. Dust still enveloped the chamber from the falling debris and sand in the antechamber below, after the booby-trap had been triggered. Flashlights suddenly appeared, sabering through the gloom. Kiri's beam fixed on something metallic, reflecting a bright orange glow. She moved closer and found a coffin cast in copper. There was an inscription written in ancient Chinese calligraphy. She turned to Alexis. Can you translate this? Alexis ran her gloved hand across the copper, clearing nearly 2,300 years of dust. A few seconds later, she nodded and said, Yeah, it says here lies one of Qin Shi Huang's eight favorite concubines to ensure he is greeted with company in the afterlife. Kiri exhaled. This emperor is sounding like a real loser. The chamber extended more than thirty-six feet toward the west, before ending in a locked bronze gate. Luke's flashlight struck a ghastly sight of nearly a hundred skeletal remains. I wonder who they were, Kiri said. They're most likely craftsmen who worked on the tomb. Really? Luke replied. Some reward for their service. She nodded. When the funerary ceremonies were over, the inner passageway was blocked, and the outer gate was lowered to confine all the craftsmen in the tomb. This was to ensure that the workings of the mechanical traps and the knowledge of the tomb's treasures would not be divulged. Finally, plants and vegetation were planted on the mausoleum, so it resembled a hill. Luke looked out at the second entry chamber. And here we are, ready to rob the greatest of those treasures. Kiri met Luke's eye. I assume you can make short work of that gate. Yes, ma'am. Good. Do it. Minutes later, the bronze gate was blasted open with controlled explosives. They stepped out into the small stone hallway. It passed a series of prayer towers and a banquet hall. On their right, one of the flashlights reflected two massive ancient Chinese warriors. 
These were nearly eight feet tall and covered in armor. Kiri fixed her flashlight on the glistening, lifelike statues. Their armor seemed to have been riveted together in places and tied or sewn in others. The lamellae were small plates two by two inches and made of leather or metal with several metal studs in each plate. In general, larger plates were used to cover the chest and shoulders, and smaller plates were used to cover the arms. For additional protection, some warriors wore extra garments on their thighs in addition to the pants under their coats. Others wore shin pads, including archers who might have occasion to kneel. These warriors wore the headdresses that resembled a pheasant tail, indicating they were part of the emperor's royal guard. She grinned. They were in the throne room. Three sets of ornamental gold stairs, wrapped in silk, rose to the emperor's throne. A single blue sapphire rested on a bronze pedestal, gelded in a type of golden silk. Althea, a high-end thief and safecracker from Greece, went to touch the precious gemstone. Kiri drew in a sharp breath. Don't touch that! A split second too late, the mercenary's slippery fingers had clasped the precious stone. Why shouldn't I? She laughed with an impish smile and pried the stone free from the ancient masonry glue. Let's call it a danger bonus. The gem was secretly attached to a gadget controlling hidden arrows. They fired instantly. Every one of them hit its mark precisely. Althea's mouth opened. She tried to speak, but the words wouldn't come out. The muscles of her chest spasmed and her diaphragm dipped in, paradoxical to normal breathing, as it failed to overcome the increased pressure. She took a few more gurgled breaths as blood spilled from her lungs into her throat and eventually bubbled from her mouth. That's why not! Kiri arched an unapologetic eyebrow and gave a shrug of indifference. Another ten percent bonus, but I suggest you work to stay alive if you want to spend any of it, people. Luke stepped into the throne room, took in Althea's arrow-pierced body, and said excitedly, I found it. Show me, Kiri said. She followed Luke around to the aqueduct filled with mercury, like a secret passageway through the ancient imperial palace. Kiri grinned. They were getting close. In the distance, a large explosion echoed through the rounded, vaulted tomb. Vibrations rumbled through the ground, and small ripples of mercury swelled like the ghost of a tsunami entering the ancient aqueducts of the Imperial Palace. Kiri exchanged a glance with Luke. We're not alone! It would appear so, Luke admitted. Quick, Kiri said to her remaining team. We'll need those zodiacs inflated if we want to be the first to reach Dragon's Breath. Chapter 11 The explosion ripped through the gate. For a split second, Sam worried that the couple hundred yards they had put between them and the fortified entrance wasn't going to be enough to protect them. Shards of splintered jade, bronze, and gold fragments whizzed through the air, casting a small spray of mercury into the air where they landed. Inside the sampan, Sam covered his ears with the palms of his hands and ducked down at the base of the flat-bottom boat beside Tom. The blast shrapnel ricocheted off the solid bronze bow of the sampan with a barrage of pings. The blast was much bigger than Sam expected, he waited a full ten seconds for good measure and then sat up. He exchanged a quick glance with Tom. You all right? Tom nodded. Yeah, I think so. No scrapes or holes that you've noticed? Tom's eyes swept his armored body. No, I'm all good. Sam took the ulo and began the now familiar side-to-side -side motion of the protracted oar. The large rudder-shaped oar began to whip back and forth like the tail of a fish, and the sampan began its forward motion, lithely cutting its way through the Mercury River. Tom watched him for a few seconds. 
Sam's lips were set with a wry grin. Tom looked at Sam with a puzzled grin. What? Do you think you used enough C4? Tom spread his arms outward in an apologetic gesture. Sorry, I wasn't sure how strong that old gate was going to be. Apparently ancient bronze, half embedded in a river of mercury for more than two millennia, along with ornamental decorations of jade and gold, is fairly brittle. It would appear so. Together they worked the ulo in a synchronized effort of pulling and pushing that drove the massive ore through the mercury, propelling the sampan toward the gate. They eased their efforts and slowed as the boat slowly passed through to the inside of the Imperial Palace. The sampan silently slid through the remnants of the wrecked gate and entered the ancient palace. Inside, the sea of mercury flowed throughout a small maze of rivers that intermingled with a series of raised pathways, bridges, and gates before opening up to another lake of mercury. The entire thing reminded him more and more of a sort of Chinese version of the canals of Venice. On the small islands were archers' parapets, armed by members of the Royal Guard, like the area outside the Imperial Palace that depicted a microcosm of the Qin Empire. This area within the walls of the palace made an even more miniature version of that empire. There were models of pavilions, palaces filled with gold, gemstones, and other treasures. Sacred stone tablets on bronze pedestals lined in silk. There were copper coffins, inscribed soul towers, and prayer temples. Tom said, if Chin Shi Huang's buried here, where's his wife? Sam shrugged. Never had one. Tom laughed. All this? And he never quite caught the attention of some beautiful maiden? Sam said. Apparently, the emperor had more than 13,000 concubines. A new one brought to him every single night after he took reign at age 13. Say what? Exactly except it appears that he never named an empress. Right. Even for an emperor, that seems... Tom, unable to find the right words, turned the palms of his hands outward. Sam finished it for him. Excessive? Yeah, a little. I agree. The sampan rode along a small aqueduct through the gated palace, before entering a symbolic sea of mercury at the very center of the palace and absolute center of the underground burial chamber. Sam's eyes narrowed. They had moved into the inner sanctum of the imperial palace. Within, it appeared an even more miniaturized delineation of Qin Shi Huang's ancient world. The sea of mercury was dotted with seven individual floating islands, cast in solid bronze, each one shaped to match the once warring states, a unique visual representation of the world in the Emperor United. Qin, Zhao, Qi, Yan, Han, Wei, Chu. They weren't just shaped like their original states. They were three-dimensional models of the lands, with intricate carvings set to precise proportions of the mountains, rivers, and plains. The gaps between the islands were just big enough to sail the sampan through, but small enough that one could potentially jump from island to island to slowly make their way around the known world of Qin Shi Huang's empire. At the very center of it all floated a large golden raft, intricately carved and embedded with precious gems. In the artificial sky, set in the copper dome directly above the coffin, burned a single whale-oil lamp that flickered and shone light down on the ancient tomb like a dying sun, casting long shadows that danced across his empire. Surrounding the sun were a small myriad of diamonds, upon which this burning light flickered and sparkled like the infinite stars above. Tom said, There it is! Sam locked eyes on the floating coffin. The Emperor's Tomb. 
Chapter 12 They carefully eased the sampan toward the emperor's casket. Gently working the ulo, they positioned the sampan alongside the ancient burial raft. Sam carefully brought the boat to a stop while Tom grabbed hold of the raft. It moved like any other buoyant object, except slower. Sam removed a small piece of prusik rope from his belt, fed it through the eyelet of the sampan's bowline, and tied it off against the ancient coffin. The last thing he wanted to do was become separated from the sampan and trapped on a floating island in a sea of deadly mercury. Sam stared at the emperor's tomb. The remains of Qin Shi Huang had been dressed in jade and gold with pearls in his mouth. His coffin, floating in a bed of mercury, was anchored by a single line of golden chain links. Placed around the emperor's body were vessels with precious stones and relics. The floor was inlaid with gold and silver ducks. The ceiling of the copper dome featured a starry sky of pearls and gems and constellations fashioned from the candles made of whale oil, which burned longer than normal wax. Clasped in the emperor's right hand was a sword. It had a bronze hilt with gold lining and embedded with three precious gems, a red ruby, a blue sapphire, and a green emerald. Something about the three gems seemed to trigger something in Sam's brain, as though they meant something. He was far from an expert in ancient Chinese history, but as far as he knew, there was nothing distinct about any of those three stones, or the combination of the three. His eyes narrowed, and he grinned. He stared at them as the burning fire above flickered and shone light that landed and glistened on the color of each stone, red, green, and blue, the primary colors of light. Together they could be combined in different proportions to make all other colors. Sam considered his early preschool education in finger painting and color matching, Red and greens added together to make yellow. Red and blue make purple, and so on. Sam picked up the bejeweled sword. It was relatively short. A classic ancient Chinese weapon known as a Tao. Single-edged Chinese swords were primarily used for slashing and chopping. The most common form is also known as the Chinese saber, although those with wider blades are sometimes referred to as Chinese broadswords. Its blade was still within a scabbard. Sam withdrew the blade. It was iridescent. In the light it glistened like a rainbow. Sam placed his left hand on the blade. The Kevlar gloves prevented him from getting cut, but all the same he could feel the power of the weapon, the blade itself was unnaturally cold. Without a glove on, it would have been too cold to hold. Tom stared at the blade. Do you think that's dragon's breath? Sam sheathed the weapon, holding it from the hilt almost reverently. I don't know, but there's no doubt the Emperor valued it above all else. Tom stared at the weapon. I've never seen anything quite like it. Me neither. Sam wiped his Kevlar-gloved hand on his pants. Small beads of frost could be seen falling from them. The blade was frozen. A puzzled grin formed on Tom's lips. Frozen? It's warm down here. Exactly. Should it reach some sort of equilibrium with its environment? Sam nodded. I wasn't a chemistry major, but that was my understanding, too. It must be something about dragon's breath that keeps it sub-freezing at otherwise room temperature. Strange. I'm pretty certain that's against at least one of the major laws of physics. From what I've heard about dragon's breath, it seems to break several of those so-called laws. Tom swallowed. You sure it's safe to handle? 
No, Sam admitted. But I don't have a better idea, do you? No. Tom shook his head. Then I guess we're taking it with us. In the Emperor's left hand was a book. It appeared to have been made out of solid gold and covered in an ancient Chinese script. Sam tried to pick it up. The weight surprised him. Through his line of work, he'd had the opportunity to pick up several bars of gold bullion over the years and had always been surprised by how heavy such a bar was. But this book seemed unnaturally light. It was little more than a parting thought as he took the ancient tome and put it into the bottom of his backpack. There was little to suggest the book had anything to do with Dragon's Breath, but if he was lucky, he thought maybe whatever was written within might enlighten him of the powers of the strange weapon. Embedded on the side of the tome was a dragon. The image had been formed out of the same iridescent material used on the blade of the sword. Sam tentatively brushed it with his gloved hand. It, too, seemed cold to touch. A wry grin formed on Sam's lips, and his eyes widened as his mind began to consider the possibilities. Beside the emperor was a small dragon carved out of jade. The green dragon appeared little more than a cute relic, but in front of it, placed on a small pedestal, stood a small bag made from woven silk. Sam stared at the silk satchel. It was embroidered with a design called longevity, which used colored silk threads to illustrate the profiles of dragons among the rolling clouds. In Chinese mythology, the Chinese dragon is the guild on the path to immortality. He only recognized it because the same material was found previously in the nearby slaughter pits, where princes and princesses from the Qin dynasty were buried. Sam untied the leather seal, opened it. Inside the silk bag was filled with an almost feather-light powder. Even in the small amount of light available, he could tell the contents glistened with the same strange iridescence of the blade and side of the book. Sam drew a breath. Somehow, he knew they were standing in the midst of greatness, one of the most profound wonders of the world. Even though it were little to look at, Dragon's breath seemed to yield an ancient power, its secret formula long forgotten by alchemists, its power so unimaginable it had allowed Emperor Qin Shi Huang to unite and rule a series of warring factions and change the course of China that still resounded 2,300 years later. Tom said, Three items. Sam nodded. All touched by dragon's breath. Behind them, someone said, I'll have those, thank you, Mr. Riley." Chapter 13 Wu Ching Li stood at the top of the archer's parapet. There was an uninterrupted view of the emperor's floating coffin tied to the bronze sampan and the two intruders at the center of the floating islands that formed the ancient world of China. Hu's heart thumped in his chest, its pace picking up speed. He aimed the QSZ-92 semi-automatic pistol at the shorter of the two men. I have no desire to kill you, Mr. Riley, but if you test me, I will not hesitate to shoot you. Do you understand? Sam frowned, looking up at him with those ocean-blue eyes. They quickly darted between Hu and Ming's pistols, which were trained on them. The American's lips curled into an almost bemused smile and apparent resignation that he and his friend were in an impossible position. He turned his arms outward, and in a calm voice he said, I understand. What would you like us to do? 
You can start by slowly retrieving your weapons and dropping them into the mercury, who exhaled slowly. There's two of us with pistols already aimed at you. No chance you'll get a shot off before you're dead. Both men slowly reached for their weapons. Who stopped them? Not together, one at a time. He got a good look at Sam Riley's friend for the first time. He was roughly six foot four and built like a bulldozer. Even without a weapon, the man looked deadly. But who to disarm first? The big guy was a weapon in his own muscular right, but Sam Riley was in charge. He was used to being the boss. If he tried to make a move, the big guy would inherently follow. No, better to take their chances with Sam first. Subdue the head, and the rest of the snake will fall. Mr. Riley, you can go first. Sam said, Okay, I'm grabbing my weapon. How would you like me to do it? Thumb and forefinger on the barrel. Okay. Who watched as Sam slowly retrieved his Heckler & Koch MP5 submachine gun? As ordered, his thumb and forefinger were delicately placed on the barrel. He lifted his arm straight out, holding the weapon above the mercury lake. Do you want me to throw it? Who shook his head. Just drop it where it is. Sam shrugged. There was something in his eyes that Who didn't like. It was almost primitive. Something that made Who's primal instincts take note. The weapon dropped, landing on the mercury lake with a splash. Small ripples of the gunmetal gray liquid extending in an ever-expanding outward circle. The MP5 disappeared beneath the silvery liquid and rose above once more, settling on the surface. Sorry, Sam turned his palms outward. There was a wry grin on the man's face. Didn't anyone ever tell you mercury's a heavy metal? Who frowned? What? Mercury. It's a heavy metal. 13.5 times the molecular density of water. The big guy spoke up. Sam, forget with the chemistry lesson. They're not interested. Sam raised a hand. Okay, okay. I'm sorry. I just wanted to make sure you understood that metal, including our weapons, will float on mercury. Who looked at the man. He was a nonchalant bastard. Cool, calm, and collected with that sort of air of casual indifference, as though waiting to see how things would pan out at the end of a good book, rather than a matter of life or death. Good to know, Mr. Riley. You can call me Sam. Very good. Now you can now take that pistol and throw it over here, who said, pointing toward the north of the miniaturized ancient China. Sam smiled. What pistol? Who was it laughing? The one you keep concealed in the small of your back. Sam shrugged and removed the pistol, a Glock, and said, Oh, that one. Yes, that one. Who pointed to the north of the miniaturized world? Throw it over there, out of reach. Sam glanced at him, his eyes resting defiantly on whose hardened face. Sure. A second later, the troublesome adventurer threw the weapon to the farthest northern island. The Glock landed on the island that represented the state of Yan. The island consisted of the Yan mountain ranges that rose between the Kobai River on the west and the Shenhai Pass on the east. It is made up mostly of limestone, granite, and basalt. The Glock hit the side of the bronze recreation of the state's highest peak, Mount Wu Ling, before skidding down. Three narrow passes were intricately depicted, the Gubei Pass, the Shifang Pass, and Leng. It was halfway down the Shifang Pass that the Glock became stuck. Who drew a sharp breath? The weapon was still well out of the two men's immediate reach, but who knew for how long? Who made a mental note of the weapon's location and determined to keep the two intruders away from that side of the tomb? He pointed his pistol toward the bigger guy. You! The mountain said, Me? Yeah, your turn. What's your name? Tom. Well, Tom, 
Time to get rid of your weapons, nice and slow. Who watched as the second man repeated the steps of removing his guns? This guy was massive, like a mountain. Whose eyes darted between the bronze replica of Mount Wuling and the stranger, realizing the stranger matched the mountain's height and rough size. When they finished, who said, Back on the sampan, you can row to us. Sam and Tom worked the ulo, and the sculling oar rocked back and forth until the sampan traveled the short distance to the edge of the lake, where a series of archer parapets were joined by multiple bridges and ramparts to a small island made of basalt. The sampan rested against the shore. It was too heavy for either Sam or Tom to pull up onto the basalt island. Both men stepped off the boat onto the shore. Sam's eyes drifted from Tom to Ming before landing on who. So, now what? Who made a big theatrical sigh. Now, you hand over Dragon's Breath. Sam nodded and passed the iridescent sword over to him. Here, have it. I still don't know what Dragon's Breath does or what makes it so important. Who holstered his pistol and gripped the gem-studded hilt of the ancient Tao? It might have been seen as the height of hubris to pocket his handgun, but he was in no danger. Sam and Tom posed no threat to him. Ming still had a pistol aimed at them. He could easily squeeze off two shots before either man reached him. Besides, at close quarters, Hu was a proficient and expert swordsman. With Dragon's breath in his hands, he was unstoppable. He glanced at the sword. Three precious gems adorned the golden hilt, ruby, emerald, sapphire. They indicated the primary colors, red, green, blue, the iridescences of dragon's breath. Who unsheathed the weapon, reverently watching the colors of the rainbow glisten from its blade, like the sun's rays escaping a prism? Sam said, Satisfied? Who nodded? Very. He carefully sheathed the blade and attached it to a back scabbard he'd had purposefully built to accommodate and conceal it. The ancient weapon was designed to be hidden in the hollowed space between his skiba tank and his shirt. It was completely indistinguishable without a close inspection. Now the powder, Sam said. Sorry? Who shook his head and made a tisk-tisk sound. Let's not play games, Sam. Ah, that powder. Sam withdrew the silk satchel from his backpack and handed it to him. Who recognized the elegantly embroidered design known as longevity with its distinctive profile of dragons among the rolling clouds? The path to immortality who stared at the ancient silk bag filled with the iridescent powder. His lips curled in a wry grin. It seemed impossible that such a small rainbow metal could possess so much power. But he knew the truth. It was the deadliest material on earth. A woman said, I'll take that. Who turned to see a woman? And such a woman. Sexy, strong, and lithe, she had big, dark eyes, a mass of black hair barely restrained, and perfect teeth that currently displayed a highly satisfied smile. Maybe five foot four, her presence emanated confidence and authority. She was also carrying a submachine gun, which who recognized in an instant was trained on his head. Behind her, were five other mercenaries, each one carrying some sort of submachine gun. Every single one of those weapons were pointed at him. The soldiers were dressed in dark clothing. Apparently they had swept in around them, taking them all by surprise on board two inflatable Zodiacs with silent electric outboard motors. Who exchanged a quick glance with Ming. 
their death was almost a certainty. As the last of the Yuxia, he and Ming didn't fear death, nor would they seek it out. There were more important priorities. It was vital to protect the world from the evil of Dragon's Breath. The question remained, what could they do? That thought was still running in his mind when he realized the barrel of Ming's QSE-92 semi-automatic had turned from Sam's head directly to whose? A shadow of shock, confusion, and real fear crossed his face. His brain was still trying to replay the image he'd just seen, taking it apart and putting it back together again like some sort of giant jigsaw puzzle that just needed to be connected in such a way that it would make sense. Like a computer unable to compute, the primitive, primal part of his brain simply couldn't put it together. Before he had the chance to reach the inevitable conclusion, Ming Hui Zhang provided it to him. Hand over the dragon's breath, Hu. Hu drew a breath. Confusion was replaced by a crushing pain of betrayal and utter loss, like the death of a brother. Why? he asked. I gave you infinite income. You wanted for nothing. Your father, your father's father, and those who went before him. Your purpose was ordained throughout the ages. He shook his head. I don't understand. What could someone possibly offer you to betray us? Not someone. This one. Ming turned to look at the stunning Polynesian woman and said, Hu Ching Li, meet Kiri Villaflor. Chapter 14 Sam's eyes swept the recent arrivals. There were six new hired guns in the room, all professional soldiers, none of them friendly. It was both good and bad for him and Tom. Six more guns that could be pointed their way, but it also split the dynamics of the battle. Now there were three separate groups fighting for control over Dragon's Breath. It was a game already in play. Yet as of now, the cards had just been shuffled and re-dealt. This was a new game with a fresh set of possible outcomes. But who would come out of it alive. Sam's eyes followed the taller, somewhat corpulent one of the two members of the Yuxia as the man approached the leader of what appeared to be some sort of European coalition. The two came together in what seemed an unlikely yet loving embrace. Just their face masks prevented them from kissing. The woman turned to the shorter of the two Yuxia. I'll have the dragon's breath now, who... Who trembled and twitched, torn with indecision, like an overburdened madman trying to decide the time and means of his own death. The woman in charge said, Alexis, Carl, go get Dragon's Breath from him. Yes, yes Carrie, Carrie, they replied in unison in response to the military command. Sam made note of the name of the leader, Kiri, a traditional Polynesian name but clearly she had a strong Spanish heritage, too, and she was in charge. Sam exchanged a meaningful glance with Tom, who stepped backward slowly. Kiri pointed her star Z-84 submachine gun at him. I wouldn't move. I'll deal with the two of you soon, but if you move again, I might just shoot you both to get you out of the equation. Do I make myself clear? Yes, yes ma'am. Ma Sam and Tom replied in unison. Sam exhaled slowly. Things were about to start moving very quickly. This scrambling contest was coming to an end. The million-dollar question was, what part did he want to play in the next hand? The two European mercenaries, Alexis and Carl, approached who? The Yuxia. They quickly disarmed him, getting him to drop his pistol on the ground beside him. Alexis, a woman with a thick French accent, said in English, 
Now kick it into the sea. Who said, sure. Sam met Who's intelligent eyes. His jaw was set, and there was a certain determination in his face. Something about his look made Sam do a double take. The man's eyes were searching, hinting at something. But what? Then it struck him. The Yuxia was looking for an alliance. Did he and Tom want to form an alliance, form a temporary truce, lasting long enough to get out of the Emperor's tomb alive? Sam gave an almost imperceptible nod. Hell, yes. Who kicked the QSZ-92 pistol toward him? It skidded across the basalt island, sliding past Sam and Tom, before landing in the Mercury Lake behind them. The submachine gun dipped beneath the silvery liquid before resurfacing a few seconds later. Sam's heart beat faster. Had Kiri seen it? His heart stopped. From the side of the basalt island, Kiri said, Wait! Carl asked. What? You're not finished, Kiri said. Take his damn traditional sword from him. Ming, the taller of the two Yuxia, said, Careful! He has lightning reflexes and is probably about the best swordsman on the planet. The two mercenaries looked nonplussed. Carl said, I'll have your sword. Who unclipped the leather scabbard from his belt, removing his traditional dao still sheathed? He handed it to the German mercenary. Carl threw the sword into the mercury. Alexa said, Now hand over the dragon's breath who nodded, solemnly retrieving the silk bag of the iridescent metallic powder. The woman took it and threw it to Kiri. Kiri caught it in her left hand. She clipped her submachine gun onto its holster on her belt. With both hands, she untied the leather string and examined the powder. Kiri sealed the bag once again, a smile of satisfaction on her face. It's dragon's breath! His shoulders rounded, who lowered his head, demoralized. He was the picture of subservience. Kiri placed the silk satchel in her own backpack. Then, with a snap in her voice, she asked, What about the map? Who looked up at her? I don't know. I haven't found it yet. She glanced at Ming. The map. Ming shrugged. I'm sorry. He's telling the truth. Maybe it's still with the Emperor. Sam unconsciously found himself holding his breath. Kiri's hardened gaze landed on Sam. Do you have the map? Sam spoke with honesty. What map? Don't play stupid with me, she said, her voice harsh and uncompromising. Sam spread his arms in an apologetic gesture. I'm afraid I'm not playing. Just stupid, hey? she said, unclipping her submachine gun. Sam lifted his hands, more placating than apologetic. Wait, no, I'm serious. We never found a map, but we haven't searched the entire tomb. You interrupted us. Kiri turned to look at Ming. That's true, Ming shrugged. We were looking when you showed up. Kiri met Sam's eye. Do you have the map? Perhaps we should search for it on your dead body. No, no. We never found any damned map. Sam exhaled slowly, pausing to measure her response. When he judged the timing was just right, he played his wild card by adding, So far, we've only found that glowing powder and the sword. Sword? Kiri cocked her head to the side. What sword? Who drew the short blade from the hidden scabbard on his back? The expert swordsman moved with an impossible speed. The blade sliced across Carl's throat. On the backward movement, Who turned the blade, stabbing it into Alexis's gut. Sam didn't wait to see the inevitable gush of blood. Instead, he dropped down and grabbed the QSZ-92 semi-automatic. The safety was set on the left side of the receiver, with the hammer visible. 
In a simultaneous movement, he raised the barrel, aimed, and slid the safety to off. Aiming at Ming first, he squeezed off two shots in rapid succession. The Yaxia cried out in pain. Kiri disappeared behind a wall of basalt, while the three remaining members of the European coalition took cover behind surrounding bronze mountains in the north. Distancing themselves by spreading out in a wide arc, they turned their weapons south towards Sam and Tom. The instant Hu drew his blade, Tom began moving with the speed of an Olympic sprinter. He was running south toward jumping the small gap between the basalt mainland and the Qi state, before taking another two steps and then making the long jump to the floating Chu Island. He dived over the small bronze mountains and reached for the MP5 submachine gun that lay floating in the small Bay of Mercury. The bullets from the north began raining down upon them. He risked a quick look. There was a large chain, presumably once used to raise the miniaturized copper dome above the emperor's coffin. It hung like a candelabra. One end was fastened to the copper dome, the other attached to the basalt island. There, the chain was connected to a bronze counterweight at least six times the size of the emperor's coffin. It was behind this bronze counterweight that two people from the European coalition were taking cover as they fired back at him. From the southern floating island depicting the miniaturized state of Chu, Tom began firing his MP5 submachine gun in the opposite direction. Sam fired several shots toward the north in rapid successions and then pushed the sampan into the Mercury Lake and jumped inside. He kept his head down low while the bronze rowboat began to chime to the sounds of submachine gun fire raking its side. The ancient craftsman had built her out of bronze metal cast five inches thick. He just hoped it was strong enough to withstand the ballistic assault. From the cacophony of shots chiming against the sampan's hull, it was impossible to tell who was firing at who, let alone who was winning the battle. After a few seconds and multiple sharp bursts, all gunfire ceased. The sudden silence pressed on Sam's ears. He lifted his head just high enough to scout the battlefield. His eyes quickly swept the ancient world from left to right. There was no sign of his attackers to the north. Ming lay on the basalt island to the east, whimpering from his wounds, either unable or unwilling to drag himself away and find cover. There was no sign of Kiri or of Hu, the betrayed Yuxia and Sam's temporary ally. Strangely, there was no sign of Alexis or Carl, the two mercenaries who Hu had sliced with his ancient blade of dragon's breath. Sam was certain the weapon had inflicted a mortal blow to both men, but he was forced to doubt his own eyes. Where were the bodies? Even stranger still, where was the evidence of the attack? He'd seen Hu slice Carl's throat. There should have been blood everywhere, and yet there was no sign of it. A trickle of fear rose in his belly. Had they been wearing some sort of near-invisible protective body armor? All in all, it just added two more unknowns to the battlefield equation. To the south, there was no sign of Tom, who had taken refuge behind one of the bronze islands. His eyes slowly drifted back. There, on the Chi Island to the south, he spotted the head of one of his attackers, a woman. It wasn't much of a target from this distance. He took a couple of quick shots, but the rounds fell uselessly onto the bronze mound beside the attacker's head. A few more shots were fired from an unknown direction and then greeted by total silence. The sampan drifted toward the center of the Sea of Mercury, and Sam found himself all alone. Chapter 15 The firefight had died as quickly as it had begun. The sampan coasted through the silvery metal and came to a gentle stop as its stern bumped into the Chin Island. 
the largest of the floating bronze states. Sam raised his head tentatively, just enough to take another quick reconnaissance of the battlefield. An acrid, charred steak smell, along with a metallic sulfur scent, made a pungent odor that wafted through the mausoleum. The remaining attackers had taken refuge at opposite ends of the island, one in the north, one in the south. Ming, no longer crying out in pain, was in the middle of the basalt island to the east, where the main wall of the imperial palace stood, along with a series of smaller buildings, coffin rooms, armory, prayer towers, and royal halls, all interconnected by a maze of bridges. Sam pointed to the archer's parapet that lined the imperial palace, and Tom fixed his weapon in that direction. He kept his newly acquired pistol trained on the archer's tower. Still, no sign of the woman in charge of the European coalition. There were multiple injuries, some dead, some still yet to succumb to their injuries. All seemed to be well trained. No one made a sound. Sam knew this didn't mean there weren't people hurting out there, just that they were professional enough to keep silent. But adrenaline was running high in everyone, and that's a hard thing to hide. To the east he could hear the muffled sound of someone breathing hard. On the beach of the basalt island, Sam heard Ming suddenly cry out, Kiri, I'm dying! Please take me with you! No one answered him. To the north there were two people breathing hard. In an ordinary fight, Sam would have waited, regrouped, and planned his next move. But a quick glance at his air gauge showed he had less than forty minutes air supply left. He didn't have time to wait. They needed to get going if they wanted any hope of reaching the surface before running out of air. Sam made a couple of quick, powerful movements on the ULO. The Chinese sculling oar rotated on its fixed fulcrum, sending the sampan on a sharp turn due south toward the island of Chu. The sampan slipped through the mercury like an ancient specter. Sam kept his voice low. Tom. Here, Tom replied, his head becoming just visible through a small pass in the bronze mountain. Sam brought the sampan along beside the Chu Island. We need to get that bag of dragon's breath back, he whispered. Tom climbed on board the boat. Agreed. Any idea who survived? Ming wailed out, now sobbing and begging. Sam's face grimaced. Besides him? Yeah. No idea. But I'm pretty certain Kiri, the leader of the European coalition, got away before the firefight got out of hand. Tom asked, Any idea where? Sam shook his head. No, only that she retreated into the royal chambers. Okay, let's go after her. What about the blade? It too. If we can find who... And if he's alive, and even has the damn sword, Sam agreed. But first priority is to catch up with Kiri and get that powder back. They shifted the Yulo so the sampan made its way around the Chu and Chi Islands, before entering a small aqueduct into the royal chambers. Sam maneuvered the boat while Tom swept the area, tracking it with the barrel of his submachine gun. They headed through the aqueduct before coming out into a small opening, upon which both Zodiac boats were tied. They brought the sampan up alongside the basalt island, beside the inflatables, and an open space filled with more than a dozen royal terracotta warriors, like an ancient parade ground. The aqueduct continued on beneath another two bridges that separated the various islands. Up ahead, Sam saw a woman run across one of the bridges and into the rampart at the farthest southern end of the Imperial Palace. She moved like a wraith. Behind her, Sam spotted Hu in pursuit. Kiri looked like she was going to try and clear the wall, but at the last minute realized she didn't have the precious seconds it would take to do so. Stopping abruptly, she turned and fired at Hu. Who ducked into the corner, 
disappearing behind the terracotta warriors within the parade ground. Kiri's eyes darted maliciously. Sam and Tom ducked down, taking cover within the sampan. Their enemy kept moving. Who must have retrieved someone's gun because he started shooting at her? The woman moved with considerable speed. She was approaching the sampan. Sam and Tom climbed out, ready to stop her. Instead, were greeted by heavy fire from the east. They ducked down behind the sampan as bullets raked the side of the bronze boat. The bullets were arching around, as though the person shooting them was making their way around the boat. Sam was breathing hard. He swore. We've got to go. Tom pointed to the throne room. In there! They bolted across the open space, taking cover inside the throne room. Ming crawled out into the basalt opening before the parapet. Kiri moved slowly along the parade ground, making her way through the ancient army of royal guards. She reached the sampan, and using the barrel of her submachine gun, she glanced inside. Come on out, who? This game's no fun without you. Determined not to let someone else hide within the sampan, she put her foot on the boat and pushed hard. The sampan drifted into the middle of the Mercury Lake like a ghost ship. She stepped toward the bridge, crossing the very edge of the basalt island, and onto the stilted platforms that led to the outer wall of the Imperial Palace. It was there that the woman stopped. Kiri held the small silk bag, containing dragon's breath. The woman poured a small amount of the strange metallic powder onto her gloved right hand. Then, with her left, she quickly removed her face mask. There was something regal about the way she did it. It was a striking face. Intelligence and beauty were abundant in equal proportions. The woman smiled. A second later, her lips formed together to blow a kiss. She then exhaled, sending the vibrant dust gently floating down from the archer's parapet toward the rocky island upon which were Sam and Tom, along with various dead and living mercenaries. There was something sensual, almost sexy, about the demonstration, and the iridescent powder drifted casually toward the island. The woman placed her mask back on her face, clambered over the railing and disappeared into the clearing outside the Imperial Palace. A moment later there was an explosion unlike anything Sam had ever experienced. Chapter 16 The brilliant flash blinded Sam. One moment he was shouting at Tom, the next his vision went white. A clap of thunder tried to crush his skull, immediately deafening him. An icy shock wave followed, knocking him back like a rogue wave. He hit the ground on his back. A few seconds later, he felt a strange tug on his body, pulling him toward the explosion. Sam fought against it, panicked, down to the core. The sensation felt not only wrong, but fundamentally unnatural like some sort of evil wraith dragging his soul under. He struggled against that tide with every fiber of his being. Then it was over, as quickly as it had begun. The inexorable pull popped away, releasing him. His senses snapped back, his ears filled with wails and screams. Images swirled into focus. Sam expected the entire parade ground with all the royal terracotta warriors to have been destroyed, but to his surprise, they all appeared untouched. In fact, the entire imperial palace and miniaturized burial chamber remained intact. A single fire devil began to form. Fueled by the heat of the explosion, like a miniature tornado, the strong, well-formed, and presumably short-lived whirlwind stood just shy of six feet tall. It spun rapidly, catching dust particles in its upward circular motion. 
Sam had never seen anything like it. The dust devil looked more like a living specter than a natural weather phenomenon involving a vertically oriented rotating column of wind. This one was nearly translucent, but as light from the various whale oil lamps cast down upon it, the storm reflected all the colors of the rainbow. The sight was a mesmerizing prism, magnified by intermittent bursts of red, orange, blue, green, and even white flames. Sam knew the science, knew that there are two flows of air in this type of vortex. The first is caused by highly localized hot air rising through the cooler environmental air, forming a sharp updraft. With the right conditions, that updraft begins to rotate, and the column of hot air starts to stretch vertically, moving the mass closer to the axis of rotation, which in turn intensifies the spinning effect by conservation of angular momentum. The secondary flow in the dust devil causes other hot air to speed horizontally inward to the bottom of the newly forming vortex. As more hot air rushes in toward the developing vortex to replace the air that is rising, the spinning effect becomes further intensified and self-sustaining. A dust devil is a funnel-like chimney through which hot air moves both upwards and in a circle. As the hot air rises, it cools, losing its buoyancy, and eventually ceases to rise. As it rises, it displaces air which descends outside the core of the vortex. This cool air, returning, acts as a balance against the spinning hot air outer wall. This keeps the system stable. Sam stared as the fiery vortex bounced around the terracotta warriors lined up along the parade ground. It didn't touch any of them, as though their bronze shells held mythical powers to repel the fire devil's evils. The fire whirl soon reached the end of the parade ground at the edge of the Mercury Lake. There it immediately turned north, traversing the edge of the Mercury shore in a perfectly straight line. It was as though some sort of invisible field was guiding it, preventing it from entering the sea. The mini-tornado drifted back through the parade ground, working its way across one of the bridges. It stopped fifteen feet short of where Ming, the taller of the two Yuxia, lay on the ground. Making an abrupt change in direction, it turned and raced toward the man. Sam's eyes narrowed. If he had to guess, it almost looked as though the rainbow fire devil was sentient, although that concept was impossible. Sam was too stunned to move. Ming clambered to the front of the terracotta army royal guard. The glistening dust of the fire devil landed on his fingers. He shielded his face mask with his hands. Ming screamed and brought his hands to his face, his eyes wide with terror, Slowly, in front of him, Ming's fingers disappeared. Like the poison of a venomous creature, the strange reaction flowed up his arms, down his torso, legs, disintegrating everything in its path. Ming cried out, his voice howled, and his body disintegrated around him until only his head remained, and then even that, too, disappeared, along with his machine gun, backpack, and everything else along with him. Sam raised up on an elbow to search. There was no sign of him, no charred remains, no mangled body, nothing but a blackened circle of steaming rock. Sam struggled up. Tom looked at him. You alive? Sam nodded and stood up. I'll live. He hoped it was true. Along the parade ground, the ancient royal warriors seemed unfazed. I've never seen anything like this, Tom said, still dazed. The force of this explosion should have taken out half the crowd, including us. He held up an open palm. And just feel that heat. Sam did. 
The air around them felt like a blast furnace and reeked of burning brimstone. His stomach roiled. They watched a large boulder crumbled apart within the blast zone, breaking down into smaller rocks. The face of the basalt island began to do the same, disintegrating into a flow of boulders, then gravel, then sand. In front of their eyes, hard stone had transformed into loose sandstone, vulnerable and weak. Look at the ground, Tom said. Sam dropped to a knee to inspect the surface more closely. Then he saw it, too. He'd missed it through the swirl of steam. The stone terrain was no longer solid. Instead, it seemed more like ground pepper. And it was moving. The grains jittered and trembled as if they were drops of oil simmering atop a hot skillet. Sam watched a small pebble on the surface dissolve into coarse sand, then into a dusty powder. A drop struck the ground and blasted a crater, like a pebble hitting a still pond. Ripples spread outward across the microfine surface. Tom shook his head in disbelief. Fearful, he studied where the blast zone ended and solid ground began. As he stared, the bordering edge of stone crumbled, incrementally expanding the blast zone. It's spreading, Sam realized, and pushed Tom back. Time to go. Tom frowned, standing up to follow. How can that be possible? Sam had no answers, only a growing certainty. Something is still active. It's eating away the rock and radiating outward like some sort of chain reaction at a molecular level. Tom looked at Sam, pointing at the disintegrating ground ahead. Look! Whatever the hell that thing is doing to the ground, it's growing pretty fast. They exchanged a quick glance. It lasted a split second. Both men knew the truth. If they did nothing about the strange explosion... It would continue to eat away at the ground and everything in between. They needed to find a way out of the island and out of the entire mausoleum. Sam said, What's the quickest way out of here? Tom's eyes darted around what was left of the island. The first of the twin bridges began to disintegrate, as though fire had ripped through their ancient timbers. Only they weren't made of wood. Instead, they were made of stone. It was moving quickly, speeding up with every second. Tom pointed to the two zodiacs at the far end of the island. We need to get to one of those, Sam said. Agreed. They began running toward the inflatable boats. Who and some of the remaining European coalition had the same idea? A small firefight ensued, but there wasn't much enthusiasm for it as though everyone now knew they were in a deadly race against time. They needed to escape the mausoleum before becoming a permanent fixture entombed inside. They sped across two small bridges. Sam was about to step onto the third, but Tom grabbed him from behind, preventing him from placing a single foot on the stone bridge. It spanned the mercury aqueduct that separated them from the outer island upon which the Zodiacs had been tied up. The bridge began to crumble, its foundations melting apart like the rest of the land the dragon breath had touched, before the entire structure gave way to gravity. Tom cursed, his eyes darting through the chaos. Sam grumbled a similar sentiment. The strange chain reaction that was eating away at the entire grounds of the Imperial Palace was still spreading. Like some sort of conflagration, it only seemed to burn until it reached the impenetrable mercury. Consequently, as some bridges fell, the land-eating fire burned out, leaving some islands, archers, parapets, and ramparts still intact. Sam tried to make a mental map of the entire room. Behind him, Tom said, Over there! 
Sam's eyes followed Tom's pointing index finger, landing on a series of previously hidden gangways to the back of the Imperial Palace that had now come into sight as the rest of the grounds were destroyed. He drew a sharp breath. Let's go. There might still be time. Chapter 17 Who knew he needed to get out? Of all the people soon to be trapped within the Emperor's tomb, Hu Ching Li was the only one who was aware of the danger they were all in. He knew more about Dragon's Breath than anyone else alive, and as such, how much damage such a small amount of the rare material could cause within the ancient Imperial Palace. Between him and the pair of zodiacs on a small island of basalt, split between four separate bronze bridges with intricate ornate Chinese jade carvings, was one of the female mercenaries. She had dark skin and spoke with a French accent. She was standing up and carried a large machine gun that looked like something straight out of an old Arnold Schwarzenegger movie. She exchanged a glance with who? Her eyes met his, and for a split second he thought his life was over, before she turned the browning heavy machine gun on the bridge. The weapon was designed to be mounted on a vehicle or tripod, but without time to set it up, she was carrying it like Rambo, aiming it at the bridge. Who moved to the north, stepping past her. He kept going, realizing in an instant what she was trying to achieve. The spread of dragon breath was approaching the bridge like a rising tide, and that bridge was the only thing standing between them, like a dam. She planned to treat the bridge like a fuse. Cut the fuse, and Dragon Breath's evil burns out on the other side of the island. Who applauded her bravado and silently prayed she would succeed? All the same, he hoped to hell to be long gone before seeing the aftermath of any eventuation. The mercenary squeezed the trigger. The mechanical belt-fed fifty caliber rounds began to rattle as the browning heavy machine gun opened up. The large fifty caliber rounds raked the bronze structure of the bridge, sending shards of bronze and ornamental jade in all directions. Who reached the northern end of the small basalt island? On the other side of the bridge, the ground was already breaking apart. The spread of dragon's breath had touched the northern ramparts, flooding the rest of the islands, and engulfing the vast majority of the maze of aqueducts, bridges, and bronze islands that made up the bulk of the imperial palace's internal structures. It was moving faster than he predicted. Who planted his feet with a heavy grunt, turning back to take his chances with the woman with the heavy machine gun? His eyes met the eastern bridge. The ground began darkening before disintegrating into fractured stone, pebbles, and eventually dust. The splintering ground raced the spread of fifty caliber bullets to greet the bronze and jade bridge until the heavy machine gun fire sliced through the weakened bridge. The bronze buckled and warped under the strain as if fighting gravity. The bridge collapsed a moment later. A single piece of jade split into dozens of shards and erupted in an outward direction. The smallest of these struck the mercenary in her lower leg. She cried out in pain. The heavy machine gun fell to the ground, its ammunition belt running, until the weapon's hammer landed on empty space and the big gun went silent. She reached down to remove the shard of jade in her leg. Her right hand clasped the stone. Then her fingers fell straight through the jade as though it was liquid. All appearance of restraint was broken. The mercenary rolled onto her back and looked up at her hand in abject terror. She turned the fingers around the palm of her hand as one would trying to roll a marble, and then her fingers began to disappear followed by her forearm. 
The woman howled as her torso and entire body was snatched away from her. Inch by inch it moved, until all that was left was a kind of hollow dust upon the ground, a type of shroud of darkness. Who made a run for the boats? He jumped over the vaporized remains of the woman and onto the bridge that traversed to the other side of the island, the one where the two zodiacs had been tied up. Up ahead, two other mercenaries also ran toward the boats. Who drew an Uzi he'd taken from the dead Israeli mercenary and began spraying his attackers in the distance? His eyes narrowed as the light from the whale oil lamp landed on a single fleck of dust that settled on the Uzi in his left hand. There was something strange about it, unnatural. The speck reflected the light in a myriad of colors like a prism. Oh, shit! The weapon disintegrated in seconds, the strange destructive power eating away at his fingers before a strange tingling sensation started its journey up his arm. That was all he needed to know. If it played out as it had with the French machine gunner, who would be dead within seconds? Like a bite from a venomous snake, the poison was quickly eating its way through his body. His face was set with determination, not fear. Who stepped forward, and with his right hand, drew a broadsword from a nearby terracotta warrior, and in one quick swing he brought the ancient blade down upon his left arm. He cried out. The blade sliced through his upper arm, cleanly severing the humerus, as exacting as a butcher. The poisoned extremity fell to the ground, and utterly disappeared within seconds. Holding his arm to slow the loss of blood, who ran off before the dragon's breath had enough time to destroy the ground and catch him. His heart pounding with shock and pain, thirty feet away from the vortex, he stopped just long enough to remove a mat from a Velcro pocket on his chest. The military arterial tourniquet was designed to be used one-handed. Who applied the C-shaped strap around his left upper arm, clipped the buckle, and twisted the turnkey until the tourniquet went taut, applying enough circumferential pressure to arrest the life-threatening blood loss from his severed arm. Confident his blood had stopped flowing, he kept running toward the Zodiacs. Two soldiers were at the boats, both men. One at least twice his size, his arms covered in tattoos with a massive chest, the other was short and equally wide, reminding him of one of those dwarven miners from Tolkien's Middle Earth. The man grabbed a knife and cut open a five-inch hole in the hull of the closest of the two zodiacs. Compressed air hissed out from the wounded craft, preventing anyone else from escaping and pursuing them. Who automatically tried to raise the Uzi? The stump from his shoulder rose unconsciously. He frowned and silently cursed the loss of his dominant arm. With his right hand, he reached into the secret compartment next to his air tank that held the Emperor's short sword. The iridescent blade began to glow like a dying ember. Chin Shi Huang's ancient blade came alive with dragon's breath. He swung the ancient sword. It struck the back of the first guy's neck, decapitating it. The blade kept moving. The second mercenary reached for his submachine gun. Dragon's breath had other ideas. Who lunged forward, the tip of the blade nicking the man's forearm? The mercenary raised his weapon, a Sosimi Type 821. The Italian submachine gun looked like a ripped-off version of the Israeli Uzi. The man squeezed the trigger. Click. The gun jammed. That almost never happened. The soldier automatically racked the slide, resetting the hammer and ejecting the dud round. He squeezed the trigger. Click. The second shot jammed again. A mixture of fear and incredulity filled his eyes. 
He dropped the weapon and reached for the Beretta at his thigh. But his fingers never reached the trigger. Instead, like the woman with the heavy machine gun, his fingers, arms, and weapon began to disappear as Dragon's breath ate away at his body at a molecular level. The soldier turned to Hu, his eyes wide, and shouted, What's happening to me? Hu shook his head. I'm sorry. Dragon's breath is consuming you. The mercenary opened his mouth to ask another question, but nothing came out. Instead, Hu was met with only silence. The soldier's torso and diaphragm were gone. The man's head distorted with an expression of questioning intermingled with horror, and a moment later the unsupported head fell to the floor. Who climbed onto the second Zodiac, flicked the electric starter switch to on, and opened up the throttle fully. The propeller whirred silently as the Zodiac took off along the Mercury aqueduct. Behind him, the bodies of both mercenaries slowly vaporized, leaving nothing but a small pile of charred dust in their wake. Chapter 18 Sam and Tom circled around what was left of the Imperial Palace. The unaffected ramparts rose to the east. The first two routes were prohibited by the movement of Dragon's Breath, spreading its evil throughout. Halfway along, they reached a prayer tower that rose up to the celestial body high above the Imperial Palace. It offered the highest vantage point within the Imperial Palace. Sam stopped and took a couple of deep breaths. Let's go up there. Maybe we'll see a way out of this maze. Agreed. They reached a three-story tiered tower with multiple eaves known as a pagoda. Many classical poems attest to the joy of scaling pagodas. Although common throughout Asia, they formed a traditional part of Chinese architecture. In addition to religious use, since ancient times Chinese pagodas have been praised for the spectacular views they offer. The Chinese credit the Nepalese architect Araniko with introducing the pagoda to China. The oldest and tallest pagodas were built of wood, but most that survived were built of brick or stone. Some pagodas are solid, with no interior. Hollow pagodas have no higher floors or rooms, but the interior often contains an altar or a smaller pagoda, as well as a series of staircases for the visitor to ascend and to witness the view from an opening on one side of each tier. Most have between three and thirteen tiers, almost always an odd number, and the classic gradual tiered eaves. This one was made of stone, with human figures on its balconies armed with crossbows, and a gatehouse protecting the courtyard on the first floor it looked more like a watchtower than a religious building. The two friends raced to the top of the three-story prayer tower and stared down on what remained of the imperial palace and burial tomb. Sam's eyes swept the strange vista. Dragon's breath spread like wildfire throughout the maze of bridges, islands, and royal grounds, it made him think of a conflagration ripping mercilessly through the streets of ancient buildings, islands, and bridges that made Venice so popular. More than two-thirds of the imperial grounds were affected. Sam's eyes narrowed as he took in the sight. A darkness seemed to proliferate in all directions from where that first speck of dragon's breath landed. He could see its effects more clearly now. Sam said, Everything it touches seems to be imploding. Tom nodded. Burning from the inside out, as though its individual molecules were no longer able to sustain the strength to keep things together. Wherever it touched, the ground began to dissolve, fracturing, before turning into sand and eventually falling away completely. Slow at first, and then it spreads quickly. 
The strange phenomenon was exponential with no signs of ever fading. This bird's eye view was the first time they were able to see how the strange chain reaction spread. It seemed to burn strongest with the ground and living matter, but slower through bronze areas and didn't touch the terracotta materials upon which the royal guards were made. Likewise, mercury was completely immune to the weapon's destructive nature, like water to fire. On the smaller islands, closest to where the first specks of dragon's breath landed and the strange rainbow fire devil whirred, the ground had dissipated until the entire islands sank to the shore. At that point, mercury swamped whatever remained of the island, extinguishing it in the process. Sam stared at the maze, trying to navigate to an exit point. You see any way to reach those zodiacs? Tom shook his head. No way. No, me neither. And time's running out. What about the sampan? I can't see where it ended up, Sam confessed. I remember Kiri kicked it into the lake, but I can't see it now. Tom scanned the bronze islands and lakes. They were too far apart to reach. Not unless they decided to swim. Tom had the same thought that Sam had. Can we swim in Mercury? Sam nodded. Yes, but it'll be slow. Because of its density, you won't be able to sink very far. Even your hand won't be able to enter the lake deep enough to create purchase and allow friction to cause propulsion. So what happens? I don't know. Sam thought about it for a second. I guess we would become stuck, almost frozen in time and place. Quicksand? In a pool of metallic liquid? I guess, Sam said, considering the analogy. He tilted his head to the side. Maybe a better one would be on a boat without a paddle. Right. Tom turned and spotted the sampan. Hey, there's the sampan, right there, at the dead end of that mercury aqueduct. Sam said, Can we reach it? I don't know. I'm trying to find a way. Sam's eyes traced a mental map to the small pool of mercury at the eastern end of the royal grounds, like an internal harbor where the sampan was floating. It was impossible to reach. The area surrounding the sampan was currently untouched by dragon's breath, but it was at the center of a burning section, and a simple calculation of the progression suggested the entire area surrounding the boat would be destroyed shortly. It was impossible. Behind him, Tom said, We gotta go. What? Sam asked, turning to the area directly in front of the pagoda. The entire ground was sinking into the mercury as the conflagration of molecular instability roared uphill. Where the hell did that come from? I don't know, but we've got to go. Agreed. Sam's heart thumped in his chest. Where? Tom pointed to the north. A large chain attached to the copper dome directly over the emperor's coffin was connected to a bronze counterweight. If we can reach that chain, we might be able to use it to climb out. It's not much use to us, Sam countered. We'd only reach the Copper Dome. No way to climb across the rest of the Imperial Palace's skyline. Tom shrugged. It's as good as we're going to get with the time we have. Sam nodded. All right, let's make a run for it. Sam and Tom scrambled to the bottom of the prayer tower. At the base, they turned north, racing for the ancient chain system. Behind them, they were followed by the creaking, cracking, and crushing sound of metal and stone crumbling in the wake of dragon's breath. Breathing hard, they sped up in the sprint of their lives, competing against a ghost that dissolved everything in its path. Sam ran across one, two, three bridges, jumped across two small mercury aqueducts, and reached the counterweight. There was a large chain,
presumably once used to raise the miniaturized copper dome above the emperor's coffin. On one end, it held the copper dome. The other was attached to the basalt island. Behind them, there was a loud crack like thunder. Sam and Tom spun around. The ground split open, as though from a giant earthquake, before beginning its inevitable demise, sinking toward the mercury. It was like a ship taking on water from a mortal wound. Sam said, You climb first, Tom. Tom didn't need to be told twice. He gripped the massive chain links, which were large enough for his hands to reach inside, gripping the iron ringlets like they were a ladder. His feet stepped on the lower links, and he quickly began to climb. Tom was no more than a few feet off the ground before Sam followed directly behind him, clambering up the giant chain links, using them like a ladder. They were ten to fifteen feet off the ground when the spreading dragon's breath reached the bottom of the counterweight. Tom said, Look! Sam swore as he glanced down where the iron chain attached to the ground. A darkness crossed the ground like a wraith the telltale sign of Dragon Breath's deadly approach. It reached the bottom support where the iron chains were bolted into a massive bronze counterweight. Tom said, Hold on! Sam opened his mouth to respond, but no words came out. Instead, the burial chamber echoed with the sound of a giant chain link snapping free. Sam's fingers on both hands clasped the large chain links until his knuckles were white. He drew a breath and braced himself for the next thunderous movement. A split second later, the massive copper dome above the emperor's coffin began its sudden journey to the ground, and with it, Sam and Tom were pulled high into the chamber. Chapter 19 the giant copper dome fell hard. It struck the dense mercury with the force of two trains colliding, making a horrific clanging sound like some sort of oversized crashing cymbal. The mercury lifted upward, rising like the wall of a rogue wave. Oh, shit! Who gunned the Zodiac's electric engine? The propeller whirred silently, but the inflatable boat barely moved. The three-bladed propeller struggled to penetrate the high-density mercury, making it near impossible to gain any real traction required to achieve propulsion. His gaze turned to the approaching wave. It was just six feet high. But given mercury's density was thirteen times that of water, it meant that wall was going to go straight through him like a bulldozer. The tiny inflatable zodiac moved slowly, he might have well been stuck in the silvery liquid. His eyes darted between the upcoming wave and the Zodiac. There was no way he could outrun it at this pace. He thought about taking his chance jumping overboard and swimming, but intrinsically knew that would be impossible. Could he go underneath the wave? Like a swimmer diving under a wave on their way to the outer break in the ocean. No, that's impossible. Given Mercury's density, he'd never get his head under the water. Who swallowed hard? His time was up. Who turned to face the wave? Gripping the Emperor's personal sword, Dragon's Breath, who raised it? Then, with all the might he could muster using his remaining arm, he dug the ancient weapon into the Mercury behind the Zodiac. He didn't quite understand the ways of the unique material, the way the ancient alchemist once had but he knew enough about it to know that it didn't have any affinity for mercury. The iridescent blade stuck deep into the silvery liquid. The mercury wave split apart, along with the oncoming wave behind it. It was as though it was determined not to touch the ancient blade or the evil power within its possession. A moment later, like Moses parting the waters, the massive surge of mercury avoided the sword, continuing its outward journey and harmlessly spreading around the Zodiac. Chapter 20 
the iron chain links howled. Sam held on tight as it raced upward toward the ancient pulley more than sixty feet above. The copper dome fell hard, drawing them toward the pulley. The dome hit the mercury long before the chain ran its full length through the pulley. At the twenty feet mark, there was a double chain link. It was too large to fit through the pulley. Sam and Tom's ascent came to a jarring stop. They held on as they jerked and swung. They hung from the tail end of the chain, circling the top of the skyline of the Imperial Palace, swinging like a pendulum. The chain's movement slowed. Sam tilted his head to stare at Tom, who dangled above him. You alive? Yeah, you? I think so, although I'm not sure for how long. Sam's gaze moved upward as he searched for some means of climbing out of the Imperial Palace. There was no exit he could find. His eyes glanced downward, looking at the growing wave of mercury. It flowed outward, covering what land previously existed to make up the Imperial Palace's series of islands, bridges, and canals. All the land was disappearing, slowly sinking into the metal sea. The bronze sampan, previously trapped at the end of an aqueduct, was now free as the land surrounding it sank into the Sea of Mercury. A moment later, the tidal wave of mercury flowed over the rest of the islands. Sam stared at the blasted rock, steaming and awash with a swirl of mist. Hissing and splattering as it struck, mercury sprayed outward, raining down on the remains of the Imperial Palace. He watched as the mercury slowly receded, leaving in its wake the dissolved remnants of the destroyed Imperial Palace. Tom said, Did you see that? Sam tilted his head. What is it? The mercury. It's extinguished the fire from the dragon's breath. You're right. Sam grinned. That's it. There must be something to do with mercury that douses the destructive chain reaction, kind of like the way water puts out a fire. His eyes swept through the rest of the chamber. Everywhere the mercury touched had stopped disintegrating. There were just a few scatterings of the mysterious dark infernos that had survived the tidal wave and were still spreading on their outward trajectory. With the entire Imperial Palace at the center of a sea of mercury, Sam figured the thing would burn itself out eventually, but wondered just how far this sort of chain reaction might be allowed to spread out in the open. A small city? An island? Why not a continent? No wonder Dragon's Breath was considered the greatest weapon on Earth. Surely it was the deadliest threat to the globe. With that thought, Sam spotted the Zodiac slowly heading toward the basalt tunnel through which he and Tom had entered the Imperial Palace. The sight jarred Sam back to their priorities. Tom followed his gaze. Sam said, We need to catch him. For the sword? That, and he might just be one of the few people on Earth who knows what the hell Dragon's Breath is and more importantly, just what we can do about it now that the European psycho has a small bag of the stuff. Sounds good. Tom studied the open sea of mercury below them. Any ideas how? Sam glanced at the bronze sampan. It was roughly twenty feet away from the copper dome covering Chin Shi Huang's coffin. I'll have to try to swim to the boat. Is that possible? Sam shrugged. We'll soon find out. I thought you said you'd probably become stuck, trapped and unable to propel yourself because you're not heavy enough to get your hands and legs under the mercury. I did. So what are you going to do? You'll see. They climbed down the chain links. The copper dome formed a sort of island unto itself. Sam glanced at his air gauge. Thirty minutes. There wasn't a minute to waste. He aimed himself at the sampan and slid down the copper dome, keeping his body as rigid as possible, his legs just slightly raised in the classic dish formation of gymnasts and divers. He hit the dense mercury, 
sliding across the surface of the silvery liquid, much like a stone skimming a lake. There was just enough momentum to carry him all the way across until he slammed into the bronze sampan. Tom didn't wait to get picked up. Instead, he followed, slamming into the side of the sampan just as Sam clambered aboard. Seconds later, Sam and Tom began working the ULO. The sampan moved roughly the same speed as the Zodiac, which was struggling to make much headway despite its electric propeller. Tom said, We seem evenly matched with the Zodiac. He's got a head start. No way we'll reach him before he escapes the Sea of Mercury. Sam nodded. I've got a better idea. Really? Yeah, go left. Tom turned the ULO, and the sculling oar shifted the drifting sampan to the east. In front of them were the remains of the second Zodiac, its hull almost entirely deflated. Tom frowned. I don't think that's going to speed up the process for us. It doesn't have to, Sam said, his smile enigmatic. Just get me as close as you can to that boat. Okay, Tom said, continuing to steer the ULO toward the Zodiac. Another minute later, they pulled the empty sampan in alongside the deflated Zodiac. Sam moved quickly. He removed the Zodiac's electric engine and propeller. It was designed to clip onto the back of any small boat with a squeeze-operated vise. Sam attached the electric engine and propeller to the back of the bronze sampan. The Zodiac was struggling to make headway due to the light nature of the inflatable boat. This meant the propeller had difficulty sinking deep enough for its blade to dig into the mercury. On the other hand, the bronze sampan offered a heavy platform. Sam switched the electric switch. The tri-blade propeller began to turn. Tom looked at him. Now what? Sam grinned. Now we catch up with who and find out what the hell we've really gotten ourselves into. Chapter 21 Who needed to get off the Zodiac? The electric motor barely kept him moving forward. He glanced over his shoulder and spotted the heavy bronze sampan skimming along the silvery liquid. Come on, he thought. Faster! He willed the Zodiac to pick up its speed, but his inflatable boat was simply too light to allow its propeller to dig deep enough into the dense mercury. He didn't have the friction needed to project the boat forward at speed. His eyes searched far ahead for a means of escape. There weren't any. The Zodiac was approaching the entrance to a long, dark tunnel carved out of the local basalt upon which the ancient imperial palace had been built. The tunnel was roughly 600 feet long and completely sealed. Who swallowed, his mind working feverishly? There was nowhere for him to go, and no possible way he could outrun his pursuers. His thoughts changed gears, and he started to formulate another plan. He would need to fight off a couple of attackers, but he was badly injured. All he had was an ancient sword and only one arm. Sam and his partner carried submachine guns, or they had used them earlier. Who hoped they were out of ammunition, or at least getting low? Even so, you don't take a sword to a fight against two enemies with submachine guns and expect to walk away. Up ahead, he spotted the flickering of a shadow begin to form in the middle of the tunnel, whose eyes narrowed. What the hell is that? The black basalt tunnel began to sway and shimmy as though it were alive. The solid stone tunnel appeared to snake from side to side as though it were coming alive. No longer rigid, it became flexible. Who thought about slowing the Zodiac, but quickly suppressed the urge? He needed to get through that exit. Without doing so, he would be permanently trapped within the ancient imperial palace a death sentence in its own right. No, he must keep going. Behind him, he heard the bronze sampan skimming the mercury, reinforcing his need to carry on into the darkness. A moment later, the wall, twenty feet away, 
began to distort into smaller rocks. The stone surface wasn't solid, more like ground pepper, and it was moving. The grains jittered and trembled as if they were drops of oil. He watched a small pebble on the surface dissolve into coarse sand, then into a dusty powder. The void opened up like the mouth of a dragon. Stilled mercury suddenly became animated as he was drawn into the newly formed crater. The pull was too great for the Zodiac's little electric motor to overcome. The Zodiac was sucked into the void. Who got a good look at the opening? Dragon's breath had eaten away at the basalt tunnel, leaving a hollowed cave leading upward, and a cascading void that descended to an unknown depth far below. The mercury was now flowing like some sort of subterranean waterfall. Two choices, up or down. Who chose up? Always better to retain higher ground. He stood on top of the Zodiac and jumped reaching the edge of the crumbling passageway. The ground was weak, and it felt like climbing a steep sand dune, not the inside of a cave, but there was enough for his feet to create purchase as he clambered out of the tunnel. Behind him, the Zodiac went over the mercury waterfall, disappearing into the dark void far below. Chapter 22 Sam watched the Zodiac disappear. Beside him, Tom swore. Dragon's breath's dissolving the tunnel. Sam said, we need to turn around. Tom swung the Ulo around. The bow of the Sam pen turned. Sam turned the electric motor's tiller hard right, helping swing the bronze dragon head around. For a moment, Sam thought it might just work, too. But only for a moment. Then the undercurrent from the mercury gripped them in its wake. Sam cursed. He knew that sensation. Mercury or not, it felt exactly the same. How could he forget? Sam experienced something just like it while looking for the tomb of El Dorado. How does anyone forget being caught in the grips of a surging river as it hurried toward the edge of a waterfall? There was no way to overcome the powerful current. Who had clambered inside the newly formed cave, but now too much basalt had dissolved. Yes, there was no other word for it. The mercury was rapidly falling away. There was no escape. Sam Skiba whistled with the fifty-bar alarm. He had less than thirty minutes of air to go. Not that it mattered. Depending on the outcome of the next couple of minutes, they may not live long enough for it to matter. Sam and Tom jumped out, trying to get as far away as possible from the bronze sampan as the boat tipped over the mercury waterfall, disappearing into the void. Sam struggled to fight the current, but it was impossible. And a couple of seconds later, he and Tom were swept into the darkness far below. Chapter 23 Sam free fell for what seemed like eternity. The beam of his helmet flashlight flickered across the dark stone basalt as he swung his arms, trying to remain in a leg-downward falling position. His feet struck the water first. Sam's entire body shot more than a dozen feet underwater. Bubbles streamed across his face mask as he slowly surfaced. They landed into something altogether much softer than mercury, an underground stream. Somewhere in the recess of Sam's mind, he recalled that the terracotta army were first discovered by a farmer trying to bore from the top of the earth's crust into a subterranean spring. The entire region was riddled with springs, thanks to permeable rock which can contain or transmit groundwater called aquifers. Sam broached the surface. Next to him was the remnants of the Zodiac, unable to progress, not with this fast-flowing current. It was too buoyant to follow the spring, which was otherwise entirely underground, in a flooded cavern. A split second later, Tom also surfaced. Sam said, You okay? Never better. You? 
Sam began to answer him, but before the words were out of his mouth, the fast-flowing current had dragged him under again. Thankful for the skiba, which had now suddenly turned into S.C. Underwater B.A., he was still able to breathe. They were both suddenly dragged deep. They entered a downward spring known as a siphon and were carried along in its dark underground currents. Sam tried to keep himself tucked up in a ball with his feet first, taking the worst of the hits and absorbing the damage undertaken by running into multiple rocks. It felt like being in a washing machine. The river flowed through an underground chamber that looked more like blackwater rafting come scuba diving. They progressed through it at speed, almost entirely underwater the whole time, and thankful to be wearing skiba that had suddenly become scuba. Sam glanced at his air gauge. It read ten bar. Mere minutes worth of air to breathe, and no idea how much longer the spring would flow entirely underground with no room above with fresh air. They were in the race of their lives. Sam slowed his breathing as much as he could, taking long, careful breaths, but that could stave off the inevitable only so much. It lasted another six minutes in total. Then Sam drew a breath, and suddenly felt nothing but resistance in his full-faced mask. He could see Tom up again, but that didn't help him. After all, you can't buddy breathe with a full-faced mask, particularly one built into a body armor helmet. Besides, Tom would only have another few minutes of air left anyway. No, Sam was on his own. His breathing got harder and harder. Soon the muscles of his diaphragm were no longer strong enough to overcome the vacuum. Sam began to kick his legs and swim, trying to fight his way around the next bend in the river. Just one more bend, and another, until his world turned to darkness. Chapter 24 Sam opened his eyes. His full-faced mask and ballistic helmet were missing. Tom dragged him into a sitting position and patted him firmly on the back. Take a breath, buddy. Sam gasped. The air tasted cool, sweet, and deliriously wonderful. Tom exhaled a relieved breath. There you go. Sam took a few more welcome breaths and glanced at Tom. You saved my life again? Tom spread his arms. It happens. How many times? I don't know. I stopped counting after you outlived even the luckiest of cats. Sam suppressed a smile. Thank you. You're welcome. After a minute or so, Sam asked, What happened? Tom raised an eyebrow. You ran out of air. I know that. I mean, after that. I thought you must have been close to being out of air, too. Oh, right. Tom nodded. Yeah, I had a few more breaths than you. Basically, after you passed out, the river opened up into this air-filled chamber. Good timing. The very best, Tom laughed. Of course, you could have hung on another minute or so, and it would have saved you the embarrassment of passing out and needing me to save you. Indeed. Sam leaned forward, his head on a swivel, as he looked around. The water that flowed through the underground chamber had slowed, and the narrow, subterranean river had opened to a large chamber. High above, moonlight shone down upon the sandy, buried beach through a small opening. They were at the bottom of a well. Chapter 25 the wooden ladder looked like it had seen some better days. No doubt it had been built by local Xi'an farmers long ago to maintain the well. When the river occasionally silted up or the beach shifted its position, this opening made it possible to clear it and continue to retrieve water from the well. Tom went up the ladder first, 
followed by Sam. Sam clambered out of the well into the open field of a nearby Xi'an farmer. The sky had darkened, but he could see the limbs of distant trees swaying gently in the breeze. New spring leaves covered the barren branches. They glowed silver in the light of the crescent moon. Sam checked his GPS. They were nearly two miles from the emperor's burial mound, and three from where they had left the Dongfeng electric van. Inspired by urgency, Sam and Tom covered that ground quickly. They were surrounded by potential danger. It was impossible to know if who had gotten out alive and was lying in wait for them. Kiri and whoever was left from her team were almost certainly on the surface by now. They had just broken several laws regarding breaking into a national Chinese archaeological treasure and grave robbing, not to mention the criminal destruction of so much ancient history. If they were caught now, there was no doubt in Sam's mind how badly things would go. Despite the risk, they reached the van without an incident. Tom reached in behind the back wheel and grabbed the key fob. He clicked the button and opened the driver's door. Sam took a seat in the passenger seat. Tom pressed the start button. The soft glow of the car's blue consoles lighting up the dashboard was the only indication the vehicle was switched on. Sam exchanged a glance with his friend. You good? Tom asked. Sam nodded. Yeah, let's get out of here. Tom released the park brake and drove off slowly. The Dongfeng cruised along Chinling Beilu, heading southeast toward Xi'an International Airport. Tom carefully drove well within the speed limit. The name of the game was to blend in with the thousands of similarly colored vans that would soon be joining them on their early morning daily commute. Tom said, Well, that could have gone better. Sam nodded in agreement. I was going to say it was a shit fight. Yeah, that's one word for it. Tom suppressed a grin. Two pieces of dragon's breath, a sword, and some magic fucking dust have both been taken from the emperor's tomb, leaving us with nothing to show for it. Not entirely nothing, Sam said, retrieving the strange golden tome from his backpack at his feet. You think that's part of dragon's breath? I do. Sam's eyes narrowed on the iridescent dragon at the spine of the golden book. The headlights of an oncoming car touched the strange metal that defined Dragon's Breath, casting prisms of light across the dashboard. I think the Emperor Qin Shi Huang was buried with three pieces of Dragon's Breath, a sword, some magic dust, as you put it, and what I think is this one-off guide. Do you think that makes Dragon's Breath more or less of a threat? Sam considered that for a moment. Less, I'm hoping, but I don't really know. So far, besides that strange magic act within the Imperial Palace in which the dust caused everything it touched to disintegrate at an almost molecular level, we still have no real understanding of what Dragon's Breath is. Right. The first step is to find out where the other two pieces have gone. Tom shrugged. We don't even know who stole them. No, but we will soon, Sam countered. How? We know one of them was a member of the Yuxia. The other appeared to be little more than a well-financed soldier, probably a mercenary for hire. The question is, who hired her, and how did they find out about Dragon's Breath? Tom turned into the main highway. That's not a lot to go on. We have a digital recording of each of them. I'll give that to Elise and see what sort of magic of her own she can come up with. Tom said, She'll need to be a magician to find them. Sam's eye brightened. In that case, I have no doubt she'll be fine. Tom began to accelerate hard, overtaking the early morning traffic, the first look of concern creasing his weary but undeterred face. Sam leaned forward to get a better look in the side mirror and see what had spooked Tom. No one seemed to be chasing them. He asked, What is it? 
I'm not sure yet, Tom said, throwing caution to the wind and overtaking another two cars. But did you see that four-wheel drive behind us? Sam's eyes narrowed. The Baic? No, the blue LDV D90. Sam hadn't heard of that model and couldn't recognize it. The what? It looks like an elongated Toyota Prado. Oh, right, I see it, Sam frowned. What about it? I think it's following us. Really? Yeah. Sam reached back into a backpack behind his seat and retrieved another magazine for the MP5 submachine gun. He clipped it in, pocketing the second one for good measure. See if you can lose them, and let's find out. I'm working on it. Tom accelerated hard. The Dongfeng's underpowered Ricci EC35 drivetrain whirred, and the van speedometer began to creep upward. Sam glanced in the side mirror. The blue four-wheel drive kept up. It wasn't working hard. It didn't have to. The driver might just be rushing to get to work. Then again, the driver could credibly be waiting to kill them. Sam pulled out a digital tablet from a cargo pocket built into his pants. He brought up a digital map of the region. Over the course of a couple minutes, he plotted a reasonable strategy. His eyes narrowed on the new course. He turned to Tom. They still on our tail? Like glue, his friend replied, overtaking another truck. Okay, take the next exit. Tom nodded and kept driving as though he was going to fly right past it. This one, Sam called out, his tone a little anxious and forceful. I'm on it, Tom calmly replied, swerving at the last minute to make the turnoff. Once the Dongfeng was on the off-ramp, he slowed down to blend in with normal traffic. Sam rechecked the side mirror. For a second, he thought Tom's plan had worked. It hadn't. The blue four-wheel drive also took the exit, closely pursuing. Sam shrugged. Well, that clears that up. Whoever they are, they don't want to let us out of their sight. What's your next plan? Keep heading south. Sam shot him a pirate's grin. I have an idea. Tom kept heading southeast, toward Xi'an. He wasn't driving hard and fast anymore. Why bother? They already knew the blue four-wheel drive intended to keep up with them. Why expend additional energy, trying to make life more difficult? Ten minutes later, Sam said, Okay, take the next off-ramp. I see... Tom said, turning on his left indicator. The Dong Feng slowed to navigate the smaller, mountainous road. Good, Sam said. Now turn right. Like a kid taking a driver's test, Tom was frowning, concentrating hard. That small lane, Sam pointed. That's the one. I see it. Their shadow stayed on them, unperturbed by their new direction. The Dong Feng turned into the laneway. The blue four-wheel drive calmly followed. Rather than having been built wide enough to support more than one vehicle at a time, it was a single car-sized lane that ran both directions, one of those tiny roads where people accepted it was necessary to pull to the side if they came across an oncoming car. Steep, winding, and narrow, it climbed ever upward to some sort of vantage point. They might well have been making their way to a scenic lookout. Their dongfeng slowed to a crawl. At the end of the laneway, they reached a small turning bay. Great view, but they had arrived at a dead end. Tom started turning the van around, as though considering a run for it. But he stopped to gaze out the windshield, onto the steep valley and jungle that fell far below. The first streaks of gray pre-dawn mist rose from the valley. He drew a breath and exhaled slowly. You're sure this is the spot? Sam shrugged. Certain. You actually want to do this? Sam arched an eyebrow. I'm open to another idea if you've got one. Tom shrugged. Nah, we'll do it your way. 
The van became flooded with the powerful headlights of the four-wheel drive behind them. It parked in the middle of the turning bay, effectively blocking them in. Four doors swung open simultaneously. A total of five people got out. They were all armed with submachine guns. This was bad. Really bad. The adversary they met in the Emperor's mausoleum, the woman named Kiri, loudly called out, You're trapped! If you want to live, I suggest you hand over the map! Chapter 26 No response. Kiri stared at the gray electric van. All seemed quiet, and there was no discernible movement inside. She aimed the star Z-84 submachine gun at the windows, preparing to fire. Exchanging a glance with Luke, she asked, Why do people always choose the hard route? Luke shrugged. No idea, Kiri. She spoke again in a clear and authoritative voice. Hello in there. She was greeted by silence. You're surrounded by expert marksmen who have submachine guns trained on you. There's nowhere for you to go. Kiri drew a breath and continued. I want the map you stole and, she gave a menacing pause, I always get what I want. More continued silence. There was no sign of either the driver or the passengers in the front seats. All right, suit yourselves. One index finger pointed upward. She glanced at the rest of her team, her hand twirling in a circle. Her team walked around the van, knowing there was no way either of their targets had a chance to escape. The doors were shut. The inside of the long van was concealed through opaque tinting. Drawing a breath, Kiri turned to Luke. I guess they want to play it the hard way. I guess so. Luke flicked the safety to full automatic on his submachine gun. Destroy the van, Kiri ordered her team. Kill them all. In the subsequent seconds, all five team members put more than a hundred rounds into the innocent vehicle, presumably making mincemeat out of anything and anyone inside. When her team had fired every bullet they had, Kiri observed, People make such poor choices in life. I agree. Luke stared at the van's shredded twin back doors, turned toward his boss, and raised a questioning eyebrow. Shall we look inside? Please. Luke stepped forward, his hands gripping both handles. The doors were already open when Kiri saw their mistake. The entire interior of the Dongfeng van was covered in Kevlar, but they didn't know that then. Instead of seeing blood and body parts, two white and yellow dirt bikes faced outward, their riders hit the start buttons. With an unanticipated growl, the bike's two-stroke engines roared to life. Sam and Tom opened up the throttles, dropped the clutch, and exploded out the back of the van. To the team's astonishment, both bikes blew past them like balls shot from a cannon. Sam first, Tom right behind him, they weaved past their enemies, fired through the gap between the guardrail at the end of the turning bay, and dropped onto a steep trail that descended into the jungle below. Furious, Kiri swore volubly. Back in the car! Go after them! Luke leaped into the driver's seat of the 4 by 4 and hit the start button, bringing the engine to life. Ursula, get a drone in the air! Kiri urgently ordered through her mic to her tech expert. And for God's sake, don't lose them! Chapter 27 The Husqvarna TE-300i endurance bikes raced down, wound around, and at times flew through the air. Classic dirt bikes they were made for this fuel injected, oil injected, and a wash with traction control. These engines were virtually immune to stalling. 
Instant and controllable power was available as needed, and they needed it. Fortunately, the rock-infested, gnarly descent and occasional climb was no struggle for these big-bore two-strokes. A forest of dawn redwoods raced by as Sam expertly manipulated the motorcycle along the trail. The powerful engine whined as he crossed a narrow bridge suspended above a waterfall before dropping down a steep ravine, then launching off a fallen tree to clear the same creek where it crossed the track. As he rode the trail, Sam couldn't help but enjoy himself. The rough and rapid ride triggered muscle memory from his misspent youth racing motocross. Distant bursts of submachine gun fire raked the canopy of the dawn redwoods, but the rounds landed nowhere near Sam or Tom. The shots ended, and Sam knew that his attackers would already be getting in their vehicle to give chase. It didn't matter. He wasn't planning on getting caught. Everything had been pre-planned, even the bailout location. It was a location where only motorcycles could get through. The Husqvarna TE300i endurance bike raced down the track. Sam slowed the motorcycle as he came around a sharp bend in the trail, and jammed on the brakes in astonished surprise. The bike came to a grinding stop. There, in the middle of the path, sat a kindling panda, chomping on a branch of bamboo. That it was eating bamboo was no surprise. Pandas eat bamboo for 12 to 14 hours a day. The real surprise was that, as there are estimated to be only between 200 and 300 kindling pandas living in the wild, Sam was stunned to see one. Side by side, through the face masks of their helmets, he and Tom shared a look of mutual wonder. The distinctive subspecies of the giant panda was only found within the Kinling mountain ranges. It had dark brown and light brown fur, rather than black and white. The playful creature looked up at Sam and Tom, dropped the depleted stem of bamboo, and gave a sharp bleat more than a growl, there was a couple-second standoff. Then the kindling panda rolled up to all fours and simply walked away. Sam and Tom kicked their bikes back into gear, opened up the throttles, and continued their mad dash out of the forest. Reaching the bottom of the trail, Sam turned into the China National Highway GO45 East, heading toward the kindling mountains of the Shaanxi province. The Kinling Mountains formed the watershed between the Yellow River Basin, which was historically home to deciduous broadleaf forests, and the Yangtze River Basin, which has milder winters, more rainfall, and temperate evergreen forests. It was because of this the Kinling Mountains are commonly used as the line separating northern and southern China. The twin motorcycles began to climb toward Mount Li, an offset of the majestic peaks of the Kinling Mountains. In the Chinese language, Li means a black steed. Mount Li is so named because it looks very much like a black horse from the distance, with lush and green trees growing on it. They hadn't come very far, really, for Mount Li is home to the terracotta warriors that were buried with Emperor Qin Shi Huang. Mount Li is a mountain in Xi'an's Lintong district that has been privy to the unfolding of Chinese history. Once it was the summer resort of Tang emperors and the hold of the western Zhou dynasty. Sam passed by a tourist sign directing them to the Huaqin Hot Springs, Nine Dragon Lake, and the Taoist temples of ancient pavilions like the Wangzhou Ting but it was the summit of Mount Li that he was after. They tore past the low-elevation forests of the foothills that were dominated by temperate deciduous trees, including oaks, elm, walnut, and maple, along with evergreen forests of broad leaf and conifer. As they climbed around the forever winding bends into the middle and upper elevations, conifer trees were mixed with broadleaf birch and hornbeam, before giving way to subalpine fir forests and rhododendrons above 8,000 feet. 
On the side of the road was a sign for a nuclear symbol. Sam couldn't read the Chinese words that went with it, but the sight triggered a memory that China kept most of its nuclear warheads at a central storage facility within the Kinling mountain ranges. Frowning, he shook his head and hoped to hell it wasn't a bad omen. Sam spoke into his voice-activated helmet and called Elise, his resident expert computer geek, an incredibly capable problem-solver. She was expecting his call. Hot or cold? We'll be coming in hot. Got it? She knew the pre-planned pickup point for a hot extraction. Time, she asked. Sam glanced at his GPS heads-up display, showing a predicted ETA based on his pre-planned route and suspected speeds. It was just about as accurate as they were going to get, continuously updating and synchronizing with Elise on the way. We'll be at the LZ in 18 minutes and 30 seconds. Sam drew a breath, leaning his bike down hard into a corner. If we're still alive. Elise didn't even pause. See you there. Chapter 28 The Boeing BC-17 Globemaster III dominated the sky. The airlifter jet was a civilian version of the Moose used by the U.S. Air Force for heavy hauling sorties. It was 174 feet long, with a wingspan of 169 feet. It could deliver a payload of 77 tons on a dirt runway 3,500 feet in length, thanks to the brute force generated by the two Pratt and Whitney jet engines on each wing. Through the cockpit windshield, Elise could see blue skies all the way to the curved horizon beneath which rose a sea of cloud. They had left Xi'an Airport just ten minutes earlier and were still climbing. The altimeter showed 35,000 feet. Two pilots sat at their controls, working seamlessly together to set the aircraft on its direct course for Dubai. The co-pilot in control of the aircraft was an Asian man in his early 40s. The captain sitting beside him at the controls was in his early 50s. He had that sort of salt-and-pepper hair that suggested he had just the right amount of experience to be the top of his game, but was not too old to be past his best. The captain entered the coordinates for Dubai International Airport. Both men were confident and unperturbed as they set about their duties with a business-like air. Yet beneath their facade, if one really looked, the men were under more strain than either were willing to admit. These men were long-term employees of Global Shipping, a company Sam Riley's grandfather had started, his father had perfected, and Sam enjoyed reaping the rewards of his heritage. Instead of trying to get richer, he was happy to pick and choose his projects. Instead of moving into a future CEO role within the overall company, he settled into the director's position of Global's smaller arm, which specializes in the highly lucrative enterprise of maritime salvage and rescue. Sam had contacted both pilots directly for this task and paid each of them 100000 in U.S. dollars cash. They were booked to fly a legitimate flight between Xi'an and Dubai International, but there was a chance they would find themselves involved in something highly illegal and equally dangerous. If they were caught, they could face life-ending consequences. Still, this was a huge bonus for simply doing their job, flying a route they had flown a hundred times previously. Then again, it might not. Elise put her cell phone down. Both pilots glanced back at her. Elise said, It's a hot extraction. The captain nodded, his demeanor changing suddenly. He sat upright, his body tense, a small bead of sweat forming on his forehead. He pressed the radio transmitter and said, Xi'an Control Tower, this is Global 88. Go ahead, Global 88, Xi'an Control Tower replied. The captain drew a breath, steadied his nerves. We have multiple pressurization warning lights coming on. 
requesting clearance to descend to 5,000 feet until we know what's going on. Copy that, Global 88. Set a course for 270 degrees. Descend to 5,000 feet. Let us know what else you require. We will keep track of your vector. Runway 180 is available if you need to make an emergency landing. Thank you, Xi'an Control. Will do. The captain glanced over at Elise and his co-pilot. Here goes. The pilot began their descent. The captain exchanged a glance with Elise and rubbed his chin consideringly. Do you think they'll go through with this? Absolutely, Elise confirmed. I could hear the strain in Sam's voice. They're being pursued. Extraction will be scorching hot. The captain said, Sam Riley's nuts. He's never going to make it. Elise shrugged. You'd be surprised how often I've heard someone say that. He's insane. That too, Elise chuckled. I hear that all the time. But it's true, the captain countered. Oh, yeah, it is true, but that doesn't make him wrong. The captain shook his head. He must be extraordinarily lucky. Elise laughed. As lucky as they come. The Globemaster's nose dipped beneath the thick cloud cover. As the giant of the sky dropped beneath, they took in the sight of the peaks of the Kinling Mountains. Chapter 29 Kiri studied the image on the iPad. It showed current drone images of the twin white and yellow Husqvarna TE-300i motorcycles heading east along the GO-45, driving up the Kinling Mountains. Ursula, her tech expert, was sitting in the back of the four-wheel drive, tracking them. Kiri frowned. Where the hell are they heading? Ursula shook her head. I don't have a clue. Right now they're ascending the Kinling Mountain Ranges. They're not too far ahead of us, maybe half a mile. We can still catch them. Are they traveling at the speed limit? Yeah, looks like they don't want to draw attention to themselves by getting caught for speeding by the police. Luke said, Neither do we. Forget that. Kiri gave him a dismissive wave of her hand. We have no time for niceties. We'll sort out the legalities if the police try to interfere. Just catch up with them. Whatever you want, boss, Luke replied, gunning the engine. Kiri turned to Ursula. Why are they on that winding highway, making their way to the top of the Kindling Mountain Ranges? There's nothing up there. That I don't know. Can they get off the mountain some other way? The highway crosses the Kindling Range. But we have someone approaching from the east? Yeah, Ursula nodded. It will take them time to get there, but if they're trying to escape that way... The motorcycles will have to pass them. Good. Ursula made a curious expression. That's weird. Kiri felt the shadow of fear. What now? They turned onto Lee Mountain Summit Road. Kiri zoomed into her iPad, studying the image. A perplexed frown creased her lips. It's another dead end? Ursula grinned. Exactly. Could they have some other plan for getting off the mountain? I don't think so. I think we have them here. Kiri said, We thought that last time. Then they dropped off the mountain on damned motorbikes. Ursula nodded. This is different. Kiri's eyes narrowed in on the image of the summit. Why? We're approaching an altitude of 7,000 feet. The summit sits at the peak. A thousand-foot drop surrounds it. Good, Kiri exhaled with relief. We'll go in slowly. They won't get away this time. The four-wheel drive's wheel screeched as it turned right onto the summit road, beginning the steep and winding climb to the peak of Mount Lee. Three minutes later, Luke said excitedly, I see them. Good work. Kiri was already replacing the iPad, with their submachine gun. This time, don't let them fucking get away. 
Luke grinned as he looked at the empty lookout up ahead. There's no way in hell they can escape, not from here. You're certain? she asked. Luke smiled. Not unless they grow wings and learn to fly. The twin bikes stopped about a hundred feet from the end of the road. Perpendicular to the road, it looked as though the men on the two bikes were considering their next move. Could they possibly slip past the blue four-wheel drive? They revved their engines. Kiri said, Hit them! Luke planted his foot on the accelerator. Kiri watched as the shorter of the two riders tilted his head left, then right. The man stared at her. Their eyes met. It was a challenge. He had piercing ocean blue eyes. Then, with a curt nod of his head, he turned and gunned the motorcycle. The twin bikes raced side by side toward the end of the summit. They picked up speed like twin rockets, heading toward a dead end and more than a thousand-foot drop. An incredulous look swept across Luke's face. "'What the hell are they doing?' Kiri shook her head. "'I have a bad feeling that they're learning how to fly.' Three seconds later, the bigger rider, followed by the smaller one, rode up a small plank of wood that rested diagonally across the lookout's barrier. The two bikes took the makeshift jump in their stride, launching themselves into the open space. A second later, both motorcycles disappeared over the cliff. What the fuck? Kiri swore. Now I'll have to retrieve the manual from their broken bodies. Luke pulled the four-wheel drive right up to the edge of the lookout. Kiri got out and stared over the cliff. A mixture of incredulous disbelief and admiration was written across her face. The air and ground began to vibrate with the roar of four Pratt & Whitney F-117 PW-100 turbofans as the engines increased pitch to a constant whine as the giant military transport aircraft began its climb. Kiri felt a shadow of fear. What is that? A moment later, a Boeing BC-17 Globemaster III came into sight. Its massive cargo door was wide open. Inside were two men getting off their motorcycles. One of them, the shorter of the two, grinned at her and waved goodbye. A second later, the massive metal cargo door closed and shut its human cargo from Kiri's view. The giant aircraft rose into the sky. On its tail, she spotted the number GS-88. Lifting her cell phone, Kiri snapped a picture of the alphanumeric code on the aircraft's tail. Luke said, who the fuck was that? Kiri shook her head. I have no idea, but I'm sure as hell going to find out. Chapter 30 Deep Underground Neutrino Observatory, Kauai, Hawaii The Gecko Green Jeep Wrangler's powerful 6.4-liter Hemi V8 engine grunted as it turned up the steep track, its driver drawing on every single one of its 470 horses of pure power to make all four Nitto trail grappler tires surge forward. The wheels spun, and the four-wheel drive climbed a sharp incline. It seemed a near-impossible feat of defiance against physics and gravity. Dr. Ashley Calder laughed out loud. She traveled the only vehicle-accessible trail within the Napali Coast State Wilderness Park to the northwest of Kauai Island, Hawaii. Whether it was actually accessible was up for debate. Only a small handful of people ever utilized this one. Never My Love by the Association played on Spotify blaring on the speakers as the Wrangler navigated across the island's unique topography with its towering pali, or sea cliffs, punctuated by narrow valleys, streams, cascading waterfalls, volcanic craters, and verdant landscapes. The track cut through five valleys, including the Hanakoa Valley, 
with its native plants and ancient agricultural terraces. The four-wheel drive clambered onto the ridge line, and the driver picked up speed, moving dangerously fast along the precipice, with the carefree indifference of someone who'd made the identical journey hundreds of times before. At the end of the crest, the driver jammed on the brakes. The wrangler skidded to a stop some ten or so feet from the edge of the cliff next to a parked off-road motorcycle. She switched the vehicle off and jumped out of the truck. Ashley drew in a breath of cool morning air. She had a striking face, with a shade of auburn hair known as red sand. Intelligent blue eyes behind dark glasses, a heart-shaped face that accentuated her ruby-red lips that now formed an unrestrained grin, revealing a perfect set of evenly spaced white teeth. Her porcelain skin was flushed as she stepped over to the edge of the mountain peak. Ashley was five foot three inches, with the slim and athletic figure of someone who'd spent a lot of her free time surfing. She grinned as she took in the magical view of verdant jungles that lined the Napali high cliffs, along the shoreline that rose as much as 4,000 feet above the Pacific Ocean. It was a majestic landscape, once immortalized by the opening scenes of Jurassic Park, the 1993 version, not the sequels or remake. Although, if she was honest, maybe the same scenes were just so good that cinema photographers used these exact locations for those films, too. She didn't know. What she did know was that she had the best job, at the best location, and was in the process of living the very best time of her life. She took another step forward, where a small rocky footpath descended. Hiking this trail was the perfect way to start her day. Ashley walked another hundred or so feet down a rocky trail that hugged the side of the rocky cliffs, descending thirty or so feet down the face of the mountain. She stepped across a couple rocks as though ignorant of the four thousand odd foot drop. Ashley moved with the lithe grace and confidence of a ballerina. Perhaps a better description might be a mountain goat. Either way, Ashley had never had a problem with vertigo. The trail petered out. On the cliff wall stood a small metal door. It was painted the same shade of green as the entire Napali. From this close, it was obviously an entrance of some sort. But from the air, where someone might spot it on a scenic helicopter tour, the door blended perfectly into the mountain, impossible to differentiate. Ashley unfolded the equally green cover, revealing a digital keypad, and input the code. The heavy door hydraulically opened inward. The soft radiance of internal lighting glowed. She stepped inside the underground tunnel and waited until the automatic door closed, its electronic locks sealing her inside. She then turned and walked the 320-foot tunnel to its very end, the elevator doors were open, waiting for her. She stepped inside. There were only two buttons inside, up and down. She pressed the down button. The elevator descended 2.5 miles underground. Ashley liked everything about her job, even the slow, silent descent into the darkest bowels of the earth. Despite her youthful and almost playful demeanor, she was a scientific rising rock star in the world of theoretical nuclear physics. At just 38 years of age, she was the imminent and undisputed leader in the field. Officially, she was Global Director of the Watchman Project, but she went by another name, Ghost Catcher. Her job was to catch the elusive subatomic neutrinos known as ghost particles, neutrinos. To her, that was what it was all about. Some of the smallest subatomic particles in existence. Neutrinos were omnipresent in nature. On any given second, tens of billions of them pass through a single fingernail without us ever noticing. 
At the same time, as many as 100 trillion neutrinos zip through your body. Zip through being the right analogy. They do not see skin, walls, buildings, nor even the earth itself. They race through the planet undisturbed, barely interacting with the world. They were like ghosts, thanks to their near nothingness. Many were created during the Big Bang, and others are generated by nuclear reactions inside stars, planets, and by other interstellar processes, and here on Earth. Astrophysicists were interested in neutrinos for the insights they might provide into the development of the known universe. But the Watchman Project was more concerned with using the technology to watch over those created much closer to home, nuclear reactors. All nuclear reactions created released neutrinos. It was all welcome news. Officials could potentially use the ghost particle signal to tell, objectively, whether a nuclear reactor was acting as its officials claimed, or whether they were stockpiling the materials needed to produce plutonium. All reactors build up plutonium. Rather than asking if there is plutonium or not, the amount that is there compared to operator declaration is the critical issue. Neutrinos augmented the use of such safeguards. Rather than acting as a single big sensor, there was a global group of neutrino detectors that could allow physicists to correlate and better pinpoint the location of a signal. With those two innovations in place, they are able to more precisely map the sequence of a neutrino event and to more easily indicate when a neutrino event occurs versus what is background. Neutrinos are an unavoidable byproduct of nuclear fission and cannot be prevented from leaving the vicinity of the reactor, so this technique is not susceptible to preventive measures by the nation in question. With a sufficiently large neutrino detector, such as the one below Ashley's feet, she could monitor any nuclear reactor in the world, thus providing a way of ensuring compliance with non-proliferation treaties. Nuclear fission generates enormous power, but a certain percentage of the power essentially evaporates, zipping away, lost in the form of ghost particles of virtually no mass, that travel at nearly the speed of light. Radioactive atoms emit these particles. Technically, they're called electron antineutrinos, which nevertheless fall under the neutrino umbrella in a two-step process when their nuclei rend themselves apart. This quality makes them a sign of nuclear fission, and scientists who work as part of Ashley's global team could now know and reveal how far away a reactor is, what power level it's operating at, and what fuel it's burning. That information can reveal something its human operators might not, whether the reactor is being used to build up weapons-grade plutonium, or whether a country isn't burning up its stored plutonium as promised. The neutrino signature that slams straight through a reactor's walls changes with what's going on inside, providing a window into how much plutonium is in there and whether it matches what's expected. If not, it's a clue that some of it may have been diverted toward weapons programs. It's a real-time measurement that can augment the inspections and measurements that officials from the International Atomic Energy Agency currently do. Ashley loved everything about nuclear physics, but neutrinos offered a unique place in her heart. The peculiar particles oscillate between three types, electron, muon, and tau, but it was the challenge of the job that inspired her. Like a master stroke in chess, it was her job to outsmart the best of them. It was her job to capture these ghosts and match them with known neutrino signatures, but this was where it got a little tricky. Despite how common they are, neutrinos are extremely difficult to detect due to their low mass and lack of electric charge. 
Unlike other particles, neutrinos only interact via gravity and a sort of connectivity with a subatomic particle known as the weak interaction. The two types of weak interactions they rarely engage in are neutral current, which involves the exchange of a Z boson and only results in deflection, and charged current, which involves the exchange of a W boson and causes the neutrino to convert into a charged lepton, an electron, a muon, or a tauon, or one of their antiparticles, if an antineutrino. According to the laws of physics, neutrinos must have mass, but only a smidgen of rest mass, perhaps less than a millionth as much as an electron. So the gravitational force caused by neutrinos has so far proved too weak to detect, leaving the weak interaction as the main method of detection. That's where the deep underground neutrino detector came in. The elevator stopped, and Ashley stepped out into a secret lair that Ian Fleming's Dr. No could have been proud of. Beneath her feet, and some two and a half miles underground, was a massive water tank filled with 100,000 tons of ultra-pure water. More than 50,000 photomultiplier tubes lined up within a perfect dome designed to catch the light emitted when a neutrino interacts with the water. Ashley walked across the gangplank that overlooked the neutrino catcher dome, heading toward the computer labs. She'd been managing the project for roughly two years, yet seeing it every morning on her walk-in had never ceased to fill her with complete awe and wonder at its grand majesty, complexity, and simplicity. It was the largest neutrino catcher in the world. But despite its value, the concept was relatively simple. When neutrinos traveled through the ultra-pure water, they did so faster than light. In doing so, they produced bursts of light the same way a Concorde produced sonic booms. As the jet reached a speed faster than sound, it produced sound shock waves known as sonic booms, in a way a slower object doesn't. In the same way, a particle passing through water, if it's going faster than the speed of light in water, can also produce a shock wave of light. Ashley stopped at a viewing platform and gazed at the remarkable chamber lined with 50,000 golden light bulbs. These were incredibly sensitive light detectors called photomultiplier tubes, which could pick up these shock waves. Ashley headed into the computer room where she was to relieve Anne Marie, who looked after neutrino observation throughout the graveyard shift. Good morning, Ashley said. Morning, Ash, Anne Marie replied, handing her a coffee. She took it. Thanks. You're too good to me. Hey, one has to keep the boss happy, she said, spreading her arms. Ashley asked, Anything interesting I should know about overnight? Nah, just the usual. Right, Ashley said, pulling up a chair behind a desk with multiple computer monitors. She stared at the chart on the screen that displayed neutrino activity over the past half day, the main record that kept a rolling graph of the neutrinos captured by the photomultipliers over the past 24 hours. They held at a fairly steady pace. Even at a glance, she could tell with the few small spikes which reactors were increasing or decreasing their production rates. All normal. There was a slight flash radiating from the golden photomultipliers that lined the neutrino detector. Ashley cocked her head to the side, puzzled. The lights seemed to flicker. They never did that. The photomultiplier tubes were worth millions of dollars, designed to capture particles that existed everywhere, yet virtually didn't exist in any real sense. These lights weren't even capable of flickering, let alone failing. Anne-Marie said what Ashley was thinking. What the hell is happening? Ashley shook her head. I've no idea, but this has got to be some sort of mistake or malfunction. The chamber echoed with the burst of light. 
it gave Ashley the impression of flash powder igniting, the sort of sound one would hear when watching a movie depicting a family portrait being taken during 19th century photography. She turned her head and drew in a sharp breath. The entire neutrino detector glowed with the heated lights of 50,000 photomultipliers. Anne-Marie said, That has to be wrong. Definitely, Ashley replied, with a certainty she didn't quite feel. She ran a finger across the screen, tracing the graph. Her fingertips spiked up as it reached the current recording. It marked a sudden and massive burst of neutrinos at a level never recorded before at any neutrino detector ever built. Anne-Marie's face formed a worried frown. It must be an electrical fault, a glitch of some kind. Let's hope so, Ashley said, already reaching for the phone to cross-check with the other neutrino observatories in Japan and Antarctica. Anne-Marie said, What else could it be? The start of World War III... Ashley's voice was coldly pragmatic. And the end of all life on Earth. Someone picked up from the Super Kamiokandi in Japan, a neutrino detector at the bottom of a disused mine, 3,300 feet underground, surrounded by 100 kilotons of water in a domed tank with walls covered with some thousands of light sensors. She spoke quickly with the lab rat at the other end of the call, who confirmed they were also seeing the same strange anomaly. She asked him to email her their data, promising to get back to him when she knew what the hell was going on. Next, she spoke with her counterpart in Antarctica, who ran a machine called Ice Cube. The Ice Cube sits within an ice field in Antarctica with 5,000 blue light sensors to detect neutrinos from the sun, space, and Earth. He confirmed the same thing and promised to email his data right away. Ashley watched as the two emails came in a few minutes later. She opened them, collating the data from all three neutrino detectors. She shook her head as she examined the data, scrolling through the columns of neutrino spikes. This is not good, Anne-Marie said. They all recorded the spike in neutrinos. Afraid so. Should we call someone? Yeah, but let me find out what's going on first before I wake up some people at the White House. Anne-Marie stared at her, her face a mask of discomfort bursting to escape. What is it? Are you sure this can wait? Ashley arched a delicate eyebrow. You mean if we just spotted the beginning of World War Three? Someone at the White House should know. Ashley suppressed a smile. Anne-Marie. Yeah? If these numbers are correct and World War III just started, I assure you the Pentagon doesn't need our help to realize one hell of an atomic bomb has just gone off. So let's wait and see what the data says first before we start calling in the big guns, okay? Okay, Anne-Marie agreed. How are we going to find out? Ashley mapped the data from the three neutrino detectors. Neutrinos travel in a straight line from the source of their creation. Neither matter, gravity, nor magnetic fields deflect their path. Anne-Marie bristled. She was the most junior employee at the lab, but she had a Ph.D. in physics and didn't need to be lectured on such fundamentals. Ashley wasn't aware of her colleague's affront. If she had been, she wouldn't have cared. So, Ashley said, we'll use the data from various points around the globe and triangulate the primary source of the release of energy. Of course, Anne-Marie blinked in surprise. It was such a simple solution. Her face flushed. She then brought up the online news sites for CNN, BBC, and the China Post, but she didn't read any of the articles. She didn't have to. None of them started with the image of an atomic bomb, which meant the world wasn't at war. Ashley glanced up from her screen. 
So I guess World War III hasn't started. I'm glad to confirm that's a negative, Anne Marie replied. Yet the question remains, what did cause this unusual reaction? Ashley tapped at the keyboard below the monitor. I'm working on it. The three distinctive lines displayed on an image of the globe. Her eyes landed on a point where all three lines intersected, confirming the sources of the neutrino burst originated on Earth. Once triangulated, the location could clearly be seen. Anne-Marie looked at the map over Ashley's shoulder. Where is that? Ashley zoomed into the map. Xi'an, China. Really? Anne-Marie asked. What's in Xi'an that could possibly have caused this? Ashley shook her head. I don't know what triggered this reaction, but I know this location personally. I went there on vacation as a graduate student. Really? Anne-Marie asked. Why, what's there? The burial chamber of Qin Shi Huang, the first emperor of China. Of course, most people know Xi'an for the terracotta warriors who were discovered there by a local farmer in the 1970s. Interesting. So what the hell does an ancient burial tomb have to do with the largest neutrinos burst ever recorded? Ashley shook her head. I haven't the slightest clue but I sure as hell intend to find out. Chapter 31 Fanjing Shan Mountain Temple Red Clouds Golden Peak, China Hu Ching Li's arm hurt like hell. What was left of it did, at least. The ancient bronze sword made a relatively clean wound as it severed the limb somewhere between his elbow and shoulder. He had applied a mat, mechanical advantage tourniquet. It had stopped the bleeding and saved his life. Yet that didn't prevent pain radiating up from his missing fingers, hand, wrist, and forearm in a process medical fraternity called phantom limb. It sure as hell didn't feel like a phantom limb. Still, the pain didn't really bother him. He was happy to suffer. Hell, he deserved to suffer. His family had protected a secret that spanned more than 2,000 years since Emperor Qin Shi Huang was entombed in Xi'an. Hu Qing Li had been a part of an ancient brotherhood that kept the secret, protected the world from dragon's breath. Only now it was all over. He had failed. The emperor's tomb had been violated and dragon's breath had been set free. Time had eroded the once powerful Yuxia to but a handful of lonely warriors, and of that group the recent battle had left him as the last man standing, the last Yuxia charged with the need to take back what was stolen, to place himself in the way between Dragon's Breath and the human race. Who kept walking? He was breathing hard. Fenjin Shan Temple was perched atop the mountain on a breathtaking rocky spire. He was climbing the nearly thousand vertical stone steps, racing to the summit at full speed, taking them two or three at a time like some sort of sadist or inhuman athlete. Sprinting was his current form of punishment, and he deserved it. His eyes grew wet in the morning air, his lungs burned, his heart pounded, his breath reverberated in his own ears. At the highest point of the Red Cloud's Golden Peak at 7,660 feet, the Fanjin Shan Temple was actually two places of worship joined by a bridge. These were the Buddha and Mitraya temples. One was for worshipping Sake Muni, representing the present, and the other was for Maitreya, representing the future. Hu Ching Li paused, allowing himself to rest a few minutes until he regained his draining energy. Perhaps he'd lost more blood than he realized. He stared upward, viewing what he could see of his goal. The two shrines were built during the Ming Dynasty over 500 years ago. The present structures had been restored according to their original look and with iron tiles to protect from the strong mountain wind. 
There is only one hall in each temple, constructed with layers of stone pieces. There is a bridge linking the two structures above the deep gold sword gorge. People climbing up Mount Fanjing can only reach the top by hiking up nearly a thousand steps to first visit the Temple of Buddha on the south side, then walk across the bridge to visit Mitreya Temple on the north side of the spire, known as Red Cloud's Golden Summit. Located within the Wuling mountain range in Guizhou province, Fanjing Mountain spans in altitude between 1,500 feet and 7,660 feet above sea level favoring highly diverse types of vegetation and relief. The mountain itself is an island of metamorphic rock, limestone, dolomite, and gypsum, and is home to many plant and animal species that originated in the tertiary period between 65 million and 2 million years ago. The property's isolation has led to a high degree of biodiversity with endemic species, such as the Fanjing fir, and the largest and most contiguous primeval beech forest in the subtropical region. Throngs of tourists shuffled up and along the steep climb, where the only protection offered to avoid falling to one's death was an iron chain bolted into the rock face. They reminded Hu Qingli of the ocean, with its infinite row of gently undulating swell. They were all there on a pilgrimage to the ancient temples to pay their respects, find enlightenment, or simply to enjoy the incredible sights. Very few people realized that the peak contained an ancient safe house. It was a sanctuary offered to warriors, and who was searching for a very specific refuge inside? He reached the summit after a grueling hour of superhuman effort, having ascended precisely 8,888 steps, per the guidebook. Quickly crossing the bridge from the present into the future, he greeted one of the Buddhist monks. The Yuxia fraternity started 75 generations ago, when Hu's great ancestor swore to protect Dragon's Breath, who was the last of that brotherhood. But in addition to that, he was part of the Junzi, in China, the moral exemplar is captured in the ideal of the Junzi. The word originally described a gentleman and a member of the ruling upper classes. Confucius transformed it into an ideal of the nearly perfect person, morally advanced and virtuous. Such a person displays Zhen, the highest virtue, which loosely translates to a mixture of benevolence, virtue, and righteousness. Yet there is no English equivalent. Jen is on the inside, where one inherently strives to be a good person. When you treat people well and properly, you demonstrate virtue. It was beyond religious doctrine or organizational accolades. The Junzi were recognized throughout China for their very being. Who found a yellow-robed monk sitting cross-legged on his own separate from his colleagues. He introduced himself and said, I have traveled a long way, and I am seeking Shang Su O. Shang Su O meant sanctuary. Literally, it translated as a holy place. The monk turned to face him, a wry smile creasing his otherwise inanimate face. Those words had been spoken in secret at this location for nearly two thousand years, long before either temple existed. The monk looked around, studying the wave of passing tourists and pilgrims. Pushing to his feet, he said, Come with me. Who gave him a respectful bow? Thank you. The monk did not ask who he was. It meant the Junzi still counted for something. The monk brought him around to the eastern side of the temple, to a place off-limits to tourists, a holy place, a place for silent enlightenment. Yet it was more than that. Who descended three separate chambers by way of internal ladders. The last room looked like it didn't belong at all. If anything, it might have been mistaken for a small library within an old English manor. 
At the far end was a single reading light next to a chair, and an open fireplace burned with a gas flame. The library was old-fashioned, with a ladder on wheels to reach the upper shelves. The monk wished him good luck, told him to take all the time he needed. Then he left, closing the door behind him. Who glanced at the rows of books? It was an eclectic collection of paperbacks, mostly books on a wide range of religious doctrine and philosophy. He ran his eyes across some of the paperbacks. They made him laugh. Names like Lee Child, Orson Scott Card, Clive Cussler, Ken Follett, Wilbur Smith, Harlan Coben, and Christopher Cartwright jumped out at him. Someone had good taste. He ran his eyes across a section of philosophy books. They were more like what one would expect monks at an ancient temple of enlightenment to read while they let time pass them by. These were all leather-bound, and probably somewhere in excess of two or three hundred years old. He reached the one he was looking for, roughly two-thirds of the way along the row. Haxi. The word meant harmony. Shunzi, a famous philosopher who lived during the Warring States period, wrote, All things under the sun will flourish when harmony prevails. The concept of harmony has always been important to the Chinese people. With deep roots in Confucianism, Taoism, Wuxing, and yin and yang. Who withdrew the book? A moment later, there was a creak as a secret door opened at the opposite end of the room behind the faux fireplace. Smiling, who went to one knee and crawled through the gas fireplace into the secret passageway? The grill returned to its original position as soon as he was through and on the other side. The secret chamber widened into an entrance hall. There, a strange elevator glowed with a blue light. Who stood up, pressed the button, and stepped into the elevator? He pressed the down button, relieved to see that the internal steps that once existed to travel within the rocky spire had been modernized with the installation of an elevator. The elevator played soft K-pop music in the background, as it descended quickly. At the bottom, the elevator door opened, and Hu stepped out into a large chamber that looked like a billionaire's doomsday bunker. He wandered the vast space that was set with more than a dozen small apartments, a shared swimming pool, jacuzzi, exercise room, kitchen, theater, operating suite, deep freezers, and hydroponic vegetable gardens. The place served as a sanctuary for a large group of honorable people who served a greater purpose. As a Junzi and a member of the Yuxia, he was entitled to utilize the unique services of the secret sanctuary. But it wasn't built just for the Yuxia. It included members of the Xia, the Yuxia, philosophers, and enlightened ones from several religions. It wasn't restricted to China either. There were several sanctuaries positioned around the globe, all free and open to people who served a greater purpose. The ancient brotherhood, Sheng Suo, didn't begin in China. It originated in Europe, when a wealthy French knight returning from the Crusades sought sanctuary and aid for his injuries sustained during battle. He was being pursued, was almost certainly going to be killed, but instead he was taken in by a farmer. The farmer took pity on him and kept him hidden until his attackers passed, while the farmer's wife treated his wounds. The knight, rich from the spoils of war, was inspired, struck by a sudden holy certainty. He decided that God had enriched him so he could set up a covert sanctuary for people who were serving the greater good of mankind. Thus the sanctuary was created. Who was greeted by the caretaker? The position was held for a full decade and was highly desirable. A secret position within a secret society. It served no political or economic purpose. Instead, he sought altruism and protection 
for those whose purpose was to make the world a better place. The current caretaker, who knew, was a retired surgeon from Beijing, who greeted him. Hello, Doc. The physician, a bulky, balding man in his late sixties, greeted him with a familiar and warm smile. Ho Ching Li, I've been hearing some disturbing things, and wondered how long it would be until you showed up. What have you heard? That you entered Qin Shi Huang's tomb to protect Dragon's breath. It never ceased to amaze who, how well connected Sheng Su O were. What else did you hear? That you didn't reach it in time. Who drew the emperor's sword, its blade shimmering with iridescence? I reached this. The doc frowned. And the powder? Who shook his head? A European woman, a Spaniard, I think, stole the powder. And the map? Who shook his head? Sam Riley, a maritime archaeologist from the U.S., managed to retrieve the map. The doc shook his head. Well, well, you're out of luck, aren't you? No map and no dragon's breath powder. If I don't get them back, I'm afraid the entire world is out of luck. Right. The doc stared at Hu's absent limb with a frown. Then, as though recalling that Hu had come for a specific purpose, he asked, What do you need? I don't know. What can you do about my arm? What the hell did you do to it? The doc looked at Hu's arm, a curious frown on his lips. Did you cut it off with a knife? Bronze broadsword. Obviously. Hu said, Can you fix it? Me? Sure. Who gave a theatrical sigh. You're a surgeon, aren't you? Was. Now retired. I might have been able to help, but only to clean it up, give you antibiotics, so you don't die from an infection, and send you on your way. That's about all I was looking for. Why? What else could be done elsewhere? The caretaker wrote down a man's name and address. Contact this person. He's a wizard when it comes to bionic limbs. I have no vanity. I don't need something that looks like an arm. People are generally afraid of me anyway. It's like they sense some sort of intrinsic violence within me already. No thanks. He doesn't specialize in aesthetics. No? No. He's a world leader on robotic limbs. You're a fighting man. If you want to keep fighting, you're going to need two arms. Better yet, make the second one stronger, faster, and more dangerous than the original. That sounds good. Thank you. You're welcome. Who returned to the elevator door? You know my problem. The doc bowed his head. I know about the Yuxia, and I've heard about your losses. What do you think I should do? The doc grinned. There is only one man responsible for your losses. True, the doc met his eye. Then I suggest you find him. Chapter 32 Burj Al Arab, Dubai The Bell 429 Magnificent raced across the Dubai's skyline. It flew across the soaring skyscrapers along the beach where turquoise water was interrupted by glittering marinas and the artificial islands, built by reclaiming land out at sea known as the World and Palms. The sail-shaped silhouette of Burj Al Arab, once the tallest building in the world and seven-star hotel, approached. The luxury helicopter reduced speed and came in to land. The pilot switched off the engine, and the powerful rotor blades eased to a stop. Sam stepped out of the plush cabin onto the helipad that jutted precariously out from the sail-shaped hotel. He was followed by Tom and Elise. They were greeted by a representative of the hotel staff and taken to their room, a three-bedroom palatial suite overlooking the famed Palms. Strategy, planning, and execution. They needed to work out their next move. 
the Tehila was on the other side of the planet, and they could catch a commercial flight where they needed to be. Yet the question remained, where would the European coalition have taken Dragon's Breath? And what could they do to get it back? Sam handed Elise the memory chip from his helmet video recorder. She inserted it into the card reader on her laptop and pressed play. Sam brought her up to speed, intermittently scrolling ahead, skipping parts that weren't relevant. He paused roughly where he thought it showed their discovery of Dragon's Breath. It was a little early, depicting the scene where they were trying to gain entrance to the Imperial Palace. Sam rolled the scene forward. Elisa's eyes landed on the jade carvings next to the bronze gate. Her eyes narrowed. What is that? Tom answered first. A type of secret code pad. She nodded. Oh, yeah, I get it. Twelve animals of the Zodiac. I guess you needed to line up the animals of the Zodiac with the key dates of the Emperor Qin Shi Huang's reign. It makes sense. Sam suppressed a laugh. Yeah, right. Easy to see now. Elise shrugged. Why? What did you do? Sam fast-forwarded, skipping past the scene where Tom used C4 to decimate the ancient bronze gate. They played the discovery of the Emperor's coffin, floating in Mercury, and finding the three pieces of dragon's breath, powder, sword, and map. A leader of some sort of European coalition named Kiri has the powder, a member of the Oxia named Hu has the sword, and we have the map, Sam said, retrieving the gold-covered tome. Although it might take some work to extract exactly what we can do with it. Elise glanced at the tome. Deciphering ancient writing is really more your thing. What does it say? I don't know yet. Sam met her incredulous eye with a deprecating wave of his hand. It's not traditional Chinese, more of a disused and ancient script, possibly one used by alchemists. Alchemists? Elise asked, puzzled. Why? Sam said, alchemists and blacksmiths during that time were treated like gods, they were the enlightened few who seemed to understand the near-mystical wonders of what we now accept as science. Tom smiled. Blacksmiths? Yeah, Chinese mythology generally reflects a time when metallurgy had long been practiced. The Iron Age produced a large number of rites, myths, and symbols. It was the blacksmith who was the main agent of diffusion of mythology, rites, and metallurgical mysteries. Their secret knowledge and their powers made them founders of the human world and masters of the spirit world. This metallurgical model was reinterpreted again by Taoist alchemists. And these secrets are included in their own script, etched in gold, Elise said. It was a statement, not a question. It would appear so, Sam agreed. Elise said, Someone will be able to translate it? Yeah. In fact, I have an old friend of my father who might be able to help, a wordsmith and expert linguist named Forrest Olivier. Right, Elise said. So we get this tome translated and work out where the map leads? Then what? Sam said, We need to track down Kiri and who. Who? Elise fast-forwarded until the point where Hu and his then-partner, Ming, stole the dragon's breath sword and powder. This is Hu. As you can see, he took the sword and the powder from us. Oops! She shook her head. That was careless of you, she scolded. Sam smiled and quickly scrolled farther along in the video until Ming's betrayal and Kiri's success came into view. Of course, only a few minutes later, when Hu was betrayed by his partner Ming, this person, Kiri, stole the dragon's breath powder. So now we're looking for both of these people. What do we have on them? Not much. Hu was part of the Uxia who stole the original map to the Emperor's tomb from us back in Africa during the outbreak of the Medusa's curse. 
We have an image, but there's not much more to go on. That's assuming he even made it out of the Emperor's tomb alive. Elise turned to a screen cap of the head of the European coalition. And Kiri? Even less. She sounded Spanish, but if I had to guess, I'd say she has some Polynesian ancestry. Okay, I'll see what I can find on her. Sam said, there's something else. What? I need to understand this strange iridescent material a bit better. Strike that. I need to know it much better. Sam fast-forwarded to the scene where Kiri removed her mask and blew a small amount of the strange powder onto the islands of the Imperial Palace, causing a chain reaction that literally dissolved everything until it reached the Mercury Lake. Curious, Elise grinned. What a remarkable chemical. Yeah, it's remarkable, all right. Any idea what it does? No, I'm not a physicist, but if I had to guess... Guess away. Your guesses are generally a hit, so shoot. Elise shrugged. I'd say it's altering matter at a subatomic level, causing a nuclear chain reaction. Yet, instead of producing enormous amounts of heat and power, it simply dissolves the molecules until they become unstable and crumble. The question is, what stops it, and how far does it go? For sure. I'll find a list of nuclear physicists you might want to discuss the phenomenon with. There can only be a handful of people on Earth who are capable of even imagining what's causing this and how to overcome it. Okay, but I need to rest. We'll start again in the morning. Sounds good. Elisa's eyes on him were sympathetic and understanding. I'll take those photos of Hu and Kiri and see if I can find anything on either of them. Whose face is covered with a mask, but I have the image of Kiri blowing a kiss. It might be good enough to work with. I'll find you an expert physicist, too. Thanks. Sam took a warm shower, poured himself a glass of scotch. As he slouched lower and lower, just about ready to hop into bed, Elise knocked on his door. She didn't wait for him to answer. Instead, she walked straight in and sat down at the end of the bed. She grinned. I just found your physicist. That was quick. Who? A woman named Dr. Ashley Calder. She's based at a new neutrino observatory in Hawaii. Right, Sam said, still trying to work out where she was going with this. She just posted an interesting report on a secure forum of nuclear physicists regarding yesterday's events at Chin Chi Huang's tomb. Sam sat bolt upright. Any tiredness that had previously been close to consuming him dissipated in an instant. What did she write? he asked. There was a mysterious neutrino burst, apparently the largest in the history of neutrino observation recorded as originating at the same coordinates of the Emperor Qin Shi Huang's tomb. Sam downed a large gulp of scotch. What the hell's a neutrino burst? Neutrinos, from what I have read, are one of the most ubiquitous subatomic particles in the universe. They're everywhere. But because they have virtually no mass, they don't really exist, or at least don't have much influence on anything because they can't exert energy. Many scientists colloquially refer to them as ghost particles. So where do they come from? Space? The nuclear reactions within stars, to be more specific? And here on Earth, nuclear reactors. Dr. Calder is the lead scientist on the Watchman Project, an international program designed to monitor, scrutinize, and study the world's nuclear reactors. Do you have the report? Sure. She handed him her iPad, which he quickly scrolled through, not understanding much of the science. He frowned, unable to understand what relevance this could possibly have to the strange events he'd recently witnessed. Uh, interesting. Elise met his gaze. You don't have a clue what this means, do you? Not really. Sam raised his eyebrows. Want to explain it to me? I don't think I can. According to the various responses to this report, 
which has been disseminated throughout the global scientific community, they don't have much of an idea either. Right. Sam stood up, all thoughts of sleep forgotten. That settles it, then. Elise laughed. What? Sam smiled. Let's go find Dr. Ashley Calder and see if she can shed some light on Dragon's Breath. Chapter 33 Kahili Quarry Beach, Kauai, Hawaii It was a balmy late afternoon, with a lovely offshore breeze. The sun not quite on the horizon, it was well into its downward journey. Thanks to experience, Ashley knew there was at least another hour or possibly two left of decent surfing to be had. The gecko green jeep wrangler bounced around the dirt trail leading through the deeply green jungle before reaching the beach. At the wheel, Dr. Ashley Calder drove without a care in the world. The top was down, and her epoxy fiberglass Pizel shortboard rested comfortably in the passenger seat, prepared to hit the waves. Kauai was a surfing mecca a grooming ground for surfers that has produced numerous champion surfers, including the three-time world title winner Andy Irons. Offshore winds and ample amounts of wind swells and ground swells ensure that Kauai gets high surfs all through the year. Kahili Beach is at the ocean side of Kilauea Bay. During summer, Kahili Beach has the best conditions for surfing. During winter, the consistent small waves turn into longer and more powerful ones, making them less safe. Ashley reached the end of the dirt road and parked. Reaching into the back of the Wrangler for her surfboard, she headed off down the sandy pathway toward the beach. The trail followed a tidal river on her left, before finishing with a vantage point where she could see the meeting point of the river and the ocean. With her surfboard held under her arm, she stopped and stared at the ocean. Like any surfer, this was a ritual as much as a practical process. One studied the waves, the swell, the currents. The beach was empty, not a single surfer. She studied the surf. Large rolling waves culminated on the southern break. There was a strong offshore current, typical of the beach this time of the year. Dangerous for an inexperienced surfer, and impossible to swim against, but she'd surfed in more difficult seas before, and she liked a challenge. During winter, the North Shore attracts the most attention in Kauai. This is when surfers from all over the world flock to Kauai to ride the 30 to 40 foot ocean swells. It was the end of winter and the swell was unusually high for this time of the year. Thirty feet at least, probably higher. Ashley licked her lips and smiled. She was totally up for it. With her board in her arms, she ran toward the beach. Without pausing, she hit the water, launching herself onto her board and skimming across the water. The hardest part of surfing Hawaii's renowned giant waves was reaching the back of them. She paddled hard between each crest before duck-diving under them. The exercise felt good. It cleared her mind for the first time and allowed her to fully concentrate on the task at hand. For the first time since the mysterious neutrino burst had consumed her every thought. After several minutes battling the swell and breathing hard, she finally dived under the last wave, surfacing to find herself behind the breakers. Resting at the back of the waves, Ashley waited and caught her breath. She was content just to sit for a while and enjoy the peace and quiet. There was no hurry. Even better, there was nothing about the ocean she didn't love, so she just soaked it all in for a while. Dolphins played in the water. Some might have been chasing fish, but as she watched them, it became apparent they were just there to play. When the swell hit the sandbar and began to crest, the dolphins kicked their tails and rode the wave. 
Their joy was so infectious, she grinned so hard her face hurt. They looked like they were having fun. It was time to join them. She drifted toward an incoming wave. It looked perfect. Ashley paddled hard, taking off. Within seconds she was on the wave, suddenly soaring down the face of a beautiful azure wall of hissing, diamond-speckled water. She was exhilarated as her feet took up the weight of her body on her board. She flew out in front of the face of the wave as it opened up, tiny bumps on the flat water at the bottom of this run, slapping underneath her board and testing her feet's ability to hold on. To her great pleasure, she rode the crest of the wave with four or more dolphins. Ashley bent her legs and sprung with vigor back up the face of the wave, cutting in to attack the rise of the water and feeling it surge powerfully beneath her. Turning back once more, she settled into a groove just in front of the breaking white water and set her eyes on the point where the water meets the sand as far off in the distance as she could see. Ashley grinned and adjusted her balance, hunkered down and placed her right hand tenderly on the wall of water curling upward beside her. She gripped the left rail of her board with her other hand and relaxed. The wave enveloped her. The sound of curling, sucking water eddied around her on all sides as she carved between the thick walls of the wave. For a few moments that hallowed place of bliss and connection between those most accomplished of surfers and the ocean was hers. All her senses entirely ensconced, then, as quickly as it came, it was gone, and she was shot out the front and into the air. She laughed with sheer joy. Ashley was struck by the noise and dazzling light of the day. Thrilled and refreshed, she felt high as the wave crashed behind her. She pushed hard with her back foot, turning up and over the soft shoulder of the wave as it ebbed in the deeper edge of the breakwater. She landed softly down on her stomach, lowering herself to the board once again, and smiling. She shook the water from her hair and started the long paddle back out to sea. It took longer to catch the next wave, but it didn't matter. Her face remained in a wide grin. She lived for this. She'd already caught one of the best waves of the season, and it left her with a certain sense of euphoria that would keep her motivated to wait as long as it took for another one. Time passed slowly. She caught another couple waves and enjoyed the surf as the sun sunk lower. In the distance, the dolphins dove underwater and disappeared, as though something had spooked them. Not another surfer, surely. She craned her head back to see what had caused them to make such a fast exit. A foreboding knot twisted in her stomach. The weather had changed. It was sudden. The sky had grown darker, and the wind cut past her. It had begun to whistle as it moved around the trees that lined the nearby rocky shore, sounding almost ghost-like, a spectral flute, playing a single note. Clouds swirled and banded together, shifting in clumps as they passed overhead. The ocean was a sea of white tips, and the previously long, rolling waves were starting to break and churn dangerously. Ashley liked a challenge, but not to the death. Time to go. She paddled hard, trying to catch the next wave. Her board picked up speed. She began to rise with the crest of the wave, but it broke before she'd built up enough momentum. She cursed and paddled toward the next one. Behind her, she felt the pull of the offshore current tugging menacingly at her. It was stronger than she remembered, and now she found herself having to paddle hard just to stay where she was. She swallowed the fear that rose in her throat like bile, reassuring herself that she would catch the next wave and ride it all the way into the shore. She kept her eyes on the horizon, searching for the next wave, idly paddling toward the beach. She didn't have to wait long. At the back of a set of six there came a monster wave, maybe forty feet, possibly even bigger. 
Ordinarily, she would have let it pass her by and waited for something less dangerous, but as the offshore current tugged at her, she decided it was worth the risk. The pull of the building swell started to drag her toward its powerful grip. Ashley paddled with all her might. The board started to pick up speed, skipping along the face of the wave. She grinned. I got it! The feeling was amazing. Raw fear turned to exultation. The speed picked up as she rode down the crest of the wave, the short board skipping along the water like a rock across a lake. Something distracted her. The board shook to the right. She tried to regain balance. Squatting down, her knees bent, absorbing the jolting hammering of the board against the wave. She put weight on her left foot. It was an overcorrection. The board dug into the water, and she fell. She was dragged deep underwater. The line for her ankle strap went taut, and a split second later it ripped apart with a jolt. Separated from her board, she kicked hard and fought with all her strength to reach the surface. It might have taken just seconds, but it felt like agonizing minutes before her head finally broached the surface. The water churned. She struggled just to stay afloat. Her eyes frantically searched for her board, which was already floating toward the shore, far out of her reach. Ashley felt the familiar tendrils of the offshore current. Oh, shit! She paddled hard against it, but it was a feat that would have been impossible for an Olympic swimmer. After a couple minutes, panic subsided and logic returned. She could swim across the current. It might take some time, but she would eventually find a way back to the shore. At the back of her mind, she pictured the offshore current. It was traveling at roughly seven knots, much faster than any human could swim for more than a few seconds. Mentally, she tried to imagine where it would lead. There were no other points or islands nearby. Not just nearby. At all. The next stop for her lifeless body would be Japan. Panic reared its ugly head quickly. She put her head down and continued swimming toward the shore. Ashley tried for a good ten to fifteen minutes, but all she did was burn her energy faster. Eventually she turned over onto her back, floated, and tried to regather her strength and, more importantly, her wits. It would take her intelligence to beat this thing, if beating it was even possible. She thought back to who might know she'd gone surfing. The answer came back with jarring manifest. No one. Who would miss her? No one. She wasn't due back at work for three more days. By then, someone would go looking for her, find her jeep, and assume she'd drowned. A search would be undertaken, but by then she would be hundreds of miles out to sea. She glanced at the distant beach. Something caught her attention that made her heart race. It was another surfer. A well-built man with brown hair and a longboard entered the sea confidently and paddled out toward her, making a beeline to greet her. Ashley drew a breath and exhaled slowly. She'd gotten incredibly lucky. Someone must have watched her lose her board, becoming trapped outside the breaking waves. Observing that she had become caught in the powerful offshore current, the stranger decided to swim out with his board to help. He was coming to rescue her. She just hoped to hell he'd had the good foresight to call for some help. Chapter 34 it was always harder to spot something from in the water. Sam was breathing hard from exertion as he made it over the crest of the final wave between him and the relative safety of the deep blue water beyond the break. He sucked in the warm ocean breeze as it clipped the tops of the waves falling away behind him. Snapping himself up to sit on his surfboard, he scanned over his shoulder toward the outer current where he'd seen the woman in trouble. Staring intently, he raked the surf, trying to see her among the white water rollers. 
Then he spotted her. She was little more than a fleck in the distance, and she was still moving out to sea. Sam paddled hard until his triceps burned with exertion. The woman kept getting farther away, and for a little while he was worried he would lose her completely. Then he hit the current that was heading west. It was like trying to catch up with someone on an escalator. Now that they both shared the same fast-flowing current, he had a chance to finally catch up. He kept going, long, powerful strokes with his hands. It took another seven or eight minutes. A wave broke over him, and for a minute he was fighting just to stay afloat in the horrible whitewash and turbulent flow, even with the added buoyancy of a surfboard. He wiped the salt water off his eyes and found himself disoriented. They were far enough out at sea now that it was difficult to use the beach or the point as a navigational reference. Sam turned around, trying to find her again. Hello! A woman raised her arm, calling back to him. Over here! Sam locked into the origins of the voice, spotted the surfer with her head just above the water. She'd probably seen better days and would be tired long into the week, but the only physical distress she appeared to have suffered was exhaustion. He said, I'm coming to get you. Don't go anywhere. All right, she replied over the noise of the howling wind. Sam concentrated on her location and paddled straight to her. When he'd caught up with her, he said, Climb on my board. Despite her outwardly calm appearance, she was heavily fatigued and didn't need to be asked twice. She moved quickly and clambered half on to his surfboard. It was a twelve-foot longboard and offered plenty of buoyancy, enough to keep them afloat. Yet it would be next to impossible to paddle it together with any sort of momentum. Thank you, she gasped, revealing a nice set of teeth and a thousand-watt smile. You're welcome. Thanks for staying where you were. She tried to suppress a laugh realized it wasn't possible, and burst out laughing. It lasted a little while and held a hint of understandable hysteria. Still, she had a nice laugh, and Sam could happily get used to the sound of it. When she regained her emotional balance, the woman said, Where did you think I was going to go? I don't know, Sam admitted, but I do know I was getting tired. She chuckled again. Thank you. You're welcome although I kind of wish I'd brought a boat. She gazed at him, trying to gauge if he was serious. Sam met her eye. He decided he liked her face. It was a beautiful face, animate and intelligent. There was something intrinsically attractive about her, one of those striking faces and intense gaze. Her face was flushed with exertion, her auburn hair soaked with seawater and windswept, her intelligent blue eyes and soft features drew him in. Sam found himself holding her gaze for a second longer than he'd meant to. The spell was broken. She said, Tell me someone knows you're here. Afraid not, Sam admitted, looking only a little sheepish. You didn't send for help? She didn't even try to hide the disbelief and scorn in her voice. Sam's eyes drifted toward the secluded beach, quickly disappearing in the distance. What people? I was alone on the beach. You should have gone back for help, she said fiercely. Sam wasn't going to buy into the guilt thing. He wouldn't have been in this problem if she hadn't gotten stuck in the rip. I could have left you and just gone for a surf, although, to be honest, I think I would have given it a miss today. The swell's probably a little out of my comfort zone. I know, she nodded. Any sign of her earlier truculence now turned to abject apology. We're both in this because of me. I'm sorry. That's okay, he said, turning to the back of the board. Maybe we can paddle together to reach the shore. Unlikely. You got a better idea? No. Okay, let's try. They tried, but not for long. After just a few minutes, it became obvious that even with them both kicking and paddling, 
it was impossible to overcome a rip flowing at seven to eight knots. Sam gripped the board and rested. She swore. Sam said, Don't worry about it. Give me a minute to catch my breath and we'll try again. Maybe I'll try swimming in on my own. I'm a pretty strong swimmer, you know. The woman shook her head. I don't think so. This current is traveling pretty fast. Even if you were an Olympic swimmer, you would have trouble overcoming that. Face it. The feat's impossible. We're screwed. Sam gave a knowing smile. You're probably right. They floated in silence a couple minutes. The woman broke at first. Are you all right? Sure. I couldn't think of a better place to be stuck out at sea or in better company. I'm sure, Sam replied, enjoying the water and ocean breeze without a care in the world. She seemed concerned by his insouciance. Do you understand the situation we're in? Yeah. We could be here for hours, Sam said, clearly unperturbed by such a discovery. Nothing we can do about it, so we might as well just float and let the current drag us to the next island. The woman stared at him, a look of disbelief washed across her face. Where do you think we are? Kauai. Why? What's wrong with that idea? Her face hardened with resolve. She opened her mouth to speak, but then closed it again, as though she didn't quite know where to start. Then, like a parent explaining the painful facts of life, she said slowly, The next island is in Japan. Sam gave a theatrical groan. Oh, that's going to take ages. Oh, well, may as well get comfortable then. I'm serious. Sam shifted his position, sitting up on the board opposite to her. I know. She studied him carefully, trying to gauge if he was crazy or just stupid. You don't look too upset by it. Meh, Sam said, with a casual shrug. Nothing we can do about it right now. But you don't think you'll die? No. Why not? We'll get lucky. Plenty of boats between us and Japan. Someone will find us. Ashley rolled her eyes. Actually, they won't. There are virtually no boats in the area, and those that are out here are most likely cargo ships. Not a chance in the world someone on board a cargo ship would spot us. There was a bemused twinkle in his ocean blue eyes. Then we'll have to get really lucky. He started to laugh. It was long and boisterous and uncontrolled, and entirely inappropriate given their impossible situation. When he finally stopped, the woman opened her mouth to argue the point, but closed it again, suppressing her anger at his naive stupidity. It was as though she thought better of wasting her last days on earth debating with an idiot. Instead, she asked, So, what brings you out this way if you weren't planning on surfing? Sam's laugh disappeared. He turned serious, as though now there was something that warranted his genuine concern. His eyes leveled toward her, and his voice became focused. You did. Me? she asked, a puzzled frown on her lips. What do you mean? Dr. Calder, we need you to take a look at something. She gasped. You know who I am? Yes, Sam admitted. Dr. Ashley Calder, 38 years old a physics prodigy and rock star on the subject of nuclear physics, currently heading up the Watchman Project based at the Neutrino Observatory right here on the remote island of Kauai. What did I miss? Oh, and you like to surf. Sam glanced out at the open ocean. Possibly waves outside your capabilities. What? She pressed her lips together. Did you Google me or something? No. One of my employees probably did. She just passed on the information. He grinned. I worked out the surfing part, though. That's how I found you. You're serious. Afraid so. I'm sorry. You have me at a loss. Who are you? And why were you searching for me? In fact, how 
did you even know I would be here today? She shot him a direct look. Should I be worried about you? Sam lifted his hands in a placating gesture. No, no, it's okay. My name is Sam Riley, and I just need your help. It's actually really important. You have no idea. We have a problem, and we think just maybe you're one of the few people on the planet in a position to help us resolve it. My help? Yes. She looked suspicious. Why? Sam glanced at the setting sun disappearing into the horizon. Have you ever heard of Dragon's Breath? Dragon's Breath? she asked, letting the words play out on her lips without any recognition. No. Should I have? Sam lifted a hand to dismiss her line of questioning. Probably not. Until a week ago, I'd never heard of it either. Then why do you think I can help you with it? Sam sighed. Well, you see, there was this recent neutrino burst. Ashley made an audible gasp at this revelation. Her blue eyes suddenly alive, her face animated, as though he'd just validated his worth. How did you know about it? It originated at the site of the first emperor, Qin Shi Huang's burial tomb in Xi'an. Afterward, you wrote a report which was disseminated among leading experts in your narrow field of nuclear scientists and theoretical physicists. Do you know what caused it? I haven't a clue. Sam exhaled slowly, like a gambler, about to play his winning card. But I know that Dragon's Breath caused that energy spike. I can't tell you how or why. Over the next half an hour, Sam brought her up to speed about his discovery of an ancient map that led to a secret weapon known only as Dragon's Breath, about raiding the Emperor's tomb, only to have parts of the weapon stolen by some sort of European coalition, and a member of the Yuxia. He explained how the dust seemed to eat away at the ground and organic matter before being extinguished when it reached the mercury. Ashley listened with rapt attention. The sun set and dusk turned to night. She shook her head, throwing out possible causes, and then frowned. Sam said, What is it? Ashley shrugged. It's just tragic. Here I am on the edge of one of the greatest discoveries in subatomic particles in history, something I was born to excel at. But instead, we're going to die out here. Oh, that, Sam said. You still don't think we'll get lucky? No, she said emphatically. Mathematics wasn't my major, but I didn't become a nuclear physicist by not understanding statistics. I perfectly comprehend the odds of being picked up, and I'd say they're just about impossible. The same as winning the lotto, she sniffed, or being struck by lightning on a cloudless night. Sam let her talk. Darkness came, enveloping their world. He listened, not wanting to interrupt her until she had finished getting it all off her chest. She spoke of her fascination with the unseen world of nuclear physics that began as a child. How she learned that massless particles travel at near light speeds. Discussed violent astrophysical events like exploding stars and gamma rays. Sam admitted he got lost pretty early in her soliloquy of challenge fascination, her ongoing unfinished work, and the threat of loss of all that she loved. A minute later, something silvery appeared on the horizon. It was moving fast. Was it some sort of futuristic yacht? Ashley's eyes narrowed. What is that? Sam shot her a wide grin. If I had to guess... I'd say that would be our ride. Chapter 35 A rope ladder was lowered. Sam gestured Ashley toward the boarding ladder. After you. 
Thanks, she replied, climbing up two rungs at a time. Tom pulled Ashley onto the deck, then glanced down the side of the tequila. Decided you'd try and swim to Japan, Sam? Sam snorted. Something like that. Here, take my board. Tom took the board and Sam clambered up the rope. Sam introduced Elise, his computer whiz, Tom, his diving buddy and troubleshooter, Genevieve, the ship's chef and security officer, Veyron, the ship's submersible engineer, and Matthew, the ship's skipper. Afterward, there was a bark, and a golden retriever came bounding over to greet them in the grandfatherly bow he did for those he particularly liked. Sam patted the dog's mane and said, It's okay, Caliburn. I just went for a swim. Caliburn was quiet now, watching Sam incuriously, with his head resting on his front paws. Sam knelt down and stroked his head. I'm back now, he murmured and Caliburn wagged his tail without getting up. The dog tilted its head toward Ashley and barked. Sam said, My apologies. Ashley, may I introduce Caliburn? She gave Caliburn an affectionate pat. Nice dog! Matthew greeted Sam with the ghost of a smile. Enjoy your surf? Delightful, Sam replied. You took your time. Matthew spread his arms. Hey, it's a long way from Oahu to get here. I know, thanks. I do appreciate it. Although I was quite happy to prove to Dr. Calder that we could swim to Japan. Ashley slapped him on the shoulder. You knew they were tracking us. I did, Sam admitted. My watch connects to satellites, and there's a locator beacon. And what? She shook her head. You knew we weren't in any danger, and you let me say all those things I said when these people were coming to rescue us? Sam shrugged. I wasn't sure how long it would take for them to realize I hadn't come back. Eventually, when they discovered they couldn't reach me, someone would have brought up my GPS tracker and realized I was probably swimming a little farther out to sea than I had planned. Then they would come fetch me. Ashley placed her hands akimbo. And yet you didn't say anything? What? Sam asked. I didn't know how long it might take for them to get here. Ashley punched him in the chest hard. I thought I was going to die. Sorry. Sam gestured that they carry on this conversation downstairs. Let me make it up to you. How about I show you what we have on Dragon's Breath? Deal? Deal! She suppressed a further retort. He did save her from that rip, after all. Plus the curious and intellectual part of her took precedence. She was eager to learn more about this strange material that released such an unimaginable neutrino burst. Sam led her down into the heart of the Tehila. The place looked like a cross between the command center of a nuclear submarine and the cockpit of an F-18 fighter jet. Sam watched her face as she took in the Tehillah's command center. It was a mask of rapt incredulity mixed with awe. Who are you? Sam Riley. Sam offered his hand. At your service. So you told me. She took it with a firm shake. But really, who are you? Sam smiled. I don't understand. This ship looks like it's got more tech on it than one would find at the experimental edge of the U.S. Navy. You know all about a secure report I made less than 24 hours ago to a select forum of theoretical nuclear physicists. And you just saved my life, so I'll ask again. Who are you? Sam asked. Have you eaten? Ashley frowned. I'm serious. And I'm hungry. Elise has gone off somewhere to find you some dry clothes. Genevieve's preparing dinner, something to warm us up. Are you hungry? Sure. She met his eye, a twinkle of defiance in her own. 
but are you going to answer my question? Oh, I work for my dad's company, Global Shipping. Okay, that makes sense, she said, in a way that suggested it did anything but. You're the heir to a shipping empire? Sam spread his arms. I guess, although I have no interest in the business, per se. So what do you do? I manage the salvage and rescue arm of the company. Ashley ran her eyes across the Hollywood movie array of tech that lined the command center again. Looks like business is good. It can be profitable, Sam shrugged. He read the deep level of incredulity in her voice. Ordinarily, he would have dismissed it and kept going, but Ashley seemed different, like she wouldn't let him get away with it. Instead, he told her the truth. The ship was a gift. Nice gift? Who would you rescue? Sam paused, unsure how much he wanted to say. Ashley smiled. Come on, Sheik or Prince? Neither. Who? The U.S. Navy. Her eyes widened. Really? It's a long story. We helped find an experimental submarine that went missing. In the process, we lost our old salvage and rescue ship. Afterward, we were offered a new ship, built to our specifications, as a reward. She laughed, instinctively covering her mouth with her hand. So much for being altruistic. Sam spread his arms. Hey, they offered. And to be honest, I talked to my crew, and we put together a nice list of things we could use. On that note, let me show you the mission room. You're going to love it. Sure. Sam walked aft, guiding her to the mission room, where he offered a seat at the round table, a digital masterpiece capable of producing three-dimensional images, mapping, and holographic outlines. Elise offered Ashley towels and dry clothes that looked like they might fit her. Then Ashley was shown where to shower and change. Ashley returned to the round table in a much better state of mind, amused to find that the dog, Caliburn, was also sitting at the table, apparently as interested in the high-tech display as she was. Genevieve brought warm soup, fresh bread, and coffee. Both she and Sam began to eat. At her insistence to get started, Sam put up a copy of the recording of their time in the Emperor's tomb on the overhead projector. It displayed the video on a purpose-built display wall some ten feet high by ten feet wide. They watched the recording as though it were a movie. When they reached the jade keypad at the entrance, Ashley surprised him. She said, How long did it take you to work out the passcode was rat, dragon, and monkey? Sam paused. How did you know that? The Chinese zodiac is split into twelve animals. The relationship of these animals is then further split into four seasons, known as astrological trines. Okay, Sam said, unsure he was following. Go on. The first trine consists of rat, dragon, and monkey. This just happens to coincide with the season in which the young emperor, Qin Shi Huang, not only was born, but also when he ascended the throne. Really? Uh-huh. I went to Xi'an as a graduate. You studied ancient China? No, just a vacation. I read the guidebook. It was about fifteen years ago. And you still remember it? My memory isn't photographic, but I do okay when it comes to recalling strange facts. Sam grinned. Apparently. So... What does the Zodiac say about the first trine? Ashley thought about that for a minute. These three signs are said to be intense and powerful individuals capable of great good, who make great leaders, but are rather unpredictable. The three are said to be intelligent, magnanimous, charismatic, charming, authoritative, confident, eloquent, and artistic. 
but can be manipulative, jealous, selfish, aggressive, vindictive, and deceitful. Sounds like it fits what I've read about Qin Shi Huang to a T. Sam pressed play, continuing to show the recording. Caliburn gave a surprised woof, and Ashley was enamored with the section where Kiri blew a small pile of dragon's breath dust onto the Imperial Palace, causing it to disintegrate everything down to the Mercury line. They discussed and debated the possible causes of the strange phenomenon. Sam said, Care to make a guess what's happening here? Ashley said, It's impossible to say for sure just by seeing a video of it, but I have some ideas and possibilities. I'm happy to hear them. I'd rather wait until I can examine that dust. I wish I knew where it was taken. She frowned. Then all I can do is guess. Yeah. Ashley thought about that for a second. You said it was hot inside the chamber after Dragon's Breath ripped through it, but not burning. Yes, it was hot, but not like a fire. In fact, when the first explosion occurred, I expected everyone and everything to die. But instead, it just tugged at us, trying to pull us toward the strange material. It was as though it was a giant magnet, and we were made of iron. Interesting. How? Normally, for this sort of neutrino burst, we would expect a hundred or more nuclear bombs to have been dropped, every one of them just as powerful as Fat Man, the atomic bomb dropped on Nagasaki. Okay, Sam said, noncommittally. That sort of energy release means heat is created, a lot of heat, the sort of heat that destroys entire cities. Sam started to see where this was going. And yet there was very little destroyed. Right. So what does it all mean? If I had to guess? Sam rolled his eyes. Yes! Ashley grinned. I think it creates an exponential subatomic implosion. Chapter 36 Sam stared at the good physicist, waiting for her to add some sort of explanation. When she didn't, he asked, Care to tell me what that means? It's just a theory, she said, taking a sip of hot, dark coffee. But if you look at an atom, there are three basic particles, protons, electrons, and neutrons. Her eyebrow quirked as she studied him to see how much he learned from his high school science days. Sam nodded, as though that much he still remembered. She kept going. The nucleus at the center of the atom contains the protons, positively charged, and the neutrons, no charge. The outermost regions of the atom are called electron shells and contain the electrons, which are negatively charged. Right. Ashley met his eye. Do you remember in high school when they showed you a model of an atom and it looked like the entire thing was empty? Sam nodded. Yeah, I heard somewhere that as a general rule of thumb, nuclei are about 100,000 times smaller than the atoms that they are housed in, making them practically empty space. When you start to consider that atoms are about 99% empty space, and they make up 100% of the universe, you begin to see that we're made up of nothingness. Ashley suppressed a smile. Cute! but wrong. It is. Sam looked surprised. Her face became understanding, yet grave, like an adult about to tell a child Santa Claus is made up. It's actually a misnomer. Really? Yes. Atoms are not mostly empty space because there is no such thing as purely empty space. Rather, space is filled with a wide variety of particles and fields, Sucking all the particles and fields out of a certain volume won't make the space completely empty because new particles will still flash into existence due to vacuum energy. Oh, yeah? Exactly. Additionally, the Higgs field can't be removed. Even if we ignore every kind of field and particle, except electrons, protons, and neutrons, 
we find that atoms are still not empty. Atoms are filled with electrons. It's true that a large percentage of the atom's mass is concentrated in its tiny nucleus, but that does not imply that the rest of the atom is empty. Rather, it implies that the rest of the atom has relatively low density. Okay, Ashley said. Can you bring up a picture of the Bohr model? Sure. A 3D model consisting of a small, dense nucleus surrounded by orbiting electrons appeared in the air before them. It was quite similar to the structure of the solar system. Nice, Ashley grinned. The Rutherford Bohr model was envisioned by Niels Bohr and Ernest Rutherford in 1913. In this view, the atom consists of electron balls whizzing around the atomic nucleus, and the space between the electrons and the nucleus is empty space. That concept is a misconception. So, not empty space. All particles are partially particle-like and partially wave-like, depending on the situation. When bound in atoms in an undisturbed state, electrons act like waves. These waves are three-dimensional probability density waves that spread out to fill the entire atom. The electrons do not spread out uniformly, but rather follow specific distribution patterns called orbitals. Okay, the shape of the orbitals underpins all chemical reactions. As an example of some orbitals, the single electron density distribution is shown on the right for hydrogen in the first few lowest states. The lighter points indicate regions where the electron has a higher density. Note that each image represents a single electron. The different light spots and bands in a single image are all part of a single electron's wave state. Because bound electrons spread out into fuzzy density waves, there is no definite edge to an atom. The electron spreads out to fill all space. Although far away from the atom, it is thin enough to be negligible. Interestingly, electrons in the atom even spread out so as to overlap with the nucleus itself. This electron-nucleus overlap makes possible the effect of electron capture, where a proton in the nucleus can react with an electron and turn it into a neutron. If atoms were mostly empty space, we could remove this space and shrink atoms. In reality, atoms do not contain any empty space. Rather, they are filled completely with spread-out electrons, making the shrinking of atoms impossible. Sam said, I'm going to take you at your word on the physics of it, but what is your hypothesis about what Dragon's Breath was doing? I'll get to that. She lifted a hand, gesturing for him to wait until she gets there. What do you know about the Higgs field? Nothing. He typed something, and shortly another 3D model came up. Unfortunately, this model was a confusion of shooting particles. Ashley gave a wry, understanding grin. Then she drew a breath, like a professor about to start a long speech. The Higgs field is an area of energy that is thought to exist in every region of the universe. The field is accompanied by a fundamental particle known as the Higgs boson, which is used by the field to continuously interact with other particles, such as the electron. Everything inside an atom isn't separate, but in constant connection? Exactly. Think of a Higgs field like a type of glue that holds an atom together. Okay. Now, particles that interact with the field are given mass, and in a similar fashion to an object passing through a treacle, will become slower as they pass through it. The result of a particle gaining mass from the field is the prevention of its ability to travel at the speed of light. So, wait. A Higgs field adds weight to subatomic particles. No, mass itself is not generated by the Higgs field. The act of creating matter or energy from nothing would violate the laws of conservation. Sam rolled his eyes. Obviously. 
Mass is, however, gained by particles via their Higgs field interactions with the Higgs boson. Higgs bosons contain the relative mass in the form of energy, and once the field has endowed a formerly massless particle, the particle in question will slow down as it has now become heavy. Ashley's face looked alive and animated, as though she were enjoying herself. Sam let her keep going, even though he was only understanding part of what she had to say. She said, Giving mass to an object is referred to as the Higgs effect. This effect will transfer mass or energy to any particle that passes through it. Light that passes through it gains energy, not mass, because its waveform doesn't have mass, while its particle form constantly travels at light speed. And you think Dragon's Breath is somehow turning this Higgs field off? Uh-huh, yes I do. Ashley's eyes widened, as though she could physically picture the subatomic interactions. If the Higgs field did not exist, particles would not have the mass required to attract one another. They would float around freely at light speed. If I had to guess, I'd say it turns off the Higgs field. But you just said it can't be turned off. She shrugged. As far as I and the rest of the scientific community understood, it couldn't. Okay. Sam frowned in concentration. Let's just say for a minute that Dragon's Breath does somehow switch off this Higgs field. What then? She cocked an eyebrow. What would it do to the atom? Yeah, hypothetically. It would fall apart. All the subatomic particles that make up an atom would shoot off in every direction at the speed of light. Ashley thought about that for a second. The atom would crumble. She nodded. Get a few trillion of these together and everything would start to crumble before completely disintegrating. Sam could tell she was relishing the scientific challenge, like a master might enjoy an incredible chess opponent. Really, he said. She nodded. The outer tips of her lips curled upward in an unrestrained smile. In fact, this is it. If Dragon's breath switches off the Higgs field, it would explain everything that you showed me in that video, right down to the fact the place broke apart instead of exploding like a nuclear bomb. That's great, Sam said. You've worked it out. Yes, she made a wistful smile. There is just one problem. What's that? turning off the Higgs field is impossible. Sam grinned. Well then, congratulations on finding a way to achieve the impossible. Chapter 37 Sam tossed these ideas around in his head. After a few moments, he asked, If it's an exponential chain reaction, how far could this thing go? I don't know. I suppose, given the right circumstance, it could go all the way. Sam didn't like the sound of that. All the way? It depends how much dragon's breath is available to begin the reaction. Why? Sam asked. I mean, if it's an exponential response, what difference does it matter if it's a small handful of dust or a truckload of the material? Think of it like starting a fire. Come again. A conflagration will keep burning once it starts, so long as there is enough fuel, heat, and oxygen to keep it going. So, you ever tried to start a fire on a cold night? Sure, why? Sometimes it takes a few goes to take hold. So, what you're saying is dragon's breath is similar? That's right. A small amount might only take off the surface, yet a large amount may go all the way until it runs into mercury. That seems to stop the chain reaction. I think you'll find water will have the same effect. Great. So what? This thing left to run wild would destroy 
What, all of an island? Yes. How big of an island? As big as they come. Oh, shit. You're telling me an entire continent could dissolve down to the ocean? Caliburn whined, and Sam stroked a hand comfortingly through the fur on his neck. Yes, Ashley replied with absolute certainty. In the wrong hands, someone could definitely target America. Where? No, the entire North American continent. That horrific thought sent shivers down Sam's spine. He cuddled Caliburn this time to comfort himself. But I picked up Dragon's Breath. Why am I still here? You mean, why didn't your subatomic particles implode? Sam nodded. Yeah, that's what I said. Licking her lips, she smiled. Perhaps you're just too dense. Funny, but I'm serious. We handled it multiple times. Why didn't the chain reaction get triggered? Ashley thought about that for a moment. There must be something to do with grounding the electronic fields. She pursed her lips. You know, the same way electricity is grounded to the earth? Okay, so why am I still here? What gloves were you wearing? Come again, Sam asked, confused. Your gloves. I assume you were wearing gloves. Yeah, sure. They were Kevlar, but I don't see how that would help. I mean, Dragon's Breath forms a chain reaction, shrinking electrons or whatnot. Ah, Kevlar, that makes sense. Why? Kevlar is inherently resistant and will not melt, ignite, or conduct electricity. It forms a natural Faraday cage. A Faraday cage? A Faraday cage operates because an external electric field causes the electric charges within the cage's conducting material to be distributed so that they cancel the field's effect within the cage's interior. They are also used to protect people and equipment against actual electric currents, such as lightning strikes and electrostatic discharges, since the enclosing cage conducts current around the outside of the enclosed space, and none passes through the interior. She looked at him directly. Kevlar gloves must form a similar natural barrier. Okay, good to know. Don't touch Dragon's Breath without Kevlar gloves. Not unless you really want to lose some weight. She shot him a wry smile. And by weight, I mean all of it. What about the book? Sam asked, opening a drawer and retrieving the dragon's breath tome, placing it carefully on the table. It doesn't seem to have any protection. Ashley examined the book and shook her head. That's not true. No. No. She picked up the golden volume and pointed to the iridescent dragon on its side. At first I thought this was dragon's breath along the side, but if you look closely, it seems to be covered in a sheet of clear stone. And that makes a difference? Yeah. Very few gemstones interact with electricity and electromagnetic waves, meaning this too has been protected by its own Faraday cage. Gems don't conduct electricity? Some do, but not many. For example, quartz and tourmaline are piezoelectric, meaning that physical pressure will cause them to create an electrical charge, and inputting them with an electrical charge will cause a deformation of the crystal structure. Likewise, rubies, emeralds, and sapphires are used in certain types of high-powered lasers. But for the most part, minerals and gems are poor conductors of electricity. Good natural conductors include native metals and minerals with a metallic luster. Natural blue diamond is a semiconductor. Some stones, such as tourmaline, become electrically charged when heated and are said to be pyroelectric. Fascinating, Sam said. Then, returning to the tome, he asked, It safe to hold? Ashley nodded. Yeah, just don't drop it or you might inadvertently wipe out a continent. Sam stood up, ready to leave. Ashley tilted her head and looked at him. Where are you going? I have to work something out so that I can stop this attack. 
Where are you going? asked Ashley. Sam pointed at the strange golden tome with the image of an iridescent dragon along its spine. That depends, she frowned. On what? He met her eye. Whether or not you can read ancient Chinese script. Afraid not. Sam nodded as though he'd expected the answer. Then in that case, I'm off to Louisiana for a day. Louisiana? she asked. What the hell do you hope to find in Louisiana? I have an old friend of my father's. He's a wordsmith and an expert linguist, one of those erudite and exceptionally smart people, so smart that in his spare time he traveled to China and learned some of its oldest languages. You think he'll have an answer for you? Maybe. Sam spread his arms. Maybe not. But if anyone's going to know what this means, it will be him. Chapter 38 Beijing, China Earlier, the doctor had placed a series of electrodes on the skin of Hu Ching Li's upper arm, shoulder, and chest. These recorded the normal nerve responses of his missing limb, despite it not even being there. Hu had been given training on the pattern recognition system that made up a key part of the prosthetic limb technology. These algorithms were used to identify individual muscles, how they are contracting, communicating, and working with each other, as well as their amplitude and frequency. Who had been hooked up to a virtual reality lab so that he and his arm's inner mechanism could learn to control his prosthesis. His prosthetic system would work on implanted myoelectric sensor, IMES technology, where electric devices were directly inserted into his body. IMES was relatively easy, requiring only a 15-minute operation, with each sensor placed into tissues via incisions just one inch long. These sensors wouldn't need to be replaced unless they became damaged. Once successful, who wouldn't need to think about his movements as his unconscious reflexes would be automatically converted into myoelectric impulses, if it was successful. At the surgeon's signal, Hu Ching Li closed the fingers of his new robotic hand, re-innervated the chest muscles and nerves translated into actual movements of the arm. Hu grinned. This was the first time he'd used his hand, and it felt good. It worked well, a little too well at first, which made sense. After all, it was robotic, powered by a combination of hydraulic and pneumatic joints. In fact, much of his session today was about getting his mind and body, particularly his autonomic nervous system, to synchronize with the electronic system that controlled his new arm. He drew a breath, supremely satisfied with the results. Faster, stronger, more capable. Prosthetic limbs had come a long way, from Captain Hook attachments to the bumbling Inspector Gadget. Now prosthetic limb technology was closer to the indestructible Terminator, whose new arm was so realistic. It incorporated accurate skin color, veins, fingerprints, fingernails, and even small hairs. At the very forefront of the latest advanced technology, his bionic limb was wirelessly mind-controlled and fully integrated. To his utter joy, it replicated normal movement and functionality, instantly triggering the desired movement. After passing several tests, who thanked the surgeon and left, walking several blocks to his apartment. The technology was expensive, but so worth it. Who had come from money? A large trust had been established centuries ago to promote the Yuxia who protected the secret of Dragon's Breath. He had a degree in philosophy from Peking University and a master's degree in history from Harvard. Yet his true expertise had always been fighting. Standing at just five feet exactly, with a small, muscular, and lithe frame, 
he appeared to make an easy target, something that couldn't be farther from the truth. Who was a born fighter? All of the Yuxia had devoted their lives to protecting Dragon's Breath, needed to know everything there was to know about combat. It was a matter of necessity. But in whose case, he actually needed to fight. It was in his very DNA. He could argue the whole good versus evil Yuxia mantra of righting wrongs. In many ways, that was all true. Some warriors saw violence as a necessary means to an end. Sometimes it was. But sometimes, if he was honest with himself, who recognized that he had a taste for violence? Arriving at his penthouse, he took the elevator up to his training room. There were free weights, a boxing heavy bag, a speed bag, a grappling dummy, wooden practice swords, known as bakans in kenjutsu, the broad Japanese term for swordsmanship, a Wing Chun dummy with hardwood arms and legs. Who trained every day? He worked with some of the best fighting instructors in the world. From his very earliest memories, his father instructed him in the traditional practices of Kung Fu, the ancient Chinese martial arts of Wu Shu and Quan Fa. In China, it refers to any study, learning, or practice that requires patience, energy, and time to complete. In its original meaning, Kung Fu can refer to any discipline or skill achieved through hard work and practice, not necessarily martial arts. For example, the discipline of tea-making is called the Kung Fu tea ceremony. But as time progressed and his studies into the martial arts developed, he realized that Kung Fu on its own would never be enough. He broadened his studies and fighting techniques, most people know, and several that few people have ever heard of, taking components of various practices from around the world until he was one of the most proficient, living, breathing, killing machines alive. As the years went by, he worked his way through karate, taekwondo, kung fu, krav maga, jiu-jitsu. He spent time in Siem Reap, studying Khmer fighting technique of bakatur, which roughly translated to mean pounding a lion. He spent a summer in South Korea with a reclusive Subakto master. He studied strikes, takedowns, submissions, joint locks, pressure points, one-on-one -on -one combat, group attacks, and weaponry of all kinds. He spent time in the Philippines learning the finer details of Kali Eskrima, which emphasized weapon-based fighting with sticks, knives, bladed weapons, and various improvised weapons, as well as open-hand techniques without weapons. He was an expert marksman with a handgun and an adequate shot with a rifle. Alone in his own private gym, he stripped down to a pair of shorts. His body was slim and nimble, small but densely muscular, with disproportionate amounts of power behind those muscles. He began with a series of traditional katas, moving quickly and warming up his ligaments, muscles, and joints. The bionic arm already felt like a part of him. Between sets, he worked some two-minute rounds on the punching bag, the best cardio trainer in the world. His skin developed a coating of sweat. Who felt the rush and pushed himself harder, making moves more and more aggressively. Just below the surface, he felt filled with dormant energy, ready to burst out in atomic bomb proportions. He would never condoned violence for others, but he excused it when it came to himself. He didn't just fight as a last resort. He fought whenever he got the chance. Avoiding conflict was a struggle. In truth, he actively tried to seek it out. Deep down, he knew the truth, even if it made him ashamed. I like violence. A lot. If he was honest with himself, he fought and always had because he loved it. He worked with the Wing Chun dummy. Moving quickly, he was amazed by how seamlessly his new arm had integrated with his nervous system. It felt real. There was an old Chinese proverb, 
If you train your entire life as a martial artist, the gods will reward you with magical powers beyond normal humans, who never quite believed it, yet it seemed it was a self-fulfilling prophecy. In this moment, he fought like a god. Afterward, he hit the gym. Bench press, power lift, squat. When he was younger, he'd have specialized lifting days, such as arms, legs, chest. Now he only pumped iron three to four days a week, and generally hit most of the major muscle groups. He continued working out until his body was limp and exhausted. Then he hit the spa, sauna, and ice pools. Who liked to finish by putting his body through a series of controlled stresses? It was said to activate dormant hormones, boost one's immune system, and most importantly, it simply made him feel good. When he was finished, he showered, dried himself, and got dressed. Confident that his new arm would work as needed, he sat down at his desk and opened his laptop. He brought up an encrypted website for private trackers, investigators, and assassins, the kind of place where, for the right price, one could have anyone found, tortured, or murdered anywhere in the world. Who didn't necessarily agree with the system, but he'd used the Black Hat Company before, and he appreciated their efficiency. He brought up the drop-down box and wrote the name of the man he was looking for, Sam Riley. Chapter 39 Gonzales, Louisiana. The private jet, a Gulfstream G650, landed at Lafayette Regional Airport. Sam climbed out. On the tarmac, a private rental car was waiting for him. With its unmatched craftsmanship and design, the green Bentley stood out. Sam approved. It wasn't exactly stealthy, but it was a very comfortable car to drive. And unsurprisingly, the private jet facilities at the airport didn't rent out anything less extravagant. He was rich, and he liked fine vehicles. Some things he had stopped trying to fight. Sam climbed into the car and headed off down the road. He eased his foot on the accelerator, and the W-12 engine of the Continental GT smoothly came to life. With 6.0 liters in displacement and two turbochargers, the engine produced 650 horsepower, enough that Sam felt like a jockey working hard to restrain a horse from bolting. He headed out through Bro Bridge, driving over the steel and concrete overpass that spanned Bayou Tesh. It had long since replaced the rope suspension bridge once built by Furman Bro, from which the town once gained its name. From there he took I-10 east. Sam planted his foot on the accelerator, enjoying the sheer power of the Bentley, letting it reach 10 mph above the highway's speed limit. He crossed the Mississippi at Baton Rouge and headed south into Gonzales. Sam pulled up in front of a large two-story historical building with giant columns and a wraparound veranda. The building reminded him of a miniaturized White House. Parking the car, he walked the paved pathway and knocked on the door. A man in his mid-fifties came out. He had gray hair, a little darker around the ears, with a round, intelligent face. He wore thin-rimmed glasses and a warm grin. Smiling, he greeted Sam with a firm handshake. Sam Riley, a pleasure to meet you again. Forrest Olivier, Sam said. Thanks for seeing me. You're looking well. What has it been? Nearly ten years, Forrest examined Sam with a cursory glance. You've aged. Time will do that. Forrest studied him, placing a hand on his arm. Yeah, but you look a little more beat up than I remember. Sam shrugged. I'm afraid occasional wear and tear comes with a job. It looks like it. Forrest opened the door. Come on through. Can I offer you a drink? Yes, please. Without asking what he felt like drinking, Forrest opened the fridge 
and pulled out two local beers. He pried their lids with an opener and handed a bottle over. Sam glanced at it. The brand was Southern Craft, a local brewery from nearby Baton Rouge. He touched the neck of the bottle with the one in Forrest's hand and said, Cheers. Forrest nodded. Cheers. Sam took a small drink. Hey, this is quite good. Forrest gave him that sort of, I know, right, kind of look. Now tell me, Sam, you didn't come all the way out here to have a beer with me and talk about old times for the first time in a decade, did you? No, I need your help to translate an ancient text. Forrest gave a one-shoulder shrug. You could have emailed me a copy of the script. I could have, Sam admitted. Maybe, but this is different. I've got something truly unique. It's really like nothing I've ever seen before. Forrest took a mouthful of beer. All right. When Sam Riley tells you it's like nothing he's ever seen before, I'm bound to be interested. What have you got? An old tome found in China. The script appears to be ancient Chinese, but it's nothing I can recognize or even find a match to. I lived in China for two years studying various written languages and ancient scripts. Sam nodded. I remember my father telling me about your escapades. Apparently, you got bored cracking ancient European scripts and felt like you needed a real challenge. Yes, anything from the Orient is so unlike what one finds in Europe. I had to sort of reinvent the wheel from a linguistic point of view. He shot Sam a wide grin. It was a lot of fun. You translate ancient languages for fun? Sam snorted. Each to their own, I suppose. Linguists and wordsmiths have their own joys. Forrest looked over at Sam. So, what do you have for me? Sam removed his backpack and withdrew a small package sealed in soft felt. He carefully unwrapped it, revealing the golden tome. Forrest audibly drew in a sharp breath. Where did you find that? Inside Emperor Qin Shi Huang's tomb. You broke into the mausoleum of the Terracotta Army? Sam shrugged with a shameless smile. Yeah. Do you have any idea how much trouble you would be in if the Chinese government found out? Do you have any idea how much trouble the world would be in if I hadn't? Sam countered. That bad, hey? Worse, Sam said. If it makes you feel better, I wasn't the only person to enter the Emperor's tomb. Really? Forrest was surprised. I'd heard the entire place is filled with mercury to keep grave robbers out. It is, but two other teams entered it at the same time as we did. That's why we had to move quickly. The race was on to find and protect the hidden treasures within. Who else penetrated the mausoleum? A team of Chinese warriors known as the Yuxia. The Chinese equivalent of the Knights Errant? That doesn't sound so bad. You didn't meet them. Oh, I see. Sam shook his head. Seriously, tough adversaries. Apparently, they have been keeping guard of a strange element known as Dragon's Breath for 2,200 years. And the other team? Also quite dangerous, but I don't know. From their accents, I believe there are some sort of European coalition. One sounded Spanish, another French, and another German. So what happened? As you can imagine, there was a fight. Most of the Uxia were killed. The European coalition escaped with a large supply of dragon's breath. One of the Yuxia got a sword coated with dragon's breath, and I got this utterly unique artifact. Forrest's attention returned to the golden tome. Any idea what it is? None whatsoever. Well, unless it's some sort of map. Forrest finished his beer and replaced his glasses with a powerful magnifying loop. It was the sort of thing a jeweler or gemologist might use to inspect their craft. He slowly, carefully, and meticulously examined the gold-plated tome. 
Almost as a distraction, Forrest began to talk about his experience in China. You have to understand that for centuries, China was a much older, more advanced civilization than the West. Sam had heard this argument before, but he was happy to let Forrest enlighten him further. Go on. Forrest placed a hand on Sam's shoulder. Let me show you something. Sam looked up. Sure. What have you got? Forrest switched on his computer and opened a series of documents before finding the one he was after, labeled Shanghai Museum. He clicked on the document. A visit to the Shanghai Museum, the country's preeminent collection of ancient art, really brings home just how old this civilization is. The new page brought up an image of a bronze container. Mystified, Sam studied the image. Although he could appreciate the vessel for antiquity, its metallurgical creation and historical uses, he failed to see the reference that Forrest was implying. He shook his head. Beautiful. What is it? It's a wine vessel called a Queen Lillet from the Zhou period. That's the 11th century BCE, by the way. The Zhou dynasty ruled a large area of what is modern China, a culture so developed that written Chinese was already close to its modern form. Northern Europe, in contrast, didn't even have wine. They were too busy sacrificing animals to spirits and refusing to wash in its pre-literate tribal Iron Age. Wow, impressive, he grinned. But look at us now, right? Laughing, Forrest turned to Sam. You haven't a clue what I'm getting at, do you? Sam suppressed a grin. Honestly, would you be insulted if I said no? It's okay, Forrest laughed. I'm trying to illustrate the difference in sociological perspectives. The West is predominantly influenced by Christian eschatology. The imagination of Western countries is framed by ideas of progress toward a final goal. That is to say, the West honors progress, innovation, and novelty. But the East doesn't. The East puts the Golden Age at the beginning, the West at the end. Forrest drew a breath. This is in part why, to the Western mind, the philosophical traditions of China and India often seem primitive and stuck in their pasts. Yet it would be a mistake to dismiss them on these grounds. As we have already seen, tradition does not prevent innovation and can even enable it. Sam smiled. Interesting. A moment later, Forrest pointed to the script. Herein lies the map to the Forbidden Mine, the secret location from which Dragon's Breath is taken from deep within the earth. Sam stared at the tome. It seemed solid, gold-plated, definitely much too light to be completely made of gold, but even so, the book itself seemed to be pure gold. It looked solid. Any idea how to get inside? Forrest shook his head. Afraid not. But is it a map to some sort of secret mine where Dragon's Breath was extracted? Appears so to an ancient mine, where dragon's breath developed naturally? Forrest frowned. That's how I interpret it. Sam bit his lip, studying the tome for what felt like the hundredth time. There were no contours or images suggesting anything that delineated any landmarks or directions. Great. So, if this is the map... Where is the mine from which they sourced Dragon's Breath? Beats me, Forrest laughed. I just translate the stuff and make sense out of words. I'm afraid cryptology and secret maps is more your area of expertise, Sam. Sam nodded. Thanks for your help, Forrest said. I'm going to open another beer. Do you want to join us for dinner? I'd love to, Sam began. Forrest saw the look in his face and sighed. But you have to find this mine. Sam nodded. It's really important. I understand. 
Good luck, and let me know if I can do anything else to help. Thanks again. Heading up to the Bentley, Sam pressed the start button and drove off. Chapter 40 Forbidden City, China Formerly the Imperial Garden in the Imperial City, Beijing, and adjacent to the Forbidden City, is a place called Zhongnan Hai. The 1,500-acre compound now serves as the central headquarters for the Communist Party and the State Council of China, whose driver brought him in through the south entrance, called the Gate of New China. The view of the interior was blocked by a giant screen with the slogan, Serve the People. It was written in the distinctive calligraphy of Mao Zedong, a stylish, cursive hand that was easily recognized by more than a billion people. The public had been admitted to the Zhongnanhai for a brief period during the Cultural Revolution, but now security was massive. The firepower at the gate of New China might have withstood an invasion. Helmeted troops with bullpup rifles stared menacingly while guards examined the underside of the car with mirrors. Whose ID was carefully scrutinized, and his appointment double-checked. When his bona fides had at last been established, tire-shredding obstacles sank back into the tarmac so that the car could go forward. Two lakes took up more than half of the area of Zhongnanhai. The water bleakly reflected the gray sky, it would freeze in the winter. The government car circled the southernmost lake clockwise to the northwest corner, where most of the land was. The government buildings were traditional Chinese palaces and summer houses with swooping pagoda roofs suitable to the pleasure garden this had once been. These were the official home of the members of the Politburo Standing Committee, including the President, yet they were not obliged to live there. The driver parked outside Xinjiang Hall on the far side of the first lake. This was a new building on the site and was the office of the president, who noted there were no helmeted infantry, but several heavily muscled young men in suits that bulged with ill-conceived weapons. In China, the moral exemplar is captured in the ideal of the Junzi, the word originally described a gentleman, a member of the ruling upper classes, who was both Junzi and a nobleman with a bloodline from powerful alchemists spanning 75 generations, right back to when his ancestors provided the emperor Qin Shi Huang with the power to unite the warring states into the empire of China. In addition to this, who was a known expert on the emperor's tomb and the history associated with the first emperor. Although he hadn't been told any specific reason, who had an idea that his immediate summons to the Zhongnanhai almost certainly had to do with the recent expedition into the mausoleum, and the theft and destruction of priceless artifacts? The only hope the president's interest was to gain information about those who perpetrated such a heinous act he was relatively certain they didn't know about his involvement. Otherwise, he wouldn't be on his way to Zhongnanhai, but instead to prison, where he would be interrogated. The driver stopped the car. A middle-aged man in a well-fitting suit opened the door for him. Hu Ching Li stepped out. The stranger greeted him, told him his name was Tao Zhou'a, and that he was a senior investigator with the Jion Bu, the Ministry of State Security. A shadow of fear crossed Hu's face. The Jion Bu were the American equivalent of the CIA and Homeland Security. Hu's heart raced in his chest. They might just be looking for information, or he might be in serious trouble. Hu was taken to Tao Zhou'a's office. The man sat him down and began to question him. He was polite, respectful, but emphatic. Have you ever heard of Dragon's Breath? Do you know if it exists or is mythical? Who else knows about it? 
Where is the last known supply of this material? The questions went on for some time, and who tried his best to answer them? After a full hour, who said, What is this all about? There are certain international rumors circulating that an ancient weapon known only as Dragon's Breath has been reportedly stolen from the Emperor Qin Shi Huang's tomb. Tao paused, his eyes meeting Hu's. The investigator looked torn. Tao Zhou'a needed answers, and he needed Hu's help, if he could just trust the man. Tao lowered his voice, necessity overcoming the need for secrecy. He opened his mouth to speak, but instead he was interrupted by the entrance of the president. Both men stood up, out of respect. President Kai said, "'Sit down, gentlemen.' He turned to Hu and gave Hu's hand a firm shake. "'Hu Qingli, I knew your father. He was a good man. He was proud of you. I trusted him, and I believe I can trust you.' "'Thank you, sir.' Who didn't make an effort to confirm his trust. It was implied and indisputable. The president said, The Americans believe that the weapon was to be used for some sort of catastrophic attack on America by China. Yet the Chinese government knows nothing about it. Who said, So why don't you tell them that? Two reasons, the president said. One, they wouldn't believe us if we told them, and two, even if we could convince them that it was the truth, we don't want them to believe it. Who suppressed a smile? You want the President of the U.S. to think you have such a weapon in your possession? Exactly. From what we're hearing, Dragon's Breath has the power to level an entire continent, down to the waterline. If such a destructive instrument exists and the Americans believe we have it, all the better. The last thing we want is for them, or anyone else for that matter, to imagine such a weapon exists and that we don't have it. Right. So what can I do for you and my country, Mr. President? We need to know how true the reports of such a weapon are, and if they are possible, or if its power has been exaggerated. Who exhaled slowly. He looked his president in the eye. The weapon is real, and its power is anything but exaggerated. Chapter 41 I-10, Louisiana Sam crossed the Mississippi at Baton Rouge. The Bentley headed west along I-10. His cell phone began to ring. He hit the phone symbol on the wheel, and the cell phone came through to the car. He said, Hello. A woman answered, Sam, what the hell is going on with Dragon's Breath? Sam grinned. Good afternoon, Madam Secretary. The Secretary of Defense often came to Sam in the interest of national security when such matters dealt with ancient artifacts, were mythical in nature, or based on legends. This was no different, and he wasn't surprised. He'd been waiting for her to reach out to him. Sam waited for her to elaborate. When she kept silent, he finally asked, What do you want to know, ma'am? There are reports the weapon was recently stolen from the Emperor's tomb at Xi'an. I can verify that it was. Her voice was a mixture of excitement and relief. Did you steal it? No. Pity! Do you know who did? A woman named Kiri. I don't have her surname. She had a Spanish accent, but appeared to be Polynesian either in part or entirely. She seemed to be working with a European coalition. I've tried to track her down, but so far my efforts to locate her have been fruitless. The traffic slowed up ahead, and a big blue Dodge just about rear-ended the Bentley. Sam pulled into the breakdown lane to avoid the collision. The traffic picked up, and he shifted back into the main lane in the highway again. The secretary continued. There are reports the weapon is so powerful, it's capable of leveling entire nations. Not just nations. It can sink an island to the water. 
with some sort of chain reaction that disintegrates land. Apparently, water is one of the few things capable of stopping the reaction. Sam said, Go on. I need to know if there's any sort of validity in these reports. Sam nodded and drew a breath. I believe so. There was a cold silence as the Secretary of Defense mulled that thought over. Okay, so the weapon exists. It does, Sam sighed. And you didn't notify me. I plan to. The Secretary of Defense said nothing. Her silence hurt Sam's ears. He said, I imagine this is what Japan felt like after discovering that we had the atomic bomb and the means to level entire cities. No, she countered. This is what it would have felt like if Japan knew someone possessed the atomic bomb, yet had no idea who or why they wanted to drop it on you. Sam glanced in his rearview mirror. That Dodge truck was still on his tail. All right, Madam Secretary, I've got to go. Sam swerved and overtook a self-driving Tesla. Its owner was reading a book at the wheel without a care in the world. Go! Where? Sam swallowed. Go anywhere but where the guy tailgating me in his four-by-four four is. He cleared his throat, and before he hung up, he said, I think I'm about to find out who else is looking for Dragon's Breath. Chapter 42 Sam planted his accelerator to the floor. The Bentley's V-12 jumped into life. He turned off onto U.S. Highway 190, where the traffic seemed more spread out and the Bentley's superior performance could easily outrun the Dodge. He zipped in and out of traffic, trying to increase the gap. It was hard going, a combination of acceleration followed by heavy braking and equally heavy acceleration. After a few minutes, Sam glanced into his rearview mirror again to reassure himself that he'd lost his tail. Instead, the blue Dodge stared back at him. There were two people inside, both men. The passenger had his window down and what appeared to be the barrel of an assault rifle sticking out. Well, there goes the hope they were just being friendly. Sam picked up the pace once more. The Bentley eased past 120 miles per hour. It was nowhere near the car's top speed of 160, but felt more than fast enough, given the way he was weaving in and out of traffic. The W-12 was a powerful engine, but the Bentley weighed just shy of 6,000 pounds. Even with all that torque spread out across all four wheels, it wasn't the sort of car he wanted to be throwing around in traffic like this. Behind him, the Dodge kept pace. It must have been a ghost car, one of those vehicles with its regular engines stripped and replaced by something incredibly powerful. It was commonly seen in illegal street drag racing, where kids with more money than sense tried to trick unsuspecting rev heads into a race. He glanced at the mirror again. The Dodge was just flying in and out of the stream of vehicles moving on the public highway. Still, it was an impressive display of driving. Sam crossed the Achafalaya River and turned left into a winding road that hugged the river heading south. The road was empty. Now Sam was able to truly open up the accelerator and see what the Bentley was capable of. The powerful engine made a deep, throaty sound. Like a jet pilot, he found himself slammed hard against the plush leather seat. The Dodge was fast. The Bentley was faster. Sam was concentrating hard, keeping the car on the white lines in the middle of the asphalt to allow himself the greatest amount of room to maneuver. He was thankful the road was empty. He kept gaining speed, finally pulling away from the Dodge and increasing the gap. Behind him, the passenger in the Dodge started shooting. Sam heard the single snap of a high-powered rifle as the bullet, traveling at supersonic speeds, cracked the sound barrier. It hit the rear windshield of the Bentley. 
The large shot created a perfect hole in the windshield before landing on the headrest of the passenger seat. The exit wound in the headrest looked gnarly, as the soft material had been blown outward. Sam swerved, trying to make himself a more difficult target. Whoever the shooter was in the Dodge, they changed tack, switching to fully automatic. Sam recognized the distinctive noise of an M-16 being rapid-fired. The bullets raked along the massive trunk of the Bentley. Sam ducked down, trying to keep his head just high enough to see over the dashboard. He swerved and kept his foot planted to the floor. When the shots went quiet, he sat up again. He swung the Bentley around a sharp corner, or what felt like a sharp corner, given that he was traveling in excess of 105 miles per hour. In front of him, a three-wheeler motorcycle raced to greet him. Oh, shit. There was nothing Sam could do to miss the rider. They were set to collide. He jammed on the brakes. The Bentley's ABS braking system kicked in and all four wheels alternated between skidding and gripping, achieving the optimal traction based on a computer algorithm. Science had come a long way, but it hadn't worked out how to defy physics and inertia. It all worked to achieve some reduction in speed, but not enough to avoid the collision. No way the Bentley would stop in time. It was just too big and cumbersome at these speeds to avoid the tri-wheeler and stay on the road. The rider had jammed on his brakes, too, and tried to shift to the side, but there just simply wasn't enough time. To the left, the road ran alongside the river. Straight ahead, the rider. And to the right, a shallow embankment. At these speeds, it would be hard to stay grounded if he came off the road, but what other choice did he have? All of these thoughts happened in a microsecond. Split-second decision, only choice he could make. Sam swerved off the road. The Bentley hit the dirt, skidded, balanced for a second, then dug its front right-side wheel into a ditch and rolled. The luxury car performed a near-perfect cartwheel. Then it rolled onto its side and slid down into a shallow ravine. The side airbags deployed. They took some of the brunt force as Sam's head jolted to the side before the Bentley came to an abrupt stop. His head slammed against the steering wheel, sending a white flash of stars into his eyes and knocking him unconscious. He woke up a couple of seconds later, having been flung out of his seatbelt and onto the passenger side of the high-performance vehicle. A small trickle of blood ran down his temple. Behind him, he heard footsteps. It was followed by the metallic sound of an M-16 being fired at fully automatic. The shooter emptied the entire contents of his magazine ineffectively at the driver's side of the Bentley. Sam would have been dead if he'd still been in the driver's seat, but gravity had caused him to fall into the passenger footwell, the M-16 went silent. Then there was the distinctive crisp sound of another magazine being fed into the weapon. Sam swallowed, trying to keep himself rolled up as tightly as possible and as protected as possible in the large footwell. Thankfully, the Bentley put passenger comfort above anything else. The shooter opened up again, spraying the entire car this time. Sam listened to him turn and walk away. From the distance, another man said, What are you doing, Pierre? Did you forget we we're supposed to get the map? All right, all right, Luke. Sam struggled to reach for his weapon. It had sailed through the air during that somersault, and he'd be damned if he could find it, let alone reach it. His eyes darted toward each side of the upturned vehicle. He tried the door. It was stuck. He tried the next one. Stuck, too. He was trapped. A sitting duck. Seconds later, Pierre clambered onto the side of the upturned wrecked car. He found the door handle within a couple of seconds. There was nowhere for Sam to go. The door opened. Pierre swore. 
He reached into the small of his back, drew a Glock, and fired two shots, execution style. Double tap, each one landing at the center of Sam's chest. His attacker reached into the car, found the satchel, and retrieved the golden map. A second later, he casually walked away without a care in the world. Chapter 43 Pacific Ocean On Board the Tehila Tom answered his cell phone. It was the Secretary of Defense. Tom, I need you to put me onto Sam right away. I'm sorry, Madam Secretary. Sam's in Louisiana trying to have something deciphered. The Secretary said, We were on the phone. He got attacked. He cut me off, said he was being tailed by someone. I expected he'd deal with it and then call me back. Now I can't get through to him at all. Tom frowned. I don't know. He might be out of cell range. With his phone, she said. I doubt it. Tom did, too. Sam's phone worked on a combination of cellular network technology and satellites. Unless he was underground, it was highly unlikely he was out of range. And Sam would never skip a call from the Secretary of Defense. Yeah, unlikely, Tom agreed. Look, I'll make some calls to the linguist he was meant to be seeing and the airport. I'll keep trying to reach him. Thanks. When you catch him, give him a message from me. Sure. What's the message? The secretary exhaled slowly. Tell him, from the data coming in from intelligence, we think China has dragon's breath. If they have dragon's breath, what do you think they're planning on doing with it? That's precisely what I want Sam Riley to find out. The secretary hesitated, then added, And more importantly, what are we going to do about it? Chapter 44 Sam opened his eyes. He drew a breath with an audible gasp. The execution-style double tap, fired from close proximity, had placed two nine-millimeter parabellums at the center of his chest at near simultaneous succession. Even with his Kevlar vest, the shots had inflicted an injury akin to a sudden hit from a sledgehammer. His diaphragm took the brunt of that force. It was still spasming like mad. For a few seconds, as Sam coughed and struggled to fill his lungs, he genuinely wondered if those shots had killed him, despite his bullet-resistant vest. Sam sat forward, took another breath. It hurt. But the cold air came into his airways and felt good. There was something primitive about the ability to breathe. After a close brush with death, now he knew he was alive. All of a sudden, he had a lot more clarity with everything. The fog of confusion lifted. He glanced over to where he had last seen the satchel. The priceless dragon's breath map was missing. And that meant whoever had attacked him had taken it. In the driver's footwell, he spotted his Glock. It sat there, fully loaded, teasing him. Sam gritted his teeth against the pain and forced himself to sit up. His hand reached for his gun, finding reassurance as he clasped the hilt. With his other hand, he fumbled for the door handle. The car was leaning on its side, meaning that he had to overcome the weight of the door just to open it. He tried with his shoulder, but gravity seemed to be a bigger obstacle than he'd first considered. He turned around, leaned up against the seat, and pushed with his feet. The door swung open. A man's hand reached down into the car. The stranger said, You want a hand? Sam looked up, hesitated. The uncalloused hand belonged to a gentleman with a kind face. With the amount of adrenaline Sam had running through his veins, Sam took the man in with one look. His unknown helper had salt and pepper colored hair, a matching beard, and determined brown eyes behind a pair of thin rimmed glasses. He seemed about 5'10", maybe 180 pounds, 
broad in the shoulders and chest, in his middle fifties. This could have been one of the shooters. Then again, if his attackers already thought he was dead and had stolen the gold map, it was unlikely either of them would come back and help him out of the wrecked car. If that were the case, Sam would already be dead. Yes, please, Sam said a moment later, reaching up. Their hands gripped together like the links of a chain. It didn't take much, and Sam quickly clambered out of the car, slipping his gun behind his back and into his jeans. As soon as his feet were firmly on the ground, he ran up to the roadway. He turned his head and scanned in both directions, north and south. The road was empty. No one for as far as the eyes could see. Sam gripped his Glock in his hand. He looked at the motorcycle. It was a Harley-Davidson tri-glide, black on dark blue, covered in chrome. A big windshield at the front and twin seats. A real touring bike, built for comfort as well as speed. Its engine was a twin-cooled Milwaukee 8, displacing 1,868 cc's. Despite its comfort, it would be fast. The Good Samaritan looked at the Glock in Sam's hand. Are you sure you are all right, son? Not really. I just had something stolen by two men, and I don't even have a clue what way my attackers went. Son, I wouldn't get yourself all worked up about the loss of something material. Things can be replaced. Fact is, you're awfully lucky you got out of this thing alive. The Good Samaritan spoke with a sort of southern drawl, as though he had all the time in the world. The fact that Sam was still holding a pistol didn't seem to faze him at all. When I saw that guy shoot you, I thought you were a goner. Sam said, Wait, you saw someone shoot me? Sure did. The stranger tried to keep talking, but Sam interrupted him. I'm sorry, sir, I need to know which way they went. Forget it, the man said with a dismissive wave of his hand. It's not worth risking your life for. I can't forget it. In this case, it is worth risking my life. Yours, too. The stranger tilted his head, looked at him through a set of glasses, evaluating him like a professor might examine a student suspected of cheating. Why? It's a long story, and we don't have time to talk about it. But I can tell you that right now... Whoever attacked me is the greatest threat to America there is, and has ever been. Someone working for a terrorist with a weapon so deadly. The stranger spread his hands, a wry grin on his face. There was something genuine about it. All right, I believe you. I don't know why, but I do. What can I do to help? Sam glanced at the man's trike. I need your ride. The good Samaritan lifted a hand. No way! Nobody but me rides my trike. Fine. Can you give me a lift? Sure. Where do you want to go? Sam said, Do you think it's fast enough to catch up with the thieves? Chapter 45 The road stretched long and straight. Sam held on as the rider took the Harley-Davidson tri-glide quickly up the gears. Ahead, the blue Dodge was driving slowly and carefully, no longer on the chase, and having secured the map, the last thing they wanted to do was get pulled over by the police for a minor traffic infringement. It didn't take long to catch up. The rider backed off the throttle so he didn't have to overtake the Dodge. He leaned back, looking at him over his shoulder. What do you want me to do? Sam leaned in close so the rider could hear. Just get me close, and I'll think of something. The rider nodded. Okay. The triglide came in close to the Dodge Ram. It had a single cabin and a boxed-in tray at the back. Sam motioned for the rider to get closer. The bike eased close to the tray until it was right alongside. Sam took a deep breath, steadied his nerves, placed a foot on his seat, and jumped. 
He landed hard onto the back tray and dropped down low so the driver couldn't see him in his rearview mirror. Sam retrieved his Glock from the small of his back holster. He waited. They were doing 45 miles per hour. The wind whipped across his face as he edged toward the cabin at the front. Hanging from the back of the passenger seat, he spotted his felt satchel with the dragon's breath map. It kind of reassured him. After all, how else could he have been certain that the rider had seen the passenger of this car shoot him? The blue Dodge looked identical to the one that chased him, but in the heat of the moment Sam knew that one's memory could rarely be trusted. After a few minutes, Sam glanced back over his shoulder and spotted the Triglide rider looking at him. The crazy good Samaritan was going to give the game away. A few seconds later, the Dodge slowed to a crawl as it approached an upcoming T intersection. Now or never. Sam leaned forward. With his left hand, he held onto the back of the ram's roll cage to balance himself. Then, without a second thought, he aimed the Glock and fired two shots, one in the back of each man's head. The driver slumped forward. So did the passenger. The Dodge kept rolling. It went straight through the empty T intersection and rolled into a field of ripening corn before the soft ground eventually slowed it to a complete stop. Sam jumped out of the tray. He opened the door and put another shot into both the driver and the passenger's head. It was a little overkill, but he wasn't taking any chances. He then reached in and retrieved his map. The Good Samaritan pulled up at the T-intersection beside the cornfield. Sam saw that his erstwhile friend, the helpful motorbike rider, looked horrified. Sam held the felt satchel up like a trophy. I got it back. Good God! The rider shook his head as though he still didn't believe it. You shot them in the back of the head. I did, Sam said, unsure why that was a problem. I thought you were one of the good guys. Sam grinned. I am. Good guys don't shoot people in the back of the head. If I shot them in the front of the head, do you think they would have felt better about it? Sam gave an indifferent shrug. I had the shot, and I took it. His hands placatingly in the air, the rider was frightened now. He stared at Sam like he was a madman. If you're really one of the good guys, you'd call 911. Let the police come and do this by the book. Sure, Sam shrugged. You make the call. I have to contact someone anyway. The trike rider nodded, pulled out his cell phone, and called the police. While they talked, Sam made a call of his own. He contacted the Secretary of Defense, spoke for a couple of minutes, and hung up. He walked toward the rider. Any luck? Yeah. They said they'll be here in about 15 minutes. That's good. If they hurry, I might still be here. The rider looked around, his mind confirming that Sam must be crazy. There wasn't another car for miles. Where else do you have to go? To find who these guys were working for. Right. Well... It may be better to stay here until the police set things straight. They can be a big help when it comes to things like this, he recommended, now humoring Sam. Sam offered him his hand. I'm Sam Riley, by the way. After a moment's hesitation, the stranger took it with a firm handshake. Robert Anderson. But Anderson was wrong. The police arrived ten minutes later. Three cars in total, state police. They arrested Sam, cuffing his hands behind his back. A tall police officer began to take a statement from Sam. There was incredulous disbelief in the lawman's eyes. Sam relayed the story of being tailed and the theft with complete honesty. Sam almost had him with the concept of self-defense, up until the point where he told the officer that he'd jumped into the back of the Dodge Ram, drew his Glock, and shot both the driver and passenger dead from behind. Sir, 
Getting a good look at Sam, the officer's piercing gaze lasered into him. I hope you got a good lawyer. Uh, not really. I suppose I should find one. Now that you mention it, I'll probably need one for the next time. I don't generally need representation when this sort of thing happens. Are you telling me that you've killed people in cold blood before? That came out wrong. Sam's cuffs clinked behind his back and he sighed. The officer gave Sam a scornful look and shook his head. Maybe you better stick to your Fifth Amendment right and keep your mouth shut. Sam shrugged. It's okay. I'll be leaving shortly with those bodies, and this whole thing's going to be swept under the warm blanket of national security. The police officer rolled his eyes. He found that funny. Oh, is that right, huh? Afraid so. I doubt it. A few minutes later, after arranging what he wanted members of his team to do while he took his perpetrator somewhere to be booked, the police officer ordered Sam to take a seat in the back of the patrol car. Sam did as he was told. He relaxed back into his seat and got as comfortable as he could while wearing cuffs. The police officer opened the door and dropped into the driver's seat. Sam rested his head back and shut his eyes. He'd had one hell of a day, and was so desperately tired he could have slept. But sleep didn't come. Instead, a couple of Sikorsky Black Hawk military helicopters flew overhead, circled, and landed beside the road. The police officer turned to look back at Sam. What the hell is that? Sam shrugged. I told you this whole thing is going to be swept under the warm and comfy blanket of national security. And that... He nodded his head toward a Blackhawk, giving the cop an apologetic smile. That's my ride. Chapter 46 Pentagon, Virginia Sam was picked up by a military aide at Andrews Air Base. The driver called his name, barely speaking to him once he'd made sure he had the right passenger. Sam was used to it. The Pentagon was the headquarters building of the United States Department of Defense. People who worked there were so security conscious, at times they acted like simply saying good morning was the same as giving away state secrets. It was only 15 miles from the airbase, so despite heavy traffic, only 30 minutes passed before Sam reached his destination. The biggest office building in the world, the Pentagon, was a huge institution. Comfortably able to contain hundreds in its heavily guarded pedestrian lobby, the Pentagon accommodated 30,000 workers, yet it only had three doors to the street. Three doors. Three lines to get through security. It was like boarding an airplane, only worse, and waiting to get through an unending stream of humanity to ensure security can take time. A lot of time. Except it didn't for Sam. There was no waiting in line for him. He was shamelessly whisked to the front of one of the lines, passing those behind him with an apologetic shrug. Once through security, he was then escorted up an elevator and down several different corridors to the office of the Secretary of Defense. It was a large room with blue carpet, a massive desk, and two small tables for meetings, four seats each. The Secretary's office wasn't the kind of place for a big open meeting, just a few generals and maybe a head of state or two. Secrets pass through this unpretentious, innocuous room, day and night. Sitting at the far side of those four seats, Sam hadn't expected to see Dr. Ashley Calder here, her otherwise relaxed and playful countenance a mask of gravity and concern. She nervously tapped away at the small folder on her lap, while her piercing blue eyes were furtive, as though she wasn't sure where to look for fear of trespassing on state secrets. 
it seems that within the walls of the Pentagon, paranoia was catching. He idly wondered why Tom wasn't here, too. They had been at the Emperor's tomb together, after all. The door was closed by an aide. The discreet, airtight seal made Sam's ears pop. The three of them were alone. The Secretary of Defense greeted Sam with a firm handshake. She was a slim but muscular woman with stark red hair. Intelligent, commanding, and always intimidating. She wore her dark business suit and her permanent scowl with equal severity. She gestured toward the couch. Have a seat, Sam. Very good, ma'am, he said, dropping down on the couch next to Dr. Calder. Tom has brought me up to speed. He mentioned that you had Dr. Calder on board the Tehila. I had someone pick her up so she could debrief me on the scientific aspects of our situation. That surprised him. The Pentagon employed thousands of people from every facet of life and expertise. The Secretary of Defense must have had more than a dozen nuclear experts at her disposal if she wanted to hear about the theoretical science of Dragon's Breath or anything capable of dissolving matter. The Secretary didn't ask any questions, so he waited for her to continue speaking. The Secretary said, I've seen the video of you and Tom in the Emperor's tomb. All that destruction was shocking and unbelievable. Also, the good doctor has been updating me on what she knows. There was a bit of back and forth as the two of them answered the secretary's remaining questions and clarified all that could be clarified. Once they exhausted the subject, the secretary said, Sam, things have changed. Changed, ma'am. CERN was raided. CERN was the European Organization for Nuclear Research, a crucible of some of the brightest minds in subatomic particle physics in existence. The acronym CERN originally represented the French words for Conseil Européen pour la Recherche Nucléaire, which was a provisional council for building the laboratory, established by 12 European governments in 1952. When the name changed to the European Organization for Nuclear Research, they kept the original acronym. Raided? Sam asked. A team of elite mercenaries entered the main research facility in Geneva, Switzerland. It was a targeted attack on a brain's trust. The entire thing took less than two hours, and by the time they disappeared, they had with them 15 of the most senior physicists. Sam said, anyone who could make sense of Dragon's breath. Ashley found her voice. It's more than that. I've had a look at the people taken. These individuals specialized in theories of subatomic chain reactions. Bombs? She nodded. Among other things, Sam persisted. But you think whoever took these researchers hostage did so to understand the subatomic physics of Dragon's breath? No. I think these fifteen people specifically were targeted because they had the specialized skills to build a targeted bomb out of Dragon's breath. Sam swallowed hard. And the secretary said what he was thinking. A bomb that could decimate an entire continent to the sea level, even one as big as North America. Sam's head was racing. What do you need from me and my team? The secretary said, You're going to Japan, leaving now. Okay. I'll sleep on the plane, he thought to himself tiredly. What's in Japan? The secretary gestured toward Ashley. Fill him in on the way to Andrews Air Force Base. Is there a military jet waiting for me? No, it would create too many questions. Better that you fly privately. I'll arrange for the Gulf Stream to pick us up. It's already been done. The secretary smiled, showing that she recognized the priority, and she was the one who pulled the strings. Fueled and ready. Its flight plan has already been lodged. Okay. 
Sam said, pushing to his feet. He shook the secretary's hand. I'll do my best. I just hope it's enough. The secretary opened the oak door and said, Good luck to both of you. The same military aide escorted them to a private car and drove them to Andrews. They sat in the back seat. The soundproof barrier was up. It was designed to prohibit listening devices or even the government drivers from hearing classified conversations. Sam studied Dr. Calder. She looked tense, her jaw set with determination more than fear. Of course, it made sense she was frightened. The woman was in a better position than anyone else alive to understand just how much danger they were all in. He said, Are you okay? Yeah, I think so. She paused. I mean, no. We're talking about the potential destruction of an entire continent. Also, many of my closest academic colleagues, researchers, and friends have been abducted, and so, no, I'm not okay. So, to be honest, I'm not a happy camper right now. Sam exhaled slowly. Yeah, that's fair. I'm sorry, I'll be okay. I'll keep it together long enough to do all that is possible to prevent this from happening. All right, Sam said, meeting her determined gaze. You want to tell me why we're flying to Japan? Ashley said, Do you remember how I explained the explosion of Dragon's Breath caused a ripple effect in which billions of tiny subatomic particles called neutrinos flooded the world like an expanding bubble? Yeah, that's how you and I met. Right. Ashley drew a breath. Well, that burst of neutrinos appears to have triggered a secondary bubble at two other locations around the world. A secondary neutrino bubble, Sam said, still letting this new information sink in. What exactly do you think are causing these strange rippling effects? Ashley smiled. Oh, I can tell you quite clearly what they represent. Really? Yes. I'm sorry. I thought that much would have been obvious. Sam shook his head. Apparently it wasn't to him. What? These are the locations of the two other stores of Dragon's Breath. Sam let that sink in for a second. Is it possible they formed naturally? Ashley shrugged. As in, like, some sort of organically occurring element or mineral? Yeah, is that a possibility? I doubt it. It is conceivable, although unlikely. If Dragon's Breath occurred naturally, I think we would have heard about it by now. More likely, it has been made artificially by ancient Chinese alchemists who got lucky. Okay, so if that's the case, how did they get there? I don't know. Maybe whoever the great alchemists of Qin Shi Huang's time were had put them there? I have no idea. Looking at their remote locations, it would make sense. Maybe they were trying to study the strange material in the safety of isolation. A shadow of fear swept up Sam's spine. Your assistant found this through the deep underground neutrino observatory? Uh-huh, she agreed. Why? If your people spotted it, what's the chances that someone else, say, someone with the resources of several leading nuclear physicists from around the world, might stumble across it, too? Ashley nodded. If I had to guess? Yeah. Ashley's voice was cold and hard. It's a hundred percent certainty they already know. Sam drew a breath. Which means we need to reach it first. That's why we're heading to Japan? Yes. Where exactly? Buried somewhere deep in the Joshinetsu Kogan mountainous region of Nagano. How exactly can you predict its location? Close. Within about ten feet. Like with the original neutrino burst at Xi'an, 
we've been able to triangulate its origin from three separate neutrino detectors. Okay, that's one. Where's the other? A rocky outcrop off the northeast coast of Greenland. Sam nodded as his understanding of the situation came together. And Tom's taking the Tehila to retrieve it? That's right. Ashley met his eyes. With any luck, he should get to his destination around the time we reach our own target destination in Japan. Chapter 47 Rocky Outcrop, Greenland The Tehila motored along the northeast coast of Greenland. It was a sea of ice. Like most of Greenland's perimeter, its northern coast was lined with fjords that wind between rocky islands and peninsulas and connect inland areas to adjacent seas. Massive glaciers flowed along the mountainous fjords, racing toward the icy sea. Just before midday, the sun began its tentative efforts to rise. This time of the year, it would only barely reach the horizon, casting a warm glow, but little heat across the pristine shores of the land of ice. It would stay at the horizon just shy of three hours before retreating, leaving the northern island in absolute darkness and the aurora lights. Today, a radiant display of green, red, and blue hues danced across the sky, draped in a blanket of velvet blackness, speckled with a scattering of prominent stars. The streaks of color danced like flames across the Arctic clouds. Beneath this magical display of nature, a ship motored silently. Its dark, sharp-angled, and low-lying hull gave the ship a predator-like image, as though it was stalking some sort of mythical quarry beneath the sea, slicing through the ink-black stillness, leaving a white glow in its wake. On the Tehila's large aft deck, Tom prepared the Scorpion R.I.B. to be lowered into the water. The high-end, rigid-hulled inflatable boat was powered by twin Mercury Verados, with an output of 300 horsepower each. The R.I.B. had a single stand-up console and wheel at its center. Other than that, it was a skeleton bare workhorse, designed to go hard, fast, and survive anything. Genevieve came out, carrying a small cache of weapons, and wearing the pleasant smile of a hunter at the start of the season. She often reminded him of a pixie, with a mischievous face, short brown hair, blue eyes, and an impish grin, and he loved her to bits. Tom ran his eyes across the landscape, sea of ice, and weapon cache, before landing on her arctic blue eyes. He couldn't help but smile. Are you planning on starting a war? Probably not, she admitted. With a wry smile, Genevieve began laying out the weapons on the deck, dishing out spare magazines, submachine guns, pistols, knives, two grenades, and a block of military-grade C4 in an M112 demolition block. Tom ran his eyes across her weapons cache and arched an eyebrow. Are you sure? No, but if war comes, I sure as hell plan to be on the winning side. It's only a small rocky outcrop off Greenland. Tom tucked his thermal jacket in, trying to avoid the cold wind that seemed to keep blowing. I mean, it's freezing here. I don't think many people will be fighting you for it. You're right, Genevieve said, adding another block of C4. We'll take two of these just to be safe. Tom knew better than to argue with her about such things. Instead, he looked at her with all the affection in the world and said, Okay, darling. A few minutes later, he loaded a handheld compact neutrino detector into the back of the Zodiac. Genevieve glanced at the device. It was about the size of a portable thermos. Detecting neutrinos is difficult. Huge quantities of matter need to be monitored just to catch a few precious events. Genevieve said, Does it work? 
Tom shrugged. Beats me. We'll soon find out. I thought detecting neutrinos was one of the hardest tasks in particle physics, owing to their extremely low interaction rate with particles. Something like that, Tom said, his voice noncommittal, as though he didn't have any real knowledge or investment in the statement. Dr. Calder said something about 100,000 tons of ultra-pure water at the neutrino detector in Hawaii. Her eyes fixed on the thermosized detector. Yet, uh, that will do the same job? We'll soon find out. Apparently it works on W and Z bosons and their interactions with the neutrinos, whatever the hell they are. Tom picked it up. Something about a coherent scattering effect? I hope it works. Let's find out. Tom picked up the thermos, switched it on. Monitoring neutrino radiation is apparently similar to using a Geiger counter. The device came alive, beeping loudly and providing a compass direction from the source. Genevieve smiled. Only in this case, it points to Dragon's Breath. Chapter 48 Tom steered the scorpion into the sea of ice. Genevieve held the thermosized neutrino detector, guiding him through the scattering of small islands that lined the nearby northeast coast of Greenland. The RIB skimmed across the glassy flat sea, its powerful twin mercury outboards barely above an idol. They both wore thick Arctic-10 immersion suits, designed to keep them alive in the unfortunate event that they ended up in the sea, in the freezing water conditions, of which Greenland abounds. Sub-zero air swept across them. Tom pulled the zipper up to his mouth. Genevieve, who grew up in Moscow and had ice in her veins, barely noticed the cold. She suppressed a grin, checked the neutrino detector, and pointed to the east. Tom turned the scorpion to the left. Up ahead, he slowed the RIB as it passed a large glacial iceberg, complete with more than a dozen giant seracs that intermingled to form a series of ice tunnels and passageways. He rounded the berg and then slowly cruised around a cluster of several floating smaller chunks. These disintegrating icebergs were called growlers. Genevieve said, I still don't know why you didn't let me fly you over there on the Eurocopter. I wish, Tom replied. She gave his cold demeanor a curt appraisal. I could have. But could you have flown it into those sea caves? Tom countered. Genevieve made a face, like she was genuinely thinking it through. No, you're probably right. I guess we'll have to enjoy the fresh air. A hundred feet in the distance, they spotted the rocky outcrop that matched Dr. Calder's coordinates for where the second Dragon's Breath neutrino burst originated. At a glance, its geology was a mixture of volcanic and metamorphic. Tom motored the scorpion around the rocky outcrop and came face to face with the large maw of a sea cave. It was the sort of cave he and Sam sometimes referred to as a Hollywood cave, not for its size, but for its striking appearance. Due to its rich blues associated with clear, predominantly glacial waters, a Hollywood cave looked as though it belonged in an old 1980 sci-fi. Think Journey to the Center of the Earth. Tom watched Genevieve, who was still holding the thermos-shaped neutrino detector. It was beeping and going crazy. He nodded. I guess we're going inside, then. Guess so. Tom eased the throttle forward, and the scorpion idled slowly past a sheet of ice built up along the entrance of the cave and into a large cavern within. The sea was perfectly still, almost frozen inside. The mouth of the cave narrowed, and Tom thought they'd reached a dead end. Genevieve switched on a flashlight and shone its beam in a wide arc. Tom began to make the turn. To the west, he noticed a narrow, flooded passageway. He stopped the scorpion. In the still water, Genevieve fixed the beam of her flashlight on the passageway. 
It was so straight and perfectly formed, it looked like an old Roman aqueduct, the sort of thing one might see throughout Europe that ran along bridges that stretched across massive ravines. Tom still remembered the shock of watching a boat cruise across a bridge that spanned just such a valley in France. The neutrino detector was going berserk. Tom said, Can we fit? Genevieve squinted, trying to make an imaginary measurement. Only just, but I think we'll make it. Tom nodded. I thought so, too. He eased the throttle forward. The R.I.B. gently squeezed through the bottleneck before opening into a massive chamber. They followed the beeping neutrino detector to the farthest eastern end of the chamber, where an old lava tube extended deep into the heart of the rocky island. It was sub-zero inside the cave, and the mouth of the lava tube was lined with both ice stalagmites and stalactites, giving it the distinctive appearance of the sharp teeth of a frozen monster. Tom tied a mooring line around a large stalagmite and climbed ashore onto the volcanic ground. He switched his flashlight on. Its beam flickered across the obsidian floor, its marbled, glossy surface slippery with ice. They both wore backpacks with climbing gear and weapons, not that they were expecting to need either. Genevieve stepped up onto the shore. Her eyes swept the mouth of the passageway, focusing on the ice teeth. Seems ominous, doesn't it? A little, Genevieve said. I should have brought the C4. What would that have done? Nothing. It's just, if I'm going to have to fight a thirty-foot-tall ice monster, I'm going to want something with a little more firepower than a submachine gun. Tom stifled a grin, not sure if Genevieve was serious or not. Come on, let's go find this thing. They followed the lava tube. It progressed upward into the heart of the island. At sections it was so steep they were nearly climbing before leveling out. It twisted and turned, the same way lava tubes naturally formed all over the world, before ending in another large chamber where millions of years ago Hot magma bubbled and formed a giant air pocket. This cavity seemed different to the ones that preceded it. The walls and ground appeared pockmarked with deep craters and giant openings throughout. The place might have been Swiss cheese. The glassy obsidian was interspersed with giant seracs, icy remnants of a glacier. The western edge of the chamber was a solid wall of fern, a partially compacted type of snow that had been left over from a past season and recrystallized into a dense ice. It had a distinct shape, kind of like wet sugar but ultra-hard, and represented the ice crystals somewhere between snow and glacial ice. In the distance, the chamber echoed with the sound of running water, Thawing ice from the glacier appeared to be making its way into the cave. Tom followed the distinctive noise of running water, searching the area with his flashlight, until he located the source of the sound. The shallow trickle of water entered a moulin. Tom stared at it. The moulin was roughly a circular, vertical well-like shaft within a glacier or ice sheet into which water enters from the surface. In this case, melting ice formed a constant waterfall entering the opening. Tom tilted the beam of the flashlight and it disappeared into the gaping maw. It was a dark hole in the ground that descended deep into the rocky outcrop, where anything that goes in completely disappeared. The neutrino detector went crazy. Tom's jaw tightened and he ground his teeth. Let me guess... Genevieve bit her lower lip. We have to go down there. Chapter 49 With a resigned sigh, Tom secured an abseiling rope to a nearby ice stalagmite. It was a 1.5-inch thick static, polyamid rope, hard and durable, specifically designed for ascending and descending caves. 
he secured the neutrino detector into his backpack, connected the rope to his descender, double-checked all his gear, including an ascender, and attached his flashlight to its holder on the side of his helmet. He leaned back, ready to make his descent into total darkness. Water rushed into the black hole beside him. It was a novel experience, somewhere between canyoning, caving, and ice climbing. He looked at Genevieve. Are you sure you don't want to go first? She shook her head. No, I'm good. You're not scared? No way, Genevieve said, almost affronted by his words. I'm just lazy. If you find this thing at the bottom, feel free to retrieve it and climb back up. Sure. With that, Tom leaned back and made his slow descent into the Mulan. He sank to about twenty feet. The thawing ice hole turned to stone. It was called a giant's kettle, a cylindrical pothole drilled in solid rock underlying a glacier, either by water descending down a deep moulin or by gravel rotating in the bed of a subglacial meltwater stream. Tom continued descending into the well. Another twenty feet before it opened into a shallow subterranean creek that ran north to south. He unclipped from the rope and checked the neutrino detector. The arrow buzzed and pointed north. He called up to Genevieve. I found another passageway. You want to come down or wait up there? I'll come down, she replied without hesitation, not wanting to be mistaken for being frightened of narrow conditions that had the possibility for a person to freeze, drown, or collapse. It didn't take her long, no more than a few minutes. Where Tom had carefully abseiled, constantly stopping to check the structure of the Mulan and ensuring giant chunks of ice weren't going to fall on him, Genevieve descended like she was on a black ops mission. She unclipped from the rope and kissed Tom. Did you miss me? Always. I know, she said with a smirk. She pointed her flashlight in both directions of the underground creek. Which way? North. Okay, let's do this. I'm getting hungry. Sure. They walked along the shallow creek. It was little more than a trickle, and they were able to avoid getting wet by staying to the edge, where the creek carved its way into the metamorphic rock. The passage came to a dead end after a couple of minutes. A small trickle of water flowed from a tiny gap above. Tom frowned. Any sign of dragon's breath? Genevieve swept the chamber with the beam of light in a slow arc. She stopped at 270 degrees and fixed her flashlight on a small alcove. It was square, almost definitely too perfectly cubed to be caused by natural erosion. What is that? she asked. I don't know, but if I had to guess, I'd say someone went to great lengths to hide something here. I'll say... There were three small grooves carved into the obsidian wall, two to the left side and one on the right, rectangular, far too perfect to occur in nature. Tom used all three to scale the wall and then reached up into the alcove high above. His Kevlar-gloved hand touched something metal. He grinned and exhaled. I found something! Tom's fingers gripped the box and withdrew it. He stepped down and looked at his finding. Genevieve held her flashlight so the light shone on the storage box. It was made of bronze, with intricate jade decorations. Unmistakably ancient Chinese in its design, it had two metal clasps that prevented the box from swinging open. Tom flicked them open. The weak metal popped. They both held their breath. Inside. There was a silk satchel, with the same unique design involving dragons, just like the one found with the Emperor's copper coffin. Tom opened the satchel up. Inside was a handful of the ultralight metallic powder that glowed iridescent under the beam of his flashlight. Genevieve's eyes went wide at the remarkable sight. She'd seen the video taken from the inside of the Emperor's tomb, 
but nothing quite prepared someone for seeing the dazzling material in real life. They secured the silk satchel in a Kevlar bag inside Tom's backpack, then returned to the vertical shaft. The end of the abseil rope had a fine tremor. Tom's eyes narrowed in on it. From up above, several stones fell down the shaft. Tom stepped back out of the way of falling debris, bringing Genevieve with him. The debris was followed by the sound of voices. Genevieve put her index finger to her lips and mouthed, We have company. Chapter 50 Several voices carried down the icy Mulan. Their decision not to approach silently, brazenly chatting, had their confidence echoing down the vertical gap. Tom and Genevieve exchanged a glance. Stay and fight or run? Tom whispered, I don't like the idea of trying to get back up that rope in a firefight. All they have to do is cut the rope and we're as good as dead. Agreed. Genevieve glanced at the tunnel, her gaze tracing the water that flowed outward. Her eyes drifted to meet his. Where does that water go? Tom shrugged. It must lead to the sea somehow. Hmm. What are you thinking? These exposure suits can keep us alive in the near freezing water, at least long enough for someone from the Tehila to come get us. I think it's worth a try. They headed down the shaft, moving quickly. It wasn't far before the tunnel widened and opened to a section of flooded water. Tom could tell when he breathed in that this was seawater, not the fresh water coming from the ancient glacial runoff. A soft glow radiated from the water. Tom looked at the wall of metamorphic stone that reached the seawater. The tunnel clearly continued into the water, before coming out into the open ocean of the Greenland Sea. He swallowed. We could probably duck under there, hold our breaths, and swim up the other side. Genevieve's voice softened. It doesn't matter how far it is, it's impossible. We're not leaving this cave that way. Really? You really don't know much about ice, do you? Genevieve dropped her backpack and began setting up for a fight. There's no way we'd be able to duck under that water, let alone any rocky ledge in our immersion suits. Tom opened his mouth, thought twice about what he was going to say, and shut it again. Genevieve nodded as though she realized he already got it. And without our immersion suits, we'd freeze to death long before anyone from the Tehila reached us. Tom lowered the beam of his flashlight in the chamber. It was somewhat rounder than the rest of the tunnel. Wider meant that something had caused it to spread apart, most likely water falling from above, with the splashes over thousands of years causing the tunnel to balloon. Cold air seemed to flow in from a chimney vault high above, suggesting the opening extended all the way to the surface, he pointed the beam straight upward. It was a mixture of sedimentary, metamorphic, and volcanic, much too smooth to ever climb out. Interspersed between the various geology were a series of frozen speleothems. There were some ice stalactites hanging from the ceiling high above, with more than a dozen stalagmites lining the bottom of the vault, like some sort of horrible booby trap designed to impale any would-be intruder if they fell. But among these, and spread out throughout the chimney, were more than a dozen horizontal and diagonal ice formations known as helictites. Genevieve said, What are you thinking? Tom grinned. That we can climb out. She glanced upward. I should go first. Really? Tom asked. Why? I'm a lot lighter than you. There's more chance those helictites will hold for me. When I get to the top, I'll lower a rope. The logic seemed solid. Okay. Tom reached for his HK MP5 submachine gun. 
Good luck. I'll hold the fort. Genevieve dropped her backpack to lighten the load. Taking the spare rope with her, she wrapped it over her shoulder and around her chest. After a very brief debate with Tom, she abandoned the spare ammunition and C4. Genevieve was one of those people who, having made a decision to do something, didn't waste any time. Tom watched her as she nimbly climbed the series of helictites, maneuvering with the grace and fortitude of a professional rock climber. In total, it took less than five minutes to reach the top, secure a rope, and throw it back down. Tom grabbed the dangling rope, clipped his hand and foot ascenders. The devices had a toothed cam, which clamped the rope when the ascender was weighted, creating a solid point to climb upward. The ascenders glide friction-free up the rope, but as soon as you step on it or pull on it with your hand, the cam rocks backward and the small teeth of the ascender bite into the rope. Tom put his foot onto the ascender and took his first step. In the distance, down the tunnel, someone shouted, Stay where you are! Chapter 51 Tom reached for his submachine gun. A split second later, someone started shooting at him. He returned fire with a quick burst from the HK MP5. Shots raked the tunnel in rapid-fire succession, filling the tunnel with the echoes of submachine gun fire. Tom didn't wait to see if he'd hit anyone. He clipped his MP5 to his belt and kept climbing. Ascending took a lot of effort. Think something like climbing a ladder where gravity is twice as powerful, and in between each round of pulling yourself upward, you needed to then move the ladder's horizontal slats upward again. Every muscle hurt. He clambered over the lip of the opening. Genevieve cut the rope a split second later. It wouldn't stop their pursuers for long. They would most likely discover the helictites made for an easy climb, but it would at least slow them down. Tom drew a breath of the freezing cold air, turning around to see they were surrounded by ice-covered sea in all directions. There was a drizzle in the air. Cold sleet rained down upon them. Seconds later, Tom heard the echoes of voices and the heavy breathing of multiple people climbing hard. Genevieve aimed her MP5 submachine gun down the hole and fired a few short bursts. She backed away immediately afterward. Several shots from the enemy followed her. She exchanged a glance with Tom. Tom knew her well enough to know when to apologize. Yeah, I should have let you bring the C4. Always bring the C4. Genevieve shot him a chiding, I told you so kind of grin. Agreed. We need to find some way off this island, Tom said, staring out at the Tehila far in the distance. Should have taken the helicopter. Yeah, helicopters are good, too, Genevieve said, reaching for her satellite phone. Tom guarded the opening to the chasm. Genevieve made a call. She got through immediately. Elise, we need a hot extract with the helicopter. Meet us on the top of the outcrop. A puzzled grin touched Tom's lips. Since when did Elise learn to fly the Eurocopter? Since you and Sam were in Africa looking for the lost shipwreck of the Midas. Really? Yeah. We ended up in lockdown and I taught Elise to fly as we were bored. Tom pictured the complex machine, surrounded by detailed instruments and an innate skill that required years to perfect years that he'd spent learning such a skill, to be exact. Elise learned to fly the Eurocopter during three months of lockdown? No, she read a few flight manuals, too. I taught her the practical skills in a day. Elise descended from the Master Builders, a genetically advanced race that had been instrumental in many of mankind's advances throughout the ages. Elise was probably the fastest learner Tom had ever met, and he was surrounded by some of the smartest, most capable people on earth. Tom snorted. Obviously. Two people clambered out of the tunnel opening. 
Genevieve squeezed the trigger, raking them both across the chest. They managed to squeeze off several harmless shots, but they were both dead before they hit the ground. Tom said, What do you think? I think they outnumber us, and it's only a matter of time before they overtake this hill. We don't have anywhere to hide or take cover. We're sitting ducks. Tom eyed the freezing water far below. He considered jumping. Maybe they could swim back into the sea cave, retrieve the scorpion, and get the hell out of Dodge. He looked at Genevieve. What do you want to do? Genevieve grinned. How much dragon's breath did that Spanish bitch use inside the emperor's tomb? Tom had a bad feeling about this. The science was dubious. Dr. Ashley Calder had been adamant in her conclusion. If mercury stopped the subatomic particle implosion and chain reaction, water would too. Yet the question lingered. Could she have been wrong? The shooting became a fierce melee of chipped ice and stone, wildly firing bullets, the smell of cordite, and non-stop noise. All too soon, Tom and Genevieve were down to their last few rounds. It was only a matter of time before they got overrun. Now or never. He opened the ancient Chinese satchel, pouring a tiny amount onto his Kevlar-gloved hand, and then... Mimicking the leader of the European coalition, he blew the iridescent dust down into the rocky crevasse. Chapter 52 The explosion rocked the entire island. A clap of thunder rose from the icy chasm, just about deafening him. An icy shockwave followed knocking him back like a rogue wave. He hit the ground on his back. A few seconds later, he felt the now familiar, surreal tug on his body, pulling him toward the explosion. Tom fought against it. The sensation felt not only wrong, but fundamentally unnatural, like some sort of evil wraith dragging his soul under. Terrified of losing her, he grabbed Genevieve's hand, struggling against that tide with every fiber of his being. Then, like last time, it was over as quickly as it had begun. The inexorable pull popped away, releasing them both. His senses snapped back. His ears were filled with hellish sounds of wails and screams. A single iridescent fire devil began to form. It climbed out from the black cavity, swirling into a thirty-foot spiral that rose high above the island. Unlike the miniature tornado Tom had seen within the Emperor's tomb back in Xi'an, the strong, well-formed, and presumably short-lived whirlwind climbed well above thirty feet. Fueled by the heat of the explosion, it spun rapidly, catching dust and everything around it in its vertical motion. Genevieve's eyes were wide with awe. Her military side was impressed by the open display of power. The fire devil looked more like a living specter than a natural weather phenomenon involving a vertically oriented rotating column of wind. This one was translucent, but as sunlight cast down upon it, the storm reflected all the colors of the rainbow like a prism magnified by intermittent bursts of red, orange, blue, green, and even white flames. It looked sinister and unnatural. Evil. The vortex carried with it the screams of agony and terror from the soldiers who had been following them below. If this didn't represent Dante's inferno, nothing did. In the distance, the Eurocopter took off from the helipad. The air reeked of burning brimstone. The ground radiated the heat of a blast furnace. The earth started to crumble apart within the blast zone, breaking down into smaller rocks. Tom stared at the blasted rock, steaming and awash with a swirl of mist. The drizzling rain hissed and spattered as it struck. As they watched, a large boulder crumbled apart within the blast zone, 
breaking down into smaller rocks. The face of the island began to do the same, disintegrating into a flow of boulders and sand. Hard stone had become loose sandstone, vulnerable and weak. The island was no longer solid, more like ground pepper. Then it began moving. Grains of rock jittered and trembled. He watched a small pebble on the surface dissolve into coarse sand, then into a dusty powder. A drop of rain struck the ground and blasted a crater. Like a pebble hitting a still pond, ripples spread outward across the microfine surface. Tom shook his head in disbelief. Fearful, he studied where the blast zone ended and solid ground began. As he stared, the bordering edge of stone crumbled to sand, incrementally expanding the blast zone. Genevieve said, We've got to get off this landmass. Tom started to move toward the opposite end of the island. Run! The whole area began to disintegrate and sink. Down low, the Eurocopter raced alongside them. Sprinting, Genevieve shouted, Jump! just as she leaped through the air. Running at full speed, Tom took one more step and jumped. The ground beneath them fell away. Sixteen fingers and two sets of thumbs clung to the helicopter's landing skids. They hung underneath the rising Eurocopter, making a daring escape like heroes in an action movie. Genevieve, closer and fueled by adrenaline, reached up and caught the handle of the door. Her feet planted firmly on the skid, she slid the door open and fell inside onto her hands and knees. Behind her, Tom pulled himself up and rolled inside the cabin. Pushing to their feet inside the cabin, Elise turned to give them a thumbs up before turning back to continue flying. Tom and Genevieve stood in the open doorway, panting as though having just run a race, which, when you think about it, they had. They had been running for their life. Hearts pounding and ears ringing, they both looked down, just in time to see the last of the rocky outcrop disintegrate. It disappeared beneath the surface of the sea, water rushing in to envelop it whole. We made it, Genevieve gasped. Yeah, Tom agreed, but then he laughed out loud, barely able to stop his sudden burst of hysteria. It was a combination of shock, astonishment, heady relief, and a wicked sense of humor. We made it, but who's going to tell Sam that his new scorpion didn't? Chapter 53 Jigakudani, Nagano, Japan Twin Yamaha SX Venom snowmobiles shot through the snow. They left the small hot spring village of Kanbayashi Ansan and followed the tourist trail into the mountain into the snow monkey. It was the only way into the mountain range. The powerful two-stroke 400cc engines whined as their riders took them as high into their RPMs as they dared. The snowmobiles rode single file along the narrow, winding path, surrounded by a thick forest of conifers and maples dressed in snow as they climbed into the Jigakudani mountain range. Reaching the stairs that lined the empty gatehouse to the national park, Sam Riley slowed the snowmobile, pointed its strike single-keel ski up the stairs, and gunned the throttle. The engine rang out, and the Venom snowmobile, propelled by the 121-inch Camso hacksaw track, shot up the stairs and into the main tourist attraction. Sam drove the snowmobile up, parking near the hot springs. He idled for a few seconds, then cut the engine. He hoped to avoid spooking the snow monkeys as they groomed themselves and played in the onsen, a Japanese hot spring, or a resort that has developed around a hot spring. Dr. Ashley Calder pulled up next to him. She glanced at the snow monkeys. 
Technically, they were Japanese macaque and shared a habitat on four different islands of varied temperatures. But the group in front of them were, colloquially, and by the rest of the world, referred to as snow monkeys, because they lived in ground covered in snow most of the year and survived by warming themselves in the local hot spring. They ran around with total ease, unstartled by the arrival of two snowmobiles. They played, wrestled, and groomed each other, foraged for food, and nursed their young. They had thick brownish-gray fur, short tails, and distinctive pinkish-red faces that gave them the appearance of someone who'd spent time in a hot spring that was way too hot. A couple of them toyed with bamboo stalks. There were no signs of bamboo in the area, and Sam guessed the local rangers sometimes provided the monkeys with the bamboo as a gift. Ashley's breath misted against the icy, cold air, her eyes wide with joy. Sam stared at a line of five pink-faced monkeys, each picking at the next monkey's hair. Ugly-looking creatures, aren't they? Ashley laughed. Hey, I think they're cute. Cute? Ugly? Sam shrugged. It's a fine line sometimes. I like them, she said, retrieving her neutrino detector. She placed it on the ground and switched it on. The thing started to beep. A couple of monkeys, startled by the sound, jumped like a cat might do, and either ran up a nearby tree or jumped into the hot spring. The older ones displayed no sign of fear. Sam suppressed a grin. He looked over Ashley's shoulder. The arrow was pointing to the east, farther uphill. Sam nodded. Shall we? Yeah, let's go. The twin snowmobiles left the tourist section, riding across the snow-covered wooden bridge that crossed the boiling river and headed high into the Jigokudani. The name Jigokudani translates to mean Hell's Valley, it was easy to see the source of its etymology, given the fact that steam and boiling water bubbles out of small crevices in the frozen ground, surrounded by steep cliffs and formidably cold and hostile forests. It took twenty minutes to arrive at the top of the mountain range. They reached a snow-drenched field, intermittently pockmarked with jarring crevasses, where boiling water fed underground creeks, and steam rose like a dragon breathing. Ashley brought the snowmobile to a stop. Sam stopped next to her. He watched her go through the steps to check the neutrino detector again. A moment later, she stepped off the snowmobile and turned around, confused. Sam asked, What is it? Ashley shook her head. I don't know. He turned his arms outward. Where does the detector think it is? She handed him the neutrino detector. Here, look at this. Sam stared at the device. The arrow was slowly turning in a counterclockwise direction. A puzzled frown creased his brow. What does that mean? Ashley bit her lower lip. If I had to guess, I'd say the dragon's breath deposit is directly below us. Below us? Sam looked around, searching for a nearby chasm or something. How far? No way to tell, she admitted. Just below us, somewhere. Sam looked around. There's nothing here. I don't know what to say. Sam grabbed the shovel from the side of the snowmobile. He went to work digging away the snow. It was soft and easy to move. After a few minutes, his effort slowed and Ashley took over. Together, they worked the snow until they reached solid ground, two feet below. It was igneous rock. Not particularly surprising, given the fact the entire region was once volcanic. Sam held his breath. Well, we're not getting through that today. No, Ashley agreed. She turned around, her eyes sweeping the field before landing on a boiling crater some twenty feet away. She grinned. I have an idea. Sam said, what is it? 
We haven't a clue if this is a natural mineral or a hidden storage of the Chinese dragon's breath. Okay, what are you getting at? She dismissed him with the wave of her hand. Just hear me out. Okay, shoot. Working on the theory, one of the Qin Emperor's alchemists hid the dragon's breath here, or gifted it to the Japanese emperor at the time, who then concealed it here. She drew a breath, pausing as she tried to find the right words to explain her next idea. Whoever hid it needed a way to reach it. They didn't just bury it and then place a piece of igneous rock the size of a bus on top, right? Right. So, how did they get down there? You're positive your neutrino detector is working? Certain. You have to remember, neutrinos can travel through matter. This detector could pinpoint the location of this power source from the other side of the globe. Trust me, there's no chance it's wrong. Okay, so how do we get down there? Ashley pointed to the nearby gap in the snow where water boiled and steam rose. Sam's eyes drifted along the field, making sense of it all now. There were more than a dozen similar such openings scattered around through the field in a disordered fashion. But upon seeing it now, he realized there was an order to it all. The craters tracked the Jigokudani River, a superheated stream that meandered down the aptly named Hell Valley. Ashley said, The question is, given that we know where Dragon's Breath has been buried, what do you want to do about it? There is only one thing to do. Sam set his jaw with determination. We'll have to go to hell. Chapter 54 Heat rose from the jagged gash in the snow. It looked like a crucible containing a melting pot of molten metals. Sam tentatively neared the opening. Steam filtered through, puffing like the hot breath of a dragon. He reached out, carefully sensing just how hot the rising gas was. Any elementary school kid will tell you that water converts from a liquid to a gas at 212 degrees Fahrenheit. Add more heat, it won't get hotter. But that's hot enough to burn your skin and deadly to breathe. Likewise, reduce the temperature and it will return to a state of liquid. Sam had to know if he was looking at steam or just rising warm air. He held his breath and carefully reached in and touched the rising air. It was fog. Warm, dry air flowed freely above the boiling hot water of the Jigokurini. When that air hit the cold, moist air above, the dew point rises and it creates high humidity and forms fog. In this case, the temperature difference between the warm air below and the freezing air on the surface made it appear like steam. Ashley exchanged a glance. What do you think? It's warm, but not deadly. We can descend into that thing? Yes. Sam removed his backpack and withdrew a long rope. He tied the rope to a nearby pine tree and threw the tail end of the rope into the cavern of melted ice. They put on their harnesses and geared up. He threw the shovel down into the creek below. It wasn't deep, just over twenty feet, and filled with several ledges. Sam guessed, if they had to, they probably could have climbed without the rope. Still, he wasn't taking any chances. He looked at Ashley. You ever been abseiling? She nodded. Once. School camp. It was a long time ago. Any problems? No? All right, great. It's just like riding a bike. If you forget what to do, gravity will help you reach the bottom. She shot him a baleful smile. Not funny. It's okay. The descender has an automatic locking mechanism. Once you're attached, there's no way you can fall. That sounds better. A couple minutes later, Sam leaned back over the frosty lip and descended all the way down to the boiling river far below. Sunlight from multiple openings in the ice above the creek formed a network of skylights, 
and an arctic blue radiated throughout the entire ice tunnel that traced the creek. The river turned out to be little more than a creek. It was interspersed with thousands of rocks that worked as stepping stones. The creek melted the ice that had formed above it and allowed a shallow headroom. It was just big enough for Sam and Ashley to walk through, bending over just a little. Ashley still carried her neutrino detector. She double-checked its reading. The arrow pointed northeast. Ashley pointed north, upriver. That way. Okay, Sam said, picking up the shovel. Let's go get this thing. They followed the creek for forty or so feet. On their right, heading due east, was an incoming creek. It was fed by a hot spring, and the boiling water carved a secondary tunnel that met. Ashley cross-checked the neutrino detector with the confluence. It was a perfect match. She grinned. We're on track. They quickly covered the small amount of ground on the new ice tunnel and found themselves in a surprisingly large chamber, at the center of which hot water boiled out from some underground spring, the heat causing the nearby ice to melt. Due to the altitude, the entire place was frozen all year round. Sam stared at the chamber. A faint blue glow entered through the thick ice. The hot water was shallow and littered with the charcoal-colored basalt found throughout the region. Ashley set up the neutrino detector once more. It pointed south. Sam's eyes followed the arrow. A small gap, no wider than one's laptop computer, was lined with slightly different color stone. Sam reached into the water and picked up one of the stones. It was hot, but tolerable. He held it up to his face and stared at it. What is it? Andesite. As opposed to basalt. Right. They look the same. It was a statement, not a question. They do, Sam agreed. But? They're both igneous, but one belongs here and one doesn't. In fact, one is highly common in Japan. The other is predominantly found... Let me guess. Ashley held her index finger up in front of his face. China. Exactly. Whoever buried Dragon's Breath here went to the trouble of bringing stones from home to mark the spot, just like a pirate might do with the letter X. Sam removed the stones by hand and then began to dig. On his third go, the tip of the shovel hit metal. He cleared the surrounding gravel-like sand and was soon rewarded with the outline of a bronze chest. It was adorned with intricately carved pieces of jade. He dug a knife into the joint and pried the chest open with a crack. Inside was a silk bag, identical to the one found in the emperor's tomb. He checked the contents just to be sure, and then, having confirmed it to be Dragon's Breath Powder, he secured the silk bag in his Kevlar bag, brought for that purpose, and placed that in his backpack. They retraced their steps. The exit was easy to climb. They didn't need ascenders. Instead, they used the rope to help balance and prevent themselves from slipping as they climbed the series of icy ledges. On the last ledge, Something made Sam hesitate from climbing out. He recognized the sound. It was the distinctive noise made by two-stroke engines, whining as they hit their power band in the high-range RPMs. There were at least a dozen snowmobiles approaching. They might have been a local tour of the region. It was possible. Ashley climbed up next to him. He placed a hand on her shoulder, preventing her from climbing out of the cavern. We have company. You think they're after the dragon's breath? I don't know yet. Just wait a minute. If they are, they'll come right here in a minute. No way to hide where we've been when our footprints in the snow lead right to us. The snowmobiles all stopped. Their engines were switched off, and their riders alighted. Ashley said, they still might be a tour group. 
Sam did a quick turkey peek to view the newcomers without being seen. Only if tour groups carry submachine guns. Chapter 55 They quickly clambered down to the bottom of the ice chasm. Sam said, We need to find another way out of here. See if we're able to get out through another opening. Sounds good. They walked north along the boiling river, moving quickly, jumping from stone to stone. They skipped the first six openings and then found what they were looking for. It was a natural rocky waterfall along the stream, with multiple ledges on the side of it. Sam climbed up first. At the top, he looked back at the riders. There were fifteen in total. These people weren't taking any chances. The riders had already begun their descent into the ice cavern, having followed his and Ashley's footprints in the snow. The snowmobiles were all down past them, yet there was a single snowmobile still making its rounds, circling higher above. Ashley glanced over the edge of the snow. Any ideas? His eyebrows rose, a mischievous sparkle in his eyes. You don't know me very well. If you did, you would know that I'm full of ideas. Okay, she said cautiously. Tell me one. We're going to steal that snowmobile and make a run for it. Gazing upward, a puzzled expression crossed her face. How are we going to do that? I'll think of something. The rider stopped. He parked the snowmobile and began walking toward them. Sam reached for his Glock, wishing he'd brought something bigger. He and Ashley ducked down, waiting. Large flakes of snow were falling, and there was a slender crust of snow over the top of the waterfall. The rider stood just above it. Sam stood up, punching through the thin snow. Grabbing the rider's leg, he pulled hard. The rider screamed and toppled down into the rocky ground far below them. Sam said, Let's go. Together they ran to the snowmobile, a Polaris switchback assault. A powerful scooter, Sam knew it performed well on trail and off. Ashley automatically jumped at the controls. You shoot, I'll steer. Deal. She pressed the start button. Sam climbed up behind her, wrapping his arms around Ashley's narrow waist. They still needed to get past the group of riders, most of which were currently looking for them underground. Ashley started the engine, and suddenly the Polaris accelerated hard, racing along the back of the snowfield. Two people, having heard the rider scream as he fell, climbed out. They reached for their weapons. Sam aimed the Glock from the speeding sled. He fired. Three shots. The first bullet hit the rider closest to them in the lower abdomen. His adversary fell to the ground, most likely dead. He missed the other man completely, both times. The second rider yelled out, jumped onto a snowmobile, and then took chase. They're coming, Sam shouted. Faster! Go as fast as you can! Ashley didn't need to be told twice. Revving the engine, she pushed the Polaris through the minefield. It was riddled with loose snow, giant chasms, and a swath of boiling hell holes where steam and bubbles rose from small crevices in the frozen ground. If they hit any one of them, they would fall to their deaths. The Polaris jumped around like a motocross bike. They needed to get off the mountain. There was only one way in and out of the National Park, and that was past the snow monkeys. Up ahead, another rider approached from further down the mountain. Sam swore. How many people do our opponents have? The path was narrow. Sam leaned over Ashley's slim frame and shot the rider twice in the torso. The rider collapsed, but his snowmobile kept running toward them. The path was too tight to avoid it. Ashley saw the inevitable head-on collision. Not happy with the laws of physics? Change the laws! Ashley darted to the left, riding up and over the snow-covered embankment on the trail. The Polaris took off, flying high through the air, and landed off-trail on the downward slope of the snow-covered forest. Ashley began weaving the snowmobile through the series of trees and branches. 
Submachine gun fire raked the trees to their left. Sam looked over his shoulder to get a quick glance at his pursuers. Three riders now. Sam took two shots, but the rounds went wide. It was near impossible to hit anything while turning backward on a speeding snowmobile as it raced precariously down a steep embankment. One of the riders miscalculated his angle and slammed into a tree. The force probably killed him instantly. Two more to go. The hill became steep, so steep they were part falling, part riding down it. No chance they could stop. Up ahead, a small river came into view. Sam squeezed Ashley's waist. She shouted, I see it, and immediately opened the throttle up to full, making a beeline for the river. Sam said, What the hell are you doing? Getting us out of here, she replied. Just hold on tight. The Polaris hit a built-up section of snow just before the river. Ashley angled the snowmobile. It was vital to take the jump straight on. The twin skis hit the packed ice. All the downward force changed direction, and the suspension dipped as low as it could go, all the way down. Ashley gave one last burst of the throttle. The hacksaw tracks on the snowmobile, those cutting edges for good forward and lateral bite on hard-packed snow, spun wildly and their snowmobile left the confines of gravity, momentarily flying free as a bird. Chapter 56 The snowmobile landed hard. Sam tensed, trying to hold on and stay balanced. The machine wobbled for endless seconds. He was afraid the entire thing was going to roll. Somehow, using some sort of weird voodoo physicist trick, Ashley managed to defy the laws of physics and keep control. They raced past the wooden bridge. It crossed the Jigakudini, where boiling water flowed freely some thirty feet below. From that vantage point, Sam could see more riders racing up the tourist path from the village of Kanbayashi Onsen. He tapped Ashley's shoulder. Reinforcements. Oh, crap. How many more of these guys are there? These guys are well funded. Ashley's eyes darted in all directions. She looked back over her shoulder. We're trapped. I have an idea. Of course you do. Bring the snowmobile around to the hot springs. What? Her tone was incredulous, but she did as he asked. It was snowing heavily now. About thirty snow monkeys, with their bright pinkish-red faces, watched on as though Sam and Ashley were starring in the best show of their lives. Sam hoped they were giving them a good show, just not one of those movies where the good guys die in the end. Ashley brought the snowmobile to a stop beside the hot springs. Now what? Get in the hot spring. She ran her eyes across the series of terraced hot springs. There were trees or places to hide. In the hot springs, they would be sitting ducks. She frowned. Are you sure you want to be using a spa at a time like this? Just get in. Don't step out of the water. I have a plan. All right, all right. I trust you. I just hope you're not going to get me killed. Sam said, me too. Ashley jumped into the water, slowly moving to the back of the hot springs. The monkeys made a few bleating sounds at the strange intruder before quickly becoming indifferent. Sam positioned the snowmobile toward the bridge. He opened the throttle all the way to full and then locked it in position. He pointed the skids toward the bridge. The snowmobile shot forward. It raced toward the bridge. Then it slammed into its wooden railings, rotten from years in the snow. The railing splintered and the snowmobile fell some thirty feet into the boiling water below. From the safety of the hot spring, Sam could see the snowmobile floating down the river. He waded into the back of the hot springs behind the monkeys. Ashley said, Now what? Sam grabbed two long bamboo stalks. They were hollow inside and roughly six foot tall. He handed one to Ashley. Use this to breathe. 
Remember to breathe in through your mouth and out through your nose. Otherwise, you'll keep re-breathing the same air trapped in the pipe, and you'll end up suffocating. Right. Ashley got the picture. I'll try and remember that. Good. They moved to the very back of the hot spring. Sam whispered, Ready? Wait, how long do we stay under for? Sam said, As long as we can. With that, they slowly dipped under the warm water, keeping themselves submerged by holding onto a small rocky alcove. Bubbles flowed, and Sam got comfortable. If he was going to have to wait, he may as well enjoy a much-needed break, soaking in the warm water and free-flowing bubbles. They ended up waiting nearly two hours. It was dark by the time they surfaced. Their attackers, having accepted the ruse, were long gone. Sam and Ashley laughed at each other as every inch of each other's skin was wrinkled like a prune. It was a cold, wet walk in the darkness along the mile-long trail back to Kanbayashi Onsen. But they would live. Thankfully, their core temperatures had risen during their long soak in the hot springs, which they both appreciated. On the way back to town, Sam asked, Where the hell did you learn to ride like that? Portland, Oregon. Really? Ashley smiled, her eyes filled with fond and distant memories. Yeah, my grandmother taught me to ride at Mount Hood when I was just a kid. I've loved it ever since. Chapter 57 Matsumoto Castle, Nagano, Japan It was painted black and had been since its erection in 1595. The color gave the castle a brooding, somber image designed to sow fear into the hearts of approaching attackers. Matsumoto Castle had six floors, including the obligatory hidden floor, where the samurai soldiers once rested and kept their food and powder supplies. Built in the middle of a lake, its defenses included an extensive system of interconnecting walls, moats, and gatehouses. In the darkness, Sam and Ashley, having bribed the night's security guard to allow them into the castle, climbed the six stories. Sam glanced out from the top floor, where a striking vista of the southern Alps lined the night sky. Ashley withdrew the bag of dragon's breath and began to set up a small array of chemistry equipment including beakers, funnels, crucibles, as well as a high-end burner capable of reaching extreme temperatures. She set them all out inside a wooden crate, which she filled with water so that any mistakes she made with the dragon's breath would, hopefully, be immediately extinguished. Sam watched her. Tell me again why you chose one of Japan's oldest heritage buildings to test a material we know is capable of destroying everything in its path. Ashley gave him a patient look. Because Matsumoto Castle happens to be constructed in the middle of a lake. If things go wrong, the Japanese government are going to execute us for destroying their priceless national monument. Better that than leveling their entire island. Touché. A few minutes later, Sam's cell phone rang. He answered it, leaving Ashley to make sense of the strange iridescent powder. It was the Secretary of Defense. She spoke without preamble. We've discovered the identity of the two goons you executed in Louisiana. They worked as bodyguards and enforcers to the Infinity Group. Who were they? A global property investment group. They're big players owned by a tight group of European investment gurus. They have real estate all around the world, but the majority of owners are here in the U.S. Interesting. What the hell do they have to do with Dragon's Breath? No idea. Have they done anything unusual recently? Do you mean has the company done anything suspicious? Yeah. Like what? I don't know. Have they started to buy up something or sell something, anything that might suggest a hostile takeover? No, nothing. It looks like their thing has remained steady for the past few years. Sam frowned. 
Okay. See if your people in intelligence can keep digging. Maybe go back further. Locate where some of their larger, older land purchases have been. We know Dragon's Breath has the ability to reshape or destroy large land masses. Maybe they're looking at getting richer by changing the shape of land masses. It's a possibility. Sam said, one more thing. Shoot. Do you have a photo of the company's board of directors? Sure. The secretary drew a breath. I'm messaging it to you now. Sam glanced at the image of the company's board of directors. His eyes scanned across a group of Europeans, French, Spanish, and German. They were all young and good-looking, much younger than he expected. New money. His eyes landed on the CEO. There was no way he could forget those big dark eyes and that mass of black hair. She was strikingly beautiful. Sam swore. The secretary said, What is it? The CEO, he said, shaking his head. I've met her before. Where? Sam exhaled. Inside the Emperor Qin Shi Huang's tomb. Chapter 58 Sam watched Ashley work her magic. She appeared to be playing with her makeshift science lab like a kid after Christmas. She had the golden tome on a set of scales and was trying to make sense of something. After a few minutes, she beamed. Archimedes' principle! Sam suppressed a grin. Come again? Archimedes' principle states that the upward buoyant force that is exerted on a body immersed in a fluid, whether fully or partially, is equal to the weight of the fluid that the body displaces. Sam, not sure where she was going with this, said, Okay. The buoyant force which always opposes gravity is nevertheless caused by gravity. Fluid pressure increases with depth because of the gravitational weight of the fluid above. This increasing pressure applies a force on a submerged object that increases with depth. The result is buoyancy. You would be surprised, as a scuba diver and an expert who spent more time at sea than on land, how I actually understand all this. Sam turned the palms of his hands outward. I just don't get what this has to do with Dragon's Breath or the map. Ashley said, The map. We can work out how much of the map is gold and how much is Dragon's Breath. How? She started to explain using words he needed to look up. Sam stopped her. Actually, why is that important? Look, I've run some tests. Dragon's breath burns at a ridiculously high temperature. In fact, it's hotter than anything I can produce here. I think the alchemists of ancient China made the original map out of dragon's breath and then concealed it in gold for safekeeping. That's some expensive wrapping. It is. The question is, how much gold could there be? How the hell should we know how much it should weigh if it were solid gold? I don't know. Do you have an equal amount of solid gold? Sam smiled. Hey, I might be rich, but I'm not so vain to carry gold ingots around with me. What do you want me to do? Make a call to Fort Knox? She lifted a hand to stop him. That's all right. We can measure the map's dimensions and then work out how much it should weigh. Sam asked, What do you think? Ashley's eyes narrowed. If I had to guess? Yeah. I'd say there's another material inside. Something much lighter than gold. Most things are lighter than gold, but there's only one thing that's much lighter than gold. Sam's eyes widened. Dragon's breath. Exactly. But what could the proportions be? Eighty to twenty in favor of dragon's breath. Why? Sam shrugged. I've had a little to do with carrying gold over the years, mainly in ingots and old coins. But if I had to guess, I'd say this gold is close to a fifth as heavy as I would expect it to be. No, that doesn't work. Why not? If the weight was one-fifth of what it should be, 
then that would assume that the inside of this map was hollowed, not filled with dragon's breath. Okay, so maybe the proportions are off. It would be impossible to know. Impossible to know for certain. But I think we'll be able to make an educated guess somehow. The answer is just waiting to be found. Okay, but what if the thing really is just hollow? She shook her head. I considered that, but it isn't. Sam arched an eyebrow. You're certain? Yes. Then before he could ask why, she said, There's no timpani. Right. Sam nodded in agreement, a mildly perplexed look across his face. Timpani? It's actually a medical word. For a stone? No. Generally used for assessing abdominal sounds. Obviously, Sam said, in a manner that suggested it was anything but. Ashley went on to explain. When doctors and nurses assess a person's abdomen, they often use percussion. It consists of tapping on the body wall and eliciting a sound that has different pitches for different structures. The changes in pitch differ depending upon the organ being percussed. Timpani refers to the resonant sound typically heard over air-filled structures, such as the small intestine and the large intestine. Dullness is typically heard over fluid or solid organs, such as the liver or spleen, which can be used to determine the margins of the liver and spleen. Sam smiled and met her eyes with a candid and direct gaze. And, in this case, it's a stony, dull sound. Sam spread his arms, which makes sense, given it's made of gold, which is in fact a stone. Ha ha, Ashley said, suppressing a smile and folding her arms across her chest, suggesting it's solid stone, not hollow. Okay, so we're back to working out the proportions of dragon's breath, assuming there is some inside, right? Yeah, what about... Yin and Yang. Come again? In ancient Chinese philosophy, Yin and Yang referred to dark light or negative positive. It's a philosophical concept that contrary forces may actually be complementary, interconnected, and interdependent in the natural world, and how they may give rise to each other as they interrelate to one another. Right, Sam said. In Chinese cosmology, the universe creates itself out of a primary chaos of material energy, organized into the cycles of yin and yang, and formed into objects and lives. Yin is the receptive and yang the active principle, seen in all forms of change and difference, such as the annual cycle, winter and summer, the landscape, north-facing shade and south-facing brightness, sexual coupling, female and male, and socio-political history, disorder and order. Okay, Sam said, and waited for her to continue. Ashley gave this some thought. If we were working on the principle of natural dualities, how would that relate with the map? Sam said, as far as I can tell, it stands to reason that gold is the light and dragon's breath is the darkness. It has to be as everything it touches disappears, as if down a black hole of nothingness. Ashley thought about that analogy. That could work. Sam smiled. It's fifty-fifty. Let's test it. Together, they place the map into a tub of water. Then, subtract the weight of dragon's breath. The number came out almost exactly... Of course, she said. This is all still hypothetical. The fact remains, we might have the proportions completely wrong, not to mention the elements. There could be aluminum or titanium, either of which are ultralight metals. It's right. It makes sense. Still just a hypothesis until we test it. She made a coy smile. But I think you're right. We have our answer. Okay, so now what? Now we melt the gold away and hope to hell it reveals its secrets. How do we do that? 
Traditionally, I believe you melt gold with a fire. Sam shook his head. No, no, I mean, how do we do that without igniting the dragon's breath and causing some sort of deadly explosion? It won't. You're certain? Fairly, she said in a voice that failed to fill him with confidence given they were playing with something infinitely more dangerous than uranium. Dragon's breath responds to an electrical current, not heat. During the experiments performed on the barge, we never even managed to create enough heat to melt the material. It certainly has a higher melting point than gold. Sam was about to ask where they should go to get the thing tested when Ashley's cell phone rang. She answered it, spoke for a few minutes. Her voice was sharp and crisp. Without hearing a word said, Sam could tell that whatever news she was receiving was serious. When she finished, Sam asked, What is it? We can forget about the map for the time being. Why? We have bigger problems. What? That was my assistant at the Neutrino Observatory back in Kauai. Sam's jaw tightened. He knew where this was going. What did she say? That massive burst of neutrinos released from the first implosion caused by Dragon's Breath has begun to trigger secondary nuclear reactions in other places around the world. What do you mean? I thought you said there were trillions of these neutrinos flying through the air every second, and they have no mass. They simply pass through things. They normally do. So what's going wrong? This is different. Dragon's Breath releases unimaginable amounts of neutrinos. And given enough neutrinos, they start to add up and do what? Well, for one thing left unattended, they can cause a smoldering nuclear pile to flare up again, kind of like pouring gasoline into a fire, or the way a blacksmith uses bellows to force air into a forge to flame the fire. Only in this case, it's not a campfire. It's a nuclear reactor. There's only one major nuclear reactor that's been left smoldering unattended for decades. Oh, shit, Sam swore. You're talking about Chernobyl. Yes, and right now, some of the greatest nuclear physicists and the only ones capable of fixing this mess have all been kidnapped by terrorists, hell-bent on unlocking the secrets of Dragon's Breath. So where does that leave us? Ashley drew a breath. I don't know. Is there any chance you could get me inside Chernobyl? Chapter 59 Sam felt a lump in his throat. Whoa! You're serious? Afraid so, Ashley said, her voice matter-of-fact. Can you get me inside the reactor? Inside a uranium-filled tank, surrounded by deadly radiation, about to flare up in its nuclear reaction? He gave that a thought. Hmm. I don't see why not. Good. Ashley stood up. We'd better get a move on if we're going to avoid a nuclear meltdown that will be felt by Europe for another hundred years. Wait. A puzzled frown creased Sam's lips. How will you prevent the meltdown? Traditionally, power stations use water to regulate such things. If it was that easy, why do they need a nuclear physicist to solve their problems? Because it's not. So what is your plan? Ashley smiled, picked up the bag of dragon's breath, and said, I'm going to fight evil with evil. What about other nuclear reactors? Ashley shrugged. What about them? Will these massive neutrino spikes trigger them to flare up? Probably, but it's not a problem. Why not? A working nuclear reactor already has steps in place to moderate the nuclear reaction, such as control rods and water. What about Fukushima? The accumulating water had been stored in tanks at the Fukushima Daiichi plant since 2011, 
when a massive earthquake and tsunami damaged its reactors and their cooling water became contaminated and began leaking. TEPCO says its water storage capacity of 1.37 million tons will be full around the fall of 2022. Steps are already in place to exchange these water stage facilities and, in doing so, control any flare-up that might have been caused by the recent release of Dragon's Breath. Sam said, Okay, so that just leaves Chernobyl? Right. You said traditionally you would need some sort of control rod to absorb the neutrons and moderate the rapidly progressing nuclear reaction? That's right but there's no way we are going to be able to get these in before the power plant turns into a full nuclear meltdown. That's right. You got a plan? Ashley smiled. Yeah, I'm thinking of using some of this dragon's breath to shut down Chernobyl's reactor once and for all. Sam looked at her, meeting her eye with a candid gaze. Holy shit, you're serious. Afraid so. I know this is more your line of expertise, but isn't that just going to create some sort of super nuclear reaction? No, we know Dragon's Breath implodes atoms by removing all that subatomic dead space. So? She pursed her lips. So, if we allow Dragon's Breath to rip through what remains of Chernobyl's nuclear reactor, it should suck out all the space between the uranium atoms, causing it to become inert. Sam met her gaze. How certain are you? That I'm not going to cause the world's biggest nuclear accident? She asked with a wide, mocking grin. The thought did cross my mind, Sam admitted. It will work. Okay. What do I need to do? Not much, she shrugged. Just get me inside what remains of Chernobyl's nuclear reactor. Chapter 60. Chernobyl Power Plant, Pripyat, Ukraine. The Russian-made Kazan Ansat helicopter took off. It was a leftover from a time when Ukraine was part of the USSR, before the collapse of the Soviet Union. The helicopter flew across the haunting, desolate area of abandoned factories, schools, and houses. Overgrown concrete blocks loomed from the undergrowth of snow-covered conifer forests. Trees and foliage have overrun the once-bustling worker town, where near-derelict buildings hide amongst the overgrowth. In the pilot seat, Sam kept the helicopter steady as they cruised fast and low. A Ferris wheel and other children's facilities came into view, surrounded by a thick overgrowth of trees. They formed a poignant symbol of the hurried evacuation. They were part of a fairground set up for the Soviet May celebrations in the town of Pripyat, but would never be used as disaster struck on April 26, 1986. Herds of wild horses now run free, and packs of wolves have returned to roam the deserted land which has lain undisturbed by humans for nearly four decades. Up ahead, Sam spotted the Pripyat River, which fed the Chernobyl power plants, three miles northwest from its juncture with the Dnieper. He brought the helicopter down low and flew over the course of the river, using it as a visual aid to navigation. Along the banks of the Pripyat, Wild dogs ran as a pack through the thick forest of pine. Sam glanced at them, amazed by how healthy, happy, and free they appeared to be. Ashley said, The dogs don't bite, but they are still dangerous. These animals never leave here, and their fur can carry high levels of radiation, enough to be deadly to humans. Sam shook his head. Anyone who advocates nuclear power as a clean solution to global warming needs to visit this place. There are currently 440 nuclear power plants operating around the world, mostly without any problems. Nuclear power is safe? Yes, she paused. 
Mostly. Sam wasn't convinced. So what went wrong here? A whole long list of royal fuck-ups. Go on. Ashley's voice took on a solemn tone. History is littered with events that evoke powerful memories with the utterance of a single word. Apartheid, Dunkirk, Watergate, Hindenburg. The list goes on. Titanic, Sam said. She nodded. When it comes to evoking feelings of dread, there is one that fills the mind with a myriad of destructive imagery and apocalypse. That word is Chernobyl. You said, and I quote, there was a whole long list of royal fuck-ups. So what happened? Do you understand how a nuclear reactor works? Sam rolled his eyes. Are you seriously asking me that? She dismissed him with the wave of a hand. I mean the basic concepts. Try me. Better yet, let's say, I don't. Reactors use uranium for nuclear fuel. The uranium is processed into small ceramic pellets and stacked together into sealed metal tubes called fuel rods. Inside the reactor vessel, the fuel rods are immersed in water, which acts as both a coolant and a moderator. The moderator helps slow down the neutrons produced by fission to sustain the chain reaction. Control rods made from chemical elements such as boron, cadmium, silver, hafnium, or indium that are capable of absorbing many neutrons without themselves decaying can then be inserted into the reactor core to reduce the reaction rate or withdrawn to increase it. The heat created by fission turns the separate coolant water into steam, which spins a turbine to produce carbon-free electricity. Right. In the early hours of April 25, 1986, Chernobyl's operators begin reducing power at reactor number four in preparation for a safety test, which they had time to coincide with a routine shutdown for maintenance. The test was supposed to determine whether, in the event of a power failure, the plant's still spinning turbines could produce enough electricity to keep coolant pumps running during the brief gap before the emergency generators kick in. Ironically, this safety test brought about the reactor's ruin. It sounds like a disaster waiting to happen. It gets better, Ashley said facetiously. To ensure the fidelity of the test, the emergency cooling system was manually switched off before the safety test. Oh, dear. It wasn't until the next night when night shift staff were on duty and unaware of the upcoming test or its procedures, when the test officially commences. This was April 26th, 1986, at 1.23 a.m. Ashley drew a solemn breath. The test began, and an unexpected power surge occurred. Operators pressed the emergency shutdown button, but the control rods jammed as they entered the core. The first explosion, to be quickly followed by at least one more, blew the 1,000-ton roof right off the reactor, shooting a fireball high into the night sky, just 58 seconds after the safety test began. How long did it take them to get it under control? Official reports suggest radioactive emissions dropped sharply on the 6th of May, possibly because the fire in the core had burned itself out, but by then the damage had been done. The Soviet Union tried to deny the event at first, then admitted there had been an accident, but denied its severity. It wasn't until a few days after the disaster that Swedish air monitoring picked up the toxic plume and radiation sweeping across Europe. Soviet officials waited nearly 48 hours before issuing evacuation orders to the 115,000 residents in the nearby city of Pripyat. That's horrible. Uh-huh, she agreed. In 2006, Mikhail Gorbachev, the general secretary of the Soviet Union at the time of the accident, wrote that Chernobyl, even more than the launch of Perestroika, 
a political movement of reform within the Communist Party of the Soviet Union during the late 1980s involving glasnost, or open policy reform, was perhaps the real cause of the collapse of the Soviet Union. Sam paused, trying to picture the chaotic scene. If this was reactor number four, what happened to the other three reactors? Officials shut down reactor number three on the day of the disaster, to be followed the next morning by reactors numbers one and two. They were reopened months later. Wait. After Chernobyl went into a meltdown, they kept running the other three reactors? Ashley shrugged as though it made sense. Of course. Why? Weren't they afraid of the radiation? Sure they were. But these machines would have cost the equivalent of five to ten billion dollars apiece. No way was Ukraine going to abandon three of them. Even though right next door, reactor number four was still in a nuclear meltdown. She shrugged. Hey, no one said nuclear power didn't have some downsides. The massive concrete dome came into view. Sam brought the helicopter around, circling the site of the worst nuclear disaster in human history. Its gigantic 354-foot-high dome could cover the Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris and weighed 36,000 tons. Branded as the world's largest movable metal structure, the so-called New Safe. Reactor number four was positioned along the northeastern end of a large, purpose-built, engineered pond fed by the Pripyat River, which ran parallel. A series of rectangular canals surrounded the doomed reactor. From the air, the canals formed at right angles, giving it the appearance of a methodical maze. Sam brought the helicopter down near the remnants of the second-to-last one of those canals. There, a tunnel, just 15 feet underground, flowed to the very heart of the deadly number 4 reactor, and where they needed to dive, if they were to avert an even worse fate for the troubled reactor. Chapter 61 Sam planted the helicopter's skids on the snow-covered ground, then turned to Ashley with a wry grin. You can't say I don't take you to unique places, she snickered. That's true. He switched the engine off and waited for the rotor blades of the old Kazan Ansat Hilo to idle to a complete stop. He drew in what he imagined might be his last few breaths of trustworthy air before he opened the door to the outside world. Are you sure this is safe? Ashley flashed him an unrestrained smile. Sure. What could be dangerous about scuba diving the disused nuclear reactor of what remains the worst nuclear disaster in history? Forget I asked. Not to mention our exciting window of time. Thanks to Dragon's Breath and an excess of neutrinos, this reactor is currently coming back to life. It's like the embers of a dormant campfire being fed by a strong gust of wind and causing a forest fire. If left untreated, the resulting chain reaction will be capable of starting a conflagration as bad or worse than the original release of radioactive material. Sam sighed. Okay, can't have that. Ashley took a more moderate tone. Was there something in particular that's concerning you? Yeah, the ambient radiation levels. Oh, that, she said. Her voice almost relieved that was all that was bothering him. Don't worry about it. Do you mean don't worry about it because there's nothing we can do about it, or because we have bigger risks worth taking? Bit of both? She smiled at him in a teasing way. Honestly, though, the levels of radiation in Pripyat and the surrounding area, although far higher than the norm, are safe for the time you will be exposed to them. I wouldn't suggest licking things or eating, drinking anything. Also, stay away from plants. They all absorb radiation and are more likely to kill you. Sam arched an eyebrow. 
The plants will kill you? Afraid so? Sounds like the day of the triffids all over again. Ashley frowned, a blank expression playing out on her attractive face. Sam shrugged. Sorry, I guess the book was before your time. She dismissed it as a vague reference and said, Those who work within the zone typically work three weeks on, three weeks off. The off period must be spent outside of the zone. And they survive doing this? Generally. Ashley reached for the full-face dive mask that they'd brought. Besides, we're going to be underwater for most of our time here. Water acts as a natural nuclear moderator. Seriously, we should be safe. Very reassuring, Sam said, in a way that suggested it was anything but. Should we be carrying Geiger counters or something? Probably. But we're not? She locked eyes with his. Would the number change what we are about to do? Sam thought about that for a moment. No, it wouldn't. Forget Geiger counters. We're about to scuba dive inside a nuclear reactor. She shot him a devil-may-care grin. How amazing is that? I can't argue with that logic. Ten minutes later, they were suited up and ready to dive. Sitting inside the safety of the back of the helicopter, Sam double-checked his own gear before checking Ashley over. They were using single tanks and full-faced masks to prevent any of the toxic water from touching their mouths. In addition to scuba gear, they were using military-grade diver propulsion vehicles to shorten their passage through the moderator tunnels. He said, You're good to go. It's a shallow dive, and at these depths, we should have 90 minutes bottom time. Great. That should be more than enough to get in and get out. Sam said, You're comfortable with the dive? She thought about it for a minute. Yeah. How much diving have you done? I did a guided shore dive last year in Hawaii. Wait, you're not even certified? No, she shook her head. Didn't I mention that? Uh, no, you didn't. Ashley shrugged. Her jaw was set, her eyes filled with defiance. Look, we're trying to stave off a nuclear explosion that's capable of spewing toxic chemicals into the atmosphere at levels that will render Europe mostly uninhabitable for generations to come. So I think I can hold it together long enough to save the world. All right. He began to assemble his dive equipment and test its gauges. He switched on his diver propulsion vehicle. A little green light flashed from what could only be described as the dashboard on the handlebars of a motorcycle, indicating the device had a full battery. The device was basically a caged propeller attached to a pair of handlebars. It weighed just 18 pounds, but could propel him at six knots through the water. This switch here turns the DPV on. Sam pointed to the handlebars. This is the throttle. Works just like a motorbike. I know you're good with snowmobiles. Have you ridden a bike? I have a sports bike, a Ducati. Nice. It's pretty much the same thing, just a lot slower and underwater. I'll get the hang of it. Good. Now, at the front here, there's a heads-up display that provides various information, including compass direction and a sonar display of the area directly ahead. It is linked up with my DPV. So if you get lost, just find me and follow. Ashley looked at the screen, zeroing in on the image of a diver. A green diver? That's me. You're red on my display, by the way. Sam paused. Now, I've programmed the navigation system with the maps of the moderator pipes, so it should keep track of where you are within this maze. Assuming the pipes are still intact... Yeah. This whole thing hinges on them being intact. Any questions? Ashley shook her head. No. Nope. Good. Let's do this. Sam placed his full-faced mask on and stepped out of the safety of the helicopter into the dystopian world that awaited them at the base of Chernobyl. 
he took two steps through the snow to the side of the engineered pond. Sam exchanged a quick glance with Ashley. You have the dragon's breath? I've got it. It's all set, ready to go. Just get me into the nuclear reactor and I'll do the rest. Sam smiled, thinking he'd never heard quite as strange a sentence before. And with that thought, he stepped out into the cooling pond. Chapter 62 Icy, cool water rushed past his face mask. Sam adjusted his buoyancy control device until he was neutrally buoyant. A few seconds later, Ashley jumped into the water, sending the water white with bubbles. He waited a few seconds for things to settle. You okay? he asked through the built-in radio in the face mask. Cold as hell, but I'll live. All right, follow me. Sam slowly descended until the large moderator pipes came into view. There were four in total, each with a diameter of eight feet. They took the second one from the far right. Recent drone submersible images indicated it was the only pipe still fully intact. Here we go, Sam said, opening the electric throttle to the DPV. The twin diver propulsion vehicles whirred. The moderator pipe was basically an oversized elongated U-shape with a prolonged horizontal period. They descended 30 feet to enter the pipe before following the horizontal passage for roughly a thousand feet. In terms of overhead confined diving, it was as easy as it could possibly get, unless Ashley was wrong about the timing and the reactor turned nuclear before they reached it. The DPVs whirred as they motored along. Twin headlight beams flashed across the walls, like a pair of motorcycles riding through a dark tunnel. Sam said, Just remind me, if Dragon's Breath is so destructive, why we couldn't just leave it on the surface of the concrete dome? It would have never reached the nuclear pile. But I thought Dragon's Breath creates a chain reaction that continuously eats away at mass. It does? But when the Chernobyl disaster first occurred and concrete was pumped in and dumped on the reactor, water and liquid nitrogen was then pumped in, forming multiple safety gaps between the world's largest concrete sarcophagus and the nuclear pile. So, there's a chance Dragon's Breath would have been stopped by those sections of water. Its chain reaction would have dissipated and all would have been for nothing. Yep, you got it. And that's why we're making our way through this freezing tunnel in absolute darkness. All in total, it took just 15 minutes to reach the dry space beneath the nuclear pile. Together, they climbed the external ladder out of the nuclear water into a large venting room. It was now completely sealed within the confines of more than a quarter of a million tons of concrete. They removed their fins and left them beside the twin DPVs as they entered deeper into the reactor on foot. Ashley climbed the stairs to the highest point. She opened a digital map and followed a series of concrete corridors, stairs, and passages that workers at the power plant once used to maintain the reactor. Sam followed quickly, the beam of his flashlight flickering across the walls as he went, casting sinister shadows along the passageways, a solemn reminder of the ghosts left behind from the disaster, or the living they were trying to protect from an even worse disaster if the nuclear pile was allowed to continue and erupt once more. At the end of the maze they reached a large dry open room. It used to house the large drums that stored spent fuel rods, Ashley found a section that backed a large wall of concrete. One of the gray concrete blocks appeared loose. Ashley worked to free it. The thing slid out, revealing a hollowed section behind the wall. This will be perfect, she said. What difference does it make? Sam asked. Can't we just pour the stuff on the ground and let it do its job? Probably, but I don't want to take the chance. We need to be sure this thing takes hold. Picture it like a fire. 
Without kindling and the right set of conditions, this thing might burn out before it has the chance to really take hold. Does that make sense? Yeah, I guess. I didn't really think it through that much. Ashley looked inside the hollowed concrete block. It ran nearly thirty feet, with structural reinforced steel running the length of the wall, which appeared to descend multiple levels below them. Look at this. These gray blocks are hollow. Dragon's breath can filter through this entire region like this. Sam smiled. You really were a Girl Scout. I was, she admitted. Ashley retrieved the silk satchel stored inside a watertight container. She pulled the leather string, releasing the iridescent powder. She tipped it over, pouring the entire contents into the hollowed opening of the gray block. Nothing happened. Ashley frowned and turned to Sam. That doesn't seem right. Is that all that happened last time? Sam didn't get a chance to answer. The bright flash of light filled the entire building. It was followed by an unnerving, almost spectral pull toward the implosion. Ashley screamed, trying to grab hold of anything and everything to prevent herself from being sucked into the hollowed block where Dragon's breath was starting to take hold. The entire implosion lasted no more than fifteen or so seconds, and then they were released. Ashley turned to Sam, her eyes wide with terror. What the hell was that? That was Dragon's breath. Sam watched the wall begin to flicker a different shade of gray as its molecular structure started to become unstable. Time to go. Agreed, Ashley said, and they began to run. They backtracked through the maze of reinforced concrete tunnels all the way down to the water level. They reached their diver propulsion vehicles. A quick flick of the switch to turn the machines to on before opening the throttles to full power. Sam led the escape, shooting through at the DPV's maximum speed of six knots. It felt slow, really slow. It was like one of those nightmares where you know you need to run, but for some reason your legs are heavy and you can only move at turtle speed. Then, like a struck match tick in the distance, the tunnel opened up. Sam clambered up the side of the moderator canal. He reached down and helped pull Ashley up and out of the water. They sprinted toward the chopper. Within seconds, they stripped from their dive gear, leaving it all on the ground, and hopped on board. Sam climbed into the cockpit. He reached inside the helicopter and flicked the starter switch. The rotor blades began to turn with what appeared to be infinite slowness. Ashley glanced at the massive concrete sarcophagus. It was beginning to flicker, like the shadow of a ghost, in a weirdly ethereal sort of way. A quarter of a million tons of concrete were turning into liquid, Ashley shouted, Sam, we gotta go! I'm going, Sam gasped. His eyes glued on a single gauge, the rotor blade RPM. The concrete sarcophagus began to crumble. Ashley said, Go! The arrow on the rotor blade RPM entered the takeoff range. He pulled up the collective, and the Kazan Ansat climbed toward the sky like an invisible elevator. Fifty feet into the air, Sam allowed himself, for the first time, to glance at the concrete sarcophagus, a shrine to the worst nuclear disaster in history. Chernobyl began to disappear before their eyes. The concrete turned from gray to dark black before crumbling into pellets and disintegrating. The implosion continued to eat away at matter before the chain reaction finally settled on its molecular burn. It raged all the way to the surface of the water, upon which the remnants of Reactor 4 rested upon its island. When the disintegration reached the canals, the water prevented the chain reaction from its continued destruction, and the dragon's breath fizzled out to nothing. Water flowed into the void, and washed away any evidence that Chernobyl, the world's worst nuclear disaster, ever took place. Sam turned the helicopter to the west. 
Ashley said, Now what? Sam adjusted the helicopter controls, setting the aircraft up for straight and level flight. Now we head to Venice. Venice? What in the world is in Venice? Sam grinned. A friend of mine who's a goldsmith. I'm hoping he can help unlock the Emperor's golden map. Ashley rolled her eyes at him. Is there any one you don't know? she asked. Sam's eyes were teasing. What can I say? Lots of people like me. This made her laugh. But there are goldsmiths all over the world. Why, your pal in Venice. It's a long way to go to see a friend. The lines around Sam's face became serious. Well, I also thought if we were wrong about melting the gold from the map, I was thinking... Ashley finished his sentence. Venice, an island surrounded by water, would be the best place for us to be? Sam nodded. Exactly. Chapter 63. Le Mercury, San Marco, Venice. The Ponte di Rialto Bridge turned golden. Its white marble glistened under the warmth of the setting sun that poured down upon the medieval bridge, casting long shadows across the blue-green waters of the Grand Canal. Throngs of tourists crossed San Paolo into San Marco, where Venice's high-end market, known as Le Mercury, reigned supreme. Luxury brands, fashion outlets, and jewelry stores dominated the shopfronts. Sam and Ashley made their way along the Grand Canal, where several gondolas gently cruised toward the Venetian lagoon. They entered Le Mercury. Sam navigated the maze of bridges, pontoons, and hidden laneways with the confidence of a local. It was well known that Venice produced some of the most talented jewelers and goldsmiths in the world. He turned left into Caglia Cavalli, a discreet, narrow laneway made of 800-year-old brick masonry. Small tables and chairs of intimate restaurants lined the cobblestone lane, while colorful, flowering plants draped from balconies and clothes dried on lines that hung from cables out of third-story windows. Caglia Cavelli finished in a dead end, with walls of red and white bricks made in medieval times. An elegant green mahogany door stood quaintly at the very end. A single word was written in gold writing above. Volpata. Ashley smiled. You flew us all the way to Venice just to come here? Sam nodded. This is one of the best goldsmiths in the world, and what's more important, I know and trust the proprietor. We get one chance at this. I would have flown here from anywhere in the world to ensure Volpata did the work on our map. Right, Ashley said, clearly not impressed. There was no door handle, knocker, or anything to suggest it was a shop front. Sam lifted his hand to knock, but before his fist touched the wood, the green door opened. Sam Riley! A portly man with dark hair, thin glasses, and a jovial smile gave Sam a quick hug. Sam's voice was warm. Gabriel Volpata! It is good to see you, my friend, Volpata said, shaking his hand with familiarity. Come in, come in! They stepped into the small building. Volpata closed the door, and Sam noted that the mahogany was just a facade. The back of the door was made of solid steel, the same sort of thing you would expect to find at a bank or within a vault. Sam introduced Ashley. The middle-aged Italian greeted her with a warm handshake and a kiss on both cheeks, along with a genuine smile. He spoke perfect English, with a strong accent. "'Delighted to meet you, miss!' He brought them into a room with wooden floors, plush carpets, and comfortable furnishings. Turning back to business, he said, Now, Sam, you said that you have a very special project for me. Yes. Sam retrieved the dragon's breath tome. He handed it to Volpata. I need you to melt this down for me. A wry grin formed on Volpata's intelligent face. 
You want me to destroy such a wonderful piece of gold craftsmanship? Sam nodded. Afraid so. The goldsmith placed the gold tome on his work desk. He pulled down the jeweler's loop. He gestured to the ancient Chinese book. Do you mind if I examine it? Go ahead, Sam said. Volpata carefully studied the golden object. He stared through the thick magnifying glass of his jeweler's loop. The craftsmanship is excellent. Do you have a rough date of its creation? Sam said somewhere around 210 B.C. Volpata glanced at the ancient Chinese script. This was made for the first emperor of China, Qin Shi Huang? Yes, Sam said, surprised by the goldsmith's knowledge of ancient China. Do you know much about the Qin period? No, but I've seen some of their work. Ancient Chinese metallurgists and alchemists were centuries ahead of the rest of the world. Europe may have caught up during the Renaissance, but more than 2,000 years ago, I'm afraid the Chinese were miles ahead of us. You have no idea how right you are. Volpata arched an eyebrow. In what way? Sam said, See that iridescent image of a dragon embedded in the spine? Volpata turned the tome over on its side and carefully examined the colorful dragon. It looks like it's carved out of a solid piece of... What is that? Opal? Sam shook his head. It's not opal. Are you sure? Sam said, pretty sure. Because opal comes in many different colors, shapes, and sizes. He smiled, almost wistfully. Did you know both interference and diffraction play a role in its color? Interference occurs when parts of the light gets reflected from the surface of a silica sphere, while another part gets refracted inside the sphere, being reflected again. Diffraction in opal is the result of light hitting a gap between the spheres and then being split up into its spectral components. In precious opal, larger silica spheres of about 350 micrometers in diameter give off red flashes with changes in viewing angles. The smaller spheres result in green, blue, or purple flashes, which cannot increase in wavelength to give a red flash. Therefore, the sizes of the gaps, or voids, determine which color is seen. Interesting, Sam agreed. But I can guarantee you it's not opal. Well, it's not uh, sunstone. It seems to be covered in a protective layer of quartz, sealing it perfectly from the air. Volpata nodded. He then continued speaking, more to himself as a scientist might, rather than to Sam or Ashley. It's oxidation that causes gertite and hematite to turn golden or reddish-brown color with spectacular reflections. Hmm. What about Labradorite? No, Sam said with a grin. But I have a dog named Caliburn who would be interested to hear all about it. I'm going to tell you what it is. Volpata raised a finger, gesturing he'll work it out soon. Hmm, I'll get it. No, you won't, Sam smiled. It's called Dragon's Breath. Dragon's Breath? Volpata cocked his head to the side. Never heard of it. No one has. It's been a closely guarded secret, protected since the Qin Emperor's alchemists buried it, along with the Emperor. Interesting. Any unique properties? Ashley grinned. A few. Volpata cocked his eyebrow. What sort of properties? Ashley said, It can withstand extreme temperatures. How hot? I don't know. Ashley shrugged. To be honest, we couldn't produce enough heat to tarnish it. You're kidding. I'm not, Ashley said. There's something else you need to understand about the strange metal. Volpata lifted his loop so he could look at her. What? Ashley said, Dragon's breath reacts to electrical grounding. 
That would make sense. If it is indeed a metal, one of its traditional properties would include electrical conduction. Ashley crossed her arms. Yeah, but in this case it creates a subatomic nuclear reaction that, for lack of a better description, causes a widespread implosion of everything it touches. Volpata drew a breath, held it for a few seconds, and then said, Ah, now I see why Sam Riley has traveled all this way to seek my services. He turned to Sam. I uh, assume if you are taking these sorts of risks, this is really important. Sam nodded. Volpata, my friend, right now, Finding out the hidden contents of this tome is the most important in the world. Vulpata nodded, his voice solemn. Then I will try my best. Chapter 64 Sam stared at the oven, enthralled by the sight. Gold melts around a thousand degrees Celsius, Vulpata said. That's a little shy of a 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit for you. See how the metal is already glowing. Inside the oven, the ruddy surface of the plate had burned to a sun-bright sheen. As he watched, a single shimmering droplet appeared atop the golden tome. It rolled down the slanted slope to drip into a ceramic pan beneath the grate. It didn't take long before more blazing teardrops began to weep and flow in rivulets, slowly erasing the ancient Chinese script. The crisp, sharp edges of the tome, intricately carved with dragons, grew soft, melting away in a river of gold. Sam's attention stayed fixed on the oven. The tome was now a lump of molten gold, which flowed like liquid sunshine. Slowly the tome eroded before their eyes, shedding more and more of its mass. Ashley drew in an audible breath. Look at the top of it! Sam licked his lips. Is that what I think it is? Volpata's eyes narrowed. I believe those are the delicate outlines of mountains. A series of towering pillars appeared, protruding from the base of a valley. Sam recognized the iridescent glow, competing against the brilliance of the molten gold. Over the next few minutes, more and more of the blazing metal poured away, revealing a greater expanse of the hidden object. It's the map, Sam whispered. The delineations became clearer as the remaining gold drained away. It flowed across the rosy metal surface, exposing another long-held secret. This hidden bit of cartography wasn't a flat engraving. It's a, a topographical map, Volpata said, awed by the artistry. Tiny sculpted pillars appeared, along with a single deep-cut valley and river. The melting gold revealed a darkly glowing scale model of distinctive Chinese mountains. There were more than a dozen pillars, a small natural bridge formed between the valley's edge and an outcropping pillar, which then led to a second and third pillar. A small stream followed the three semi-joined pillars before casting a long waterfall to the valley far below. It was a distinctive landmark to find. At the top of the third pillar were three precious gemstones, emerald, ruby, and sapphire. Sparkling at the center of the three precious gems was a perfect diamond. Ashley smiled. I'd say that's as good as we get to X marks the spot. Yes, Sam said, although I'm surprised those gemstones didn't melt. Volpata said, no, diamond melts above 7,200 degrees Fahrenheit. As for the other three gems... Ruby has the lowest melting point, but even that is still 3,400 degrees Fahrenheit, much higher than gold's 1,948 Fahrenheit. All I can say is whoever the craftsmen that made this were, they sure knew what they were doing. Yeah, it's quite amazing, Ashley agreed. 
Sam took a step back, studying the entire image, and recognized those mountains. I can't believe it. Soon, only the map remained on the ceramic grate. Its edges were rough, misshapen, slightly curled up at the corners. Is that writing? Ashley asked. Sam's eyes narrowed. Where? Along the map's margins, she replied. Sam leaned closer to the oven, the radiating heat burning his face. His eyes were sharp. Faint lines of script did indeed run along the map, like notations from a cartographer. They're in the same ancient Chinese script. I'll take a picture of them, and Forrest, my linguist friend, will translate them for us. Ashley said, I don't suppose you have any idea where that is. Actually, I do. Really? she asked. Where? A satisfied smile tugged at Sam's lips. The floating mountains of Zhang Yaji, China. Chapter 65 Santa Lucia, Venice Hu Ching Li knew he had to move fast. He didn't like taking unnecessary risks, but this wasn't a time to focus on safety. His train arrived at the Santa Lucia station, linking the mainland to the islands of Venice. He rudely pushed his way to the front of the line. As soon as the train stopped at his destination, he forced the doors open and began to run. He'd employed a small number of investigators to track down Sam Riley. These included computer whizzes who ran programs designed to scroll over immeasurable amounts of global data. One such area of data included registered flight paths. One, registered in the name Charles Paladin, one of several aliases who had since learned were commonly used by Sam, showed a flight from Ukraine to Venice. Within minutes, who had boarded a flight to Venice's Marco Polo International Airport. Sam's flight had beat him there by a little over an hour. Then the train from the airport, which was on the mainland, was delayed. On the flight over, he'd contemplated what purpose Sam could have possibly had going to Venice. Sam was a smart man, with resources that extended to all areas. It would only be a matter of time before he discovered the tome must be melted down to reveal the hidden map. Who searched for records of all goldsmiths in Venice with kilns large enough to smelt gold the size of Qin Shi Huang's tome? It turned out there were more than ninety on the small maze of Venetian islands. He needed to narrow it down. If Sam was visiting a goldsmith, it stood to reason that he knew someone in particular— someone he trusted. He then had his computer people search for any historical trips Sam might have placed to Venice and see if there was ever any record of him visiting a particular goldsmith. Eureka! The man had visited Venice more than twenty times over the past three decades. On fifteen of those, he visited a local goldsmith, apparently a family friend, who stared at the man's name. Gabriel Volpata. Then it hit him. Sam had the map. Who kept running? He crossed the Ponte degli Scalzi, the stone bridge that spanned the Grand Canal. He made his way through the maze of canals, bridges, and stone paths, using the bell tower of Basilica San Maria Gloriosa dei Frari that rose above the rest of the buildings to navigate toward La Mercury. After twenty minutes, who came out of the maze to find his route blocked by the Grand Canal, which had snaked and come back around again? It was a busy river, with a small flotilla of gondolas along with several pleasure boats. He brought up his GPS and cursed himself for not taking note of the fact the Ponte di Rialto bridge was several blocks upriver. The goldsmith was down a laneway directly opposite him, he frowned. It would involve backtracking when he didn't have much time. He saw an Italian couple bringing a wooden pleasure cruiser alongside the jetty, a young boy and girl. They were a good-looking couple, still madly in love. Emotionally, who wished them all the luck in the world? Yet, practically, 
he did what he knew needed to be done. Who held out two green 100-euro banknotes? Excuse me, I need to get to the other side of the Grand Canal. The woman shook her head. This is a private boat. We're not here to take tourists out. Even so, I really must get there. I'm sorry. The man stood up, any pretense of being a friendly Venetian, keen on keeping a tourist happy, now removed from his tone. Listen, she said we are busy. Now leave us alone. Whose attention was distracted for a split second. On the opposite side of the Grand Canal, he spotted a woman he'd recognized. And how could he not? Kiri Villaflor was stunningly beautiful and equally deadly. She carried a submachine gun brazenly, along with four other people. She disappeared down a laneway, heading toward the goldsmith, who drew his pistol, pointed it at the Italian, and said, I'm very sorry, but I'm afraid I'm going to have to insist. Chapter 66 Kiri watched the green door open. A corpulent, middle-aged Italian man stepped out. She moved quickly, with a pleasing smile. She asked, Gabriel Volpata? Volpata looked at her. Any sense of fear he might have had at being disturbed by a stranger while leaving his shop were dissuaded by the sight of her. Kiri was a stunner. Even the most disinterested of men found it hard to keep their eyes off her. He gave her a warm smile. May I help you? Yes, she said, pulling out her submachine gun. Let's go inside. We need to talk. Volpata turned the palms of his hands outward in a submissive gesture. You can have whatever you want. The place is in short, so there's nothing here that I'm willing to die to protect. That's good to hear, Mr. Volpata, she smiled and her four goons followed her in, closing the solid green door behind them. We'd like to know what Sam Riley was doing here. He put on an oily, almost obsequious smile. Sam Riley is an old friend of mine. He had some work in Venice, just stopped in on his way through. Yeah, I don't buy that. She pointed the submachine gun at his head. Care to try again? He came to ask me to smelt the gold that covered a hidden map. Do you want the gold? He never even bothered to ask for the gold, just waited until the map was revealed and then left. It was her turn to make a fake smile. I don't care about the gold. It's your lucky day. You can keep it. He arched an eyebrow. What do you want? Do you have a copy of the map? The map? He looked surprised. No, Sam didn't make a copy. He just picked up the original and left. She shifted gears. How do I access your security footage? He opened his mouth, his eyes darting furtively away from hers, as though he was going to try and tell a lie. She pushed the cold steel barrel of her submachine gun playfully up to his forehead. He got the hint. It's just back there. Do you want me to? No, you stay put. She turned to one of her crew. Andre, see what you can find on that footage. Very good, Andre said, opening the security console. He typed a few words and then frowned. Looking at Volpata, he said, Password? Volpata123. What, do you think I'm an idiot? What's the real password? Volpata looked at Kiri, his eyes trying to avoid the barrel, sweat beads dripping from his face. No, I'm serious. Try it. That's the password. The insurance company says I need to have a password on the digital tapes, so I have a password. But who cares? I mean, with the exception of you fine people, no one breaks into a goldsmith's vault to steal security footage. Andrei looked unimpressed. Kiri said, Give it a try, Andrei. Andrei quickly typed the password. The security footage came up. Andrei scrolled through until a clear image of the map came into view. 
He hit pause. Kiri stepped in, looked at it, and snapped a quick photo on her phone. She zoomed in. Got it! You know where that is? Andrei asked. Not exactly, but I know the overall location. I'll need to look at a topographical map to match it up. But I believe we have all that we need here. Very good. Andrei took the high-powered magnet to the hard drive, permanently wiping all of its data. The last thing they needed was anyone else finding the image of the hidden map and beating them to its secret location. Kiri turned to Volpata. She pulled out a German Sig Sauer P320 handgun and carefully attached a silencer to its barrel and aimed it at his head. Well, I must thank you for being so very helpful, but as you can appreciate, we really can't leave loose ends. The man actually smiled at her. There was something almost wrong with that smile, but she couldn't figure out what it could be. Whatever. It was unimportant to the mission. She squeezed the trigger and permanently wiped the smile off his face. Time to go, she said. Secure the front door. I'm just going to check out the back that we haven't left any other loose ends. Andrei nodded and headed toward the front door. Kiri reached the back of the goldsmith shop. It was small and, as expected, didn't lead anywhere. Volpata was on his own. She turned to leave. A moment later, Andrei opened the front door. In that moment, the front of the goldsmith's shop disappeared in a flash of white. The explosion killed all four of her mercenaries in an instant, sending her flying backward. Kiri hit the ground, but the solid walls that adjoined the gold kiln took the brunt of the explosion. She found herself shaking her head in admiration. That crazy Italian had a trigger on his security password. It was designed to let anyone who used it to gain access to the footage, but then trigger an explosion. No wonder the man had been smiling at his death. Vulpata thought he'd have the last laugh. Kiri picked herself up. Sirens were already wailing from outside. It was time to go before she could be implicated in anything. If she hurried, she still might beat Sam Riley to the Dragon's Breath Mine. Chapter 67 The explosion rocked Venice, its shock waves sending ripples along the otherwise stilled canals. Sam turned around to see the rising smoke in the distance originating somewhere near Volpata's goldsmith shop. The coincidence was too much to hope for, and if it wasn't a coincidence, then it meant someone had come after Zolpata because of him. He exchanged a quick glance with Ashley. We have to help. Ashley tried to stop him. There's nothing we can do. Sam didn't care. Adrenaline was already running rampant in his veins, fueling his speed and clouding any rational thought. He drew his glock and ran toward his friend's burning building. The sound of Ashley's feet running along the stone laneway and her shouting resonated into the blur of a distant recess of his mind. All of Sam's attention was focused on reaching Calia Cavalli, where the dark smoke rose. In the distance, he spotted a woman with dark hair climbing onto a small speedboat. It was a fleeting sight, but it could have easily been Kiri, the woman from the Emperor's mausoleum. He tried to stop her, but the speedboat took off and headed northeast, disappearing into a narrow canal. Sam kept running. He crossed a small bridge, turned left, and stopped. A small mushroom cloud of dust erupted. The smoldering fire that slowly consumed the building must have finally reached the acetylene and 100% oxygen tanks Volpata used to heat up the gold-smelting oven, causing a massive explosion. Anyone still alive inside would now be dead. Ashley stood next to him and gently reached out to place an arm on his shoulder. I'm sorry, Sam. 
Sam squeezed her hand and then stepped away, shaking his head. This was my fault. You couldn't have known someone would have followed you here, Ashley said. Come on, we need to get out of here. Sam pushed through, trying to get closer. More sirens wailed in the distance. We need to go, she said, more forcefully this time. Sam stared blankly at her. His hand was still grasping his Glock, as though he could still seek vengeance. Ashley said, Put the damn gun away before you get arrested. Anyone sees you with that, they're going to assume you were involved. It was enough to snap Sam out of it. All right, all right, Sam said. You're right, let's go. We need to make sure we reach that mine first, so Valpata's death wasn't in vain. He and Ashley turned and ran. They got two blocks away, crossed a bridge. They were running hard. Sam and Ashley were headed south, trying to distance themselves from the explosion and lose themselves from the authorities who were quickly swooping in on the goldsmith's shop. They were making their way through the labyrinthian maze of narrow streets, shallow bridges, and canals. Sam had no idea where he was, but he could see the gilded domes of St. Mark's Cathedral in the distance, and kept heading in that direction. Sam passed a bridge and into a dark laneway. It made him feel safer to flee the light and enter the safety of the darkness. On the downward step from the bridge, something caught Sam's leg. He tried to jump it. His foot locked for a split second, just long enough for Sam's forward momentum to carry him just past the point of upward balance. He fell forward, rolling as he hit the ground. Sam was quick. He rolled twice and finished standing up. Six feet away from him, he came face to face with the face of Hu Ching Li, the last Yuxia from inside the Emperor's mausoleum. Sam automatically reached for his Glock, but his hand clutched on to thin air. A wave of fear washed over him. His weapon was missing. Who held up the Glock? Are you looking for this? Chapter 68 Furious with himself, and devastated by the loss of Gabrielle Volpata, Sam had a tight rein on his temper and submissively held his hands up. Grimacing, Ashley copied his movement. Sam drew in a deep and calming breath. Mr. Hu Ching Li, I believe. That's right, Hu replied. Sam Riley. Did you just blow up my friend in his home? I did not. Sam tilted his head. No. No. Must have been someone else then, he said, accepting this. In a strangely formal manner, Sam looked at Ashley and said, This is Dr. Ashley Calder, a leaning expert in subatomic physics. Pleased to meet you, doctor who said, with equal formality. I can see why he brought you to help with Dragon's Breath. You can let her go, Sam said. I've already written down everything she knows about Dragon's Breath, if that's what you're interested in. Who made a wry smile? Sam Riley, my good fellow, do you think I've come here to find out about Dragon's Breath? Sam gave a half-shoulder shrug. Well, yes. I know everything there is to know about Dragon's Breath. I didn't come here for that. I came here for you. Me? What do you want with me? Honestly? He paused. I need your help. Sam's eyes were incredulous. My help? Yeah. With what? Whose jaw stiffened. Saving the world. Chapter 69 Sam tried to read the man pointing a gun at him. Elise had managed to find out some things about him. In addition to being one of the last members of the Yuxia, the Chinese equivalent of the European Knights Errant, 
the man was part of the Junzi. It set him on a pedestal in line with the upper echelons of the ruling class in China, as well as being a person of virtue. Virtuous or not, the man was still aiming a gun at him. Who broke the silence? What do you say? Sam cocked his head to the side. About what? Helping me save the world. You want my help to save the world. That's what I came here for. Sam exhaled. Then I accept. Good. Smiling, Sam almost laughed out loud. Who asked, What's so funny? Well, to be honest, I'm not sure I can trust you. So if it's all the same to you, I'll be on my way. Who frowned. Why not? For starters, Sam said, hardly attempting to suppress his supercilious smile now, you're pointing my own gun at me. And you don't like it. Not really. If I'm to be perfectly honest with you, it doesn't exactly fill me with trust for an open, friendly, and productive relationship. Who nodded? All right. What do you suggest I do to gain your trust? I suppose you could give me my gun back. Then we could all talk like normal people and discuss how we're going to go about saving the world. Whose eyes shifted between Ashley and then back to Sam. If I do that, you might shoot me in the head. It's a possibility, Sam admitted. Then again, all good relationships take a certain leap of faith to achieve mutual trust. Who lowered the Glock and handed it to him. Sam took the weapon. His fingers fit reassuring along the hilt, and his trigger finger remained distinctively outside the frame. Okay. Who took a step back, turning his palms outward. Now what? Ashley raised her Glock and aimed it at who? She spoke with confidence and just the trace of a fine tremor. In the spirit of our newfound trust and honesty, I'd like you to know I've never actually fired a weapon before, but I've seen one fired, and I think I could probably work it out. Okay, so we are all in agreement. Who made a charming smile, full of teeth? It's better to keep this an honest relationship also, we might want to make a move on. Kiri Villaflor almost certainly obtained a copy of your hidden map from the goldsmith's security footage. That means we don't have a lot of time to decipher the map and mine it first. Mine what? Sam asked. Dragon's Breath, of course. There'll be enough powder to level an entire continent. What do you know about Dragon's Breath? Who said, Everything. Sam was interested. He was finally getting answers. Go on. I am 75th generation Ching Li, who made no attempt to conceal the pride from his voice. It was a routine Sam imagined him telling himself many times throughout his life. My ancestors were the greatest alchemists to have ever lived. 200 years B.C., the science of alchemy had reached its pinnacle. My great ancestor, who lived during the reign of the first emperor, Qin Shi Huang, was the last of the very greatest. Your ancestor discovered Dragon's Breath? Yes. Its ore was mined somewhere within the Qin dynasty. Ashley asked, So, it's a naturally occurring element? No. It does occur naturally, but in itself it is inert. The alchemists at the time discovered a secret recipe to turn it into the deadly substance you've seen it to be. Ashley asked, How? No idea, who admitted. Some secrets have been lost long ago. I imagine it's similar to uranium being converted to plutonium in a nuclear reactor before it can be used to make a bomb. Nice analogy, Ashley agreed. Terrifying, but fitting who said, and a thousand times worse. Sam asked, so what happened? Whose eyebrows arched? To my ancestors? Sam nodded. And to the Chin Empire's dragon's breath. 
First Emperor Qin Shi Huang was probably one of the greatest minds to have ever lived in China, or in the world, as far as I'm concerned. Even without Dragon's Breath, he would have achieved greatness. But Dragon's Breath stacked good fortune in his favor. Who lowered his head? Yes, terribly so. And absolute power, as we all know, inevitably corrupts. I believe it shows just how great the emperor was that he managed to refrain from abusing it for so long. In the end, he wanted to use Dragon's Breath to destroy the world outside of the newly unified China. The world, Sam said, not understanding where this was going. What part of it? No, no, you're misunderstanding me. Emperor Qin Shi Huang wanted to level all of it. He ordered his alchemists to produce as much dragon's breath as humanly possible, enough to send every piece of land outside of his dominion beneath the sea. There was an insurrection, led by my great ancestor. I remember, Sam snapped his fingers. He was searching for eternal life. And my great ancestor gave it to him. Did he? Sam recalled the story of how the emperor had finally died. The emperor was poisoned with an elixir of mercury, which his alchemists informed him would offer him passage to immortality. That's right, who grinned. That was my ancestor. Ah, clever man. So what happened to Dragon's Breath? You must understand, during the Qin dynasty, alchemy was considered next to godly. As the leading alchemist of the entire lands, he was able to reorganize the emperor's mausoleum to ensure the secrets of Dragon's Breath were buried forever. Sam said, he started the Yuxia? Yes. A puzzled frown spread across Sam's lips. If that's the case, why didn't you know where Dragon's Breath was, or this mine, for that matter? My ancestor set up the Yuxia to protect Dragon's Breath, but he knew that no secret can be kept guarded forever. He didn't tell his children the location? No. He left us with stories and details of what we must protect, along with the funds that were invested in perpetuity to ensure we need never work a traditional job. Instead, we were to expend all our efforts toward protecting the secret of Dragon's Breath. What happened to the last alchemist? My ancestor, confident that he had set up the Yuxia, ensured he was buried alive within the Emperor's burial tomb. He chose to die. Who nodded? Who else could set all the booby traps once the hermetically sealed mound was closed? Sam said, So, now what? We need to use the map to find this ancient mine site. What do we do once we find it? Isn't it obvious? Who asked. Or did I misjudge you? I don't know. It's not obvious to me. He chuckled. Maybe you misjudged my intelligence. Not your intelligence. Your character? Go on, what do you think we should do? Who crossed his arms? We need to mine the last of the dragon's breath ore. Then we need to dispose of every ounce at the bottom of the ocean. There it will dissipate and become inert. Ashley sent a questioning look at Sam. What do you think? I think it's a great idea. He slowly exhaled and turned to who? You can count us in. We'll do this together. Chapter 70 The Floating Mountains of Zhang Gi, China The Eurocopter flew across the northwest Hunan province at 145 knots. Tianmen Mountain came into view its distinctive limestone arch, the world's highest naturally formed arch, known as Gateway to Heaven, came into view. Tongtien Avenue, a long and winding road up the mountain with ninety-nine bends, snaked its way to the base of the mountain. 
There, a farther 999 steps allowed thousands of tourists to climb to the base of the arch. The helicopter banked hard to starboard before descending deep into the Zhangyagi Canyon, revealing the first glimpses of the ancient forest of stone in which dragon's breath once flowed. A sea of thick clouds rose from the jungle far below. There, hundreds of jagged quartzite sandstone columns rose as much as 600 feet from the valley floor. From above they appeared to float like small, struggling life rafts in a tempestuous ocean. Inside, the five occupants drew an audible breath as the near-mythical landscape came into view. It was filled with soaring sandstone pillars clad in an emerald forest. It was easy to understand how this magical location inspired James Cameron's floating Hallelujah Mountains, featured in Avatar, the 2009 film. All in total, there were 243 peaks and 3,000 pinnacles and spires within the park. At the controls was Genevieve. Sitting in the co-pilot seat was Tom, his massive frame appearing almost comical as he folded his body to make it fit. In the back was Hu, surprisingly true to form for the Asian stereotype, sleeping soundly. Next to him was Ashley, who was double-checking a compact neutrino detector. In the rear-facing seat, Sam stared at the map, his face a mixture of awe and wonder. It depicted a large totem of sandstone and quartzite, roughly 550 feet tall and narrow, no more than 20 or 30 feet wide, and standing at the end of four large pillars. The largest one formed a bridge with the zhang Ji mountain range that lined the valley. Along the range, a small stream flowed, forming a waterfall that disappeared into a fine mist before it reached the ground some 600 feet below. They had located the matching geological formation that produced a near-perfect match with known topological information of zhang Ji. The map marked a row of four giant totem poles, but down below, Sam could only see three. It meant they had the wrong location, or more likely, there had been a geologically recent event in the past 2,300 years in which the fourth totem fell. Or possibly, Dragon's Breath had already been removed from existence. Sam felt certain they had the right place. The question that nagged him was if the original mine for Dragon's Breath was hidden in this forest of stone for the past 2,300 years, why had nobody else found it? Over their headphones came Genevieve's voice. We're approaching our insertion point in three minutes. At these words, next to Sam, who woke up instantly? Who had used his Junzi status and noble history to clear several layers of bureaucratic red tape to allow them to fly over the zhang Ji forest? It was windy. Up ahead, they approached the site from the map. The three remaining pillars looked spectacular. Giant pillars floating on a bed of cloud. A land bridge crossed the first two pillars, where water from a small creek flowed before falling over the top of the third pillar. The waterfall disappeared into a fine mist, upon which the morning sun shone down, turning it to a prism of colors before disappearing completely. Genevieve circled the third quartzite pillar. They were forbidden to land anywhere within the zhang Ji Canyon, much less alone on top of one of the narrower totem poles, which were geologically fragile. Genevieve had registered the flight as a sightseeing tour, and Hu had used his influence from within the Chinese Ministry of Lands to gain special approval. The plan was for Sam, Tom, Ashley, and Hu to climb out while Genevieve hovered directly above the totem before continuing on with her registered flight path. She would refuel and return three hours later. 
Sam and Tom carried Heckler and Cock submachine guns. Ashley carried a Glock 19. Sam had tried to offer Hu a weapon, but he'd refused. He pointed to Emperor Chin's ancient sword, confiding that he felt safest with the ancient weapon dipped in the blood of dragon's breath. Genevieve held the helicopter in a delicate hover. One by one, the four of them quickly alighted at the insertion point. Sam located the tiny crevice. It was hidden from sight by the waterfall, which fell over the top of the pillar, although not striking it, concealing the ancient opening. It would take a champion rock climber to reach the summit and discover the entrance. Even then, it was unlikely they would try and explore the karst entry unless they had a specific interest in speleology. A lone wuling pine, an endemic species of tree, had established itself in prime position on the top of the quartzite pillar. Known for its vitality and ability to grow on Zhangyaji hillsides within stone cracks of mountains, its roots extended deep into the heart of the ancient cave system. Sam exchanged a glance with Tom. I can see how this has remained hidden throughout the ages. I'll say. The cave entrance was tight. Too tight for Tom to penetrate, no matter how good he might be at twisting and turning his body. His broad chest was simply too large. Tom signaled to Genevieve, who was hovering midair to the side of the pillar. She would pick him up. We'll be back for pickup in three hours. Tom shot Sam a meaningful glare. Don't do anything stupid. Sam gave him a thumbs up. I'll try my best. Good luck. A few seconds later, Sam shuffled through the tight squeeze between the Wuling Pine and the rock entrance, followed by Ashley and Hu. They all switched on their headlights. Then slowly and carefully, they began the long journey deep into the hidden void. Chapter 71 Sam led the way. He squeezed past the mouth of the cave system, around the trunk of the tree, before it opened up to a steep, near-vertical passageway. Possibly it led all the way to the bottom of the quartzite pillar, some six hundred feet below. The Wuling Pine cast a thick web of roots down in the cavern that extended deep into the earth. Sam used the roots to hold on to, descending the horizontal ones like the rungs of a ladder. The beam from his helmet-mounted flashlight shone on the walls of the seemingly endless fissure system. At first he'd assumed the cave was caused by natural erosion, but now that he'd had time to examine the internal structure, he realized it was far too unnatural. The edges were harsh and too angular to have been caused by water or wind erosion. Ancient miners must have built the entire thing. He wasn't descending an ancient cave. He was descending the vertical shaft of an archaic mine. Now that he'd thought of it, the entire place was clearly a mine shaft, with hollowed carvings into the quartzite upon which one could climb. They weren't naturally formed. He could still make out the fine grooves carved by a rudimentary chisel and hammer. A few minutes later, he fixed the beam of his light on a point where one root had grown into a carved, hollow section. A wry grin creased his face. The carved ladder went around the tree root, not the other way around. It meant that the ancient builders had incorporated the wooling tree's root system into their vertical shaft. Sam considered that for a minute. He'd assumed the tree had grown long after the miners had left, and long after Dragon's Breath was forgotten from the collective minds of humanity. But now he was seeing clear evidence that the tree had come first. He wondered how old the tree was. Was it possible for a tree to live 2,300 years, or more? It seemed unbelievable. Ashley climbed down above him. He'd slowed down enough that, although he was usually the fastest, he'd now become the cause of the bottleneck. 
She said, everything all right? Yeah, sorry, I was just lost in thought, Sam said, and he continued his downward climb. What thought? she asked, her voice filled with genuine interest. Do you have any idea how old a tree can live? A long time. Why? I was wondering if this wooling pine has been here since the original alchemists mined dragon's breath. From appearances, that seems to be the case. He showed her how the carved ladder went around the tree root rather than the other way around. But I'm not sure a tree can even live that long. That's incredible, Ashley said. I'm not sure about wooling pine, but I know pine trees are some of the longest-lived trees on earth. Twenty-three hundred years long-lived? Ashley nodded, making a smile of brilliant teeth. Yeah, the Great Basin Bristlecone Pine is older than five thousand years. Sam slid down a straight section of the rigid root, using it like a fireman's pole, before landing on a small ledge. Now that he'd made it more than forty feet down, he realized the old miners must have intentionally alternated sides of the quartzite pillar to carve. That way, the artificial landing spaces were formed every fifteen to twenty feet. He waited for Ashley to follow. When she slid down next to him, she asked, You okay? Sure, Sam said. Where were we? You were telling me some silly story about a tree that's more than five thousand years old, Sam said. It's true, she said, defensively. It's in the White Mountains of California. I've been there myself. Hey, I'm not saying it's not possible, but I don't know how they could have possibly calculated its age. I mean, I know a little bit about dendrology, and the most basic part is that you determine the tree's age by adding up and dating tree rings. She shrugged. So? So, if the tree's still alive, how in the world will they know its precise age? Oh, this one I know. Really? Yeah. It was on a placard at the site of the world's oldest tree. And what did it say? Sam asked, intrigued. They used an incremental borer, basically a tool that can be drilled into the center of a tree and retracted, removing a cylinder of the trunk. The thin cylinder extracted from the tree will show all of the tree's rings, which can accurately determine its age. Okay, cool. So I guess it's possible the ancient miners planted a tree on top of the pillar to mark their opening. Or conceal it? That's correct, whose voice piped up as he slid down the vertical route. There's even stories about this great tree that descended into the great mine and thrived on the very essence of dragon's breath, producing roots that extended hundreds of feet. Amazing, Sam admitted. You want a break, or do you want to lead for a while? I'll lead, who said. All three of them spent the next thirty-five minutes descending the mine shaft. It finally opened into a large chamber, presumably where people once hauled the heavy ore and prepared it for its long journey up the pillar. A horizontal passage headed off to the east. There was no way to know for sure, but Sam was fairly confident they were now lower than the base of the quartzite pillar. At last they had reached a part of the mine that was technically below ground. Sam shined his flashlight down the horizontal tunnel. It was bone dry. Sam began to laugh. What? Who asked. Sam shook his head. It's nothing. No, it's not. A wry grin formed on Who's lips. I know you well enough now to know this isn't nothing. Sam shrugged. It's just, usually, in places like this, I tend to find the mine has flooded with water, that's all. I was kind of expecting it to be flooded. Who stared at the narrow passageway, his eyes a mixture of unrestrained fear and incredulity. In that case, how did you expect to reach the end of the mine? 
What would you do, bring in scuba gear all the way down here or something? Sam grinned. Yeah, something just like that. Who laughed? You're lucky that's not the case. Oh, yeah? If it was, it would have been just you and Ashley down here. Sam beamed with amusement. You're afraid of scuba diving? Me? Whose dark eyes twinkled and he shrugged. I can't even swim. Chapter 72 Sam took the lead again, stopping at the end of a horizontal tunnel. A large chamber spread out in a multitude of spidery shafts where miners once worked the walls to pry free their precious ore. The beam of his helmet light flashed on the wall, and a soft glow of iridescent flecks mixed with quartz sandstone flickered back at him. I don't get it, his brow furrowed. Those specks look like dragon's breath ore. Ashley nodded, testing it with the miniature neutrino detector. I'd say you're right, but... How does that even work? Ashley gave him a well-practiced, sympathetic smile, as though she were used to explaining things to people who were clearly less intelligent than her, which was everyone, given she was one of the leading experts in theoretical nuclear physics. We're in the Dragon's Breath Mine. What did you expect to find? Sam cut her off with a wave of his hand. I know that. I just mean we know Dragon's Breath responds to any sort of electrical grounding. She smiled. So you're wondering why this entire chamber hasn't imploded? Sam nodded, his eyes darting toward her, and took note of the fact that she didn't appear concerned. The question did cross my mind. It's because it's Dragon's Breath in its raw natural form. Sam thought about that for a second. How does that change anything? It means it's unrefined ore. She glanced at Sam to see if that cleared things up. It didn't. Sam said, keep going. Ashley nodded, her face comfortable and relaxed as she considered the right analogy. Okay, think of uranium and plutonium. Explain it to me. The difference between uranium and plutonium is that uranium can be obtained in natural form from mines, in the form of ores, which are later purified. Plutonium, on the other hand, is such an element that it cannot be obtained naturally by any means. It is a product of the reaction between uranium-238 and neutrons. So what? Sam asked. You're saying this ore needs to be put through some sort of fission process to become an entirely different element or the ancient and refined material once known as Dragon's Breath? Uh-huh, that's right. Any idea how the ore is processed and converted to Dragon's Breath? To be honest, not a clue. She grinned, her red lips curved in an almost seductive smile. But I'd love to find out. Sam didn't find the idea of Ashley, or anyone else for that matter, experimenting on dragon's breath ore to determine how to cause it to create a chain reaction particularly reassuring. He considered voicing his concerns, but decided it could wait. Better to find the remaining dragon's breath and then decide how best to deal with the dangerous material. They kept walking. Who took a tunnel to the right, seeking an unmined section? After another five or six minutes of walking, they reached another chamber. This one was much larger than the rest of them. The beam of Sam's flashlight swept in a wide arc across the space. Unlike some of the earlier sections that may have been caused by natural erosion throughout the eons, it was obvious this one had been caused through extensive mining. There were no signs of the iridescent flecks to be seen. Sam drew a breath. It looks like we got here at the wrong time. We're more than 2,000 years too late. Ashley shook her head. Look at the walls! Sam touched the sides of the cave. There were identical grooves running along the walls, 
along with the remnants of several perfectly circular holes. He fixed his flashlight on one of the holes. It was roughly six feet deep. He'd seen those types of holes before. They were used to embed dynamite and were commonly used in modern mining practices known as blast mining. He frowned. You think someone beat us to this recently? Yes. How recently? Hard to tell. Sam said, I suppose it's impossible to know if we're talking about the past hundred years or one hundred days. Impossible to know precisely, although I'm sure an archaeologist or a geologist could give you a better idea. Ashley made a theatrical sigh, picked up a stone, and threw it to Sam. Then again, maybe not. Sam caught the stone. It was kind of an orange color. Even to his rudimentary knowledge of geology, he could guess the stone was some sort of iron ore. Still, he couldn't see how that changed anything. I'm afraid I'm still not following you, or how a piece of iron ore is going to help you narrow down the timeline for when the last of the dragon's breath was mined here. Ashley nodded as though she expected such a response. That's limonite. Okay, Sam said in such a way that suggested he still had no idea where she was going with any of this. Most of this mine is surrounded by olive-colored iron, called olivine. To prove her point, Ashley chipped off a bit of the wall with her pickaxe and handed Sam a couple gray rocks with green crystals inside. See? It's iron olivine. That's what this entire area is made of once you get away from the dragon's breath ore. Sam ran his eyes across the chamber's wall, taking note of the iron olivine in the walls and ceiling. Okay, so how did this limonite get here? Not how did it get here, Ashley said, placing a hand on Sam's shoulder. It's always been here. The question is, how long does it take to oxidize and turn orange? Sam drew a breath, exhaled, suddenly seeing where Ashley was going with this. He held a piece of iron olivine in one hand and compared it to the limonite in the other. This entire chamber was filled with iron olivine. Once it is mined, the moment olivine comes free from its earthly confines, it meets with oxygen in the air and becomes oxidized. Right, now you're getting it. So how long does it take green olivine to oxidize into orange limonite? Ashley exhaled, shaking her head. No more than a couple of hours, I should think. Which means we're a few hours too late? I'm afraid so. Sam looked at who, who was still taking samples and running tests on the depleted mine site. Come on, we gotta go. Chapter 73 Sam moved quickly. They passed back through the horizontal tunnel and began the long climb out from the 600-odd-foot-tall quartzite pillar. Together, the three of them set up a rotating system where one would rest on the platform while the next two leapfrogged past. This way, every third section, each person got an extra-long rest break. Even so, it was slow going and hard work. They dropped their backpacks, keeping only their weapons and single radio. They didn't want to slow their ascent rate with additional weight. Somewhere, roughly two-thirds, possibly even higher, up the mine shaft, Ashley asked, What do you think that is? What's what? Sam asked. She fixed the beam of her flashlight on the small device. The red light seemed to be flashing at a faster rate. That device... I didn't see it on our way down. Bomb! Sam swore. Run! Chapter 74 They set a new climbing record, all three of them. The vertical mine shaft was narrow and difficult to maneuver, but they managed it. All three looked like a freakish combination somewhere between a parkour 
and speed climber champion. Sam yelled, When the bomb goes off, keep your head down, your mouths open, and try to relax your muscles. They were on the second platform when the bomb exploded. Sam instinctively threw Ashley to the ground. Both he and who protectively covered her with their bodies. It was a natural response, a genetic thing and a gender thing. Both men knew Ashley was perfectly capable of fighting her own battles, but when it came down to it, women and children first was bred into them, hardwired into their Y chromosomes. The blast wave washed over them. High above them, the sound of multiple explosions echoed. Rocks and debris fell like a storm of solid rain. It all came to pass after a little over a minute. Sam sat up. His head hurt and his ears were ringing like mad. Everyone all right? Alive, who responded with indifference. Sam moved his flashlight to the side of Ashley. You? I'm okay. My ears are still ringing, but I'm alive. Good, let's keep going so we can make sure to stay that way. They kept climbing, making decent time once more. Sam shook his head. I would have noticed that bomb on our way down. What are you saying? Ashley asked. Who answered? He is saying that Kiri and her goons must have been inside one of those disused mine shafts when we entered. They waited until we passed, and then headed on to the vertical shaft and to freedom. That sucks, she said. Come on, Sam said. We can still catch them. Maybe Genevieve and Tom already have eyes on them. We sure as hell better hope so, who said ominously. They kept climbing. Two, then three rest platforms, until they reached an impassable section. There had been a second explosion, the rubble of which had blocked part of their escape route. If they worked on it for a few hours, they might just make it large enough for who to slip through and get help. They were pondering these problems when they were interrupted by a new sound, one of whirling and swirling. A gush of air seemed to permeate the ancient vertical tunnel system. The air felt heavier, almost oppressive. Ashley said, Is that what I think it is? Sounds like water whose throat tightened, and he found it hard to swallow. Water, Ashley frowned. Where the hell does water come from above a 600-foot totem pole? Sam shook his head, turning to look for an alternative exit. If I had to guess, I'd say one of the explosions redirected the course of that waterfall. Whose face turned ashen? Oh, shit! Chapter 75 They stripped off their shirts. Then they began jamming the cotton material into the small holes in the gaps in the rubble, along with anything and everything else they could get their hands on to block the flow of the incoming water. But it was useless against the torrent. More like trying to plug the hole of a dam with a bag of sand. The water gushed through crevices, pouring down upon them like the torrential flow of a cracked fire hydrant. It formed a waterfall that ripped through the confined space of the vertical shaft. The downpour was too much. It knocked Ashley's lithe frame, sending her falling backward. Sam reached out, grabbing her by her shoulder at the last minute, her legs dangling above fifteen feet of air. He pulled her back into the ledge. Are you all right? She said, No, but I'll live. Come on, let's get away from this ledge. Agreed. The three of them descended to the ledge below. Who said, We have bigger problems. Sam asked, What? Who pointed his flashlight downward. The first explosion had caused two large boulders to break free, wedging together twenty-five feet below. It had caused a watertight plug in the ancient shaft. Already the water was several feet high and filling quickly. Ashley turned white. Well, fuck a duck. We're going to drown. Sam's eyes darted between the rapidly filling dam below them and the rocky barrier above before meeting her gaze. I wouldn't be so sure. 
We need a deus ex machina to get out of this one, Ashley snapped, nearing the end of her patience. Deus ex machina? Who asked? Ashley said, where an unsolvable problem is suddenly and abruptly resolved by an unexpected and unlikely occurrence, literally translated as God from the Machine, it's in reference to implausible plots in a movie or book. I thought of it as I feel like I've been living in an action movie ever since I met you, Sam Riley. Sorry about that, Sam said, but we'll figure this out. When I'm in a bad spot, I give it time. A solution will come to one of us. What options do we have? Who asked. Sam said, two that I can see. Ashley exhaled slowly, somewhat relieved by his composure. I'm listening. First option is the weight of the water above gets so tremendous that it pushes that wedge free. Ashley looked up. The fear written on her face showed she could imagine the rocky ceiling coming free would almost certainly kill them all with falling debris, even if it prevented them from drowning. She steeled her nerve. And the second option? Same equation. The one below us breaks free. Wouldn't we still be caught down here? Sure, but you forget Tom and Genevieve are topside. Eventually they realize we're not coming, and even the most basic investigation will reveal we're trapped. After that, it's only a matter of time before they move hell and high water to get us out. So our best chance is to wait this out? Sam nodded reassuringly. Probably our only one. Time passed quickly. The water rose. It became obvious their entire world, a corridor between two impassable objects, was getting smaller. Even Sam could see the truth. There was no way out. Water was flooding in, and they were going to drown. The water reached the ledge they were on, lapping playfully like a devil at their feet. Who swore? Sam remembered the man couldn't swim. He would die first. Whose eyes lit up? A sardonic grin spread across his lips as he swore and drew his sword. Sam frowned. Don't do anything rash just yet. Give it time. We don't have time, who said. Hey, I'm up for anything, but I don't see how a sword is likely to help. Don't end your life yet. Give it every last chance for something to happen. Who pulled the blade free from its protective scabbard? The blade gleamed with the iridescent gold of dragon's breath. I'm not trying to kill myself. This will either save our lives... Ashley swallowed hard. Or, who shrugged, end them faster. Chapter 76 Sam's eyes narrowed as he watched whose blade make contact with the cave wall. Having seen the effects of Dragon's breath on stone, he half expected for a moment that the weapon would slice through the cavern like some sort of Jedi lightsaber. Instead, who began etching away at the soft sandstone quartzite? The sword chimed as the ancient weapon cut a fraction of an inch into the soft stone, slowly forming the shape of a small door, just big enough for all three of them to possibly climb through. It might even succeed if they had several days to work on it, a moment later, the stone began to disassemble. Then a small gust of air whipped around, and the wall imploded. It was like a plug had been removed in a giant bathtub. A small whirlpool formed, and the newly formed pond began to swirl. There was a horrific sucking sound where the water siphoned through the opening. It roared like a torrent. One by one, all three of them were caught up in the powerful vortex. They were ripped around the downward spiral. If they didn't get out of the fast-running current, they would be sucked under and spat out through the deadly and freshly formed opening. Sam reached up, trying to grab anything he could. 
his head and body swirling, he was unable to comprehend what was up or down. And then suddenly he was in an open space, free-falling. His arms flailed, windmilling in the air for a few seconds, before clasping at a large vine that draped from the outside of the quartzite pillar. Sam's hands gripped on tight, arresting his fall. A second or two later, he was swinging. Next to him, who and Ashley caught and held on to other vines for dear life. Sam glanced down. They were dangling some four or five hundred feet above the ground. His eyes darted upward where the torrent of water was mercifully turning to mist high above them. All three of them glanced at each other. Nobody said a word. Their expressions told their mutual story. We're so completely and utterly screwed. Sam committed every last bit of strength just to hanging on. A Herculean effort that was doomed to fail, as even the strongest climbers know, your arms are only designed to hold your body weight for so long. Above them, the tone of the howling waterfall changed its pitch. In a somewhat surreal way, the water began to alter its course, as though blown in the opposite direction. Dragon's breath had changed the course of the river. He didn't know where it was going, nor did he care, as long as it wasn't flowing anywhere near him. Then Sam heard the distinctive whoop-whoop sound of the Eurocopter's powerful rotor blades beating the air above them. Ashley asked, What the hell is that? Sam grinned. That's our deus ex machina. Chapter 77 Kiri Villaflor woke up with a jolt. she just had that nightmare again. In it she was still a little girl, in the house her mother had grown up in, on the low-lying Marshall Islands in the Pacific. The cyclones, the southern hemisphere's equivalent of hurricanes, came through. The water kept rising. She and her mom tried to run, to find higher ground. There was none within the Marshall Islands. They climbed a nearby coconut tree. Both good climbers, they quickly scaled it all the way to the top. Yet the ocean's water kept coming. It rose right up to their feet, lapping away like some sort of hungry beast, eager to take them from this world. Then the water swept them both away. It was a nightmare that many Pacific nation people shared, a sort of collective form of post-traumatic stress disorder. For many of those living in Pacific nations, rising sea levels quite literally posed an existential threat. Atoll islands such as Kiribati, the Marshall Islands, Tuvalu, and the Maldives, to name just a few, were in danger of disappearing over the coming decades, all while scientists and politicians debated the effects of climate change. It was almost as though the nightmare was scarred into her most fundamental genetic makeup, her lizard brain. The truth be told, she never even visited the Marshall Islands. Kiri's mother married a wealthy businessman in Spain. Kiri had grown up in Barcelona, living a highly privileged life, and identifying as a European more than Polynesian. But she'd seen recent videos of her mother's homeland being inundated by the rising seas. It had touched her soul and triggered nightmares in a way she would have once never believed possible. Genetics! she marveled, designed to store a collective story of her blood. Fears and desires were all coded into her DNA, her brain hardwired to a certain type of thinking. Incredible! That brought her to her father's history. Her ancestor was the captain of a Spanish slave ship called the Midas. In 1829, the captain a man named Oliver de Leon, came into possession of a map that purported to lead to a secret weapon called Dragon's Breath. 
a weapon that held the power to destroy vast amounts of land, sinking them all the way to the sea. Whoever wielded such a machine would be capable of unstoppable power. De Leon was set to go in search of the fabled dragon's breath after he finished a final run across the Atlantic, transferring slaves from Mendeland to the Caribbean. During that voyage, the slaves revolted, taking the Midas, before being placed under the protection of Queen Elizabeth of England. Armed with the Queen's special letter of mark, which offered its holders legitimacy to pirate Spanish and Portuguese vessels, the Midas continued to pirate the profitable waters of the Caribbean for three years, before strangely disappearing somewhere along the east coast of Africa. De Leon, who had managed to trade his wealth of navigational secrets for his life, was marooned on a small island off the coast of Zanzibar. Years later, he managed to return to Spain, where he tried to find out what had become of the Midas, but there was no further news of the ship, and it was presumed lost at sea. Until recently, when legendary explorer Sam Riley had found its wreckage and located the Dragon's Breath map. It was here that Kiri discovered, through her connections with people within the Yuxia, who had sworn to protect the secrets of Dragon's Breath, that the shipwreck had been found and its map revealed. After that, her strategy materialized at unbelievable speeds, all the time. While she planned it down to its infinite detail, she teased herself, challenging herself, as though she didn't even believe she could go through with it. Funny, she thought, what people were capable of under the right set of circumstances. People, she knew, were incredible liars. Everyone told them. The most prolific lies, though, were the ones people told themselves. Humans control their own personal narrative, shaping it, rearranging events in their own mind, so things made sense. Until everything came together into a nice jigsaw piece, and they were perfectly justified in their own minds, nobody believed they were bad. There was a lie and a rational reason for everything. Kiri pulled these strings of human deceit when she first broached the subject with the four permanent members of her board of directors for the Infinity Group. The global real estate conglomerate was already rich. Unfortunately, the value of property, which seemed to be forever on an upward trajectory, had turned of late, and for the past few years there had been a downward trend and people were discovering the pain and hardship of negative equity. Shareholders were angry with her company, Infinity Group, who had historically achieved unimaginable financial results for its investors. And who wouldn't be? After all, they had trusted in the company, and in her specifically. A lot of people were going to go bankrupt. Kiri smiled as she thought about it all, the board of directors quickly saw the benefit to such a scheme as they weighed it up on their imaginary balance scales. On one side, there were riches and people praising their ability to steer the ship through such treacherous times and still achieve great returns. Then, on the other hand, there was devastating financial loss, bankruptcies, shame, and inevitably bankers taking their own lives. Of course, there was still the matter of the horrific loss of life such a scheme would inflict, yet even that, too, could easily be washed clean with the lies we tell ourselves and the development of a reality that we concoct. Earth is already overpopulated. All life is irrelevant. Why is human life so much more valuable than the 80 billion animals brought to the slaughter for meat production. Kiri thought about them all. 
If she wanted, she too could have concocted just such a fantasy reality for herself. Maybe she needed to see the demise of America after that nation, one of the greatest CO2 emitters on Earth, pulled out of the Paris Agreement. It would be a good lie. People could understand something like that. Not her fault. She saw rage when she watched the children of her mother's homeland get swept away by rising seas. Who could blame her? Yet Kiri was one of those rare individuals capable of telling the truth, at least to herself. If she was going to tell herself a narrative, it might as well be the truth. At least then, she could be honest about that. And what was the truth? Kiri was a megalomaniacal, homicidal sociopath who was greedy and willing for millions of people to die in order to be rich and to avoid her ultimate fear of bankruptcy. There, she said it. At least she owned it. She got out of bed, had a shower, got dressed, and drove herself to the airport. Kiri always flew via her private jet, but suspected that by now her name and flight details would be plastered on every hit list. Today she was flying commercial, economy class, under an alias which she had spent a fortune to have a matching American passport. Drawing a deep breath, she got on the flight with a feeling of satisfaction. Then she settled into the uncomfortable seat and drifted off to sleep. Tomorrow, the world would be a very different place, and she would be one of the richest people in it. Chapter 78 Pentagon, Virginia The mood inside the office of the Secretary of Defense was a somber mixture of incredulity and terror. The Secretary of Defense sat on one side of the blue couch, along Scott Medbury, a five-star general, and Dwight Richards, the head of the FAA. On the opposite side sat Sam Riley and Ashley Calder. The Secretary of Defense said, So, you're telling me if this bomb reaches American soil... The entire North American continent could sink into the ocean. Sam nodded. If we let it. The secretary turned to Dwight Richards. How likely are we to let this thing enter U.S. soil? The director of the FAA said, We're doing our best, ma'am. What are the chances? Hard to say for sure. But the only way to prevent this happening would be to ground all commercial flights. That can't be done, the secretary said. Scott Medbury said, It can, and was, during 9-11. The secretary nodded. I remember. That was more than 4,000 aircraft grounded. The problem is that wouldn't work in this situation. We need to set up a permanent no-fly zone above U.S. land until Kiri Villaflor is found along with the bomb. Besides... Given how small this device could be, and its ability to be hidden, I think it's unlikely to stop her. Our only hope is to find her and locate that weapon. Maybe be better to keep her in the dark. Maybe she will slip up, and we can catch her with the bomb. Which brings me to the next question, Dr. Calder. Is there any way we can narrow down where the bomb will be placed? Yes, Ashley nodded opening her laptop and turning it to face the secretary. I've narrowed it down to just 15 places. The secretary arched an eyebrow. How? I thought this dragon's breath was capable of causing a chain reaction of implosions, meaning the thing would continue indefinitely until the water of the ocean disrupted it. That's right, but like a fire, it isn't guaranteed to keep burning. Why not? Ashley pointed toward the detailed map of North America. We know both water and mercury disrupt the chain reaction. 
there's not a lot of natural mercury found at levels needed to help, but there are places with more water. If someone wanted to cause the maximum amount of damage, they would want to position the bomb in a dry region, preferably underground, where rain, wind, and other natural variances are unable to have any effect. The secretary asked, Would Villaflor know this? Ashley nodded. Her team raided CERN last week, taking hostage some of the best theoretical nuclear physicists on Earth, so we can safely assume she knows as much as we do about Dragon's Breath and its potential. Okay, so what areas should our people be looking out for? Dry places, deserts, particularly ones with dry caves where Dragon's Breath could be allowed to burn unrestrained gathering enough momentum to overcome bodies of water throughout the continent. Ashley handed the secretary a list of specific locations. These are the places that I would guard. The secretary took the paper, glanced at it, and passed it along to the five-star general. Scott, do you want to ensure your people are moving into position to protect these sites and any others that meet Dr. Calder's descriptions? Yes, ma'am. Sam said, May I make a suggestion? The secretary said, Go ahead. Sam said, We don't want to give the game away by stationing soldiers at every desert. I mean, even if we get exceptionally lucky and have a guard at the right location, what's to stop Kiri simply moving another mile out of the way? The secretary nodded. What do you suggest? We need people in helicopters, equipped with water, ready to go. Dr. Calder discovered that Dragon's Breath struggled with sub-freezing conditions. Therefore, these helicopters need to be equipped with liquid nitrogen. Okay, so an army of helicopters, positioned around the continent, armed with liquid nitrogen, like some sort of high-tech firefighters. In the meantime, we need to examine these high-risk areas. Try and get inside Kiri's mind and predict where she might naturally go. How could we do that? Picture it. Even if she gets here by aircraft, she will still have to drive to a location and then probably go on foot for the last of it. So we need to find caves in dry areas, accessible by foot. Dwight Richards said, Actually, that's not entirely correct. Sorry, Sam said. What isn't? Our records show Kiri Villaflor is a registered helicopter pilot with more than 600 hours of flying under her belt. Well, that just opens her options right up, the secretary said. Sam grinned. No, it doesn't. If we're lucky, it just narrowed it. How so? the secretary asked. If she can fly herself... It's almost a certainty that's what she will try to do. We have records of every helicopter in the country. Now all we need to do is track down the ones closest to these locations. We'll arrange surveillance and find out if anyone goes to move them. The secretary smiled. You're right. Okay, let's get a move on. Chapter 79. Boulder City, Nevada The Airbus EcoStar 130 helicopter flew south along the Colorado River. It was painted blue and advertised chartered tourist flights departing from Las Vegas. It was a modern and sleek-looking machine, filled with new technology, including a Fenestron anti-torque device that blended into the tail in place of a conventional tail rotor. At the controls, Sam Riley was maneuvering the machine along the canyon. Beside him, Ashley searched the nearby hills and caves for any sign of Kiri Villaflor. Several large desert bighorn sheep clambered up the steep, rocky slopes of the Black Canyon as the Colorado River snaked through the more than thousand-foot-deep, rugged desert gorge. One bald eagle, unimpressed by the arrival of the helicopter, took refuge in a small cave along the canyon's wall. 
They passed the remnants of a World War II-era magnesium mine, and on the southern Arizona side of the river, the Liberty Bell Arch came into view, perched high on a barren buttress. Its name originated from the hollowed negative space formed by the arch's resemblance to the iconic Liberty Bell in Philadelphia. The helicopter banked to the left to keep track of the twisting canyon, and they flew across the Arizona hot springs, where more than 30 people were happily basking in the sun and soaking up the warm water. Sam glanced at Ashley. Any sign of her? Nothing yet. Sam's jaw was set hard. She's out here. We just have to find her. Ashley said, find her in time. They had left Las Vegas 40 minutes earlier, searching for any sign of Kiri or Dragon's Breath. They were just one of the thousands of people involved in the secret search for the worst terrorist in the history of the human race. Tom and Genevieve had taken off from Las Vegas and were currently searching the area north of Lake Mead. Just five minutes ago, he had received a call. A woman matching Kiri Villaflor's descriptions, including being exceptionally beautiful, had rented a Robinson 22 training helicopter from a private airfield in Boulder City. She had paid cash and left her rented Mercedes as surety. According to the instructor, who only noticed the facts sitting in the office regarding the warning and search for Kiri Villaflor after she left, he witnessed her take off and head toward the Colorado River. An MQ-9 Reaper unmanned aerial vehicle had been launched from Creech Air Force Base in Clark County, Nevada, where pilots remotely operated the surveillance machine, searching for signs of Kiri. Simultaneously, a squadron of F-16s took off from Nellis Air Force Base, spreading out in search of her helicopter at supersonic speeds. Even as they searched for her, debate was raging at the Pentagon. The question was whether or not the F-16s should shoot her down as soon as they spotted her, or whether their AIM-9 Sidewinder heat-seeking short-range air-to-air missiles would effectively neutralize the threat or trigger Dragon's Breath to explode and ignite the molecular conflagration that would destroy North America. The helicopter flew across Emerald Cove, a massive limestone littoral cave that descended hundreds of feet into the side of the Black Canyon. The sun's rays glistened at just the right angle, hitting the water, causing deep reflections off the sediment on the cave walls. It gave the river the unique green appearance from which the cove inherited its name. Sam took the helicopter up higher. They flew south another three minutes, and Ashley pointed toward the northern Nevada side of the river and shouted, There! Sam's gaze followed where she was pointing. On the dusty red ground, a single Robinson 22 helicopter had landed, its rotor blades already completely still. He circled the area with his helicopter. Where is she? Ashley shook her head. I don't see her. Sam took the aircraft down, landing 50 feet from the other helicopter and keeping his eyes on the Robinson 22. The helicopter was tiny, more like a motorbike with a rotor blade and a big bubble dome for a cockpit than a helicopter. It was impossible to hide inside. He shut the Airbus helicopter down and removed the key lock that disabled the ignition circuitry and prevented tourists from stealing the expensive machine. The last thing he needed was for the terrorists to escape with their own helicopter. Sam reached back and grabbed his backpack. It was small and full of military equipment. In his hands, he carried a submachine gun, while Ashley carried a small bottle of liquid nitrogen that looked like a fire extinguisher. Together, they were armed with all that stood between a deadly extremist and the end of the North American continent. They reached the Robinson 22. No sign of Kiri or where she might have gone. 
Sam's eyes swept the entire region. Nothing. You've got to be kidding me, Ashley said. Maybe she ran away somewhere. I didn't see anyone from the air, and all of this ground is flat until you reach the Colorado Gorge. Ashley shook her head. So where does that leave us? I have no idea. Sam opened the door to the Robinson 22. There was no sign of anything within the aircraft. Then he looked down and laughed. He saw the mouth of a small crevice descending into a cave. Kiri had hidden the entrance with the Robinson 22. Chapter 80 the helicopter's skids had landed parallel to the cave's entrance. Its fuselage provided the perfect camouflage to the terrorist's hiding place. The mouth was narrow enough for an adult to slide through and maybe five feet long. It barely looked big enough for someone to enter, let alone disappear inside. But the mouth of caves, Sam knew better than anyone else alive, were poor examples of what one might find within them. Some of the largest cave systems on the planet started out from openings no bigger than a child. Sam grabbed a block of C4 from his backpack. He grinned. As usual, Genevieve was right. Always bring the C4. He placed it next to the helicopter's fuel tank, attached the digital timer, and set it for five minutes. Ashley glanced at him, curiosity in her eyes, but she didn't say anything. They were running out of time, and every second counted. Sam dropped his backpack, attaching a flashlight to his MP5 submachine gun and dumping the rest of the equipment. He moved quickly, descending into the small opening of the cave. The cavern below was like a mirage, or a TARDIS for those who watched Doctor Who, as he had expected, despite the tiny opening, the cave system was massive. Sam knocked over a few stones as he clambered down inside. The rocks rolled, their sound echoing far into the chamber. In the darkness up ahead, he heard the sound of heavy breathing. It was followed by someone running. Sam shouted, Kiri! It's over! The woman stopped. She was holding a large jar. It looked almost like a ceramic amphora, similar to those used by the ancient Greeks to transport wine and oil. The pot had a pointed bottom, twin handles, and a sealed cork. Presumably the dragon's breath bomb was stored inside. Kiri held up the jar. Don't come any closer, or I drop this and kill us all, Sam said. You don't want to do that. Kiri smiled. Even under these horrific circumstances, Sam couldn't help but wonder how many hearts that very smile had melted. You don't know what I want, Mr. Riley. No, but I'm happy to listen. I bet you are. Her eyes flashed seductively. But I'm not interested in talking. Sam shrugged. All right, don't talk, just listen. Kiri remained silent but held the jar out farther, as though threatening to throw it on the ground and end everything. Sam said, surely you must realize that if you drop that, you'll kill yourself. Maybe I'll be long gone before it destroys this chamber. Maybe, Sam admitted. But even if you do leave the chamber, you'll never outrun it. Why? A Robinson 22 flies at 109 knots. I think I'll be fine. Possibly. Sam turned to Ashley. Dr. Calder, do you think 109 knots is fast enough to outrun Dragon's Breath? I doubt it. Maybe for a little bit, but because Dragon's Breath works on an exponential chain reaction, it would quickly overtake the helicopter. So what? Kiri said, slowly shifting her position so that she could get closer to the cave's entrance. Helicopters fly above it. That's fine, Sam admitted. 
but you'd better hope you can swim, because last time I checked a Robinson 22's fuel range wasn't anywhere near the two or more thousand miles you'll need to fly to reach the safety of land. I'll be fine, Kiri said. Sam shrugged. Suit yourself. An explosion rocked the ground outside. It was immediately followed by a second one, most likely caused by the Robinson 22's fuel tank igniting in a ball of fire. Kiri swore and looked at Sam. What the hell was that? Sam said, that was your ride, disappearing. A wry grin formed on her lips. You blew up my helicopter. Afraid so. Why would you do that? Because I'd rather no one gets off this rock than you get away with murdering millions of people. You think I'm doing this just to murder millions? Perhaps because I want vengeance? I don't have any clue why you want to kill everyone in North America. Well, for the record, this has nothing to do with murder. I'm simply one of those people who can't live with failure. And bankruptcy was not an option. You're doing all this for a sum of money? For lots and lots of money, she corrected him. And yes, I'm doing it all for cold, hard cash. Oldest reason in the book. But there you have it. I just want to be filthy rich. Kiri had positioned herself, so she was now halfway between Sam and the entrance to the cave. It was fifty-fifty whether or not she would make it. Sam couldn't shoot her while she held the jar of dragon's breath. Too dangerous. He might accidentally set about the destruction of half the American continent. She made a split-second decision to roll the dice. Sam and Ashley raced toward her. Kiri was fast, really fast. Like the sort of sprinter that only someone with extensive track and field time might have achieved. For a second, Sam thought she was going to make it, and she probably would have, but it was dark, and caves are notoriously known for having uneven ground. Kiri's right leg was the one that let her down. It tripped on something, and she fell forward. She threw her arms out, trying to protect her head. It was instinctive, drummed into the primitive part of her brain throughout the ages, Nothing she could do could override that. The ceramic jar fell, it hit a rock, the jar fractured into a dozen pieces, and Dragon's breath erupted. The iridescent metallic powder landed on her face. Kiri's strikingly beautiful face distorted in a mixed fury of abject horror and disbelief. She wouldn't give up her life. She knew the only chance she had to survive was to remove the skin touched by Dragon's breath. She clawed away at her face, her fingernails digging in hard, drawing blood, and pulling the flesh off her once beautiful visage in large chunks. She screamed. Unthinkingly, Ashley moved to help her. Sam lifted his arm to caution her to stop. The cave echoed with the wraith-like sound of a tormented soul. Sam, unable to witness such suffering, aimed his MP5 directly at her chest and squeezed the trigger. It was a short burst of gunfire. The shots fired true, landing at the center of her chest, a narrow grouping of five bullets. And Kiri Villaflor went peacefully silent before disappearing completely. Chapter 81 Ashley emptied the contents of the liquid nitrogen fire extinguisher on Dragon's breath. It didn't work. Not even close. The vortex grew in all its rainbow glory. Sam swore. We've got to get out of here. Ashley held back. We can't go. If we let this chain reaction continue to grow, it will sink Canada and the United States. Sam grabbed her hand. Come on! No! I have an idea. Well aware of Sam's ideas, Ashley stopped resisting and followed him. Together they ran through the monstrous cavern, 
before quickly clambering up the narrow crevice through which they had entered. The explosion had destroyed the Robinson 22, leaving a clear opening to the sky through the mouth of the cavern's entrance. Together they climbed on board the Airbus EcoStar 130 helicopter. Sam inserted the ignition key lock and flicked the ignition switches. The powerful turbine engine slowly powered up. The massive rotor blade came to life. Ashley said, I don't mean to rush you. Yeah, yeah, I know. We're about to be eaten up by dissolving ground. Sam's eyes locked on the gauge that measured rotor blade RPM. It seemed to be crawling to its desired rate. Sam grinned. We've been here before. The helicopter approached takeoff speed. The ground below began to crumble. Sam! Ashley shouted. His eyes darted toward the ground. It looked like a giant slithering snake eating its way through the topsoil. The solid ground was turning into unstable pebbles. The helicopter shook. I see it, Sam said, adjusting the controls. The main rotor blade's RPM just wasn't fast enough to take off, but it might be enough to prevent them from sinking. The helicopter stabilized. A crack formed along the ground like a slice of earthquake before giving way completely. The RPM hit that magic number. Sam raised the collective stick and the helicopter reached into the air. Below them, the ground dissolved into a large sinkhole, exponentially spreading deeper and wider. It wouldn't take long before that abyss would eat away the entire continent. Ashley said, Where are you heading? The Hoover Dam. Her eyes widened. Why, what are you thinking? Sam set his jaw with tenacity. I'm thinking to save North America, I'm going to have to become the most hated man in America. Chapter 82 Hoover Dam, Nevada The Airbus EcoStar 130 helicopter flew north at its maximum speed. Sam said, in my left cargo pocket is a phone. I need you to call the Secretary of Defense. Her number is the first one in my contact list. Ashley grabbed the cell phone, quickly scrolling through his address list. Found it! Great. Hit the call button and put it on speaker. She did, raising the volume to maximum. It was hard to hear anything above the sound of the helicopter's turbines and rotor blades, but impossible for Sam to relinquish any of the controls long enough to pick up the phone himself. Sam, came the voice of the Secretary of Defense. Sam said, Madam Secretary, I need you to enact whatever disaster plan is set in place to protect people downriver in the event the Hoover Dam gets destroyed. Wait, why? There's no time, just do it. I don't know how many lives will be lost if you wait. Okay. Is Kiri going to destroy the Hoover Dam? No, Sam said emphatically. I am. And if we're lucky, it might just save all of North America. Chapter 83 The Hoover Dam came into view. Ashley said, That's the Hoover Dam. It's 660 feet thick concrete at the base. You're going to need something a lot bigger than a couple blocks of C4 to take it out. Sam grinned. Good thing we have something that likes to eat matter. She looked at him through an arched eyebrow. You want to use the remaining bag of dragon's breath? He shrugged. Hey, they say fight fire with fire. Okay, that's a stupid saying. Fire would just make more fire. Right. Forget the stupid analogy. We need to destroy the dam and cause one hell of a flood that will extinguish that dragon's breath sinkhole. Ashley reached into her backpack and retrieved the small silk satchel that Tom and Genevieve had found in the rocky outcrop in Greenland. Got it! Sam brought the helicopter around to the top of the Hoover Dam. He hovered above it for a moment, then circled back around, dropping altitude. He said, I'm going to take us down toward the base. The wind is blowing upward along the dam. When I bank to the left, scatter the dragon's breath. Understood. 
Ashley opened the small side window. Ready! Sam brought the helicopter around, banking hard so that the massive 760-foot concrete contemporary megalith came into view. Ashley spread the dragon's breath. It flustered out the window, landing on the giant concrete wall. Nothing happened for a few seconds. Sam and Ashley held their breaths. Silence was broken by a giant flash of white light, followed by several iridescent fire devils, their sinister vortexes dancing happily all over the wall. A hole formed in the middle of the dam. Water poured out through it, raging down the Colorado River. Sam brought the helicopter up, gaining altitude, until they had a clear view of the river, the dam, and the massive expanding sinkhole where Kiri Villaflor's dragon's breath had struck. The raging waters filled the hole, extinguishing the wrath of dragon's breath. It surged and swamped the hole in the ground, rising out through the Colorado Gorge. Behind them, the dragon's breath had been extinguished along the Hoover Dam by the flow of water from Lake Mead. The powerful torrent of water brought with it huge amounts of debris, slowly blocking the gap in the dam. Ashley looked at the remaining sections of Hoover Dam. It wasn't all gone. A large hole had been created, sure, but once water hit it, the implosion stopped. Enough water got through to stop the destructive chain reaction. She smiled. We did it! Yeah, we did. We saved the continent. That's good. I've always been kind of fond of it. Me too. Sam turned to head back to the helicopter base in Las Vegas. Ashley said, Oh, shit! What? Look! Sam stared at the flooring of the helicopter. It became glassy, almost transparent. Ashley lifted her legs up onto her seat, doing everything possible to avoid being touched with dragon's breath. The tiniest bit of powder would kill her. Sam swore. Some of the dragon's breath must have blown onto the helicopter's skids. A second later, the engine's multi-warning alarm blared. He adjusted the helicopter, setting it up for an immediate engine failure auto-rotation drill. A second later, the engine cut out completely. Chapter 84 the Airbus EcoStar 130 helicopter held its position in the sky for a split second before losing its battle with gravity. Sam felt the cyclic stick lose all resistance as the main rotor blades lost RPMs and no longer created lift. The altimeter, which was based on air pressure, showed they were falling at a rate of 2,000 feet per minute. Power's gone, Sam said, as he lowered the collective all the way down. This allowed the main rotor blades to spin freely and pick up RPM speed, and at the same time maintain a normal angle of attack, similar to a glide position in a fixed-wing aircraft. He then shoved the cyclic stick as far forward as it would go. With his right foot, he pressed hard on the pedal in an attempt to counteract the sudden loss of torque normally provided by the engine. He hoped to prevent the helicopter from entering a death spiral. The immediate result was that instead of an uncontrolled drop, Sam maintained command of the helicopter as it fell rapidly from the sky in a process known as auto-rotation. Ashley asked, What do you need me to do? Sam said, Try the power switch. Maybe we can get the engines to fire one more time before we hit the ground. She flicked the switches next to her in an attempt to restart the engine. Power's not coming back. Copy. Sam glanced at the altimeter. We're at 500 feet. I've commenced auto-rotation. I need a wet place to land. Ashley pointed toward a ritzy desert oasis. There! Lake Las Vegas! I see it. Lake Las Vegas was a resort community centered on its namesake, the artificial Lake Las Vegas. Sam banked gently, aiming toward the open water, avoiding water slides and watercraft. His eyes glanced at the RPM counter for the main rotor blades. The speed increased as the air started to flow up through the rotor system. 
He was still a long way off the speed required to land the helicopter. He turned gently to the left in order to set up for a landing into the wind and on to his final approach. What's my altitude and airspeed? Ashley read out. Sixty knots, forty feet. Sam nodded and pulled back on the cyclic control stick to commence flaring. The nose of the Airbus EcoStar 130 helicopter lifted, and their descent rate slowed from 2,000 feet per minute to 1,000 feet in an instant. At the same time, forward movement reduced to zero. The helicopter stabilized to a level attitude approximately seven feet off the ground. Sam gently raised the collective pitch, causing the main rotor blades to decrease RPM speed but increase lift. A moment later, the landing skids and entire bottom half of the helicopter disappeared, along with the engine above them, doors, and windshield. The controls came free of their connections on the floor of the helicopter. Sam was left holding the detached cyclic collective stick. It remained there, sitting stupidly in his hand. The helicopter sank gently into the water. Dragon's breath hissed as the water extinguished its subatomic chain reaction, dissolving matter flickered like someone playing with a light switch. Sam said, Get your belt off. He unclipped his belt. Ashley's mind was still switched on. Her belt was already unclasped. Water filled the entire cabin. Sam held his breath as a wave of liquid swamped their cockpit cabin. Together they swam out of the wreckage. Completely spent, they pulled themselves up along a sandy beach and onto the manicured green of a fancy golf course. Ashley wrapped her arms around Sam. They squeezed each other tight, both happy to be alive. Tearing away from him, she impulsively kissed Sam for all she was worth. It was slow and passionate and short-lived. She pulled away. Sam held her in a fierce embrace. They were on the same team. Despite every difficulty, dilemma, and challenge in their way, they won. We did it, she gasped. We saved the day. Sam grinned. That we did. Chapter 85 Hanalei Bay, Hawaii Two Days Later The Tehila rested peacefully at her anchor. It was the largest bay on the north shore of Kauai Island in Hawaii a well-protected shallow bay of pristine and tranquil green and blue waters, surrounded by a sandy beach and the striking giants of the Nepali coast. Sam, along with the rest of the crew of the Tehila, with the addition of Ashley Calder and Hu Ching Li, sipped cocktails. Caliburn happily lapped up some sort of liquid from his bowl. It was a uniquely doggy-formulated cocktail that even from a distance looked disgusting, but judging by his wagging tail, tasted divine. Sam's was an after-dinner mint made with creme de menthe, Bailey's, gin, fresh cream, chocolate, crushed ice, and garnished with fresh mint. It was new to him and tasted very good, like the delicious feeling of success. All had worked out well in the end, their insane attempt to stave off the destruction of the North American continent had paid off. The Hoover Dam had only partially been damaged, and the water, although having flooded some surrounding areas, had inflicted much less damage than expected. Sam read that the global real estate conglomerate Infinity Group had gone bankrupt. One of its members of the board of directors had been murdered by an unhappy investor who'd lost their life savings. Another one took his own life, and the other two were currently in prison, awaiting trial for embezzlement on a grand scale. Who asked, I have a question for you, Mr. Riley. Sam grinned. Just Sam. I think we're past formalities, given what we've been through together in the past few days. Okay, Sam, I have a question for you. Shoot. 
You use the alias Charles Paladin sometimes when you fly. It was a statement, not a question. Sam waited. Who got the hint? Why? Sam gave a half shrug. Why not? It's a unique alias. Who leaned back into his beach lounge and sipped his cocktail, a tequila sunrise? Yes, someone on board had wittily made a play on words with the classic Mexican drink. Who put the glass down? Almost medieval. You want to know why I use that name in particular? Yes. Sam crossed his arms. Look, I've read the dossier on you. You're an educated man, particularly in terms of history. So I'll make you a deal. If you can tell me the origin of the word paladin, I'll tell you why I use it. What do you say? Sure. Okay. What have you got for me? Who said, The paladins, or twelve peers, were twelve fictional knights of legend, the foremost members of Charlemagne's court in the eighth century. Who paused, smiling. Charlemagne's court. Charles. Sam nodded. Yes, I could hardly use Charlemagne, so I went with its shortened version of Charles. Go on. Who said, They first appear in the medieval poetic verse known as Chanson de Geste, in Matter of France, where they play a similar role to the Knights of the Round Table in Arthurian romance. In these romantic portrayals, the chivalric paladins represent Christianity against a Saracen, Muslim invasion of Europe. The names of the paladins vary between sources, but there are always twelve of them, a number with Christian associations, led by Roland. The paladin's most influential appearance is in the Song of Roland, written between 1050 and 1115, which narrates the heroic death of Roland at the Battle of Roncevaux Pass. Sam stopped him. That's very impressive, who? So why do you use it? Honestly, it's a kind of tribute to my brother. Your brother's name was Charles Peladin? No. When we were kids, we sometimes used to play computer games. Who frowned, not even attempting to hide his disappointment at such a simple answer? Okay. One that we particularly enjoyed was called Heroes of Might and Magic. It was one of those old-fashioned games set in a mythical world with knights and magicians. One particular class of characters included the knights errant known as a paladin. Who smiled? I'm aware of the concept of the knights errant. It's the closest equivalent to our Yuxia, to which I've dedicated my life. Sam smiled his eyes looking at who, but seeing a distant memory. My brother used to always pick the paladin. It seemed like a fitting name to use as an alias. Yeah, I guess so. Genevieve offered another round of cocktails. Sam simply took a bottle of tequila out of the drink cabinet and poured it, one for him and one for who. You look somewhat gloomy, who? What's wrong? Who said, it's over. Dragon's breath is no more. You sound somber. I am. Why? Sam asked. I would have thought you of all people would be stoked to see the last of it disappear, which according to Ashley, it truly has. There were no secondary aftershocks indicating more caches of the rare mineral. So why aren't you happy? I am, who agreed. But, after so many generations of protecting its secret, it's sad to find myself at the very end of it all. To be honest, I don't even know what to do with myself now. This has been my purpose, my family's purpose, for the past 2,300-odd years. Have a vacation, Sam suggested. You've earned it. I don't know how to have one. It's not that hard. You'll work it out. Who shrugged? Sure, but to be honest, I think I need something else in my life. Like what? I don't know. A purpose? 
A passion? Something to do? What are you good at? Hurting people. Who saw Sam's reaction? Protecting people, too. What do you like? Honestly, I like adventure. And I don't mind the occasional bit of violence in the process. Who shrugged? I guess there's not that much work for that sort of person. Hell, I think that's a good thing there isn't, for that matter. Sam smiled, but said nothing. Who looked him in the eye? What? Sam shrugged. You want a job? Whose eyes narrowed, a wry grin forming on his lips. With you? Yeah, why the hell not? Doing what? I don't know. But you would be surprised how often we could use a person with your unique skill set. Are you serious? Pay is adequate. Room and board are provided. Not that you ever stay in the same place long enough to enjoy it. The risk is high, but the adventure is out of this world. What do you say? Who shook Sam's hand with a firm shake? When do I start? Now? Sam laughed. Or at any rate, after your vacation. When you're ready. Who grinned? I have no affairs to get in order, or anywhere else to be. Sam laughed. Then welcome to the team. Chapter 86 Your stupid phone has been ringing non-stop down below, Elise said, throwing Sam his cell. He glanced at the missed calls. There were several in a row from the same number. It began to vibrate. Sam pressed the accept button. Madam Secretary? We have a problem. Sam said, I'm sorry about the Hoover Dam. I just couldn't think of any other solution, and it seemed to be the best of all possible outcomes. Forget the dam. The engineers will work that out. It's a public work. Governments and societies, for that matter, run off public works. You're not mad about the dam? If I had time, I might be. Sam said, what's happened? I need to send you to Antarctica. Sure, Sam said noncommittally. What's in Antarctica? The Russians have spent nearly a decade drilling into the Vostok Lake, at exactly 3 a.m. today, they broke through a little over two miles of ice to take core samples of water untouched for who knows how long. I remember reading about the project, Sam said. It was a scientific miracle, akin to landing a man or woman on the moon in terms of geological studies closer to home. They were using a two-mile-long drill, if I recall. It kept breaking. I think they were looking to take water samples from the sealed lake inside, which formed a sort of chemical and biological time capsule from 20 million years ago. That's right. As of an hour ago, they retrieved the first water samples and published the results. The findings were mildly interesting for the scientific community, but nothing that was world-changing. Okay, so why do you want me to go there? Because they lied about their findings, Sam. He shrugged. Obviously, she continued. Someone talked. Already teams from Germany, France, England, and Australia are all racing to intercept at the Russian-held part of Antarctica known as Vostok. That's not good. Sam drew a breath. What did they find? The Secretary of Defense's voice became cold as the Antarctic ice. Something that will change the course of human history and most likely our future forever. The End This has been Dragon's Breath, Sam Riley Series Book 25, written by Christopher Cartwright, narrated by David Gilmour. Copyright 2022 by Christopher Cartwright. Production Copyright 2022 by Christopher Cartwright. This is David Gilmore. Thank you for listening.